Moby Dick, or The Whale, by Herman Melville. Prologues. Etymology. Supplied by a late consumptive usher to a grammar school. The pale usher, threadbare in coat, heart, body, and brain, I see him now. He was ever dusting his old lexicons and grammars with a queer handkerchief, mockingly embellished with all the gay flags of all the known nations of the world. He loved to dust his old grammars. It somehow mildly reminded him of his mortality. Quote, While you take in hand to school others and to teach them by what name a whalefish is to be called in our tongue, leaving out through ignorance the letter H, which almost alone maketh the signification of the word, you deliver that which is not true. Hackluit. Quote, Whale, Swedish and Danish Hval. This animal is named from roundness or rolling, for in Danish, Havalt is arched or vaulted. Webster's Dictionary. Quote, Whale. It is more immediately from the Dutch and German Valen, Anglo-Saxon Valvian, to roll, to wallow. Richardson's Dictionary. Ketos, Greek. Ketos, Latin. Huel, Anglo-Saxon. Hvalt, Danish. Val, Dutch. Hval, Swedish. Hvale, Icelandic. Whale, English. Balen, French. Balena, Spanish. Piki Nui Nui, Fiji. Piki Nui Nui, Aromanguin. Extracts, supplied by a sub-sub librarian. It will be seen that this mere painstaking burrower and grubworm of a poor devil of a sub-sub appears to have gone through the long Vaticans and street stalls of the earth, picking up whatever random allusions to whales he could anyways find in any book whatsoever, sacred or profane. Therefore you must not, in every case at least, take the higgledy-piggledy whale statements, however authentic, in these extracts for veritable gospel cetology. Far from it. As touching the ancient authors generally, as well as the poets here appearing, these extracts are solely valuable or entertaining as affording a glancing bird's-eye view of what has been promiscuously said, thought, fancied, and sung of Leviathan by many nations and generations, including our own. So fare thee well, poor devil of a sub-sub, whose commentator I am. Thou belongst to that hopeless sallow tribe which no wine of this world will ever warm, and for whom even pale sherry would be too rosy strong, but with whom one sometimes loves to sit and feel poor devilish too, and grow convivial upon tears, and say to them bluntly with full eyes and empty glasses, and in not altogether unpleasant sadness, Give it up, sub-subs! For by how much the more pains you take to please the world, by so much more shall you forever go thankless. Would that I could clear out Hampton Court and the Tulleries for you! But gulp down your tears, and high aloft to the royal mast with your hearts, for your friends who have gone before are clearing out the seven-storied heavens, and making refugees of long-pampered Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael against your coming. Here you strike but splintered hearts together, there you shall strike unsplinterable glasses. Extracts Quote, And God created great whales. Genesis Quote, Leviathan maketh a path to shine after him, one would think the deep to be hoary. Job Quote, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah Quote, There go the ships, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. Psalms Quote, 
in that day the Lord, with his sore and great and strong sword, shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah. Quote, and what thing soever besides cometh within the chaos of this monster's mouth, be it beast, boat, or stone, down it goes all incontinently that foul great swallow of his, and perisheth in the bottomless gulf of his paunch. Holland's Plutarch's Morals Quote, The Indian Sea breedeth the most and biggest fishes that are, among which the whales and whirlpools called Belena take up as much in length as four acres or arpens of land. Holland's Pliny Quote, Scarcely had we proceeded two days on the sea, when about sunrise a great many whales and other monsters of the sea appeared. Among the former one was of a most monstrous size. This came towards us, open-mouthed, raising the waves on all sides, and beating the sea before him into a foam. Tooks Lucian the true history. Quote, he visited this country also with a view of catching horse whales, which had bones of very great value for their teeth, of which he brought some to the king. The best whales were catched in his own country, of which some were forty-eight, some fifty yards long. He said that he was one of six who had killed sixty in two days." other or author's verbal narrative taken down from his mouth by king alfred a d eight ninety quote, and whereas all the other things whether beast or vessel that enter into the dreadful gulf of this monster's whale's mouth are immediately lost and swallowed up the sea gudgeon retires into it in great security and there sleeps montaigne apology for raymond sebond Quote, let us fly, let us fly. Old Nick, take me if it's not Leviathan, described by the noble prophet Moses in the life of the patient Job. Rabelais. Quote, this whale's liver was two cartloads. Stowe's annals. Quote, the great Leviathan that maketh the seas to seethe like boiling pan. Lord Bacon's version of the Psalms. Quote, Touching that monstrous bulk of the whale or orc, we have received nothing certain. They grow exceeding fat, insomuch that an incredible quantity of oil will be extracted out of one whale. Ibid, History of Life and Death. Quote, the sovereignest thing on earth is parmacetti for an inward bruise. King Henry. Quote, very like a whale. Hamlet. Quote, which to secure no skill of leech's art, mote him avail, but to return again to his wounds worker that with lowly dart, dinting his breast, had bred his restless pain, like as the wounded whale to shore flies through the main. The Fairy Queen. Quote, Immense as whales, the motion of whose vast bodies can in a peaceful calm trouble the ocean till it boil. Sir William Davenant, Preface to Gondibert. Quote, what spermaceti is, men might justly doubt, since the learned Hosmanus, in his work of thirty years, saith plainly, Nescio quid sit. Sir T. Brown, of spermaceti and the spermaceti whale, vide his V. E. Quote, like Spencer's talus with his modern flail, he threatens ruin with his ponderous tail. Their fixed javelins in his side he wears, and on his back a grove of pikes appears. Waller's Battle of the Summer Islands Quote, By art is created that great leviathan, called a commonwealth or state, in Latin civitas, which is but an artificial man. Opening sentence of Hobbes's Leviathan. Quote, Silly Mansoul swallowed it without chewing, as if it had been a sprat in the mouth of a whale. Pilgrim's Progress. Quote, 
that sea beast leviathan which god of all his works created hugest that swim the ocean stream paradise lost Quote, there leviathan hugest of living creatures in the deep stretched like a promontory sleeps or swims and seems a moving land and at his gills draws in and at his breath spouts out a sea ibid Quote, the mighty whales which swim in a sea of water and have a sea of oil swimming in them fuller's profane and holy state Quote, so close behind some promontory lie the huge leviathan to attend their prey, and give no chance but swallow in the fry, which through their gaping jaws mistake the way. Dryden's Annus Mirabilis. Quote, While the whale is floating at the stern of the ship, they cut off his head, and tow it with the boat as near the shore as it will come, but it will be aground in twelve or thirteen feet water. Thomas Edges, Ten Voyages to Spitzbergen, in Purchase. Quote, in their way they saw many whales sporting in the ocean, and in wantonness fuzzing up the water through their pipes and vents, which nature has placed on their shoulders. Sir T. Herbert's Voyages into Asia and Africa, Harris Call. Quote, here they saw such huge troops of whales that they were forced to proceed with a great deal of caution, for fear they should run their ship upon them. Schouten's Sixth Circumnavigation Quote, We set sail from the Elba, wind northeast, in the ship called the Jonas and the Whale. Some say the whale can't open his mouth, but that is a fable. They frequently climb up the mast to see whether they can see a whale, for the first discoverer has a ducat for his pains. I was told of a whale taken near Shetland that had above a barrel of herrings in his belly. One of our harpooners told me that he caught once a whale in Spitzbergen that was white all over. A Voyage to Greenland, A.D. 1671. Harris Call. Quote, Several whales have come in upon this coast, Fife. Anno 1652, one eighty feet in length of the whalebone kind came in, which, as I was informed, besides a vast quantity of oil, did afford five hundred weight of baleen. The jaws of it stand for a gate in the garden of Pitferen. Sibald's Fife and Kinross. Quote, Myself have agreed to try whether I can master and kill this spermaceti whale, for I could never hear of any of that sort that was killed by any man, such as his fierceness and swiftness. Richard Straffer's Letter from the Bermudas, Philosophical Transactions, A.D. 1668. Quote, Whales in the Sea God's Voice Obey. N.E. Primer. Quote, we saw also abundance of large whales, there being more in those southern seas, as I may say, by a hundred to one, than we have had to the northward of us. Captain Cowley's Voyage Round the Globe, A.D. 1729. Quote, and the breath of a whale is frequently attended with such an insupportable smell as to bring on a disorder of the brain. Uloa's South America. Quote, to fifty chosen sylphs of special note, we trust the important charge, the petticoat. Oft we have known that sevenfold fence to fail, though stuffed with hoops and armed with ribs of whale. Rape of the Lock. Quote, if we compare land animals in respect to magnitude with those that take up their abode in the deep, we shall find that they will appear contemptible in the comparison. The whale is doubtless the largest animal in creation. Goldsmith, Natural History. Quote, if you should write a fable for little fishes, you would make them speak like great whales. Goldsmith to Johnson. Quote, in the afternoon we saw what was supposed to be a rock, but it was found to be a dead whale, which some Asiatics had killed and were then towing ashore. 
they seem to endeavor to conceal themselves behind the whale in order to avoid being seen by us. Cook's Voyages. Quote, the larger whales they seldom venture to attack. They stand in great dread of some of them, that when out at sea they are afraid to mention even their names, and carry dung, limestone, juniper wood, and some other articles of the same nature in their boats, in order to terrify and prevent their too near approach. Uno von Troil's Letters on Banks's and Salander's Voyage to Iceland in 1772. Quote, the spermaceti whale found by the Nantiquas is an active, fierce animal, and requires vast address and boldness in the fishermen. Thomas Jefferson's Whale Memorial to the French Minister in 1778. Quote, and pray, sir, what in the world is equal to it? Edmund Burke's reference in Parliament to the Nantucket whale fishery. Quote, Spain, a great whale stranded on the shores of Europe. Edmund Burke, somewhere. Quote, a tenth branch of the king's ordinary revenue, said to be grounded on the consideration of his guarding and protecting the seas from pirates and robbers, is the right to royal fish, which are whales and sturgeon, and these, when either thrown ashore or caught near the coast, are the property of the king. Blackstone. Quote, Soon to the sport of death the crews repair, Rodmond unerring o'er his head suspends, The barbed steel and every turn attends. Falconer's Shipwreck. Quote, Bright shone the roofs, the domes, the spires, and rockets blew self-driven, to hang their momentary fire around the vault of heaven. So fire with water to compare the ocean serves on high, upspouted by a whale in air to express unwieldy joy. Cowper on the Queen's visit to London. Quote, Ten or fifteen gallons of blood are thrown out of the heart at a stroke, with immense velocity. John Hunter's account of the dissection of a whale, a small-sized one. Quote, the aorta of a whale is larger in the bore than the main pipe of the waterworks at London Bridge, and the water roaring in its passage through that pipe is inferior in impetus and velocity to the blood gushing from the whale's heart. Paley's Theology. Quote, the whale is a mammiferous animal without hind feet, Baron Cuvier. Quote, in forty degrees south we saw spermaceti whales, but did not take any till the first of May, the sea being then covered with them. Colnett's voyage for the purpose of extending the spermaceti whale fishery. Quote, in the free element beneath me swam, floundered and dived in play, in chase, in battle, fishes of every color, form, and kind, which language cannot paint, and mariner had never seen, from dread leviathan to insect millions peopling every wave, gathered in shoals immense like floating islands, led by mysterious instincts through that waste and trackless region, though on every side assaulted by voracious enemies, whales, sharks, and monsters armed in front or jaw, with sword saws, spiral horns, or hooked fangs. Montgomery's World Before the Flood Io, Paean, Io, sing to the finny people's king. Not a mightier whale than this in the vast Atlantic is, not a fatter fish than he flounders round the polar sea. Charles Lamb's Triumph of the Whale. Quote, in the year 1690, some persons were on a high hill observing the whales spouting and sporting with each other, when one observed, there, pointing to the sea, is a green pasture where our children's grandchildren will go for bread. Obed Macy's History of Nantucket Quote, I built a cottage for Susan and myself, and made a gateway in the form of a Gothic arch, by setting up a whale's jaw-bones. Hawthorne's Twice-Told Tales Quote, She came to bespeak a monument for her first love, who had been killed by a whale in the Pacific Ocean no less than forty years ago. Ibid. 
Quote, no, sir, tis a right whale, answered Tom. I saw his spout. He threw up a pair of as pretty rainbows as a Christian would wish to look at. He's a real oil butt, that fellow. Cooper's Pilot. Quote, the papers were brought in, and we saw in the Berlin Gazette that whales had been introduced on the stage there. Eckerman's Conversations with Goethe. Quote, my God, Mr. Chase, what is the matter? I answered, We have been stove by a whale. Narrative of the shipwreck of the whale ship Essex of Nantucket, which was attacked and finally destroyed by a large sperm whale in the Pacific Ocean. By Owen Chase of Nantucket, first mate of said vessel. New York, 1821. Quote, a mariner sat in the shrouds one night, the wind was piping free. Now bright, now dimmed, was the moonlight pale, and the phosphor gleamed in the wake of the whale as it floundered in the sea. Elizabeth Oakes Smith Quote, The quantity of line withdrawn from the boats engaged in the capture of this one whale amounted altogether to 10,440 yards, or nearly six English miles. Sometimes the whale shakes its tremendous tail in the air, which, cracking like a whip, resounds to the distance of three or four miles. Scoresby. Quote, Mad with the agonies he endures from these fresh attacks, the infuriated sperm whale rolls over and over. He rears his enormous head, and with wide expanded jaws snaps at everything around him. He rushes at the boats with his head, they are propelled before him with vast swiftness, and sometimes utterly destroyed. It is a matter of great astonishment that the consideration of the habits of so interesting, and in a commercial point of view, so important an animal as the sperm whale, should have been so entirely neglected, or should have excited so little curiosity among the numerous, and many of them competent, observers, that of late years must have possessed the most abundant and most convenient opportunities of witnessing their habitudes. Thomas Beale's History of the Sperm Whale, 1839. Quote, the cachalot, sperm whale, is not only better armed than the true whale, Greenland or right whale, in possessing a formidable weapon at either extremity of its body, but also more frequently displays a disposition to employ these weapons offensively, and in a manner at once so artful, bold, and mischievous, as to lead to its being regarded as the most dangerous to attack of all the known species of the whale tribe. Frederick de Bell Bennett's Whaling Voyage Round the Globe, 1840. Quote, October 13. There she blows, was sung out from the masthead. Where away? demanded the captain. Three points off the lee bow, sir. Raise up your wheel. Steady. Steady, sir. Masthead ahoy. Do you see that whale now? Aye, aye, sir. A shoal of sperm whales. There she blows. There she breaches. Sing out. Sing out every time. Aye, aye, sir. There she blows. There. There. There she blows. Bows. Bows. How far off? Two miles and a half. Thunder and lightning, so near. Call all hands. J. Ross Brown's Etchings of a Whaling Cruise, 1846. Quote, the whale ship Globe, on board of which vessel occurred the horrid transactions we are about to relate, belonged to the island of Nantucket. Narrative of the Globe by Lay and Hussey Survivors, A.D. 1828. Quote, being once pursued by a whale which he had wounded, he parried the assault for some time with a lance, but the furious monster at length rushed on the boat, himself and comrades only being preserved by leaping into the water when they saw that onset was inevitable. Missionary Journal of Tyreman and Bennett Quote, Nantucket itself, said Mr. Webster, is a very striking and peculiar portion of the national interest. There is a population of eight or nine thousand persons living here in the sea, adding largely every year to the national wealth by the boldest and most persevering industry. 
Report of Daniel Webster's speech in the U.S. Senate on the application for the erection of a breakwater at Nantucket, 1828. Quote, the whale fell directly over him and probably killed him in a moment. The whale and his captors, or the whaleman's adventures, and the whale's biography, gathered on the homeward cruise of the Commodore Preble. By Rev. Henry T. Cheever. Quote, if you make the least damn bit of noise, replied Samuel, I will send you to hell. Life of Samuel Comstock, the mutineer, by his brother William Comstock, another version of the whale ship globe narrative. Quote, the voyages of the Dutch and English to the Northern Ocean, in order, if possible, to discover a passage through it to India, though they failed of their main object, laid open the haunts of the whale. McCulloch's Commercial Dictionary. Quote, These things are reciprocal. The ball rebounds only to bound forward again, for now in laying open the haunts of the whale, the whalemen seem to have indirectly hit upon new clues to that same mystic northwest passage. From something unpublished. Quote, it is impossible to meet a whale-ship on the ocean without being struck by her near appearance. The vessel, under short sail, with lookouts at the mastheads, eagerly scanning the wide expanse around them, has a totally different air from those engaged in regular voyage. Currents and Whaling, U.S. XX. Quote, Pedestrians in the vicinity of London and elsewhere may recollect having seen large curved bones set upright in the earth, either to form arches over gateways or entrances to alcoves, uh, and they may perhaps have been told that these were the ribs of whales. Tales of a Whale Voyager to the Arctic Ocean. Quote, it was not till the boats returned from the pursuit of these whales that the whites saw their ship in bloody possession of the savages enrolled among the crew. Newspaper account of the taking and retaking of the whale ship Hobomack. Quote, it is generally well known that out of the crews of whaling vessels, American, few ever return in the ships on board which they departed. Crews in a whale boat. Quote, Suddenly a mighty mass emerged from the water and shot up perpendicularly into the air. It was the whale. Miriam Coffin, or the Whale Fisherman. Quote, the whale is harpooned, to be sure, but bethink you how you would manage a powerful unbroken colt with the mere appliance of a rope tied to the root of his tail. A chapter on whaling in ribs and trucks. Quote, on one occasion I saw two of these monsters, whales, probably male and female, slowly swimming one after the other within less than a stone's throw of the shore, Tierra del Fuego, over which the beech tree extended its branches. Darwin's Voyage of a Naturalist. Quote, Stern all, exclaimed the mate upon turning his head, and saw the distended jaws of the large sperm whale close to the head of the boat, threatening it with instant destruction. Stern all for your lives! Wharton, the Whale Killer. Quote, so be cheery, my lads, let your hearts never fail, while the bold harpineer is striking the whale. Nantucket Song. Quote, Oh, the rare old whale, mid storm and gale, in his ocean home will be, a giant in might, where might is right, and king of the boundless sea. Whale Song End of Prologues Chapter 3 The Spouter Inn Entering that gable-ended spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, straggling entry, with old-fashioned wainscots, reminding one of the bulwarks of some condemned old craft. On one side hung a very large oil painting, so thoroughly besmoked, and every way defaced, that, in the unequal cross-lights by which you viewed it, it was only by diligent study and a series of systematic visits to it, and careful inquiry of the neighbors, that you could any way arrive at an understanding of its purpose. Such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows, 
that at first you almost thought some ambitious young artist, in the time of the New England hags, had endeavoured to delineate chaos bewitched. But by dint of much and earnest contemplation and oft-repeated ponderings, and especially by throwing open the little window towards the back of the entry, you might at last come to the conclusion that such an idea, however wild, might not be altogether unwarranted. But what most puzzled and confounded you was a long, limber, portentous black mass of something hovering at the centre of the picture, over three blue, dim, perpendicular lines floating in a nameless yeast, a boggy, soggy, squitchy picture, truly, enough to uh, drive a nervous man distracted. Yet was there a sort of indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity about it that fairly froze you to it, till you involuntarily took an oath with yourself to find out what that marvellous painting meant. Ever and anon a bright but, alas, deceptive idea would dart you through. It's the black sea in a midnight gale. It's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements. It's a blasted heath. It's a hyperborean winter scene. It's the breaking up of the ice-bound stream of time. But at last all these fancies yielded to that one portentous something in the picture's midst. That once found out, and all the rest were plain. But stop, does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic fish, even the great leviathan himself? In fact, the artist's design seemed this, a final theory of my own, partly based upon the aggregated opinions of many aged persons with whom I conversed upon the subject. The picture represents a Cape Horner in a great hurricane, the half-foundered ship weltering there with its three dismantled masts alone visible, and an exasperated whale, purposing to spring clean over the craft, is in the enormous act of impaling himself upon the three mastheads. The opposite wall of this entry was hung over with a heathenish array of monstrous clubs and spears. Some were thickly set with glittering teeth resembling ivory saws, others were tufted with knots of human hair, and one was sickle-shaped, with a vast handle sweeping round like the segment made in the new-mown grass by a long-armed mower. You shuddered as you gazed, and wondered what monstrous cannibal and savage could ever have gone a death-harvesting with such a hacking, horrifying implement. Mixed with these were rusty old whaling lances and harpoons all broken and deformed. Some were storied weapons. With this once long last, now wildly elbowed, fifty years ago did Nathan Swain kill fifteen whales between a sunrise and a sunset, and that harpoon, so like a corkscrew now, was flung in the Javan seas and run away with by a whale years afterwards slain off the Cape of Blanco. The original iron entered nigh the tail, and, like a restless needle sojourning in the body of a man, travelled full forty feet and at last was found embedded in the hump. Crossing this dusky entry, and on through yon low-arched way, cut through what in old times must have been a great central chimney with fireplaces all round, you enter the public room. A still duskier place as this, with such low ponderous beams above, and such old wrinkled planks beneath, that you would almost fancy you trod some old craft's cockpits, especially of such a howling night when this corner-anchored old ark rocked so furiously. On one side stood a long, low, shelf-like table covered with cracked glass cases, filled with dusty rarities gathered from this wide world's remotest nooks. Projecting from the further angle of the room stands a dark-looking den, the bar, a rude attempt at a right whale's head. Be that how it may, there stands the vast arched bone of the whale's jaw, so wide a coach might almost drive beneath it. Within are shabby shelves, ranged round with old decanters, bottles, flasks, and in those jaws of swift destruction, like another cursed Jonah, by which name indeed they called him, bustles a little withered old man, who, for their money, dearly sells the sailors' deliriums and death. Abominable are the tumblers into which he pours his poison. Though true cylinders without, within the villainous green goggling glasses deceitfully tapered downwards to a cheating bottom. 
Parallel meridians rudely pecked into the glass surround these footpad goblets. Fill to this mark, and your charge is but a penny. To this, a penny more, and so on to the full glass, the Cape Horn measure, which you may gulp down for a shilling. Upon entering the place I found a number of young seamen gathered about a table, examining by a dim light the diverse specimens of scrimshander. I sought the landlord, and telling him I desired to be accommodated with a room, received for answer that his house was full, not a bed unoccupied. "'But have asked,' he added, tapping his forehead, "'you hain't no objections to sharing a hoppineer's blanket, have ye? "'I suppose you're going a-whaling, so you better get used to that sort of thing.' I told him that I never liked to sleep two in a bed, that if I should ever do so it would depend upon who the harpineer might be, and that if he, the landlord, really had no other place for me, and the harpooner was not decidedly objectionable, why, rather than wander further about a strange town on so bitter a night, I would put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. I thought so. All right, take a seat. Supper? You want supper? Supper'll be ready directly. I sat down on an old wooden settle, carved all over like a bench on the battery. At one end a ruminating tar was still further adorning it with his jackknife, stooping over and diligently working away at the space between his legs. He was trying his hand at a ship under full sail, but he didn't make much headway, I thought. At last some four or five of us were summoned to our meal in an adjoining room. It was cold as Iceland, no fire at all. The landlord said he couldn't afford it. Nothing but two dismal tallow candles, each in a winding sheet. We were fain to button up our monkey jackets, and hold to our lips cups of scalding tea with our half-frozen fingers. But the fare was of the most substantial kind. Not only meat and potatoes, but dumplings, good heavens! Dumplings for supper! One young fellow in a green box-coat addressed himself to these dumplings in a most direful manner. "'My boy,' said the landlord, "'you'll have the nightmare to a dead certainty.' "'Landlord,' I whispered, "'that ain't the harpooner, is it?' "'Oh, no,' said he, looking sort of diabolically funny. "'The harpooner is a dark-complexioned chap. "'He never eats dumplings, he don't. "'He eats nothing but steaks, and he likes em rare.' "'The devil he does,' says I. "'Where is that harpooner? Is he here?' "'He'll be here for long,' was the answer. I could not help it, but I began to feel suspicious of this dark-complexioned harpooner. At any rate, I made up my mind that if it so turned out that we should sleep together, he must undress and get into bed before I did. Supper over, the company went back to the bar-room, when, knowing not what else to do with myself, I resolved to spend the rest of the evening as a looker-on. Presently a rioting noise was heard without. Starting up, the landlord cried, "'That's the Grampus's crew. I seed her reported in the offing this morning. A three years' voyage and a full ship. Hurrah, boys! Now we'll have the latest news from the Fijis.' A tramping of sea-boots was heard in the entry. The door was flung open, and in rolled a wild set of mariners enough. Enveloped in their shaggy watch-coats, and with their heads muffled in woollen comforters, all bedarned and ragged, and their beards stiff with icicles, they seemed an eruption of bears from Labrador. They had just landed from their boat, and this was the first house they entered. No wonder, then, that they made a straight wake for the whale's mouth, the bar, when the wrinkled little old Jonah, their officiating, soon poured them out brimmers all round. One complained of a bad cold in his head, upon which Jonah mixed him a pitch-like potion of gin and molasses, which he swore was a sovereign cure for all colds and catters whatever, never mind of how long-standing, or whether caught off the coast of Labrador or on the weather side of an ice island. The liquor soon mounted into their heads, as it generally does even with the errantest toppers newly landed from sea, and they began capering about most obstreperously. I observed, however, that one of them held somewhat aloof, and though he seemed desirous not to spoil the hilarity of his shipmates by his own sober face, yet upon the whole he refrained from making as much noise as the rest, 
This man interested me at once, and since the sea gods had ordained that he should soon be my shipmate, though but a sleeping partner one so far as this narrative is concerned, I will here venture upon a little description of him. He stood a full six feet in height, with noble shoulders, and a chest like a coffer dam. I have seldom seen such brawn in a man. His face was deeply brown and burnt, making his white teeth dazzling by the contrast, while in the deep shadows of his eyes floated some reminiscences that did not seem to give him much joy. His voice at once announced that he was a southerner, and from his fine stature I thought he must be one of those tall mountaineers from the Alleghanian Ridge in Virginia. When the revelry of his companions had mounted to its height, this man slipped away unobserved, and I saw no more of him till he became my comrade on the sea. In a few minutes, however, he was missed by his shipmates, and, being, it seems, for some reason a huge favorite with them, they raised a cry of, "'Bulkington! Bulkington! Where's Bulkington?' and darted out of the house in pursuit of him. It was now about nine o'clock, and the room seeming almost supernaturally quiet after these orgies, I began to congratulate myself upon a little plan that had occurred to me just previous to the entrance of the seamen. No man prefers to sleep too in a bed. In fact, you would a good deal rather not sleep with your own brother. I don't know how it is, but people like to be private when they are sleeping. And when it comes to sleeping with an unknown stranger in a strange inn in a strange town, and that stranger a harpooner, then your objections indefinitely multiply. Nor was there any earthly reason why I, as a sailor, should sleep too in a bed more than anybody else, for sailors no more sleep too in a bed at sea than bachelor kings do ashore. To be sure, they all sleep together in one apartment, but you have your own hammock and cover yourself with your own blanket and sleep in your own skin. The more I pondered over this harpooner, the more I abominated the thought of sleeping with him. It was fair to presume that being a harpooner, his linen or woolen, as the case might be, would not be of the tidiest, certainly none of the finest, I began to twitch all over. Besides, it was getting late, and my decent harpooner ought to be home and going bedwards. Suppose now he should tumble in upon me at midnight. How could I tell from what vile hole he had been coming? Landlord, I've changed my mind about that harpooner. I shan't sleep with him. I'll try the bench here. Just as you please. I'm sorry I can't spare you a tablecloth for the mattress. And it's a plaguey rough board here, feeling of the knots and notches. But wait a bit, Scrimshander. I've got a carpenter's plane there in the bar. Wait, I say, and I'll make you snug enough. So saying, he procured the plane, and with his old silk handkerchief first dusting the bench, vigorously set to planing away at my bed, the while grinning like an ape. The shavings flew right and left, till at last the plane iron came bump against an indestructible knot. The landlord was near spraining his wrist, and I told him for heaven's sake to quit. The bed was soft enough to suit me, and I did not know how all the planing in the world could make eider down of a pine plank. So, gathering up the shavings with another grin, and throwing them into the great stove in the middle of the room, he went about his business and left me in a brown study. I now took the measure of the bench, and found that it was a foot too short, but that could be mended with a chair. But it was a foot too narrow, and the other bench in the room was about four inches higher than the planed one, so there was no yoking them. I then placed the first bench lengthwise along the only clear space against the wall, leaving a little interval between for my back to settle down in. But I soon found that there came such a draught of cold air over me from under the sill of the window that this plan would never do at all, especially as another current from the rickety door met the one from the window, and both together formed a series of small whirlwinds in the immediate vicinity of the spot where I had thought to spend the night. The devil fetch that harpooner, thought I. But stop, couldn't I steal a march on him? bolt his door inside and jump into his bed, not to be wakened by the most violent knockings. It seemed no bad idea, but upon second thoughts I dismissed it. For who could tell but what the next morning, so soon as I popped out of the room, the harpooner might be standing in the entry, all ready to knock me down. 
still looking round me again and seeing no possible chance of spending a sufferable night unless in some other person's bed, I began to think that after all I might be cherishing unwarrantable prejudices against this unknown harpooner. Thinks I, I'll wait a while. He must be dropping in before long. I'll have a good look at him then, and perhaps we may become jolly good bedfellows after all. There's no telling. But though the other boarders kept coming in by ones, twos, and threes, and going to bed, yet no sign of my harpooner. "'Landlord,' said I, "'what sort of chap is he? Does he always keep such late hours?' It was now hard upon twelve o'clock. The landlord chuckled again with his lean chuckle, and seemed to be mightily tickled at something beyond my comprehension. "'No,' he answered. "'Generally he's an early bird, early to bed and early to rise. Yes, he's the bird what catches the worm. But to-night he went out a-peddling, you see, and I don't see what on earth keeps him so late, unless maybe he can't sell his head.' "'Can't sell his head?' "'What sort of a bamboozlingly story is this you're telling me?' "'Getting into a towering rage. "'Do you pretend to say, landlord, "'that this harpooner is actually engaged this blessed Saturday night, "'or rather Sunday morning, in peddling his head around town?' "'That's precisely it,' said the landlord. "'And I told him he couldn't sell it here. "'The market's overstocked.' "'With what?' shouted I. "'With heads, to be sure. "'Ain't there too many heads in the world?' "'I tell you what it is, landlord,' I said quite calmly. "'You'd better stop spinning that yarn to me. I am not green.' And "'Maybe not,' taking a stick out and whittling a toothpick. "'But I rather guess you'll be done brown if that air harpooner hears you a-slander in his head.' "'I'll break it for him,' said I, now flying into a passion against this unaccountable farrago of the landlord's. "'It's broke already,' said he. "'Broke,' said I. "'Broke, do you mean?' "'Certain, and that's the very reason he can't sell it, I guess.' "'Landlord,' said I, going up to him as cool as Mount Hecla in a snowstorm, "'Landlord, stop whittling. "'You and I must understand one another, and that too without delay. "'I come to your house and want a bed. "'You tell me you can only give me half of one, "'that the other half belongs to a certain harpooner.' and about this harpooner, whom I have not yet seen, you persist in telling me the most mystifying and exasperating stories, tending to beget in me an uncomfortable feeling towards the man whom you design for my bedfellow. A sort of connection, landlord, which is an intimate and confidential one in the highest degree. I now demand of you to speak out and tell me who and what this harpooner is, and whether I shall be in all respects safe to spend the night with him and in the first place you will be so good as to unsay that story about selling his head, which, if true, I take to be good evidence that this harpooner is stark mad, and I've no idea of sleeping with a madman. And you, sir, you, I mean, landlord, you, sir, by trying to induce me to do so knowingly would thereby render yourself liable to a criminal prosecution." "'Well,' said the landlord, fetching a long breath, "'that's a pretty long sermon for a chap that rips a little now and then. "'But be easy, be easy. "'This here harpooner I've been telling you of "'has just arrived from the South Seas, "'where he bought up a lot of bomb New Zealand heads, "'great curios, you know, "'and he sold all of them but one, "'and that one he's trying to sell to-night, "'cause to-morrow's Sunday, "'and it would not do to be selling human heads "'about the streets when folks is going to churches. "'He wanted to last Sunday, "'but I stopped him just as he was going out the door "'with four heads strung on a string, "'for all the earth like a string of onions.' "'This account cleared up the otherwise unaccountable mystery "'and showed that the landlord, after all, "'had no idea of fooling me.' But at the same time, what could I think of a harpooner who stayed out of a Saturday night clean into the Holy Sabbath, engaged in such a cannibal business as selling the heads of dead idolaters? Depend upon it, landlord, that harpooner is a dangerous man. He pays regular, was the rejoinder. But come, it's getting dreadful late. You'd better be turning flukes. It's a nice bed. Sal and me slept in that air bed the night we was spliced. "'There's plenty of room for two to kick about in that bed. "'It's an almighty big bed, that. 
Why, afore we give it up, Sal used to put our Sam and little Johnny in the foot of it. But I got a dreamin' and sprawlin' about one night, and somehow Sam got pitched on the floor, and came near breakin' his arm. After that, Sal said it wouldn't do. Come along here, I'll give you a glim in a jiffy. And so saying, he lighted a candle and held it towards me, offering to lead the way. But I stood irresolute. When looking at a clock in the corner, he exclaimed, I vomit Sunday. You won't see that hoppin' here tonight. He's come to anchor somewhere. Come along, then. Do come, won't you come? I considered the matter a moment, and then upstairs we went. And I was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam, and furnished, sure enough, with a prodigious bed, almost big enough, indeed, for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. There, said the landlord, placing the candle on a crazy old sea-chest that did double duty as a washstand and centre-table. There, make yourself comfortable now, and good night to you. I turned round from eyeing the bed, but he had disappeared. Folding back the counterpane, I stood over the bed. Though none of the most elegant, it yet stood the scrutiny tolerable well. I then glanced round the room, and besides the bedstead and centre-table could see no other furniture belonging to the place, but a rude shelf, the four walls, and a papered fireboard representing a man striking a whale. Of things not properly belonging to the room, there was a hammock lashed up and thrown upon the floor in one corner, also a large seaman's bag containing the harpooner's wardrobe, no doubt in lieu of a land trunk. Likewise there was a parcel of outlandish bone fish-hooks on the shelf over the fireplace, and a tall harpoon standing at the head of the bed. But what is this on the chest? I took it up, and held it close to the light, and felt it, and smelt it, and tried every way possible to arrive at some satisfactory conclusion concerning it. I can compare it to nothing but a large doormat, ornamented at the edges with little tinkling tags, something like the stained porcupine quills round an Indian moccasin. There was a hole or slit in the middle of this mat, as you see the same in South American ponchos. But could it be possible that any sober harpooner could get into a doormat and parade the streets of any Christian town in that sort of guise? I put it on to try it, and it weighed me down like a hamper, being uncommonly shaggy and thick, and I thought a little damp, as though this mysterious harpooner had been wearing it of a rainy day. I went up to it in a bit of glass stuck against the wall, and I never saw such a sight in my life. I tore myself out of it in such a hurry that I gave myself a kink in the neck. I sat down on the side of the bed and commenced thinking about this head-peddling harpooner and his doormat. After thinking some time on the bedside, I got up and took off my monkey jacket, and then stood in the middle of the room thinking. Then I took off my coat and thought a little more in my shirt-sleeves but beginning to feel very cold now, half undressed as I was, and remembering what the landlord said about the harpooners not coming home at all that night, it being so very late, I made no more ado, but jumped out of my pantaloons and boots, and then, blowing out the light, tumbled into bed, and commended myself to the care of heaven. Whether that mattress was stuffed with corn-cobs or broken crockery, there is no telling, but I rolled about a good deal, and could not sleep for a long time. At last I slid off into a light doze, and had pretty nearly made a good offing towards the land of Nod, when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage, and saw a glimmer of light come into the room from under the door. "'Lord, save me,' thinks I, "'that must be the harpooner, the infernal head peddler. But I lay perfectly still, and resolved not to say a word till spoken to. Holding a light in one hand, and that identical New Zealand head in the other, the stranger entered the room, and without looking towards the bed, placed his candle a good way off from me on the floor in one corner, and then began working away at the knotted cords of the large bag I before spoke of as being in the room. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing the bag's mouth. This accomplished, however, he turned round, when, good heavens, what a sight! Such a face! It was of a dark purplish-yellow color, here and there stuck over with large blackish-looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought, he's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and here he is just from the surgeon. 
but at that moment he chanced to turn his face so towards the light that I plainly saw they could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his cheeks. They were stains of some sort or other. At first I knew not what to make of this, but soon an inkling of the truth occurred to me. I remembered a story of a white man, a whaleman too, who, falling among the cannibals, had been tattooed by them. I concluded that this harpooner in the course of his distant voyages must have met with a similar adventure. And what is it, thought I, after all? It's only his outside. A man can be honest in any sort of skin. But then what to make of his unearthly complexion? That part of it, I mean, lying round about and completely independent of the squares of tattooing. To be sure, it might be nothing but a good coat of tropical tanning, but I never heard of a hot sun tanning a white man into a purplish-yellow one. However, I had never been in the South Seas, and perhaps the sun there produced these extraordinary effects upon the skin. Now, while all these ideas were passing through me like lightning, this harpooner never noticed me at all. But after some difficulty, having opened his bag, he commenced fumbling in it, and presently pulled out a sort of a tomahawk, and a sealskin wallet with the hair on. Putting these on the old chest in the middle of the room, he then took the New Zealand head, a ghastly thing enough, and crammed it down into the bag. He now took off his hat, a new beaver hat, when I came nigh singing out with fresh surprise. There was no hair on his head, none to speak of, at least, nothing but a small scalp-knot twisted upon his forehead. His bald, purplish head now looked for all the world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker than I ever bolted a dinner. Even as it was, I thought something of slipping out the window, but it was the second floor back. I am no coward, but what to make of this head-peddling purple rascal altogether passed my comprehension. Ignorance is the parent of fear, and being completely nonplussed and confounded about the stranger, I confessed I was now as much afraid of him— as if it was the devil himself who had thus broken into my room in the dead of night. In fact, I was so afraid of him that I was not game enough just then to address him, and demand a satisfactory answer concerning what seemed inexplicable in him. Meanwhile he continued the business of undressing, and at last showed his chest and arms. As I live, these covered parts of him were checkered with the same squares as his face. His back, too, was all over the same dark squares— he seemed to have been in a thirty years' war, and just escaped from it with a sticking-plaster shirt. Still more, his very legs were marked as if a parcel of dark green frogs were running up the trunks of young palms. It was now quite plain that he must be some abominable savage or other shipped aboard of a whaleman in the South Seas, and so landed in this Christian country. I quaked to think of it. A peddler of heads, too. Perhaps the heads of his own brothers— he might take a fancy to mine. Heavens, look at that tomahawk! But there was no time for shuddering, for now the savage went about something that completely fascinated my attention, and convinced me that he must indeed be a heathen. Going to his heavy grego, or rapal, or dreadnought, which he had previously hung on a chair, he fumbled in the pockets, and produced at length a curious little deformed image, with a hunch on its back, and exactly the colour of a three-days-old Congo baby. Remembering the embalmed head, at first I almost thought that this black mannequin was a real baby preserved in some similar manner. But seeing that it was not at all limber, and that it glistened a good deal like polished ebony, I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol, which indeed it proved to be. For now the savage goes up to the empty fireplace, and, removing the papered fireboard, sets up this little hunchbacked image like a ten-pin between the andirons, the chimney jams and all the bricks inside were very sooty, so that I thought this fireplace made a very appropriate little shrine or chapel for his Congo idol. I now screwed my eyes hard toward the half-hidden image, feeling but ill at ease, meantime, to see what was next to follow. First he takes about a double handful of shavings out of his Grego pocket, and places them carefully before the idol. Then, laying a bit of ship-biscuit on top, and applying the flame from the lamp, he kindled the shavings into a sacrificial blaze. Presently, after many hasty snatches into the fire, and still hastier withdrawals of his fingers, whereby he seemed to be scorching them badly, he at last succeeded in drawing out the biscuit, 
then blowing off the heat and ashes a little, he made a polite offer of it to the little negro. But the little devil did not seem to fancy such dry sort of fare at all. He never moved his lips. All these strange antics were accompanied by still stranger guttural noises from the devotee, who seemed to be praying in a sing-song, or else singing some pagan psalmody or other, during which his face twitched about in the most unnatural manner. At last, extinguishing the fire, he took his idol up very unceremoniously, and bagged it again in his grego pocket as carelessly as if he were a sportsman bagging a dead woodcock. All these queer proceedings increased my uncomfortableness, and seeing him now exhibiting strong symptoms of concluding his business operations and jumping into bed with me, I thought it was high time, now or never, before the light was put out, to break the spell in which I had so long been bound. But the interval I spent in deliberating what to say was a fatal one. Taking his tomahawk from the table, he examined the head of it for an instant, and then holding it to the light, with his mouth at the handle, he puffed out great clouds of tobacco smoke. The next moment the light was extinguished, and this wild cannibal, tomahawk between his teeth, sprang into bed with me. I sang out, I could not help it now, and giving a sudden grunt of astonishment, he began feeling me. Stammering out something, I knew not what, I rolled away from him against the wall, and then conjured him, whoever or whatever he might be, to keep quiet, and let me get up and light the lamp again. But his guttural responses satisfied me at once that he but ill comprehended my meaning. "'Who a devil you?' he said at last. "'You no speak ye, damn me, I kill ye!' And so saying, the lighted tomahawk began flourishing about me in the dark. "'Landlord, for God's sake, Peter Coffin!' shouted I. "'Landlord, watch! Coffin! Angel, save me!' "'Speak ye! Tell ye me who ye be, or damn me, I kill ye!' again growled the cannibal while his horrid flourishings of the tomahawk scattered the hot tobacco ashes about me till I thought my linen would get on fire. But, thank heaven, at that moment the landlord came into the room, light in hand, and leaping from the bed I ran up to him. "'Don't be afraid now,' said he, grinning again. "'Queequeg here wouldn't harm a hair of your head.' "'Stop your grinning!' shouted I. "'And why didn't you tell me that that infernal harpooner was a cannibal?' "'I thought you'd know it.' "'Didn't I tell you he was a-peddlin' heads around town? "'But turn flukes again and go to sleep. "'Queequeg, look here. "'You sabby me, I sabby you. "'This man sleepy you. "'You sabby?' "'Me sabby plenty,' grunted Queequeg, "'puffing away at his pipe and sitting up in bed. "'You get ye in,' he added, "'motioning to me with his tomahawk "'and throwing the clothes to one side.' He really did this in not only a civil, but really a kind and charitable way. I stood looking at him a moment. For all his tattooings, he was on the whole a clean, comely-looking cannibal. What's all this fuss I have been making about, thought I to myself. The man's a human being, just as I am. He has as much reason to fear me as I have to be afraid of him. Better sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Landlord, said I, "'Tell him to stash his tomahawk there, or a pipe, or whatever you call it. "'Tell him to stop smoking, in short, and I will turn in with him. "'But I don't fancy having a man smoking in bed with me. "'It's dangerous. Besides, I ain't insured.' "'This being told to Queequeg, he at once complied, "'and again politely motioned me to get into bed, "'rolling over to one side as much to say, "'I won't touch a leg of you.' "'Good night, landlord,' said I. "'You may go.' I turned in, and never slept better in my life. End of chapter 3 Chapters 4 through 7 Chapter 4 The Counterpane Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been his wife. The counterpane was of patchwork, full of odd little party-coloured squares and triangles, and this arm of his, tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure, no two parts of which were of one precise shade, owing, I suppose, to his keeping his arm at sea unmethodically in sun and shade, his shirt-sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times, 
This same arm of his, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same patchwork quilt. Indeed, partly lying on it as the arm did when I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt they so blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell that Queequeg was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain them. When I was a child, I well remember a somewhat similar circumstance that befell me. Whether it was a reality or a dream, I never could entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other. I think it was trying to crawl up the chimney, as I had seen a little sweep do a few days previous. And my stepmother, who somehow or other was all the time whipping me or sending me to bed supperless, my mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st June, the longest day of the year in our hemisphere. I felt dreadfully. But there was no help for it, so upstairs I went to my little room in the third floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time, and with a bitter sigh got between the sheets. I lay there dismally calculating that sixteen entire hours must elapse before I could hope for a resurrection. Sixteen hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was so light, too, the sun shining in at the window, and a great rattling of coaches in the streets, and the sound of gay voices all over the house. I felt worse and worse. At last I got up, dressed, and, softly going down in my stocking feet, sought out my stepmother, and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseeching her as a particular favour to give me a good slippering for my misbehaviour, anything indeed but condemning me to lie abed such an endurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of stepmothers, and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there, broad awake, feeling a great deal worse than I have ever done since, even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze, and slowly waking from it, half steeped in dreams, I opened my eyes, and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in outer darkness. Instantly I felt a shock running through all my frame. Nothing was to be seen, and nothing was to be heard. But a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane, and the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom to which the hand belonged seemed closely seated by my bedside. For what seemed ages piled on ages, I lay there, frozen with the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand, yet ever thinking that if I could but stir it one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this consciousness at last glided away from me, but waking in the morning I shudderingly remembered it all, and for days and weeks and months afterwards I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour I often puzzle myself with it. Now take away the awful fear, and my sensations at feeling the supernatural hand in mine were very similar in their strangeness to those which I experienced on waking up and seeing Queequeg's pagan arm thrown round me. But at length all the past night's events soberly recurred, one by one, in fixed reality, and then I lay only alive to the comical predicament. For though I tried to move his arm, unlock his bridegroom clasp, yet, sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly, as though naught but death should part us twain. I now strove to rouse him. Queequeg! But his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were in a horse-collar, and suddenly felt a slight scratch. Throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk, sleeping by the savage's side, as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. A pretty pickle, truly, thought I. A bed here in a strange house, in broad day, with a cannibal and a tomahawk. Queequeg! In the name of goodness, Queequeg, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling and loud and incessant expostulations upon the unbecomingness of his hugging a fellow male in that matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew back his arm, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog just from the water, 
and sat up in bed, stiff as a pike-staff, looking at me, and rubbing his eyes as if he did not altogether remember how I came to be there, though a dim consciousness of knowing something about me seemed slowly dawning over him. Meanwhile I lay quietly eyeing him, having no serious misgivings now, and bent upon narrowly observing so curious a creature. When, at last, his mind seemed made up touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact, he jumped out upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds gave me to understand that, if it pleased me, he would dress first, and then leave me to dress afterward, leaving the whole apartment to myself. Thinks I, Queequeg, under the circumstances this is a very civilized overture, but the truth is, these savages have an innate sense of delicacy, say what you will. It is marvellous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg, because he treated me with so much civility and consideration, while I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed, and watching all of his toilette motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg you don't see every day, he and his ways were well worth unusual regarding. He commenced dressing at top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then, still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. What under the heavens he did it for I cannot tell, but his next movement was to crush himself, boots in hand and hat on, under the bed, when, from sundry violent gaspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But Queequeg, do you see, was a creature in the transition stage, neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manners. His education was not yet completed." he was an undergraduate. If he had not been a small degree civilized, he probably would not have troubled himself with boots at all. But then, if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last he emerged, with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes, and began creaking and limping about the room, as if not being much accustomed to boots, his pair of damp, wrinkled cowhide ones, probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go off of a bitter cold morning. Seeing now that there were no curtains to the window, and that the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room, and observing more and more the indecorous figure that Queequeg made, staving about with little else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get into his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied, and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning any Christian would have washed his face, but Queequeg, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablutions to his chest, arms, and hands. He then donned his waistcoat, and, taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand centre-table, dipped it into water, and commenced lathering his face. I was washing to see where he kept his razor, and, lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed-corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and, striding up to the bit of mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping, or rather harpooning, of his cheeks. Thinks I, Queequeg, this is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards I wondered less at this operation when I came to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made— and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in his great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. CHAPTER V. BREAKFAST I quickly followed suit, and descending into the bar-room accosted the grinning landlord very pleasantly, I cherished no malice toward him, though he had been skylarking with me not a little in the matter of my bedfellow. However, a good laugh is a mighty good thing, and rather too scarce a good thing, the more's the pity. 
So if any one man in his own proper person affords stuff for a good joke to anybody, let him not be backward, but let him cheerfully allow himself to spend and be spent in that way. And the man that has anything bountifully laughable about him, be sure there is more in that man than you perhaps think for. The bar-room was now full of the boarders who had been dropping in the night previous, and whom I had not as yet had a good look at. They were nearly all whalemen, chief mates, and second mates, and third mates, and sea carpenters, and sea coopers, and sea blacksmiths, and harpooners, and shipkeepers, a brown and brawny company with bosky beards, an unshorn shaggy set, all wearing monkey jackets for morning gowns. You could pretty plainly tell how long each one had been ashore. This young fellow's healthy cheek is like a sun-toasted pear in hue, and would seem to smell almost as musky. He can not have been three days landed from his Indian voyage. That man next him looks a few shades lighter. You might say a touch of satin wood is in him. In the complexion of a third, still lingers a tropic tawn, but slightly bleached withal. He, doubtless, has tarried whole weeks ashore. But who could show a cheek like Queequeg, which, barred with various tints, seemed, like the Andes' western slope, to show forth in one array contrasting climates, zone by zone. "'Grub, ho!' now cried the landlord, flinging open a door, and in we went to breakfast. They say that men who have seen the world thereby become quite at ease in manner, quite self-possessed in company. Not always, though. Ledyard, the great New England traveller, and Mungo Park, the Scotch one, of all men they possess the least assurance in the parlour. But perhaps the mere crossing of Siberia in a sledge drawn by dogs, as Ledyard did, or the taking of a long solitary walk on an empty stomach in the negro heart of Africa, which was the sum of poor Mungo's performances, this kind of travel, I say, may not be the very best mode of attaining a high social polish. Still, for the most part, that sort of thing is to be had anywhere. These reflections just here are occasioned by the circumstance that after we were all seated at the table, and I was preparing to hear some good stories about whaling, to my no small surprise nearly every man maintained a profound silence, and not only that, but they looked embarrassed. Yes, here were a set of sea-dogs, many of whom, without the slightest bashfulness, had boarded great whales on the high seas, entire strangers to them, and dueled them dead without winking, and yet here they sat at a social breakfast-table, all of the same calling, all of kindred tastes, looking round as sheepishly at each other as though they had never been out of sight of some sheepfold among the green mountains. A curious sight, these bashful bears, these timid warrior whalemen. But as for Queequeg, why Queequeg sat there among them, at the head of the table, too, it so chanced, as cool as an icicle. To be sure, I cannot say much for his breeding. His greatest admirer could not have cordially justified his bringing his harpoon into breakfast with him, and using it there without ceremony, reaching over the table with it to the imminent jeopardy of many heads, and grappling the beefsteaks toward him. But that was certainly very coolly done by him, and every one knows that in most people's estimation, to do anything coolly is to do it genteelly. We will not speak of all Queequeg's peculiarities here, how he eschewed coffee and hot rolls, and applied his undivided attention to beefsteaks done rare, Enough that when breakfast was over he withdrew like the rest into the public room, lighted his tomahawk pipe, and was sitting there quietly digesting and smoking with his inseparable hat on when I sallied out for a stroll. CHAPTER Six, THE STREET If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Lascars and Malays, 
and at bombay in the apollo green live yankees have often scared the natives but new bedford beats all water street and wapping in these last mentioned haunts you see only sailors but in new bedford actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners savages outright many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh it makes a stranger stare but besides the fijians tongataboars aramangoans panangians and brigians and besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft which unheeded reel about the streets you will see other sights still more curious certainly more comical there weekly arrive in this town scores of green vermonters and new hampshire men all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery they are mostly young of stalwart frames fellows who have felled forests and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale lance many are as green as the green mountains whence they came in some things you would think them but a few hours old look there that chap strutting round the corner he wears a beaver hat and swallow-tailed coat girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife here comes another with a southwester and a bombazine cloak no town-bred dandy will compare with a country-bred one i mean a downright bumpkin dandy a fellow that in the dog days will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands now when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation and joins the great whale fishery you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport in bespeaking his sea outfit he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats straps to his canvas trousers ah poor hayseed how bitterly will burst those straps in the first howling gale when thou art driven straps button and all down the throat of the tempest but think not that this famous town has only harpooners cannibals and bumpkins to show her visitors not at all still new bedford is a queer place had it not been for us whalemen that tract of land would this day perhaps have been in as howling condition as the coast of labrador as it is parts of her back country are enough to frighten one they look so bony the town itself is perhaps the dearest place to live in in all new england it is a land of oil true enough but not like canaan a land also of corn and wine the streets do not run with milk nor in the springtime do they pave them with fresh eggs yet in spite of this nowhere in all america will you find more patrician-like houses parks and gardens more opulent than in new bedford whence came they how planted upon this once scraggy scoria of a country go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round yonder lofty mansion and your question will be answered yes all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the atlantic pacific and indian ocean one and all they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea can herr alexander perform a feat like that in new bedford fathers they say give whales for the, for dowers to their daughters and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises apiece you must go to new bedford to see a brilliant wedding for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house and every night recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti candles in summer time the town is sweet to see full of fine maples long avenues of green and gold and in august high in air the beautiful and bountiful horse chestnuts candelabra wise proffer the passer-by their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms so omnipotent is art which in many a district of new bedford has superinduced bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day and the women of new bedford they bloom like their own red roses but roses only bloom in summer whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens elsewhere match that bloom of theirs ye cannot save in salem where they tell me the young girls breathe such musk their sailor sweethearts smell them miles off shore as though they were drawing nigh the odorous moluccas instead of the puritanic sands chapter seven the chapel in this same new bedford there stands a whaleman's chapel 
and few are the moody fishermen shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific who fail to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sallied out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear, sunny cold to driving sleet and mist. Wrapping myself in my shaggy jacket of the cloth called bearskin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned, only broken at times by the shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshipper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other, as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived, and there these silent islands of men and women sat steadfastly eyeing several marble tablets with black borders masoned into the walls on either side of the pulpit. Three of them ran something like the following, but I do not pretend to quote. Sacred to the memory of John Talbot, who, at the age of eighteen, was lost overboard near the Isle of Desolation, off Patagonia, November 1st, 1836. This tablet is erected to his memory by his sister. Sacred to the memory of Robert Long, Willis Ellery, Nathan Coleman, Walter Canney, Seth Macy, and Samuel Gleig, forming one of the boat's crews of the ship Eliza, who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the Pacific, December 31st, 1839. This marble is here placed by their surviving shipmates. Sacred to the memory of the late Captain Ezekiel Hardy, who, in the bows of his boat, was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of Japan, August 3rd, 1833. This tablet is erected to his memory by his widow. Shaking off the sleet from my ice-glazed hat and jacket, I seated myself near the door, and turning sideways was surprised to see Queequeg near me. Affected by the solemnity of the scene, there was a wondering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance. This savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance, because he was the only one who could not read, and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall. Whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation, I knew not. But so many are the unrecorded accidents in the fishery, and so plainly did several women present wear the countenance, if not the trappings, of some unceasing grief, that I feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hearts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh. O oh, ye whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, who, standing among flowers, can say, Here, here lies my beloved, you know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. What bitter blanks in those black-bordered marbles which cover no ashes! What despair in those immovable inscriptions! What deadly voids and unbidden infidelities in the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith, and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave! As well might those tablets stand in the cave of Elephanta as here. In what census of living creatures the dead of mankind are included, why it is that a universal proverb says of them that they tell no tales, though containing more secrets than the good one's sands, how it is that to his name, who yesterday departed for the other world, we prefix so significant and infidel a word, and yet do not thus entitle him if he but embarks for the remotest indies of this living earth, why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals, in what eternal unstirring paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique Adam, who died sixty round centuries ago, how it is that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss, why all the living so strive to hush all the dead, wherefore but the rumour of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city, all these things are not without their meanings. But faith, like a jackal, feeds among the tombs, and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope. 
It needs scarcely be told with what feelings on the eve of a Nantucket voyage I regarded those marble tablets, and by the murky light of that darkened doleful day, read the fate of the whaleman who had gone before me. Yes, Ishmael, the same fate may be thine. But somehow I grew merry again. Delightful inducements to embark. Fine chance for promotion, it seems. Ay, a stove-boat will make me an immortal by brevet. Yes, there is death in this business of whaling, a speechlessly quick, chaotic bundling of a man into eternity. But what then? Methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death. Methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance. Methinks that in looking at things spiritual we are too much like oysters, observing the sun through the water, and thinking that thick water the thinnest of air. Methinks my body is but the lees of my better being. In fact, take my body who will. Take it, I say. It is not me. And, therefore, three cheers for Nantucket, and come a stove-boat and stove-body when they will, for stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. End of chapters 4 through 7 Chapters 8 and 9 Chapter 8 The Pulpit I had not been seated very long ere a man of a certain venerable robustness entered. Immediately, as the storm-pelted door flew back upon admitting him, a quick, regardful eyeing of him by all of the congregation sufficiently attested that this fine old man was the chaplain. Yes, it was the famous Father Mapple, so called by the whalemen, among whom he was a very great favorite. He had been a sailor and a harpooner in his youth, but for many years past had dedicated his life to the ministry. At the time I now write of, Father Mapple was in the hardy winter of a healthy old age, that sort of old age which seems merging into a second flowering youth, for among all the fissures of his wrinkles there shone certain mild gleams of a newly developing bloom, the spring verdure peeping forth even beneath February's snow. No one, having previously heard his history, could for the first time behold Father Mapple without the utmost interest, because there were certain engrafted clerical peculiarities about him, imputable to that adventurous maritime life he had led. When he entered, I observed that he carried no umbrella, and certainly had not come in his carriage, for his tarpaulin hat ran down with melting sleet, and his great pilot-cloth jacket seemed almost to drag him to the floor with the weight of the water it had absorbed. However, hat and coat and overshoes were one by one removed, and hung up in a little space in an adjacent corner, when, arrayed in a decent suit, he quietly approached the pulpit. Like most old-fashioned pulpits, it was a very lofty one, and, since a regular stairs to such a height would, by its long angle with the floor, seriously contract the already small area of the chapel, the architect, it seemed, had acted upon the hint of Father Mapple, and finished the pulpit without a stairs, substituting a perpendicular side ladder, like those used in mounting a ship from a boat at sea. The wife of a whaling captain had provided the chapel with a handsome pair of red-worsted man-ropes for this ladder, which, being itself nicely headed and stained with a mahogany color, the whole contrivance, considering what manner of chapel it was, seemed by no means in bad taste. Halting for an instant at the foot of the ladder, and with both hands grasping the ornamental knobs of the man-ropes, Father Mapple cast a look upwards, and then, with a truly sailor-like but still reverential dexterity, hand over hand, mounted the steps as if ascending the main top of his vessel. The perpendicular parts of this side-ladder, as is usually the case with swinging ones, were of cloth-covered rope. Only the rounds were of wood, so that at every step there was a joint. At my first glimpse of the pulpit it had not escaped me that however convenient for a ship these joints in the present instance seemed unnecessary, for I was not prepared to see Father Mapple, after gaining the height, slowly turn round, and stooping over the pulpit, deliberately drag up the ladder step by step, till the hole was deposited within, leaving him impregnable in his little Quebec. I pondered some time without fully comprehending the reason for this, 
Father Mapple enjoyed such a wide reputation for sincerity and sanctity that I could not suspect him of courting notoriety by any mere tricks of the stage. No, thought I, there must be some sober reason for this thing. Furthermore, it must symbolize something unseen. Can it be, then, that by that act of physical isolation he signifies his spiritual withdrawal for the time from all outward worldly ties and connections? Yes, for, replenished with the meat and wine of the word, to the faithful man of God this pulpit, I see, is a self-containing stronghold, a lofty Ehrenbreitstein, with a perennial well of water within the walls. But the side ladder was not the only strange feature of the place, borrowed from the chaplain's former seafarings. Between the marble cenotaphs on either hand of the pulpit, the wall which formed its back was adorned with a large painting representing a gallant ship beating against a terrible storm off a lee coast of black rocks and snowy breakers. But high above the flying scud and dark rolling clouds there floated a little isle of sunlight, from which beamed forth an angel's face, and this bright face shed a distinct spot of radiance upon the ship's tossed deck, something like that silver plate now inserted into the victory's plank where Nelson fell. Ah, noble ship, the angel seemed to say, beat on, beat on, thou noble ship, and bear a hearty helm, for lo, the sun is breaking through, the clouds are rolling off, serenest azure is at hand. Nor was the pulpit itself without a trace of the same sea taste that had achieved the latter in the picture. Its panelled front was in the likeness of a ship's bluff bows, and the Holy Bible rested on a projecting piece of scroll-work fashioned after a ship's fiddle-headed beak. What could be more full of meaning? For the pulpit is ever this earth's foremost part. All the rest comes in its rear. The pulpit leads the world. From thence it is the storm of God's quick wrath is first descried, and the bow must bear the earliest brunt. From thence it is the God of breezes, fair or foul, is first invoked for favorable winds. Yes, the world's a ship on its passage out, and not a voyage complete, and the pulpit is its prow. CHAPTER Nine, THE SERMON Father Mapple rose, and in a mild voice of unassuming authority, ordered the scattered people to condense. "'Starboard gangway there, side away to larboard, larboard gangway to starboard, midships, midships!' There was a low rumbling of heavy sea-boots among the benches, and a still slighter shuffling of women's shoes, and all was quiet again, and every eye on the preacher. He paused a little, then kneeling in the pulpit's bows, folded his large brown hands across his chest, uplifted his closed eyes, and offered a prayer so deeply devout that he seemed kneeling and praying at the bottom of the sea. This ended in prolonged solemn tones like the continual tolling of a bell in a ship that is foundering at sea in a fog. In such tones he commenced reading the following hymn, but changing his manner towards the concluding stanzas, burst forth with appealing exultation and joy. The ribs and terrors of the whale arched over me in dismal gloom, while all God's sunlit waves rolled by and lift me deepening down to doom. I saw the opening maw of hell with endless pains and sorrows there, which none but they that feel can tell. Oh, I was plunging to despair. In black distress I called my God, when I could scarce believe him mine. He bowed his ear to my complaints, no more the wail did me confine. With speed he flew to my relief, as on a radiant dolphin born, awful yet bright as lightning shone, the face of my deliverer God. My song forever shall record that terrible, that joyful hour. I give the glory to my God, his all the mercy and the power. Nearly all joined in singing this hymn, which swelled high above the howling of the storm. A brief pause ensued. The preacher slowly turned over the leaves of the Bible, and at last, folding his hand down on the proper page, said, "'Beloved shipmates, clinch the last verse of the first chapter of Jonah. And God had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Shipmates, this book 
containing only four chapters, four yarns, is one of the smallest strands in the mighty cable of the scriptures. Yet what depths of the soul does Jonah's deep sea-line sound? What a pregnant lesson to us is this prophet! What a noble thing is that canticle in the fish's belly! How billow-like and boisterously grand! We feel the flood surging over us, we sound with him to the kelpy bottom of the waters. Seaweed and all the slime of the sea is about us. But what is the lesson that this book of Jonah teaches? Shipmates, it is a two-stranded lesson, a lesson to us all as sinful men, and a lesson to me as a pilot of the living God. As sinful men it is a lesson to us all, because it is the story of the sin, hard-heartedness, suddenly awakened fears, the swift punishment, repentance, prayers, and finally the deliverance and joy of Jonah. As with all sinners among men, the sin of this son of Amittai was in his willful disobedience to the command of God, never mind now what that command was or how conveyed, which he found a hard command. But all things that God would have us do are hard for us to do. Remember that. And hence he oftener commands us than endeavors to persuade. And if we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God consists. With this sin of disobedience in him, Jonah still further flouts at God by seeking to flee from him. He thinks that a ship made by men will carry him into countries where God does not reign, but only the captains of this earth. He skulks about the wharves of Joppa, and seeks a ship that's bound for Tarshish. There lurks perhaps a hitherto unheeded meaning here. By all accounts Tarshish could have been no other city than the modern Cadiz. That's the opinion of learned men. And where is Cadiz, shipmates? Cadiz is in Spain as far by water from Joppa as Jonah could possibly have sailed in those ancient days when the Atlantic was an almost unknown sea, because Joppa, the modern Jaffa, shipmates, is on the most easterly coast of the Mediterranean, the Syrian, and Tarshish or Cadiz more than two thousand miles to the westward from that, just outside the Straits of Gibraltar. See ye not then, shipmates, that Jonah sought to flee world-wide from God? Miserable man! Oh, most contemptible, and worthy of all scorn, with slouched hat and guilty eyes, skulking from his God, prowling among the shipping like a vile burglar hastening to cross the seas. So disordered, self-condemning in his look, that had there been policemen in those days, Jonah, on the mere suspicion of something wrong, had been arrested ere he touched a deck. How plainly he's a fugitive! No baggage, not a hat-box, valise, or carpet-bag. No friends accompany him to the wharf with their adieus. At last, after much dodging search, he finds the Tarshi ship receiving the last items of her cargo— and as he steps on board to see its captain in the cabin, all the sailors, for the moment, desist from hoisting in the goods to mark the stranger's evil eye. Jonah sees this, but in vain he tries to look all ease and confidence, in vain essays his wretched smile. Strong intuitions of the men assure the mariners he can be no innocent. In their gamesome but still serious way one whispers to the other, "'Jack, he's robbed a widow.' or Joe, do you mark him? He's a bigamist. Or Harry, lad, I guess he's the adulterer that broke jail in old Gomorrah, or be like one of the missing murderers from Sodom. Another runs to read the bill that's stuck against the spile upon the wharf to which the ship is moored, offering five hundred gold coins for the apprehension of a parricide, and containing a description of his person. He reads and looks from Jonah to the bill, while all his sympathetic shipmates now crowd round Jonah, prepared to lay their hands upon him. Frightened Jonah trembles, and summoning all his boldness to his face, only looks so much the more a coward. He will not confess himself suspected, but that itself is strong suspicion. So he makes the best of it, and when the sailors find him not to be the man that is advertised, they let him pass, and he descends into the cabin." "'Who's there?' cries the captain at his busy desk, hurriedly making out his papers for the customs. "'Who's there?' 
Oh, how that harmless question mangles Jonah! For the instant he almost turns to flee again, but he rallies. I seek a passage in this ship to Tarshish. How soon sail ye, sir? Thus far the busy captain had not looked up to Jonah, though the man now stands before him, but no sooner does he hear that hollow voice than he darts a scrutinizing glance. We sail with the next coming tide, at last he slowly answered, still intently eyeing him. No sooner, sir. Soon enough for any honest man that goes a passenger. Ha! Jonah, that's another stab. But he swiftly calls away the captain from the scent. I'll sail with you, he says. The passage money, how much is that? I'll pay now. For it is particularly written, shipmates, as if it were a thing not to be overlooked in this history, that he paid the fare thereof ere the craft did sail. And taken with the context, this is full of meaning. Now Jonah's captain, shipmates, was one whose discernment detects crime in any, but whose cupidity exposes it only in the penniless. In this world, shipmates, sin that pays its way can travel freely, and without a passport, whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. So Jonah's captain prepares to test the length of Jonah's purse, ere he judge him openly. He charges him thrice the usual sum, and it's assented to. Then the captain knows that Jonah is a fugitive, but at the same time resolves to help a flight that paves its rear with gold. Yet, when Jonah fairly takes out his purse, prudent suspicion still molests the captain. He rings every coin to find a counterfeit. Not a forger, anyway, he mutters, and Jonah is put down for his passage. Point out my stateroom, sir, says Jonah now. I'm travel-weary. I need sleep. Thou looks like it, says the captain. There's thy room. Jonah enters, and would lock the door, but the lock contains no key. Hearing him foolishly fumbling there, the captain laughs slowly to himself, and mutters something about the doors of convict cells being never allowed to be locked within. All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth, and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then, in that contracted hole, sunk too beneath the ship's water-line, Jonah feels the heralding presentiment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels' wards. Screwed at its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slightly oscillates in Jonah's room, and the ship heeling over towards the wharf with the weight of the last bales received, the lamp, flame, and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room, though in truth infallibly straight itself, it but made obvious the false lying levels among which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah, as lying in his berth his tormented eyes roll round the place, and this thus far successful fugitive finds no refuge for his restless glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more appalls him. The floor, the ceiling, and the side are all awry. Oh, so my conscience hangs in me, he groans, straight upwards so it burns, but the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. Like one who, after a night of drunken revelry, hies to his bed, still reeling, but with conscience yet pricking him, as the plungings of the Roman racehorse but so much more strike his steel tags into him, as one who in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be past, and at last amid the whirl of woe he feels a deep stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death, for conscience is the wound, and there's naught to stanch it. So, after sore wrestlings in his birth, Jonah's prodigy of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep. And now the time of tide has come, the ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf the uncheered ship for Tarshish, all careening, glides to sea. That ship, my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. But the sea rebels. He will not bear the wicked burden. 
a dreadful storm comes on the ship is like to break but now when the boatswain calls all hands to lighten her when boxes bales and jars are clattering overboard when the wind is shrieking and the men are yelling and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over jonah's head in all this raging tumult jonah sleeps his hideous sleep he sees no black sky and raging sea feels not the reeling timbers and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him ay shipmates jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship a berth in the cabin as i have taken it and was fast asleep but the frightened master comes to him and shrieks in his dead ear what meanest thou o sleeper arise startled from his lethargy by that direful cry jonah staggers to his feet and stumbling to the deck grasps a shroud to look out upon the sea but at that moment he is sprung upon by a panther billow leaping over the bulwarks wave after wave thus leaps on to the ship and finding no speedy vent runs roaring fore and aft till the mariners come nigh to drowning while yet afloat and ever as the white moon shows her affrighted face from the steep gullies in the blackness overhead aghast jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward but soon beat downward again towards the tormented deep terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul in all his cringing attitudes the god fugitive is now too plainly known the sailors mark him more and more certain grow their suspicions of him and at last fully to test the truth by referring the whole matter to high heaven they fall to casting lots to see for whose cause this great tempest was upon him the lot is jonah's that discovered then how furiously they mob him with their questions what is thine occupation whence comest thou thy country what people but mark now shipmates the behaviour of poor jonah the eager mariners but ask him who he is and where from whereas they not only receive an answer to those questions but likewise another answer to a question not put by them but the unsolicited answer is forced from jonah by the hard hand of god that is upon him i am a hebrew he cries and then i fear the lord god of heaven who hath made the sea and the dry land fear him o jonah ay well mightst thou fear the lord god then straight away he now goes on to make a full confession whereupon the mariners became more and more appalled but still are pitiful for when jonah not yet supplicating god for mercy since he but too well knew the darkness of his deserts when wretched jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea for he knew that it was for his sake this great tempest was upon them they mercifully turn from him and seek by other means to save the ship but all in vain the indignant gale howls louder and then with one hand raised invokingly to god with the other they not unreluctantly lay hold of jonah and now behold jonah taken up as an anchor and dropped into the sea when instantly an oily calmness floats out from the east and the sea is still as jonah carries down the gale with him leaving smooth water behind he goes down in a whirling heart of such a masterless commotion that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops seething into the yawning jaws awaiting him and the whale shoots too all his ivory teeth like so many white bolts upon his prison then jonah prayed unto the lord out of the fish's belly but observe his prayer and learn a weighty lesson for sinful as he is jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance he feels that his dreadful punishment is just he leaves all his deliverance to god contenting himself with this that spite of all his pains and pangs he will still look towards his holy temple and here shipmates is true and faithful repentance not clamorous for pardon but grateful for punishment and how pleasing to god was this conduct in jonah is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale shipmates i do not place jonah before you to be copied for his sin but i do place him before you as a model for repentance sin not but if you do take heed to repent of it like jonah
While he was speaking these words, the howling of the shrieking, slanting storm without seemed to add new power to the preacher, who, when describing Jonah's sea-storm, seemed tossed by a storm himself. His deep chest heaved as with a ground-swell, his tossed arms seemed the warring elements at work, and the thunders that rolled away from off his swarthy brow, and the light leaping from his eye, made all his simple hearers look on him with a quick fear that was strange to them. There now came a lull in his look, as he silently turned over the leaves of the book once more, and at last, standing motionless, with closed eyes, for the moment seemed communing with God and himself. But again he leaned towards the people, and bowing his head lowly with an aspect of the deepest yet manliest humility, he spake these words. Shipmates, God has laid but one hand upon you. Both his hands press upon me. I have read ye by what murky light may be mine the lesson that Jonah teaches to all sinners, and therefore to you, and still more to me, for I am a greater sinner than you. And now how gladly would I come down from this masthead and sit on the hatches there where you sit, and listen as you listen, while some one of you reads me that other and more awful lesson which Jonah teaches to me as a pilot of the living God. How, being anointed pilot, prophet, or speaker of true things, and bidden by the Lord to sound those unwelcome truths in the ears of a wicked Nineveh, Jonah, appalled at the hostility he should raise, fled from his mission, and sought to escape his duty and his God by taking ship at Joppa. But God is everywhere. Tarshish he never reached. As we have seen, God came upon him in the whale, and swallowed him down to the living gulfs of doom, and with swift slantings tore him along into the midst of the seas, where the eddying depths sucked him ten thousand fathoms down, and the weeds were wrapped about his head, and all the watery world of woe bowled over him. Yet even then, beyond the reach of any plummet, out of the belly of hell, when the whale grounded upon the ocean's utmost bones, even then God heard the engulfed repenting prophet when he cried. Then God spake unto the fish, and from the shuddering cold and blackness of the sea the whale came breaching up towards the warm and pleasant sun, and all the delights of air and earth, and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land, when the word of the Lord came a second time. And Jonah, bruised and beaten, his ears, like two sea-shells, still multitudinously murmuring of the ocean, Jonah did the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? To preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This, shipmates, is the other lesson, and woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him whom this world charms from gospel duty. Woe to him who seeks to pour oil upon the waters when God has brewed them into a gale. Woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. Woe to him whose good name is more to him than goodness. Woe to him who in this world courts not dishonor. Woe to him who would not be true, even though to be false were salvation. Yea, woe to him who, as the great pilot Paul has it, while preaching to others is himself a castaway. He dropped and fell away from himself for a moment, then, lifting his face to them again, showed a deep joy in his eyes as he cried out with a heavenly enthusiasm, But, oh, shipmates, on the starboard hand of every woe there is a sure delight, and higher the top of that delight than the bottom of the woe is deep. Is not the main truck higher than the kelson is low? Delight is to him, a far, far upward and inward delight, who against the proud gods and commodores of this earth ever stands forth his own inexorable self. Delight is to him whose strong arms yet support him, when the ship of this base, treacherous world has gone down beneath him. Delight it is to him who gives no quarter in the truth, and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. Delight, top-gallant delight, is to him who acknowledges no law or lord but the Lord his God, and is only a patriot to heaven. Delight is to him 
whom all the waves of the billows of the seas and the boisterous mob can never shake from this sure keel of the ages. An eternal delight and deliciousness will be his, who, coming to lay him down, can say with his final breath, O oh, Father, chiefly known to me by thy rod, mortal or immortal, here I die. I have striven to be thine, more than to be this world's or mine own. Yet this is nothing. I leave eternity to thee. For what is man that he should live out the lifetime of his God? He said no more, but slowly waving a benediction, covered his face with his hands, and so remained kneeling till all the people had departed, and he was left alone in the place. End of chapters 8 and 9 Chapters 10 through 12 Chapter 10 A Bosom Friend Returning to the Spouter Inn from the chapel, I found Queequeg there quite alone, he having left the chapel before the benediction some time. He was sitting on a bench before the fire, with his feet on the stove-hearth, and in one hand was holding close to his face that little negro idol of his, peering hard into its face, and with a jackknife gently whittling away at its nose, meanwhile humming to himself in his heathenish way. But being now interrupted, he put up the image, and pretty soon, going to the table, took up a large book there, and placing it on his lap, began counting the pages with deliberate regularity, at every fiftieth page, as I fancied, stopping a moment, looking vacantly around him, and giving utterance to a long-drawn gurgling whistle of astonishment. He would then begin again at the next fifty, seeming to commence at the number one each time, as though he could not count more than fifty, and it was only by such a large number of fifties being found together that his astonishment at the multitude of pages was excited. With much interest I sat watching him. Savage though he was, and hideously marred about the face, at least to my taste, his countenance yet had something in it which was by no means disagreeable. You cannot hide the soul. Through all his unearthly tattooings I thought I saw the traces of a simple, honest heart, and in his large, deep eyes, fiery black and bold, there seemed tokens of a spirit that would dare a thousand devils. And besides all this, there was a certain lofty bearing about the pagan, which even his uncouthness could not altogether maim. He looked like a man who had never cringed and had never had a creditor. Whether it was, too, that his head being shaved, his forehead was drawn out in freer and brighter relief, and looked more expansive than it otherwise would, this I will not venture to decide. But certain it was, his head was phrenologically an excellent one, it may seem ridiculous, but it reminded me of General Washington's head, as seen in the popular busts of him. It had the same long, regularly graded, retreating slope from above the brows, which were likewise very projecting, like two long promontories thickly wooded on top. Queequeg was George Washington cannibalistically developed. Whilst I was thus closely scanning him, half pretending meanwhile to be looking out at the storm from the casement, he never heeded my presence, never troubled himself with so much as a single glance, but appeared wholly occupied with counting the pages of the marvellous book. Considering how sociably we had been sleeping together the night previous, and especially considering the affectionate arm I had found thrown over me waking in the morning, I thought this indifference of his very strange. But savages are strange beings. At times you do not know exactly how to take them. At first they are overawing, their calm self-collectedness of simplicity seems a Socratic wisdom. I had noticed also that Queequeg never consorted at all, or but very little, with the other seamen in the inn. He made no advances whatever, appeared to have no desire to enlarge the circle of his acquaintances. All this struck me as mighty singular, yet upon second thoughts there was something almost sublime in it. Here was a man some twenty thousand miles from home, by way of Cape Horn, that is, which was the only way he could get there, thrown among people as strange to him as though he were in the planet Jupiter. And yet he seemed entirely at his ease, preserving the utmost serenity, content with his own companionship, always equal to himself. 
Surely this was a touch of fine philosophy, though no doubt he had never heard there was such a thing as that. But perhaps to be true philosophers, we mortals should not be conscious of so living or so striving. So soon as I hear that such and such a man gives himself out for a philosopher, I conclude that, like the dyspeptic old woman, he must have broken his digester. As I sat there in that now lonely room, the fire burning low in that mild stage when, after its first intensity has warmed the air, it then only glows to be looked at, the evening shades and phantoms gathering round the casements, and peering in upon us silent solitary twain, the storm booming without in solemn swells, I began to be sensible of strange feelings. I felt a melting in me. No more my splintered heart and maddened hand were turned against the wolfish world. This soothing savage had redeemed it. There he sat, his very indifference speaking a nature in which there lurked no civilized hypocrisies and bland deceits. Wild he was, a very sight of sights to see, yet I began to feel myself mysteriously drawn towards him. And those same things that would have repelled most others, they were the very magnets that thus drew me. I'll try a pagan friend, thought I, since Christian kindness has proved but hollow courtesy. I drew my bench near him, and made some friendly signs and hints, doing my best to talk with him meanwhile. At first he little noticed these advances, but presently, upon my referring to his last night's hospitalities, he made out to ask me whether we were again to be bedfellows. I told him yes, whereat I thought he looked pleased, perhaps a little complimented. We then turned over the book together, and I endeavoured to explain to him the purpose of the printing, and the meaning of the few pictures that were in it. Thus I soon engaged his interest, and from that we went to jabbering the best we could about the various outer sights to be seen in this famous town. Soon I proposed a social smoke, and producing his pouch and tomahawk, he quietly offered me a puff. And then we sat exchanging puffs from that wild pipe of his, and keeping it regularly passing between us. If there yet lurked any ice of indifference toward me in the pagan's breast, this pleasant, genial smoke we had soon thawed it out, and left us cronies. He seemed to take to me quite as naturally and unbiddenly as I to him, and when our smoke was over he pressed his forehead against mine, clasped me round the waist, and said that henceforth we were married, meaning, in his country's phrase, that we were bosom friends. He would gladly die for me, if the need should be. In a countryman this sudden flame of friendship would have seemed far too premature, a thing to be much distrusted, but in this simple savage those old rules would not apply. After supper and another social chat and smoke we went to our room together. He made me a present of his embalmed head, took out his enormous tobacco wallet, and groping under the tobacco drew out some thirty dollars in silver. Then, spreading them on the table, and mechanically dividing them into two equal portions, pushed one of them toward me, and said it was mine. I was going to remonstrate, but he silenced me by pouring them into my trousers' pockets. I let them stay. He then went about his evening prayers, took out his idol, and removed the paper fireboard. By certain signs and symptoms I thought he seemed anxious for me to join him, but well knowing what was to follow, I deliberated a moment whether, in case he invited me, I would comply or otherwise. I was a good Christian, born and bred in the bosom of the infallible Presbyterian Church. How, then, could I unite with this wild idolater in worshipping his piece of wood? But what is worship, thought I? Do you suppose now, Ishmael, that the magnanimous God of heaven and earth, pagans and all included, can possibly be jealous of an insignificant bit of black wood? Impossible. But what is worship? To do the will of God, that is worship. And what is the will of God? To do to my fellow man what I would have my fellow man do to me, that is the will of God. Now Queequeg is my fellow man. And what do I wish that this Queequeg would do to me? Why, unite with me in my particular Presbyterian form of worship. Consequently, I must then unite with him in his. Ergo, I must turn idolater. So I kindled the shavings, 
helped prop up the innocent little idol, offered him burnt biscuit with Queequeg, salaamed before him twice or thrice, kissed his nose, and that done, we undressed and went to bed, at peace with our own consciences and all the world. But we did not go to sleep without some little chat. How it is I know not, but there is no place like a bed for confidential disclosures between friends. Man and wife, they say, there open the very bottom of their souls to each other, and some old couples often lie and chat over old times till nearly morning. Thus, then, in our heart's honeymoon, lay I and Queequeg, a cosy, loving pair. CHAPTER Eleven, NIGHTGOWN We had lain thus in bed, chatting and napping at short intervals, and Queequeg now and then affectionately throwing his brown tattooed legs over mine, and then drawing them back, so entirely sociable and free and easy were we, when at last, by reason of our confabulations, what little nappishness remained in us altogether departed, and we felt like getting up again, though daybreak was yet some way down the future. Yes, we became very wakeful, so much so that our recumbent position began to grow wearisome, and by little and little we found ourselves sitting up, the clothes well tucked around us, leaning against the headboard with our four knees drawn up close together and our two noses bending over them, as if our knee-pans were warming pans. We felt very nice and snug, the more so since it was so chilly out of doors, indeed out of bedclothes too, seeing that there was no fire in the room. The more so, I say, because truly to enjoy bodily warmth some small part of you must be cold, for there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast. Nothing exists in itself. If you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable, and have been so for a long time, then you cannot be said to be comfortable any more. But if, like Queequeg and me in the bed, the tip of your nose or the crown of your head be slightly chilled, why then indeed in the general consciousness you feel most delightfully and unmistakably warm. For this reason a sleeping apartment should never be furnished with a fire, which is one of the luxurious discomforts of the rich. For the height of this sort of deliciousness is to have nothing but the blanket between you and your snugness and the cold of the outer air. Then there you lie like the one warm spark in the heart of an arctic crystal. We had been sitting in this crouching manner for some time, when all at once I thought I would open my eyes. For when between sheets, whether by day or by night, and whether asleep or awake, I have a way of always keeping my eyes shut, in order the more to concentrate on the snugness of being in bed. Because no man can ever feel his own identity aright except his eyes be closed, as if darkness were indeed the proper element of our essences, though light be more congenial to our clayey part. Upon opening my eyes, then, and coming out of my own pleasant and self-created darkness into the imposed and coarse outer gloom of the unilluminated twelve o'clock at night, I experienced a disagreeable revulsion. Nor did I at all object to the hint from Queequeg that perhaps it were best to strike a light, seeing that we were so wide awake, and besides he felt a strong desire to have a few quiet puffs from his tomahawk. Be it said that though I had felt such a strong repugnance to his smoking in the bed the night before, yet see how elastic our stiff prejudices grow when love comes once to bend them. For now I like nothing better than to have Queequeg smoking by me, even in bed, because he seemed to be full of such serene household joy then. I no more felt unduly concerned for the landlord's policy of insurance. I was only alive to the condensed, confidential comfortableness of sharing a pipe and a blanket with a real friend. With our shaggy jackets drawn about our shoulders, we now passed the tomahawk from one to the other, till slowly there grew over us a blue-hanging tester of smoke, illuminated by the flame of the new-lit lamp. Whether it was that this undulating tester rolled the savage away to far-distant scenes, I know not. But he now spoke of his native island, and eager to hear his history, I begged him to go on and tell it. He gladly complied, though at the time I but ill comprehended not a few of his words, yet subsequent disclosures, when I had become more familiar with his broken phraseology, now enable me to present the whole story, such as it may prove, in the mere skeleton I give. Chapter 12. Biographical. 
Queequeg was a native of Kokovoko, an island far away to the west and south. It is not down in any map. True places never are. When a new-hatched savage, running wild about his native woodlands in a grass-clout, followed by the nibbling goats as if he were a green sapling, even then, in Queequeg's ambitious soul, lurked a strong desire to see something more of Christendom than a specimen whaler or two. His father was a high chief, a king, his uncle a high priest, and on the maternal side he boasted aunts who were the wives of unconquerable warriors. There was excellent blood in his veins, royal stuff, though sadly vitiated, I fear, by the cannibal propensity he nourished in his untutored youth. A Sag Harbor ship visited his father's bay, and Queequeg sought a passage to the Christian lands. But the ship, having her full complement of seamen, spurned his suit, and not all the king his father's influence could prevail. But Queequeg vowed a vow. Alone in his canoe he paddled off to a distant strait, which he knew the ship must pass through when she quitted the island. On one side was a coral reef, on the other a low tongue of land, covered with mangrove thickets that grew out into the water. Hiding his canoe, still afloat among these thickets, with its prow seaward, he sat down in the stern, paddle low in hand, and when the ship was gliding by, like a flash he darted out, gained her side, and with one backward dash of his foot, capsized and sank the canoe, climbed up the chains, and throwing himself at full length upon the deck, grappled a ring-bolt there, and swore not to let go, though hacked in pieces. In vain the captain threatened to throw him overboard, suspended a cutlass over his naked wrists. Queequeg was the son of a king, and Queequeg budged not. Struck by his desperate dauntlessness, and his wild desire to visit Christendom, the captain at last relented, and told him he might make himself at home. But this fine young savage, this sea prince of Wales, never saw the captain's cabin. They put him down among the sailors, and made a whaleman of him. But like Tsar Peter, content to toil in the shipyards of foreign cities, Queequeg disdained no seeming ignominy, if thereby he might happily gain the power of enlightening his untutored countrymen. For at bottom, so he told me, he was actuated by a profound desire to learn among the Christians the arts whereby to make his people still happier than they were, and more than that, still better than they were. But, alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked, infinitely more so than all his father's heathens, arrived at last in old Sag Harbor, and seeing what the sailors did there, and going on to Nantucket, and seeing how they spent their wages in that place also, poor Queequeg gave it up for lost. Thought he, it's a wicked world in all meridians. I'll die a pagan. And thus, an old idolater at heart, he yet lived among these Christians, wore their clothes, and tried to talk their gibberish, hence the queer ways about him, though now some time from home. By hints I asked him whether he did not propose going back, and having a coronation, since he might now consider his father dead and gone, he being very old and feeble at the last accounts. He answered no, not yet, and added that he was fearful Christianity, or rather Christians, had unfitted him for ascending the pure and undefiled throne of thirty pagan kings before him. But by and by, he said, he would return, as soon as he felt himself baptized again. For the nonce, however, he proposed to sail about and sow his wild oats in all four oceans. They had made a harpooner of him, and that barbed iron was in lieu of a scepter now. I asked him what might be his immediate purpose touching his future movements. He answered to go to sea again in his old vocation. Upon this I told him that whaling was my own design, and informed him of my intention to sail out of Nantucket, as being the most promising port for an adventurous whaleman to embark from. He at once resolved to accompany me to that island, ship aboard the same vessel, get into the same watch, the same boat, the same mess with me, in short, to share my every hap, with both my hands in his, boldly dip into the potluck of both worlds. To all this I joyously assented, for besides the affection I now felt for Queequeg, he was an experienced harpooner, and as such could not fail to be of great usefulness to one who, like me, was wholly ignorant of the mysteries of whaling, though well acquainted with the sea, as known to merchant seamen. 
His story being ended, with his pipe's last dying puff, Queequeg embraced me, pressed his forehead against mine, and blowing out the light, we rolled over from each other this way and that, and very soon were sleeping. End of chapters 10 through 12 Chapters 13 through 15 Chapter 13 Wheelbarrow Next morning, Monday, after disposing of the embalmed head to a barber for a block, I settled my own and comrade's bill, using, however, my comrade's money. The grinning landlord, as well as the boarders, seemed amazingly tickled at the sudden friendship which had sprung up between me and Queequeg, especially as Peter Coffin's cock-and-bull stories about him had previously so much alarmed me concerning the very person whom I now companied with. We borrowed a wheelbarrow, and embarking our things, including my own poor carpet-bag and Queequeg's canvas sack and hammock, away went down to the moss, a little Nantucket packet schooner moored at the wharf. As we were going along, the people stared, not at Queequeg so much, for they were used to seeing cannibals like him in their streets, but at seeing him and me on such confidential terms. But we heeded them not, going along wheeling the barrow by turns, and Queequeg now and then stopping to adjust the sheath on his harpoon barbs. I asked him why he carried such a troublesome thing with him ashore, and whether all whaling ships did not find their own harpoons. To this, in substance, he replied that, though what I hinted was true enough, yet he had a particular affection for his own harpoon, because it was of assured stuff, well tried in many a mortal combat, and deeply intimate with the hearts of whales. In short, like many inland reapers and mowers, who go into the farmer's meadows armed with their own scythes, though in no wise obliged to furnish them, even so Queequeg, for his own private reasons, preferred his own harpoon. Shifting the barrow from my hand to his, he told me a funny story about the first wheelbarrow he had ever seen. It was in Sag Harbor. The owners of his ship, it seems, had lent him one, in which to carry his heavy chest to his boarding-house. Not to seem ignorant about the thing, though in truth he was entirely so, concerning the precise way in which to manage the barrow, Queequeg put his chest upon it, lashes it fast, and then shoulders the barrow and marches up the wharf. Why, said I, Queequeg, you might have known better than that, one would think. Didn't the people laugh? Upon this he told me another story. The people of his island of Cocovoco, it seems, at their wedding feasts, express the fragrant water of young coconuts into a large, stained calabash, like a punch-bowl, and this punch-bowl always forms the great central ornament on the braided mat where the feast is held. Now a certain grand merchant ship once touched at Cocovoco, and its commander, uh, from all accounts a very stately, punctilious gentleman, at least for a sea captain, this commander was invited to the wedding feast of Queequeg's sister, a pretty young princess just turned of ten. Well, when all the wedding guests were assembled at the bride's bamboo cottage, this captain marches in, and being assigned the post of honor, placed himself over against the punch bowl, and between the high priest and his majesty the king, Queequeg's father. Grace being said, for those people have grace as well as we, though Queequeg told me that unlike us, who at such times look downward to our platters, they, on the contrary, copying the ducks, glance upward to the great giver of all feasts. Grace, I say, being said, the high priest opens the banquet by the immemorial ceremony of the island, that is, dipping his consecrated and consecrating fingers into the bowl before the blessed beverage circulates. Seeing himself placed next to the priest, and noting the ceremony, and thinking himself, being captain of a ship, as having plain precedence over a mere island king, especially in the king's own house, the captain coolly proceeds to wash his hands in the punch-bowl, taking it, I suppose, for a huge finger-glass. Now, said Queequeg, what do you think now? Didn't our people laugh? At last, passage paid and luggage safe, we stood on board the schooner. Hoisting sail, it glided down the Acushnet River. On one side New Bedford rose in terraces of streets, their ice-covered trees all glittering in the clear, cold air. Huge hills and mountains of casks on casks were piled upon her wharves, 
and side by side the world-wandering whale-ships lay silent and safely moored at last, while from others came a sound of carpenters and coopers, with blended noises of fires and forges to melt the pitch, all betokening that new cruises were on the start, that one most perilous and long voyage ended only begins a second, and a second ended only begins a third, and so on, forever and for aye. Such is the endlessness, yea, the intolerableness, of all earthly effort. Gaining the more open water, the bracing breeze waxed fresh. The little moss tossed the quick foam from her bows as a young colt his snortings. How I snuffed that tartar air! How I spurned that turnpike earth, that common highway all over dented with the marks of slavish heels and hoofs, and turned me to admire the magnanimity of the sea which will permit no records. At the same foam fountain, Queequeg seemed to drink and reel with me. His dusky nostrils swelled apart, he showed his filed and pointed teeth. On, on we flew, and, our offing gained, the moss did homage to the blast, ducked and dived her bows as a slave before the sultan. Sideways leaning, we sideways darted, every rope-yarn tingling like a wire, the two tall masts buckling like Indian canes in land tornadoes. So full of this reeling scene were we, as we stood by the plunging bowsprit, that for some time we did not notice the jeering glances of the passengers, a lubber-like assembly, who marvelled that two fellow-beings should be so companionable, as though a white man were anything more dignified than a whitewashed negro. But there were some boobies and bumpkins there, who, by their intense greenness, must have come from the heart and centre of all verdure. Queequeg caught one of these young saplings, mimicking him behind his back. I thought the bumpkin's hour of doom was come. Dropping his harpoon, the brawny savage caught him in his arms, and by an almost miraculous dexterity and strength sent him high up bodily into the air. Then, slightly tapping his stern in mid-somerset, the fellow landed with bursting lungs upon his feet, while Queequeg, turning his back upon him, lighted his tomahawk pipe and passed it to me for a puff. "'Capting! Capting!' yelled the bumpkin, running towards that officer. "'Capting! Capting! Here's the devil!' "'Hello, you, sir!' cried the captain, a gaunt rib of the sea, stalking up to Queequeg. "'What in thunder do you mean by that? Don't you know you might have killed that chap?' "'What him say?' said Queequeg, as he mildly turned to me. "'He say,' said I, "'that you came near Killy that man there.' pointing to the still shivering greenhorn. Gilly, cried Queequeg, twisting his tattooed face into an unearthly expression of disdain. Ah, him bevy small fishy. Queequeg no killy so smally fishy. Queequeg killy big whale. Look you, roared the captain. I'll killy you, you cannibal, if you try any more of your tricks aboard here, so mind your eye. But it so happened just then that it was high time for the captain to mind his own eye. The prodigious strain upon the mainsail had parted the weather-sheet, and the tremendous boom was now flying from side to side, completely sweeping the entire after part of the deck. The poor fellow whom Queequeg had handled so roughly was swept overboard. All hands were in a panic, and to attempt snatching at the boom to stay it seemed madness. It flew from right to left and back again, almost in one ticking of a watch, and every instant seemed on the point of snapping into splinters. Nothing was done, and nothing seemed capable of being done. Those on deck rushed toward the bows and stood eyeing the boom as if it were the lower jaw of an exasperated whale. In the midst of this consternation, Queequeg dropped deftly to his knees, and crawling under the path of the boom, whipped hold of a rope, secured one end to the bulwarks, and then flinging the other like a lasso, caught it round the boom as it swept over his head, and at the next jerk the spar was that way trapped and all was safe. The schooner was run into the wind, and while the hands were clearing away the stern-boat, Queequeg, stripped to the waist, darted from the side with a long living arc of a leap. For three minutes or more he was seen swimming like a dog, throwing his long arms straight out before him, and by turns revealing his brawny shoulders through the freezing foam. I looked at the grand and glorious fellow, but saw no one to be saved. The greenhorn had gone down. Shooting himself perpendicularly from the water, 
Queequeg now took an instant's glance around him, and seeming to see just how matters were, dived down and disappeared. A few minutes more, and he rose again, one arm still striking out, and with the other dragging a lifeless form. The boat soon picked them up. The poor bumpkin was restored. All hands voted Queequeg a noble trump. The captain begged his pardon. From that hour I clove to Queequeg like a barnacle. Yea, till poor Queequeg took his last long dive. Was there ever such unconsciousness? He did not seem to think that he had all deserved a medal from the humane and magnanimous societies. He only asked for water, fresh water, something to wipe the brine off. That done, he put on dry clothes, lighted his pipe, and leaning against the bulwarks, and mildly eyeing those around him, seemed to be saying to himself, It's a mutual joint-stock world in all meridians. We cannibals must help these Christians. CHAPTER Fourteen, NANTUCKET Nothing more happened on the passage worthy of mentioning, so after a fine run we safely arrived in Nantucket. Nantucket! Take out your map and look at it. See what a real corner of the world it occupies, how it stands there, away off shore, more lonely than the Eddystone lighthouse. Look at it, a mere hillock and elbow of sand, all beach and without a background. There is more sand there than you would use in twenty years as a substitute for blotting paper. Some gamesome whites will tell you that they have to plant weeds there, that they don't grow naturally, that they import Canada thistles that they have to send beyond seas for a spile to stop a leak in an oil cask, that pieces of wood in Nantucket are carried about like bits of the true cross in Rome, that people there plant toadstools before their house to get under the shade in summer time, that one blade of grass makes an oasis, three blades in a day's walk a prairie, that they wear quicksand shoes, something like Laplander snowshoes, that they are so shut up, belted about, every way enclosed, surrounded, and made an utter island of by the ocean, that to their very chairs and tables small clams will sometimes be found adhering, as to the backs of sea-turtles. But these extravaganzas only show that Nantucket is no Illinois. Look now at the wondrous traditional story of how this island was settled by the red men. Thus goes the legend. In olden times an eagle swooped down upon the New England coast, and carried off an infant Indian in its talons. With loud laments the parents saw their child borne out of sight over the wide waters. They resolved to follow in the same direction. Setting out in their canoes, after a perilous passage, they discovered the island, and there they found an empty ivory casket, the poor little Indian's skeleton." What wonder, then, that these Nantucketers, born on a beach, should take to the sea for a livelihood? They first caught crabs and quahogs in the sand. Grown bolder, they waded out with nets for mackerel. More experienced, they pushed off in boats and captured cod, and at last, launching a navy of great ships on the sea, explored this watery world, put an incessant belt of circumnavigations round it, peeped in at Bering Straits, and in all seasons and all oceans declared everlasting war with the mightiest animated mass that has survived the flood, most monstrous and most mountainous, that Himalayan salt-sea mastodon, clothed with such portentousness of unconscious power, that his very panics are more to be dreaded than his most fearless and malicious assaults. And thus of these naked Nantucketers, these sea-hermits, issuing from their anthill in the sea, overrun and conquered the watery world like so many Alexanders, parceling out among them the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans, as the three pirate powers did Poland. Let America add Mexico to Texas, and pile Cuba upon Canada. Let the English overswarm all India, and hang out their blazing banner from the sun. Two-thirds of this terraqueous globe are the Nantucketers, for the sea is his, he owns it, as emperors own empires, other seamen having but a right of way through it. Merchant ships are but extension bridges, armed ones but floating forts. Even pirates and privateers, though following the sea as highwaymen the road, they but plunder other ships, other fragments of the land like themselves, without seeking to draw their living from the bottomless deep itself. The Nantucketer, he alone resides and riots on the sea. 
He alone, in Bible language, goes down to it in ships, to and fro ploughing it as his own special plantation. There is his home, there lies his business, which a Noah's flood would not interrupt, though it overwhelmed all the millions in China. He lives on the sea as prairie cocks in the prairie. He hides among the waves. He climbs them as chamois hunters climb the Alps. For years he knows not the land, so that when he comes to it at last, it smells like another world, more strangely than the moon would to an earthman. With the landless gull that at sunset folds her wings and is rocked to sleep between billows, so at nightfall the Nantucketer, out of sight of land, furls his sails and lays him to his rest, while under his very pillow rush herds of walruses and whales. Chapter 15 Chowder It was quite late in the evening when the little moss came snugly to anchor, and Queequeg and I went ashore, so we could attend to no business that day, at least none but a supper and a bed. The landlord of the Spouter Inn had recommended us to his cousin, Hosea Hussey, of the Tripots, whom he asserted to be the proprietor of one of the best-kept hotels in all Nantucket. And, moreover, he had assured us that cousin Hosea, as he called him, was famous for his chowders. In short, he plainly hinted that we could not possibly do better than try potluck at the tripots. But the directions he had given us about keeping a yellow warehouse on our starboard hand till we opened a white church to the larboard, and then keeping that on the larboard hand till we made a corner three points to the starboard, and that done, then asked the first man we met where the place was, these crooked directions of his very much puzzled us at first, especially as at the outset Queequeg insisted that the yellow warehouse, our first point of departure, must be left on the larboard hand, whereas I had understood Peter Coffin to say it was on the starboard. However, by dint of beating about a little in the dark, and now and then knocking up a peaceable inhabitant to inquire the way, we at last came to something which there was no mistaking. Two enormous wooden pots, painted black, and suspended by asses' ears, swung from the cross-trees of an old topmast, planted in front of an old doorway. The horns of the cross-trees were sawed off on the other side, so that this old topmast looked not a little like the gallows. Perhaps I was oversensitive to such impressions at the time, but I could not help staring at this gallows with vague misgiving. A sort of crick was in my neck as I gazed up to the two remaining horns. Yes, two of them, one for Queequeg and one for me. It's ominous, thinks I. A coffin, my innkeeper, upon landing in my first whaling port, tombstones staring at me in the whaleman's chapel, and here a gallows, and a pair of prodigious black pots, too. Are these last throwing out oblique hints touching Tophet? I was called from these reflections by the sight of a freckled woman with yellow hair and a yellow gown, standing in the porch of the inn under a dull red lamp swinging there, that looked much like an injured eye, and carrying on a brisk scolding with a man in a purple woolen shirt. "'Get along with ye,' she said to the man, "'or I'll be combing ye.' "'Come on, Queequeg,' said I. "'All right, there's Mrs. Hussey.' And so it turned out, Mr. Hosea Hussey being from home, but leaving Mrs. Hussey entirely competent to attend to all his affairs. Upon making known our desires for supper and a bed, Mrs. Hussey, postponing further scolding for the present, ushered us into a little room, and seating us at a table spread with the relics of a recently concluded repast, turned round to us and said, "'Clam or cod?' "'What's that about cods, ma'am?' said I, with much politeness. "'Clam or cod?' she repeated. "'A clam for supper. A cold clam. Is that what you mean, Mrs. Hussey?' says I. "'But that's a rather cold and clammy reception in the winter time, ain't it, Mrs. Hussey?' But being in a great hurry to resume scolding the man in the purple shirt, who was waiting for it in the entry, and seeming to hear nothing but the word clam, Mrs. Hussey hurried towards an open door leading to the kitchen, and bawling out, "'Clam for two! disappeared. "'Queequeg,' said I, "'do you think that we can make out a supper for us both on one clam?' However, a warm and savoury steam from the kitchen served to belie the apparently cheerless prospect before us. 
but when that smoking chowder came in, the mystery was delightfully explained. Oh, sweet friends, hearken to me! It was made of small, juicy clams, scarcely bigger than hazelnuts, mixed with pounded ship-biscuit, and salted pork cut up into little flakes, the whole enriched with butter and plentifully seasoned with pepper and salt. Our appetites being sharpened by the frosty voyage, and in particular Queequeg seeing his favorite fishing food before him, and the chowder being surpassingly excellent, we dispatched it with great expedition. When, leaning back a moment, and bethinking me of Mrs. Hussey's clam and cod announcement, I thought I would try a little experiment. Stepping to the kitchen door, I uttered the word, COD, with great emphasis, and resumed my seat. In a few moments, the savory steam came forth again, but with a different flavor, and in good time a fine cod chowder was placed before us. We resumed business, and, while plying our spoons in the bowl, thinks I to myself, I wonder now if this here has any effect on the head. What's that stultifying saying about chowder-headed people? But look, Queequeg, ain't that a live eel in your bowl? Where's your harpoon? Fishiest of all fishy places was the tripots, which well deserved its name, for the pots there were always boiling chowders, chowder for breakfast, and chowder for dinner, and chowder for supper, till you began to look for fish bones coming through your clothes. The area before the house was paved with clam shells. Mrs. Hussey wore a polished necklace of codfish vertebrae, and Hosea Hussey had his account books bound in superior old shark skin. There was a fishy flavor to the milk, too, which I could not at all account for, till one morning, happening to take a stroll along the beach, among some fishermen's boats, I saw Hosea's brindled cow feeding on fish remnants, and marching along the sand with each foot in a cod's decapitated head, looking very slipshod, I assure you. Supper concluded, we received a lamp, and directions from Mrs. Hussey concerning the nearest way to bed. But as Queequeg was about to precede me up the stairs, the lady reached forth her arm, and demanded his harpoon. She allowed no harpoon in her chambers. "'Why not?' said I. "'Every true whaleman sleeps with his harpoon. "'But why not?' "'Because it's dangerous,' says she. "'Ever since young Stiggs, coming from that unfortunate voyage of his, "'when he was gone four years and a half with only three barrels of ile, "'was found dead in my first floor back with his harpoon in his side. "'Ever since then I allow no boarders to take sich dangerous weapons in their rooms at night. "'So, Mr. Queequeg, for she had learned his name, I will just take this here iron and keep it for you till morning. But the chowder, clam or cod tomorrow for breakfast, men? Both, says I, and let's have a couple of smoked herring by way of variety. End of chapters 13 through 15 Chapter 16 The Ship In bed we concocted our plans for the morrow, but to my surprise, and no small concern, Queequeg now gave me to understand that he had been diligently consulting Yojo, the name of his black little god, and Yojo had told him two or three times over, and strongly insisted upon it every way, that instead of our going together among the whaling fleet in the harbour, and in concert selecting our craft, instead of this, I say, Yojo earnestly enjoined that the selection of the ship should rest wholly with me, inasmuch as Yojo proposed befriending us, and, in order to do so, had already pitched upon a vessel, which, if left to myself, I, Ishmael, should infallibly light upon, for all the world as though it had turned out by chance, and in that vessel I must immediately ship myself, for the present irrespective of Queequeg. I have forgotten to mention that in many things Queequeg placed great confidence in the excellence of Yojo's judgment and surprising forecast of things, and cherished Yojo with considerable esteem, as a rather good sort of god who perhaps meant well enough upon the whole, but in all cases did not succeed in his benevolent designs. Now this plan of Queequeg's, or rather Yojo's, touching the selection of our craft, I did not like that plan at all. I had not a little relied upon Queequeg's sagacity to point out the whaler best fitted to carry us and our fortunes securely. But as all my remonstrances produced no effect upon Queequeg, I was obliged to acquiesce, 
and accordingly prepared to set about this business with a determined rushing sort of energy and vigour that should quickly settle that trifling little affair. Next morning, early, leaving Queequeg shut up with Yojo in our little bedroom, for it seemed that it was some sort of Lent or Ramadan or day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer with Queequeg and Yojo that day. How it was I never could find out, for though I applied myself to it several times I never could master his liturgies and thirty-nine articles. Leaving Queequeg then, fasting on his tomahawk pipe, and Yojo warming himself at his sacrificial fire of shavings, I sallied out among the shipping. After much prolonged sauntering and many random inquiries, I learnt that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Pequod. Devil Dam I do not know the origin of, Titbit is obvious, Pequod, you will no doubt remember, was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians, now extinct as the ancient Medes. I peered in pride about the Devil Dam, from her hopped over to the titbit, and finally going on board the Pequod, looked around her for a moment, and then decided that this was the very ship for us. You may have seen many a quaint craft in your day, for aught I know, square-toed luggers, mountainous Japanese junks, butter-box galliots, and what not, but take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Pequod. She was a ship of the old school, rather small, if anything, with an old-fashioned claw-footed look about her, long-seasoned and weather-stained in typhoons and calms of all four oceans, her old hull's complexion was darkened like a French grenadier's, who has alike fought in Egypt and Siberia. Her venerable bows looked bearded. Her masts, cut somewhere on the coasts of Japan, where her original ones were lost overboard in a gale, her masts stood stiffly up like the spines of the three old kings of Cologne. Her ancient decks were worn and wrinkled like the pilgrim-worshipped flagstone in Canterbury Cathedral where Becket bled. But to all these, her old antiquities, were added new and marvellous features, pertaining to the wild business that for more than half a century she had followed. Old Captain Peleg, many years her chief mate, before he commanded another vessel of his own, and now a retired seaman and one of the principal owners of the Pequod, this old Peleg, during the term of his chief mateship, had built upon her original grotesqueness and inlaid it all over, with a quaintness both of material and device, unmatched by anything except it be Thorkill Hake's carved buckler or bedstead. She was apparelled like any barbaric Ethiopian emperor, his neck heavy with pendants of polished ivory. She was a thing of trophies, a cannibal of a craft, tricking herself forth in the chaste bones of her enemies. All round her unpanelled open bulwarks were garnished like one continuous jaw, with the long sharp teeth of the sperm whale inserted there for pins to fasten her old hempen thews and tendons to. Those thews ran not through base blocks of land wood, but deftly travelled over sheaves of sea ivory. Scorning a turnstile wheel at her reverend helm, she sported there a tiller, and that tiller was in one mass, curiously carved from the long, narrow lower jaw of her hereditary foe. The helmsman who steered by that tiller in a tempest felt like the tartar when he holds back his fiery steed by clutching its jaw. A noble craft, but somehow a most melancholy. All noble things are touched with that. Now when I looked about the quarter-deck for someone having authority in order to propose myself as a candidate for the voyage, at first I saw nobody. But I could not well overlook a strange sort of tent, or rather wigwam, pitched a little behind the mainmast. It seemed only a temporary erection used in port. It was of a conical shape, some ten feet high, consisting of the long, huge slabs of limber black bone taken from the middle and highest part of the jaws of the right whale. Planted with their broad ends on the deck, a circle of these slabs, laced together, mutually sloped towards each other 
and at the apex united in a tufted point where the loose hairy fibres waved to and fro like the topknot on some old Potawatomi sachem's head. A triangular opening faced towards the bows of the ship, so that the insider commanded a complete view forward. And half concealed in this queer tenement I at length found one who, by his aspect, seemed to have authority, and who, it being noon, and the ship's work suspended, was now enjoying respite from the burden of command. He was seated on an old-fashioned oaken chair, wriggling all over with curious carving, and the bottom of which was formed of a stout interlacing of the same elastic stuff of which the wigwam was constructed. There was nothing so very particular, perhaps, about the appearance of the elderly man I saw. He was brown and brawny, like most old seamen, and heavily rolled up in blue pilot-cloth, cut in the Quaker style. Only there was a fine and almost microscopic network of the minutest wrinkles interlacing round his eyes, which must have arisen from his continual sailings and many hard gales, and always looking to windward, for this causes the muscles about the eyes to become pursed together. Such eye-wrinkles are very effectual in a scowl. "'Is this the captain of the Pequod?' said I, advancing to the door of the tent. "'Supposing it be the captain of the Pequod, what dost thou want of him?' he demanded. "'I was thinking of shipping.' "'Thou wast, wast thou? I see thou art no Nantucketer. Ever been in a stove-boat?' "'No, sir, I never have.' "'Dost know nothing at all about whaling, I dare say, eh?' "'Nothing, sir, but I have no doubt I soon shall learn. I've been several voyages in the merchant service, and I think that merchant service be damned. Talk not that lingo to me. Dost see that leg? I'll take that leg away from thy stern, if ever thou talkest of the merchant service to me again. Merchant service, indeed. I suppose now ye feel considerable proud of having served in those merchant ships. But flukes, man! What makes thee want to go a-whaling, eh? It looks a little suspicious, don't it, eh? Hast not been a pirate, hast thou? Didst not rob thy last captain, didst thou? Didst not think of murdering the officers when thou gettest to sea? I protested my innocence of these things. I saw that under the mask of these half-humorous innuendos, this old seaman, as an insulated Quakerish Nantucketer, was full of his insular prejudices, and rather distrustful of all aliens unless they hailed from Cape Cod or the Vineyard. "'But what takes thee a-whaling? I want to know that before I think of shipping ye.' "'Well, sir, I want to see what whaling is. I want to see the world.' "'Want to see what whaling is, eh? Have ye clapped an eye on Captain Ahab?' "'Who is Captain Ahab, sir?' "'Aye, aye, I thought so. Captain Ahab is the captain of this ship.' I am mistaken, then. I thought I was speaking to the captain himself. Thou art speaking to Captain Peleg. That's who ye are speaking to, young man. It belongs to me and Captain Bildad to see the Pequod fitted out for the voyage and supplied with all her needs, including crew. We are part owners and agents. But as I was going to say, if thou wantest to know what whaling is, as thou tellest ye do— I can put ye in the way of finding it out before ye bind yourself to it, past backing out. Clap eye on Captain Ahab, young man, and thou wilt find that he has only one leg. What do you mean, sir? Was the other lost by a whale? Lost by a whale? Young man, come nearer to me. It was devoured, chewed up, crunched by the monstrousest parmacetti that ever chipped a boat. Ah! Ah! I was a little alarmed by his energy, perhaps also a little touched at the hearty grief in his concluding exclamation, but said as calmly as I could, What you say is no doubt true enough, sir, but how could I know there was any peculiar ferocity in that particular whale, though indeed I might have inferred as much from the simple fact of the accident? Now look ye, young man— Thy lungs are a sort of a soft, do you see? Thou dost not talk shark a bit. Sure you've been to sea before now. Sure of that. Sir, said I, I thought I told you that I had been four voyages in the merchant— Hard down on that! 
Mind what I said about the marching service. Don't aggravate me. I won't have it. But let us understand each other. I have given thee a hint about what whaling is. Do you yet feel inclined for it? I do, sir. Very good. Now art thou the man to pitch a harpoon down a live whale's throat, and then jump after it? Answer quick. I am, sir, if it should be positively indispensable to do so, not to be got rid of, that is, which I don't take to be the fact. Good again. Now then, thou not only wantest to go whaling to find out by experience what whaling is, but ye also want to go in order to see the world. Was that not what ye said? I thought so. Well then, just step forward there and take a peep over the weather bow and then back to me and tell me what you see there. For a moment I stood a little puzzled by this curious request, not knowing exactly how to take it, whether humorously or in earnest. But concentrating all his crow's feet into one scowl, Captain Peleg started me on the errand. Going forward and glancing over the weather bow, I perceived that the ship swinging to her anchor with the flood tide was now obliquely pointing towards the open ocean. The prospect was unlimited, but exceedingly monotonous and forbidding, not the slightest variety that I could see. "'Well, what's the report?' said Peleg, when I came back. "'What did you see?' "'Not much,' I replied. "'Nothing but water. Considerable horizon, though, and there's a squall coming up, I think. "'Well, what dost thou think, then, of seeing the world? Do you wish to go round Cape Horn to see any more of it, eh?' "'Can't you see the world where you stand?' "'I was a little staggered, but go a-wailing I must, and I would, "'and the Pequod was as good a ship as any, I thought the best. "'And all this I now repeated to Peleg. "'Seeing me so determined, he expressed his willingness to ship me. "'And thou mayest as well sign the papers right off,' he added. "'Come along with ye.' "'And so saying, he led the way below deck into the cabin.' Seated on the transom was what seemed to me a most uncommon and surprising figure. It turned out to be Captain Bildad, who, along with Captain Peleg, was one of the largest owners of the vessel, the other shares, as is sometimes the case in these ports, being held by a crowd of old annuitants, widows, fatherless children, and chancery wards, each owning about the value of a timber-head or a foot of plank or a nail or two in the ship, People in Nantucket invest their money in whaling vessels the same way that you do yours in approved state stocks bringing in good interest. Now Bildad, like Peleg, and indeed many other Nantucketers, was a Quaker, the island having been originally settled by that sect, and to this day its inhabitants in general retain in an uncommon measure the peculiarities of the Quaker only variously and anomalously modified by things altogether alien and heterogeneous. For some of these same Quakers are the most sanguinary of all sailors and whale-hunters. They are fighting Quakers. They are Quakers with a vengeance. So that there are instances among them of men who, named with scripture names, a singularly common fashion on the island, and in childhood naturally imbibing the stately dr dramatic thee and thou of the Quaker idiom, still from the audacious daring and boundless adventure of their subsequent lives, strangely blend with these unoutgrown pe peculiarities a thousand bold dashes of character not unworthy of a Scandinavian sea-king or a poetical pagan Roman. And when these things unite in a man of greatly superior natural force, with a globular brain and a ponderous heart, who has also by the stillness and seclusion of many long night watches in the remotest waters, and beneath constellations never seen here at the north, been led to think untraditionally and independently, receiving all nature's sweet or savage impressions fresh from her own virgin, voluntary, and confiding breast, and thereby chiefly, but with some help from accidental advantages, to learn a bold and nervous lofty language, that man makes one in a whole nation census, a mighty pageant creature formed for noble tragedies. 
nor will it at all detract from him, dramatically regarded, if either by birth or other circumstances, he have what seems a half-wilful overruling morbidness at the bottom of his nature. For all men tragically great are made so through a certain morbidness. Be sure of this, O young ambition, all mortal greatness is but disease. But as yet we have not to do with such a one, but with quite another, and still a man who, if indeed peculiar, it only results again from another phase of the Quaker, modified by individual circumstances. Like Captain Peleg, Captain Bildad was a well-to-do, retired whaleman. But unlike Captain Peleg, who cared not a rush for what are called serious things, and indeed deemed those self-same serious things the veriest of all trifles, Captain Bildad had not only been originally educated according to the strictest sect of Nantucket Quakerism, but all his subsequent ocean life, and the sight of many unclad lovely island creatures round the horn, all that had not moved this native-born Quaker one single jot, had not so much as altered one angle of his vest. Still, for all this immutableness, there was some lack of common consistency about the worthy Captain Bildad. Though refusing from conscientious scruples to bear arms against land invaders, yet himself had illimitably invaded the Atlantic and Pacific, and, though a sworn foe to human bloodshed, yet had he, in his straight-bodied coat, spilled tons upon tons of leviathan gore. How now, in the contemplative evening of his days, the pious Bildad reconciled these things in his reminiscence, I do not know, but it did not seem to concern him much, and very probably he had long since come to the sage and sensible conclusion that a man's religion is one thing, and this practical world quite another. This world pays dividends. Rising from a little cabin boy in short clothes of the drabbest drab to a harpooner in the broad shad-bellied waistcoat, from that becoming boat-header, chief mate, and captain, and finally a ship-owner, Bildad, as I hinted before, had concluded his adventurous career by wholly retiring from active life at the goodly age of sixty, and dedicating his remaining days to the quiet receiving of his well-earned income. Now Bildad, I am sorry to say, had the reputation of being an incorrigible old hunks, and in his sea-going days a bitter, hard taskmaster. They told me in Nantucket, though it certainly seems a curious story, that when he sailed the old Cattegut whaleman, his crew, upon arriving home, were mostly all carried ashore to the hospital, sore exhausted and worn out. For a pious man, especially for a Quaker, he was certainly rather hard-hearted, to say the least. He never used to swear, though, at his men, they said. But somehow he got an inordinate quantity of cruel, unmitigated hard work out of them. When Bildad was a chief mate, to have his drab-coloured eye intently looking at you made you feel completely nervous, till you could clutch something, a hammer or a marling spike, and go to work like mad at something or other, never mind what. Indolence and idleness perished before him. His own person was the exact embodiment of his utilitarian character. On his long, gaunt body he carried no spare flesh, no superfluous beard, his chin having a soft, economical nap to it, like the worn nap of his broad-brimmed hat. Such, then, was the person that I saw seated on the transom when I followed Captain Peleg down into the cabin. The space between the decks was small, and there, bolt upright, sat old Bildad, who always sat so, and never leaned, and this to save his coat-tails. His broad brim was placed beside him, his legs were stiffly crossed, his drab vesture was buttoned up to his chin, and spectacles on nose he seemed absorbed in reading from a ponderous volume. "'Bildad!' cried Captain Peleg. "'At it again, Bildad, eh? You've been studying those scriptures now for the last thirty years, to my certain knowledge. How far you get, Bildad?' As if long habituated to such profane talk from his old shipmate, Bildad, without noticing his present irreverence, quietly looked up, and seeing me, glanced again inquiringly towards Peleg. "'He says he's our man, Bildad,' said Peleg. "'He wants to ship.' "'Dust thee,' said Bildad, in a hollow tone, and turning round to me. "'I dust,' 
said I unconsciously, he was so intense a Quaker. "'What do you think of him, Bildad?' said Peleg. "'He'll do,' said Bildad, eyeing me, and then went on spelling away at his book in a mumbling tone quite audible. I thought him the queerest old Quaker I ever saw, especially as Peleg, his friend and old shipmate, seemed such a blusterer. But I said nothing, only looking round me sharply. Peleg now threw open a chest, and drawing forth the ship's articles, placed pen and ink before him, and seated himself at a little table. I began to think it was high time to settle with myself at what terms I would be willing to engage for the voyage. I was already aware that in the whaling business they paid no wages, but all hands, including the captain, received certain shares of the profit, called lays, and that these lays were proportioned to the degree of importance pertaining to the respective duties of the ship's company. I was also aware that being a green hand at whaling, my own lay could not be very large, but considering that I was used to the sea, could steer a ship, splice a rope, and all that, I made no doubt that from all I had heard I should be offered at least the 275th lay, that is, the 275th part of the clear net proceeds of the voyage, whatever that might eventually amount to. And though the 275th lay was what they call a rather long lay, yet it was better than nothing, and if we had a lucky voyage might pretty nearly pay for the clothing I would wear out on it, not to speak of my three years' beef and board, for which I would not have to pay one stiver. It might be thought that this was a very poor way to accumulate a princely fortune, and so it was, a very poor way indeed. But I am one of those that never take on about princely fortunes, and am quite content if the world is ready to board and lodge me, while I am putting up at this grim sign of the thundercloud. Upon the whole, I thought that the 275th lay would be about the fair thing, but I would not have been surprised if I had been offered the 200th, considering I was of a broad-shouldered make. But one thing, nevertheless, that made me a little distrustful about receiving a generous share of the profits was this. Ashore I had heard something of both Captain Peleg and his unaccountable old crony Bildad, how that they, being the principal proprietors of the Pequod, Therefore the other and more inconsiderable scattered owners left nearly the whole management of sh the ship's affairs to these two, and I did not know but what the stingy old Bildad might have a mighty deal to say about shipping hands, especially as I now found him on board the Pequod, quite at home there in the cabin, and reading his Bible as if at his own fireside. Now, while Peleg was vainly trying to mend a pen with his jackknife, Old Bildad, to my no small surprise, considering that he was such an interested party in these proceedings, Bildad never heeded us, but went on mumbling to himself out of his book, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where mo— Well, Captain Bildad, interrupted Peleg, what do you say? What lay shall we give this young man? Thou knowest best, was the sepulchral reply. The seven hundred and seventy-seventh wouldn't be too much, would it? Where moth and rust do corrupt, but lay— Lay, indeed, thought I, and such a lay! The seven hundred and seventy-seventh? Well, old Bildad, you are determined that I, for one, shall not lay up many lays here below, where moth and rust do corrupt. It was an exceedingly long lay, that indeed— and though from the magnitude of the figure it might at first deceive the landsman, yet the slightest consideration will show that though 777 is a pretty large number, yet when you come to make a tenth of it, you will see, as I say, that the 777th part of a farthing is a good deal less than 777 gold doubloons, and so thought I at the time. "'I blast your eyes, Bildad!' cried Peleg. Thou dost not want to swindle this young man. He must have more than that. Seven hundred and seventy-seventh, again said Bildad, without lifting his eyes, and then went on mumbling, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I am going to put him down for the three hundredth, said Peleg. Do you hear that, Bildad? The three hundredth lay, I say. Bildad lay down his book, and turning solemnly towards him, said, Captain Peleg, thou hast a generous heart, 
but thou must consider the duty thou owest to the other owners of this ship, widows and orphans, many of them, and that if we too abundantly reward the labours of this young man, we may be taking bread from those widows and those orphans. The seven hundred and seventy-seventh lay, Captain Peleg. "'Thou Bildad!' roared Peleg, starting up and clattering about the cabin. "'Blast ye, Captain Bildad, if I had followed thy advice in these matters, I would afore now had a conscience to lug about, and would be heavy enough to founder the largest ship that ever sailed round Cape Horn.' "'Captain Peleg,' said Bildad steadily, "'thy conscience may be drawing ten inches of water, or ten fathoms, I can't tell.' But as thou art still an impenitent man, Captain Peleg, I greatly fear, lest thy conscience be but a leaky one, and will in the end sink thee foundering down to the fiery pit, Captain Peleg. Fiery pit! Fiery pit! Ye insult me, man! Past all natural bearing ye insult me! It's an all-fired outrage to tell any human creature that he's bound to hell. Flukes and flames, Bildad! Say that again to me, and start my soul bolts, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll swallow a live goat with all his hair and horns on. Out of the cabin, ye canting, drab-colored son of a wooden gun. A straight wake with ye. As he thundered out this, he made a rush at Bildad, but with a marvelous oblique sliding celerity, Bildad for that time eluded him. Alarmed at this terrible outburst between the two principal and responsible owners of the ship, and feeling half a mind to give up all idea of sailing in a vessel so questionably owned and temporarily commanded, I stepped aside from the door to give egress to Bildad, who, I made no doubt, was all eagerness to vanish before the awakened wrath of Peleg. But to my astonishment he sat down again on the transom very quietly, and seemed to have not the slightest intention of withdrawing. He seemed quite used to the impenitent Peleg in his ways. As for Peleg, after letting off his rage as he had, there seemed no more left in him, and he too sat down like a lamb, though he twitched a little, as if still nervously agitated. Whew! he whistled at last. A squall's gone off to leeward, I think. Bildad, thou used to be good at sharpening a lance. Mend that pen, will you? My jackknife here needs the grindstone. That's he, thank you, Bildad. Now then, my young man, Ishmael's thy name, didn't you say? Well then, down you go here, Ishmael, for the three hundredth lay. Captain Peleg, said I, I have a friend with me who wants to ship too. Shall I bring him down to-morrow? To be sure, said Peleg. Fetch him along, and we'll look at him. What lay does he want? groaned Bildad glancing up from the book in which he had again been burying himself. "'Ah, never mind about that, Bildad,' said Peleg. "'Has he ever wailed at any?' turning to me. "'Killed more whales than I can count, Captain Peleg. "'Well, bring him along, then.' And after signing the papers, off I went, nothing doubting but that I had done a good morning's work, and that the Pequod was the identical ship that Yojo had provided to carry Queequeg and me round the Cape.' but I had not proceeded far when I began to bethink me that the captain with whom I was to sail yet remained unseen by me, though indeed in many cases a whale-ship will be completely fitted out, and receive all her crew on board ere the captain makes himself visible by arriving to take command, for sometimes these voyages are so prolonged and the shore intervals at home so exceedingly brief that if the captain have a family or any absorbing concernment of that sort, he does not trouble himself much about his ship in port, but leaves her to the owners till all is ready for sea. However, it is always as well to have a look at him before irrevocably committing yourself into his hands. Turning back, I accosted Captain Peleg, inquiring where Captain Ahab was to be found. "'And what dost thou want of Captain Ahab? It's all right enough, thou art shipped.' "'Yes, but I should like to see him.' "'But I don't think you will be able to at present.' I don't know exactly what's the matter with him, but he keeps close inside the house, a sort of sick, and yet he don't look so. In fact, he ain't sick, but no, he isn't well, either. Anyhow, young man, he won't always see me, so I don't suppose he will thee. He's a queer man, Captain Ahab, so some think, but a good one. 
Oh, thou'lt like him well enough. No fear, no fear. He's a grand, ungodly, godlike man, Captain Ahab. Doesn't speak much, but when he does speak, then you may well listen. Mark ye, be forewarned. Ahab's above the common. Ahab's been in colleges, as well as amongst the cannibals, been used to deeper wonders than the waves, fixed his fiery lance in mightier stranger foes than whales. His lance, ay, the keenest and the surest that out of all our isle. Oh, he ain't Captain Bildad, no, and he ain't Captain Peleg, he's Ahab, boy. And Ahab of old, thou knowest, was a crowned king. And a very vile one. When that wicked king was slain, the dogs, did they not lick his blood? Come hither to me. Hither, hither, said Peleg, with a significance in his eye that almost startled me. Look ye, lad, never say that on board the Pequod. Never say it anywhere. Captain Ahab did not name himself. Twas a foolish, ignorant whim of his crazy widowed mother, who died when he was only twelve month old. And yet the old squaw, Tistig, at Gayhead, said that the name would somehow prove prophetic. And perhaps other fools like her may tell thee the same. I wish to warn thee. It's a lie. I know Captain Ahab well. I've sailed with him as mate years ago. I know what he is. A good man. Not a pious good man like Bildad, but a swearing good man. Something like me. Only there's a good deal more of him. Ay, ay. I know that he was never very jolly, and I know that on the passage home he was a little out of his mind for a spell, but it was the sharp shooting pains in his bleeding stump that brought that about, as any one might see. I know, too, that ever since he lost his leg last voyage by that accursed wail he's been a kind of moody, desperate moody, and savage sometimes, but that will all pass off. And once for all, let me tell ye and assure thee, young man, it's better to sail with a moody good captain than a laughing bad one. So good-bye to thee, and wrong not Captain Ahab, because he happens to have a wicked name. Besides, my boy, he has a wife, not three voyages wedded, a sweet resigned girl. Think of that. And by that sweet girl that old man has a child. Hold ye then, can there be any utter hopeless harm in Ahab? No, no, my lad. Stricken, blasted if he be, Ahab has his humanities. As I walked away, I was full of thoughtfulness. What had been incidentally revealed to me of Captain Ahab filled me with a certain wild vagueness of painfulness concerning him, and somehow at the time I felt a sympathy and a sorrow for him, but for I don't know what, unless it was the cruel loss of his leg. And yet I also felt a strange awe of him, but that sort of awe which I cannot at all describe was not exactly awe. I do not know what it was, but I felt it, and it did not disincline me towards him, though I felt impatience at what seemed like mystery in him, so imperfectly as he was known to me then. However, my thoughts were at length carried in other directions, so that for the present dark Ahab slipped my mind. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 to 21. Chapter 17. The Ramadan. As Queequeg's Ramadan, or fasting and humiliation, was to continue all day, I did not choose to disturb him till towards nightfall, for I cherished the greatest respect towards everybody's religious obligations, never mind how comical and couldn't find it in my heart to undervalue even a congregation of ants worshipping a toadstool, or those other creatures in certain parts of our earth who, with a degree of footmanism quite unprecedented in other planets, bow down before the torso of a deceased landed proprietor merely on account of the inordinate possessions yet owned and rented in his name. I say we good Presbyterian Christians should be charitable in these things, and not fancy ourselves so vastly superior to other mortals, pagans and what not, because of their half-crazy conceits on these subjects. There was Queequeg now, certainly entertaining the most absurd notions about Yojo and his Ramadan, but what of that? Queequeg thought he knew what he was about, I suppose. He seemed to be content, 
and there let him rest. All our arguing with him would not avail. Let him be, I say, and heaven have mercy on us all, Presbyterians and pagans alike, for we are all somehow dreadfully cracked about the head, and sadly need mending. Towards evening, when I felt assured that all his performances and rituals must be over, I went up to his room and knocked at the door, but no answer. I tried to open it, but it was fastened inside. Queequeg, said I, softly, through the keyhole, all silent. I say, Queequeg, why don't you speak? It's I, Ishmael. But all remained still as before. I began to grow alarmed. I had allowed him such abundant time I thought he might have had an apoplectic fit. I looked through the keyhole, but the door opening into an odd corner of the room, the keyhole prospect was but a crooked and sinister one. I could only see part of the footboard of the bed, and a line of the wall, but nothing more. I was surprised to behold, resting against the wall, the wooden shaft of Queequeg's harpoon, which the landlady the evening previous had taken from him before our mounting to the chamber. That's strange, thought I. But at any rate, since the harpoon stands yonder, and he seldom or never goes abroad without it, therefore he must be inside here, and no possible mistake. Queequeg! Queequeg! All still. Something must have happened. Apoplexy. I tried to burst open the door, but it stubbornly resisted. Running downstairs, I quickly stated my suspicions to the first person I met, the chambermaid. "'La, la!' she cried. "'I thought something must be the matter. "'I went to make the bed after breakfast, "'and the door was locked, "'and not a mouse to be heard, "'and it's been just so silent ever since. "'But I thought maybe you had both gone off "'and locked your baggage in for safe keeping. "'La, la, ma'am! "'Mistress! "'Murder! "'Mrs. Hussey! "'Apoplexy!' "'And with these cries she ran toward the kitchen, "'I following.' Mrs. Hussey soon appeared with a mustard pot in one hand and a vinegar cruet in the other, having just broken away from the occupation of attending to the casters and scolding her little black boy meantime. "'Woodhouse!' cried I. "'Which way to it? Run, for God's sake, and fetch something to pry open the door. The axe! The axe! He's had a stroke, depend upon it!' And so saying, I was unmethodically rushing upstairs again empty-handed when Mrs. Hussey interposed the mustard pot and vinegar cruet, and the entire castor of her countenance. "'What's the matter with you, young man?' "'Get the axe. For God's sake, run for the doctor, someone, while I pry it open.' "'Look here,' said the landlady, quickly putting down the vinegar cruet, so as to have one hand free. "'Look here. Are you talking about prying open any of my doors?' And with that she seized my arm. "'What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, shipmate?' In as calm but as rapid a manner as possible, I gave her to understand the whole case. Unconsciously clapping the vinegar cruet to one side of her nose, she ruminated for an instant, then exclaimed, "'No, I haven't seen it since I put it there.' Running to the little closet under the landing of the stairs, she glanced in, and returning told me that Queequeg's harpoon was missing. "'He's killed himself!' she cried. "'It's unfortunate Stig's done over again!' There goes another counterpane. God pity his poor mother. It'll be the ruin of my house. Has the poor lad a sister? Where's that girl? There, Betty, go to Snarls the painter and tell him to paint me a sign, with no suicides permitted here and no smoking in the parlor. Might as well kill both birds at once. Kill! Ah, oh, the Lord be merciful to his ghost. What's that noise there? You, young man, have ass there. And running up after me, she caught me as I was again trying to force open the door. I don't allow it. I won't have my premises spoiled. Go for the locksmith. There's one about a mile from here. But avast, putting her hand in her side pocket, here's a key that'll fit, I guess. Let's see. And with that, she turned it in the lock, but alas, Queequeg's supplemental bolt remained undrawn within. Have to burst it open, said I and was running down the entry a little for a good start when the landlady caught at me, again vowing that I should not break down her premises. But I tore from her, and with a sudden bodily rush dashed myself full against the mark. With a prodigious noise the door flew open, and the knob slamming against the wall sent the plaster to the ceiling. And there, good heavens, there sat Queequeg, 
altogether cool and self-collected, right in the middle of his room, squatting on his hams and holding Yojo on the top of his head. He looked neither one way nor the other way, but sat like a carved image with scarce a sign of active life. Queequeg, said I, going up to him. Queequeg, what's the matter with you? He ain't been sitting so all day, has he? said the landlady. But all we said, not a word could we drag out of him. I almost felt like pushing him over so as to change his position, for it was almost intolerable. It seemed so painfully and unnaturally constrained, especially as in all probability he had been sitting so for upwards of eight or ten hours, going to without his regular meals. Mrs. Hussey, said I, he's alive at all events, so leave us, if you please, and I will see to this strange affair myself. Closing the door upon the landlady, I endeavoured to prevail upon Queequeg to take a chair, but in vain. There he sat, and all he could do, for all my polite arts and blandishments, he would not move a peg, nor say a single word, nor even look at me, nor notice my presence in the slightest way. I wonder, thought I, if this can possibly be a part of his Ramadan. Do they fast on their hams that way in his native island? It must be so. Yes, it's part of his creed, I suppose. Well, then, let him rest. He'll get up sooner or later, no doubt. It can't last forever, thank God, and his Ramadan only comes once a year, and I don't believe it's very punctual then. I went down to supper. After sitting a long time listening to the long stories of some sailors who had just come from a plum-pudding voyage, as they call it, uh, that is, a short whaling voyage in a schooner or brig confined to the north of the line in the Atlantic Ocean only. After listening to these plum puddingers till nearly eleven o'clock, I went upstairs to go to bed, feeling quite sure by this time Queequeg must certainly have brought his Ramadan to a termination. But no, there he was, just where I had left him. He had not stirred an inch. I began to grow vexed with him. It seemed so downright senseless and insane to be sitting there all day and half the night on his hams in a cold room, holding a piece of wood on his head. For heaven's sake, Queequeg, get up and shake yourself. Get up and have some supper. You'll starve. You'll kill yourself, Queequeg. But not a word did he reply. Despairing of him, therefore, I determined to go to bed and to sleep and no doubt before a great while he would follow me. But previous to turning in, I took my heavy bearskin jacket and threw it over him, as it promised to be a very cold night, and he had nothing but his ordinary round jacket on. For some time, do all I would, I could not get into the faintest doze. I had blown out the candle, and the mere thought of Queequeg, not four feet off, sitting there in that uneasy position, stark alone, in the cold and dark, this made me really wretched. Think of it sleeping all night in the same room with a wide-awake pagan on his hams in this dreary, unaccountable Ramadan. But somehow I dropped off at last, and knew nothing more till break of day, when, looking over the bedside, there squatted Queequeg, as if he had been screwed down to the floor. But as soon as the first glimpse of sun entered the window, up he got, with stiff and grating joints, but with a cheerful look, limped towards me where I lay, pressed his forehead against mine, and said his Ramadan was over. Now, as I before hinted, I have no objection to any person's religion, be it what it may, so long as that person does not kill or insult any other person, because that other person don't believe it also. But when a man's religion becomes really frantic, when it is a positive torment to him, and, in fine, makes this earth of ours an uncomfortable inn to lodge in, then I think it high time to take that individual aside and argue the point with him. And just so I now did with Queequeg. Queequeg, said I, get into bed now and lie and listen with me. Then I went on, beginning with the rise and progress of the primitive religions, and coming down to the various religions of the present time, during which time I laboured to show Queequeg that all these Lents, Ramadans, and prolonged ham-squattings in cold, cheerless rooms were stark nonsense, bad for the health, useless for the soul, opposed, in short, to the obvious laws of hygiene and common sense— I told him, too, that he, being in other things such an extremely sensible and sagacious savage, it pained me, very badly pained me, to see him now so deplorably foolish about this ridiculous Ramadan of his. Besides, argued I, 
Fasting makes the body cave in, hence the spirit caves in, and all thoughts born of a fast must necessarily be half-starved. This is the reason why most dyspeptic religionists cherish such melancholy notions about their hereafters. In one word, Queequeg, said I, rather digressively, hell is an idea first born on an undigested apple dumpling, and since then perpetuated through the hereditary dyspepsias nurtured by Ramadans. I then asked Queequeg whether he himself was ever troubled with dyspepsia, expressing the idea very plainly so that he could take it in. He said no, only upon one memorable occasion. It was after a great feast given by his father, the king, on the gaining of a great battle wherein fifty of the enemy had been killed by about two o'clock in the afternoon, and all cooked and eaten that very evening. "'No more, Queequeg,' said I, shuddering. "'That will do, for I knew the inferences without his further hinting them. I had seen a sailor who had visited that very island, and he told me that it was the custom, when a great battle had been gained there, to barbecue all the slain in the yard or garden of the victor, and then, one by one, they were placed in great wooden trenchers, and garnished round like a pillow, with breadfruit and coconuts, and with some parsley in their mouths, were sent round with the victor's compliments to all his friends, just as though these presents were so many Christmas turkeys. After all, I do not think that my remarks about religion made much of an impression on Queequeg, because, in the first place, he somehow seemed dull of hearing on that important subject, unless considered from his own point of view, and, in the second place, he did not more than one-third understand me, couch my ideas as simply as I would, and, finally, he no doubt thought he knew a good deal more about true religion than I did. He looked at me with a sort of condescending concern and compassion, as though he thought it a great pity that such a sensible young man should be so hopelessly lost to evangelical pagan piety. At last we rose and dressed, and Queequeg, taking a prodigiously hearty breakfast of chowders of all sorts, so that the landlady should not make much profit by reason of his Ramadan, we sallied out to board the Pequod, sauntering along and picking our teeth with halibut bones. CHAPTER Eighteen, HIS MARK As we were walking down the end of the wharf towards the ship, Queequeg carrying his harpoon, Captain Peleg, in his gruff voice, loudly hailed us from his wigwam, saying he had not suspected my friend was a cannibal, and furthermore announcing that he let no cannibals on board that craft unless they previously produced their papers. "'What do you mean by that, Captain Peleg?' said I, now jumping on the bulwarks, and leaving my comrade standing on the wharf. "'I mean,' he replied, "'he must show his papers.' "'Yes,' said Captain Bildad, in his hollow voice, sticking his head from behind Peleg's out of the wigwam. "'He must show that he's converted. "'Son of darkness,' he added, turning to Queequeg, "'art thou at present in communion with any Christian church?' Why, said I, he's a member of the first congregational church. Here be it said that many tattooed savages sailing in Nantucket ships at last come to be converted into churches. First congregational church, cried Bildad. What, that worships in Deacon Deuteronomy Coleman's meeting-house? And so saying, taking out his spectacles, he rubbed them with his great yellow bandana handkerchief, and putting them on very carefully, came out of the wigwam, and leaning stiffly over the bulwarks, took a good long look at Queequeg. "'How long hath he been a member?' he then said, turning to me. "'Not very long, I rather guess, young man.' "'No,' said Peleg. "'And he hasn't been baptized right either, or it would have washed some of that devil's blue off his face.' "'Do tell now,' cried Bildad. "'Is this Philistine a regular member of Deacon Deuteronomy's meeting? "'I never saw him going there, and I pass it every Lord's Day.' "'I don't know anything about Deacon Deuteronomy or his meeting,' said I. "'All I know is that Queequeg here is a born member of the First Congregational Church. "'He is a deacon himself, Queequeg is.' "'Young man,' said Bildad sternly, "'thou art skylarking with me.' "'Explain thyself, thou young Hittite. "'What church does thee mean? "'Answer me.' "'Finding myself thus hard-pushed, I replied, 
I mean, sir, the same ancient Catholic church to which you and I and Captain Peleg there and Queequeg here and all of us and every mother's son and soul of us belong, the great and everlasting first congregation of this whole worshipping world. We all belong to that. Only some of us cherish some queer crotchets in no way touching the grand belief. In that we all join hands. Splice, thou meanst, splice hands! cried Peleg, drawing nearer. Young man, you'd better ship for a missionary instead of a foremast hand. I never heard a better sermon. Deacon Deuteronomy, why, Father Mapple himself couldn't beat it, and he's reckoned something. Come aboard, come aboard, never mind about the papers. I say, tell Quahog there, what's that you call him? Tell Quahog to step along. By the great anchor, what a harpoon he's got there. Looks like good stuff, that and he handles it about right. I say, Quahog, or whatever your name is, did you ever stand in the head of a whale-boat? Did you ever strike a fish? Without saying a word, Queequeg, in his wild sort of way, jumped upon the bulwarks, from thence into the bows of one of the whale-boats hanging to the side, and then bracing his left knee and poising his harpoon, cried out in some such way as this, Cap'n, you see him small drop tar on water dare. You see him? "'Well, s'pose him one whale eye. Well, den.' And taking sharp aim at it, he darted the iron right over Bildad's broad brim, clean across the ship's deck, and struck the glistening tar spot out of sight. "'Now,' said Queequeg, quietly hauling in the line, "'spose him whaley eye. Why, dat whale dead.' "'Quick, Bildad,' said Peleg, his partner, who, aghast at the close vicinity of the flying harpoon, had retreated towards the cabin gangway. "'Quick, I say you, Bildad, and get the ship's papers. We must have Hedgehog, the, I mean Quahog, in one of our boats. Look ye, Quahog, we'll give ye the ninetieth lay, and that's more than ever was given a harpooner yet out of Nantucket.' So down we went into the cabin, and to my great joy Queequeg was soon enrolled among the same ship's company to which I myself belonged. When all preliminaries were over, and Peleg had got everything ready for signing, he turned to me and said, "'I guess Quahog there don't know how to write, does he? I say, Quahog, blast ye! Dost thou sign thy name, or make thy mark?' But at this question Queequeg, who had twice or thrice before taken part in similar ceremonies, looked no ways abashed, but taking the offered pen, copied upon the paper, in the proper place, an exact counterpart of the queer round figure which was tattooed upon his arm, so that through Captain Peleg's obstinate mistake touching his appellative, it stood something like this. Quahog. His mark. X. Meanwhile, Captain Bildad sat earnestly and steadfastly eyeing Queequeg, and at last, rising solemnly and fumbling in the huge pockets of his broad-skirted drab coat, took out a bundle of tracts, and selecting one entitled, The Latter Day Coming, or No Time to Lose, placed it in Queequeg's hands, and grasping them and the book with both his, looked earnestly into his eyes and said, "'Son of darkness, I must do my duty by thee. I am part owner of this ship, and feel concerned for the souls of all its crew. If thou still clingest to thy pagan ways, which I sadly fear, I beseech thee remain not for I a belial bondsman. Spurn the idle bell and the hideous dragon. Turn from the wrath to come. Mind thine eye, I say. Ah, oh, goodness gracious!' steer clear of the fiery pit. Something of the salt sea yet lingered in old Bildad's language, heterogeneously mixed with scriptural and domestic phrases. Avast there, avast there, Bildad, avast now spoiling our harpooner, cried Peleg. Pious harpooners never make good voyagers. It takes the shark out of em. No harpooner is worth a straw who ain't pretty sharkish. There was young Nat Swain, once the bravest boat-header out of all Nantucket and the vineyard. He joined the meeting and never came to good. He got so frightened about his plaguy soul that he shrinked and steered away from whales, for fear of afterclaps, in case he got stove and went to Davy Jones. Peleg, Peleg, said Bildad, lifting his eyes and hands, thou thyself 
as I myself hast seen many a perilous time. Thou knowest, Peleg, what it is to have the fear of death. How then canst thou prate in this ungodly guise? Thou beliest thine own heart, Peleg, Tell me, when this same Pequod here had her three masts overboard in that typhoon on Japan, that same voyage when thou went mate with Captain Ahab, didst thou not think of death and the judgment then? Hear him, hear him now, cried Peleg, marching across the cabin and thrusting his hands far down into his pockets. Hear him, all of ye. Think of that, when every moment we thought the ship would sink. Death and the judgment then? What? with all three masts making such an everlasting thundering against the side, and every sea breaking over us fore and aft? Think of death and the judgment then? No, no time to think about death then. Life was what Captain Ahab and I was thinking of, and how to save all hands, how to rig jury masts, how to get into the nearest port. That's what I was thinking of. Bildad said no more, but buttoning up his coat, stalked on deck, where we followed him. There he stood, very quietly overlooking some sailmakers who were mending a topsail in the waist. Now and then he stooped to pick up a patch or save an end of tarred twine, which otherwise might have been wasted. Chapter 19 The Prophet Shipmates, have ye shipped in that ship? Queequeg and I had just left the Pequod, and were sauntering away from the water, for the moment each occupied with his own thoughts, when the above words were put to us by a stranger, who, pausing before us, levelled his massive forefinger at the vessel in question. He was but shabbily apparelled in faded jacket and patched trousers, a rag of a black handkerchief investing his neck. A confluent smallpox had in all directions flowed over his face, and left it like the complicated ribbed bed of a torrent when the rushing waters have been dried up. "'Have ye shipped in her?' he repeated. "'You mean the ship Pequod, I suppose,' said I, trying to gain a little more time for an uninterrupted look at him. "'Aye, the Pequod. That ship there,' he said, drawing back his whole arm, and then rapidly shoving it straight out from him with the fixed bayonet of his pointed finger darted full at the object. Yes, said I, we have just signed the articles. Anything down there about your souls? About what? Oh, perhaps you haven't got any, he said quickly. No matter, though. I know many chaps that haven't got any. Good luck to him, and they are all the better off for it. A soul's a sort of a fifth wheel to a wagon. What are you jabbering about, shipmate? said I. He's got enough, though to make up for all deficiencies of that sort and other chaps. Abruptly said the stranger, placing a nervous emphasis upon the word he. Queequeg, said I, let's go. This fellow has broken loose from somewhere. He's talking about something and somebody we don't know. Stop! cried the stranger. You said true. You haven't seen old thunder yet, have you? Who's old thunder? said I again riveted with the insane earnestness of his manner. "'Captain Ahab!' "'What, the captain of our ship, the Pequod?' "'Aye, among some of us old sailor chaps he goes by that name. "'You haven't seen him yet, have ye?' "'No, we haven't. He's sick, they say, but is getting better, and will be all right again before long.' "'All right again before long,' <laughs> laughed the stranger, with a solemnly derisive sort of laugh. Look ye, when Captain Ahab is all right, then this left arm of mine will be all right, not before. What do you know about him? What did they tell you about him? Say that. They didn't tell much of anything about him, only I've heard he's a good whale hunter and a good captain to his crew. That's true. That's true. Yes, both true enough. But you must jump when he gives an order. Step and growl, growl and go. That's the word with Captain Ahab. But nothing about the thing that happened to him off Cape Horn long ago, when he lay like dead for three days and nights. Nothing about that deadly scrimmage with the Spaniard before the altar in Santa. Heard nothing about that, eh? Nothing about the silver calabash he spat into. And nothing about losing his leg last voyage, according to the prophecy. 
didn't you hear a word about them matters and something more, eh? No, I don't think you did. How could ye? Who knows it? Not all Nantucket, I guess. But how's ever, mayhap, you've heard tell about the leg, and how he lost it. Ay, you've heard of that, I dare say. Oh, yes, that every one knows a-most. I mean, they know he's only one leg, and that a parm is said he took the other off. My friend, said I, what all this gibberish of yours is about, I don't know, and I don't much care, for it seems to me that you must be a little damaged in the head. But if you are speaking of Captain Ahab, of that ship there, the Pequod, then let me tell you that I know all about the loss of his leg. All about it, eh? Sure you do? All? Pretty sure. With finger pointed and eye levelled at the Pequod, the beggar-like stranger stood a moment, as if in troubled reverie, and then, starting a little, turned and said, "'You've shipped, have you? Names down on the papers? Well, well, what's signed is signed, and what's to be will be, and then again perhaps it won't be, after all. Anyhow, it's all fixed and arranged already, and some sailors or other must go with him, I suppose.' "'As well these as any other men, God pity em. "'Morning to you, shipmates, morning. "'The ineffable heavens bless ye. "'I'm sorry I stopped ye.' "'Look here, friend,' said I, "'if you have anything important to tell us, out with it. "'But if you are only trying to bamboozle us, "'you're mistaken in your game. "'That's all I have to say.' "'And it's said very well. "'And I like to hear a chap talk up that way. "'You are just the man for him, the likes of you.' "'Mornin' to your shipmates, morning. "'Oh, when you get there, tell em I've concluded not to make one of em. "'Ah, oh, my dear fellow, you can't fool us that way. "'You can't fool us. "'It is the easiest thing in the world for a man to look as if he had a great secret in him. "'Mornin' to your shipmates, morning. "'Morning it is,' said I. "'Come along, Queequeg, let's leave this crazy man. "'But stop. Tell me your name, will you?' Elijah. Elijah, thought I, and we walked away, both commenting after each other's fashion upon this ragged old sailor, and agreed that he was nothing but a humbug trying to be a bugbear. But we had not gone perhaps above a hundred yards when chancing to turn a corner and looking back as I did so, who should be seen but Elijah following us, though at a distance, Somehow the sight of him struck me so that I said nothing to Queequeg of his being behind, but passed on with my comrade, anxious to see whether the stranger would turn the same corner that we did. He did, and then it seemed to me that he was dogging us, but with what intent I could not for the life of me imagine. This circumstance, coupled with his ambiguous half-hinting, half-revealing, shrouded sort of talk, now begat in me all kinds of vague wonderments and half-apprehensions, and all connected with the Pequod, and Captain Ahab, and the leg he had lost, and the Cape Horn fit, and the silver calabash, and what Captain Peleg had said of him when I left the ship on the day previous, and the prediction of the Squaw Tistig, and the voyage we had bound ourselves to sail, and a hundred other shadowy things. I was resolved to satisfy myself whether this ragged Elijah was really dogging us or not, and with that intent crossed the way with Queequeg, and on that side of it retraced our steps. But Elijah passed on without seeming to notice us. This relieved me, and once more and finally, as it seemed to me, I pronounced him, in my heart, a humbug. CHAPTER Twenty, ALL ASTIR a day or two passed, and there was great activity aboard the Pequod. Not only were the old sails being mended, but new sails were coming on board, and bolts of canvas and coils of rigging. In short, everything betokened that the ship's preparations were hurrying to a close. Captain Peleg seldom or never went ashore, but sat in his wigwam, keeping a sharp lookout upon the hands. Bildad did all the purchasing and providing at the stores, and the men employed in the hold and on the rigging were working till long after nightfall. On the day following Queequeg's signing the articles, word was given at all the inns where the ship's company were stopping that their chests must be on board before night, for there was no telling how soon the vessel might be sailing. So Queequeg got down our traps, resolving, however, to sleep ashore till the last. But it seems they always give very long notice in these cases, and the ship did not sail for several days. 
But no wonder, there was a good deal to be done, and there is no telling how many things to be thought of before the Pequod was fully equipped. Everyone knows what a multitude of things, beds, saucepans, knives and forks, shovels and tongs, napkins, nutcrackers and what not, are indispensable to the business of housekeeping, just so with whaling, which necessitates the three years' housekeeping upon the wide ocean, far from all grocers, costermongers, doctors, bakers, and bankers. And though this also holds true of merchant vessels, yet not by any means to the same extent as with whalemen. For besides the great length of the whaling voyage, the numerous articles peculiar to the prosecution of the fishery, and the impossibility of replacing them at the remote harbours usually frequented, it must be remembered that of all ships, whaling vessels are the most exposed to accidents of all kinds, and especially to the destruction and loss of the very things upon which the success of the voyage most depends. Hence the spare boats, spare spars, and spare lines and harpoons, and spare everythings almost but a spare captain and duplicate ship. At the period of our arrival at the island, the heaviest storage of the Pequod had been almost completed, comprising her beef, bread, water, fuel, and iron hoops and staves. But as before hinted, for some time there was a continual fetching and carrying on board of diverse odds and ends of things, both large and small. Chief among those who did this fetching and carrying was Captain Bildad's sister, a lean old lady of a most determined and indefatigable spirit, but withal very kind-hearted, who seemed resolved that if she could help it, nothing should be found wanting in the Pequod, after once fairly getting to sea. At one time she would come on board with a jar of pickles for the steward's pantry, another time with a bunch of quills for the chief mate's desk, where he kept his log, a third time with a roll of flannel for the small of someone's rheumatic back, Never did any woman better deserve her name, which was Charity, Aunt Charity, as every one called her. And, like a sister of Charity, did this charitable Aunt Charity bustle about, hither and thither, ready to turn her hand and heart to anything that promised to yield safety, comfort, and consolation to all on board a ship in which her beloved brother Bildad was concerned, and in which she herself owned a score or two of well-saved dollars." But it was startling to see this excellent-hearted Quakeress coming on board, as she did the last day, with a long oil-ladle in one hand and a still longer whaling lance in the other. Nor was Bildad himself, nor Captain Peleg, at all backward. As for Bildad, he carried about with him a long list of the articles needed, and at every fresh arrival down went his mark opposite that article upon the paper. Every once in a while Peleg came hobbling out of his whalebone den, roaring at the men down the hatchways, roaring up to the riggers at the masthead, and then concluding by roaring back into his wigwam. During these days of preparation Queequeg and I often visited the craft, and as often I asked about Captain Ahab, and how he was, and when he was going to come on board his ship. To these questions they would answer that he was getting better and better, and was expected aboard every day. Meantime the two captains, Peleg and Bildad, could attend to everything necessary to fit the vessel for the voyage. If I had been downright honest with myself, I would have seen very plainly in my heart that I did but half fancy being committed this way to so long a voyage, without once laying my eyes on the man who was to be the absolute dictator of it, so soon as the ship sailed out upon the open sea. But when a man suspects any wrong, it sometimes happens that if he be already involved in the matter, he insensibly strives to cover up his suspicions even from himself. And much this way it was with me. I said nothing, and tried to think nothing. At last it was given out that some time next day the ship would certainly sail. So next morning Queequeg and I took a very early start. CHAPTER Twenty One, GOING ABOARD It was nearly six o'clock, but only grey, imperfect, misty dawn, when we drew nigh the wharf. "'There are some sailors running ahead there, if I see right,' said I to Queequeg. "'It can't be shadows. She's off by sunrise, I guess. Come on.' "'Avast!' cried a voice, whose owner, at the same time coming close behind us, laid a hand upon both our shoulders and then insinuating himself between us, stood stooping forward a little, 
in the uncertain twilight strangely peering from Queequeg to me. It was Elijah. "'Going aboard?' "'Hands off, will you?' said I. "'Looky here,' said Queequeg, shaking himself. "'Go away!' "'Ain't going aboard, then?' "'Yes, we are,' said I. "'But what business is that of yours? "'Do you know, Mr. Elijah, that I consider you a little impertinent?' "'No, no, no, I wasn't aware of that.' said Elijah, slowly and wonderingly looking from me to Queequeg with the most unaccountable glances. Elijah, said I, you will oblige my friend and me by withdrawing. We are going to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and would prefer not to be detained. Ye be, be ye, coming back before breakfast? He's cracked, Queequeg, said I. Come on. Hello, cried stationary Elijah, hailing us when we had removed a few paces. "'Never mind him,' said I. "'Queequeg, come on.' But he stole up to us again, and suddenly clapping his hands on my shoulder, said, "'Did you see anything looking like men going towards that ship a while ago?' Struck by this plain matter-of-fact question, I answered, saying, "'Yes, I thought I did see four or five men, but it was too dim to be sure.' "'Very dim, very dim,' said Elijah. "'Morning to ye.' Once more we quitted him, but once more he came softly after us, and touching my shoulder again, said, "'See if you can find him now, will ye?' "'Find who?' "'Morning to ye, morning to ye,' he rejoined, again moving off. "'Oh, I was going to warn you against—but never mind, never mind. It's all one, all in the family, too. Sharp frost this morning, ain't it? Good-bye to ye.' "'Shan't see you again very soon, I guess, unless it's before the grand jury.' And with these cracked words he finally departed, leaving me for the moment in no small wonderment at his frantic impudence. At last, stepping on board the Pequod, we found everything in profound quiet, not a soul moving. The cabin entrance was locked within, the hatches were all on, and lumbered with coils of rigging. Going forward to the forecastle, we found the slide of the scuttle open. Seeing a light, we went down, and found only an old rigger there, wrapped in a tattered pea-jacket. He was thrown at whole length upon two chests, his face downwards and enclosed in his folded arms. The profoundest slumber slept upon him. "'Those sailors we saw, Queequeg, where can they have gone to?' said I, looking dubiously at the sleeper. But it seemed that, when on the wharf, Queequeg had not at all noticed what I now alluded to. Hence I would have thought myself to have been optically deceived in that matter were it not for Elijah's otherwise inexplicable question. But I beat the thing down, and again marking the sleeper, jocularly hinted to Queequeg that perhaps we had best sit up with the body, telling him to establish himself accordingly. He put his hand upon the sleeper's rear, as though feeling if it was soft enough, and then, without more ado, quietly sat down there. "'Gracious, Queequeg, don't sit there,' said I. "'Oh, Perry dood seat,' said Queequeg. "'My country way. Won't hurt him face.' "'Face,' said I. "'Call that his face? A very benevolent countenance, then. But how hard he breathes. He's heaving himself. Get off, Queequeg. You're heavy. It's grinding the face of the poor. Get off, Queequeg. Look, he'll twitch you off soon.' I wonder he don't wake. Queequeg removed himself to just beyond the head of the sleeper, and lighted his tomahawk pipe. I sat at the feet. We kept the pipe passing over the sleeper, and from one to the other. Meanwhile, upon questioning him in his broken fashion, Queequeg gave me to understand that in his land, owing to the absence of settees and sofas of all sorts, the kings, chiefs, and great people generally were in the custom of fattening some of the lower orders for Ottomans, and to furnish a house comfortably in that respect you had only to buy up eight or ten lazy fellows and lay them round in the piers and alcoves besides it was very convenient on an excursion much better than those garden chairs which are convertible into walking sticks upon occasion a chief calling his attendant and desiring him to make a settee of himself under a spreading tea perhaps in some damp marshy place while narrating these things, every time Queequeg received the tomahawk from me, he flourished the hatchet side of it over the sleeper's head. "'What's that for, Queequeg?' "'Perry easy, Killy. Oh, perry easy!' He was going on with some wild reminiscences about his tomahawk pipe, which, it seemed, 
had in its two uses both brained his foes and soothed his soul, when we were directly attracted to the sleeping rigor. The strong vapor was now completely filling the contracted hole. It began to tell upon him. He breathed with a sort of muffledness, then seemed troubled in the nose, then revolved over once or twice, then sat up and rubbed his eyes. Hello, he breathed at last. Who be ye smokers? Shipped men, answered I. When does she sail? Aye, aye, you're a-going in her, be ye? She sails to-day. The captain came aboard last night. What captain? Ahab? Who but him indeed? I was going to ask him some further questions concerning Ahab when we heard a noise on deck. Hello, Starbuck's astir, said the rigger. He's a lively chief mate, that. Good man and a pious, but all alive now. I must turn too. And so saying, he went on deck, and we followed. It was now clear sunrise. Soon the crew came on board in twos and threes, the riggers bestirred themselves, the mates were actively engaged, and several of the shore people were busy in bringing various last things on board. Meanwhile, Captain Ahab remained invisibly enshrined within his cabin. End of chapters 17 to 21 Chapters 22 through 25 Chapter 22 Merry Christmas At length, towards noon, upon the final dismissal of the ship's riggers, and after the Pequod had been hauled for out from the wharf, and after the ever-thoughtful Charity had come off in a whale-boat, with her last gift, a nightcap for Stubb, the second mate, her brother-in-law, and a spare Bible for the steward, after all this the two captains, Peleg and Bildad, issued from the cabin, and turning to the chief mate, Peleg said, "'Now, Mr. Starbuck, are you sure everything is all right? Captain Ahab is all ready?' Just spoke to him, nothing more to be got from shore, eh? Well, call all hands, then. Muster em aft here, blast em. No need of profane words, however great the hurry, Peleg, said Bildad. But away with thee, friend Starbuck, and do our bidding. How now, here upon the very point of starting for the voyage, Captain Peleg and Captain Bildad were going it with a high hand on the quarter-deck, just as if they were to be joint commanders at sea, as well as to all appearances in port. And as for Captain Ahab, no sign of him was yet to be seen. Only, they said, he was in the cabin. But then the idea was that his presence was by no means necessary in getting the ship under way, and steering her well out to sea. Indeed, as that was not at all his proper business but the pilot's, and as he was not yet completely recovered, so they said. Therefore Captain Ahab stayed below. And all this seemed natural enough, especially as in the merchant service many captains never show themselves on deck for a considerable time after heaving up the anchor, but remain over the cabin table, having a farewell merry-making with their shore friends, before they quit the ship for good with the pilot." But there was not much chance to think over the matter, for Captain Peleg was now all alive. He seemed to do most of the talking and commanding, and not Bildad. "'Aft here, ye sons of bachelors!' he cried, as the sailors lingered at the mainmast. "'Mr. Starbuck, drive him aft!' "'Strike the tent there!' was the next order. As I hinted before, this whalebone marquee was never pitched except in port, and on board the Pequod, for thirty years, the order to strike the tent was well known to be the next thing to heaving up the anchor. "'Man the capstan! Blood and thunder! Jump!' was the next command, and the crew sprang for the handspikes. Now in getting under way, the station generally occupied by the pilot is the forward part of the ship, and here Bildad, who, with Peleg, be it known, in addition to his other officers, was one of the licensed pilots of the port, he being suspected to have got himself made a pilot in order to save the Nantucket pilot fee to all the ships he was concerned in, for he never piloted any other craft, Bildad, I say, might now be seen actively engaged in looking over the bows for the approaching anchor, 
and at intervals singing what seemed a dismal stave of psalmody to cheer the hands at the windlass, who roared forth some sort of chorus about the girls in Booble Alley, with a hearty good will. Nevertheless, not three days previous, Bildad had told them that no profane songs would be allowed on board the Pequod, particularly in getting under way, and Charity, his sister, had placed a small, choiced copy of Watts in each seaman's berth. Meantime, overseeing the other part of the ship, Captain Peleg ripped and swore astern in the most frightful manner. I almost thought he would sink the ship before the anchor could be got up. Involuntarily I paused on my handspike and told Queequeg to do the same, thinking of the perils we both ran in starting on the voyage with such a devil for a pilot. I was comforting myself, however, with the thought that in pious Bildad might be found some salvation, spite of his 777th lay, when I felt a sudden sharp poke in my rear, and, turning round, was horrified at the apparition of Captain Peleg in the act of withdrawing his leg from my immediate vicinity. That was my first kick. "'Is that the way they heave in the merchant service?' he roared. "'Spring, thou sheephead, spring, and break thy backbone. Why don't you spring, I say, all of you, spring?' Quahog, spring, thou chap with the red whiskers, spring there, scotch cap, spring, thou green pants, spring, I say, all of ye, and spring your eyes out. And so saying, he moved along the windlass, here and there using his leg very freely, while imperturbable Bildad kept leading off with his psalmody. Thinks I, Captain Peleg must have been drinking something today. At last the anchor was up. The sails were set, and off we glided. It was a short, cold Christmas, and as the short northern day merged into night, we found ourselves almost broad upon the wintry ocean, whose freezing spray cased us in ice as in polished armor. The long rows of teeth on the bulwarks glistened in the moonlight, and like the white ivory tusks of some huge elephant, vast curving icicles depended from the bows. Lank Bildad, as pilot, headed the first watch, and ever and anon, as the old craft deep-dived into the green seas, and sent the shivering frost all over her, and the winds howled, and the cordage rang, his steady notes were heard. Sweet fields beyond the swelling flood, stand dressed in living green, so to the Jews old Canaan stood, while Jordan rolled between. Never did those sweet words sound more sweetly to me than then. They were full of hope and fruition. Spite of this frigid winter night in the boisterous Atlantic, spite of my wet feet and wetter jacket, there was yet, it then seemed to me, many a pleasant haven in store, and meads and glades so eternally vernal that the grass shot up by the spring, untrodden, unwilted, remains at midsummer. At last we gained such an offing that the two pilots were needed no longer. The stout sailboat that had accompanied us began ranging alongside. It was curious and not unpleasing how Peleg and Bildad were affected at this juncture, especially Captain Bildad. For loath to depart yet, very loath to leave, for good, a ship bound on so long and perilous a voyage, beyond both stormy capes, a ship in which some thousands of his hard-earned dollars were invested, a ship in which an old shipmate sailed as captain, a man almost as old as he, once more starting to encounter all the terrors of the pitiless jaw, loath to say good-bye to a thing so every way brimful of every interest to him, poor old Bildad lingered long, paced the deck with anxious strides, ran down into the cabin to speak another farewell word there, again came on deck, and looked to windward, looked towards the wide and endless waters, only bounded by the far-off, unseen eastern continents, looked toward the land, looked aloft, looked right and left, looked everywhere and nowhere, and at last, mechanically coiling a rope upon its pin, convulsively grasped stout Peleg by the hand, and holding up a lantern, for the moment stood gazing heroically in his face, as much to say, Nevertheless, friend Peleg, I can stand it. Yes, I can. As for Peleg himself, he took it more like a philosopher. But for all his philosophy, there was a tear twinkling in his eye when the lantern came too near. 
and he too did not a little run from cabin to deck, now a word below, now a word with Starbuck, the chief mate. But at last he turned to his comrade with a final sort of look about him. "'Captain Bildad! Come, old shipmate, we must go. Back the main-yard there. Boat ahoy! Stand by to come close alongside now. Careful, careful. Come, Bildad, boy, say your last. Luck to you, Starbuck. Luck to you, Mr. Stubb. Luck to you, Mr. Flask. Good-bye and good luck to you all. And this day three years I'll have a hot supper smoking for ye in old Nantucket. Hurrah and away! God bless ye, and have ye in his holy keeping, men, murmured old Bildad almost incoherently. I hope you'll have fine weather now, so that Captain Ahab may soon be moving among ye. A pleasant sun is all he needs, and you'll have plenty of them in the tropic voyage you go. Be careful in the hunt, ye mates. Don't stave the boats needlessly, ye harpeneers. Good white cedar plank has raised full three per cent within the year. Don't forget your prayers, either. Mr. Starbuck, mind that cooper don't waste the spare staves. Oh, the sail-needles are in the green locker. Don't wail it too much on the Lord's days, men. But don't miss a fair chance, either. That's rejecting heaven's good gifts. Have an eye to the molasses, tears, Mr. Stubb. It was a little leaky, I thought. If you touch at the islands, Mr. Flask, beware of fornication. Good-bye, good-bye. Don't keep that cheese too long down in the hold, Mr. Starbuck. It'll spoil. Be careful with the butter. Twenty cents the pound it was. And mind ye if— Come, come, Captain Bildad. Stop palavering. Away! And with that— Peleg hurried him over the side, and both dropped into the boat. Ship and boat diverged, the cold, damp night breeze blew between, a screaming gull flew overhead, the two hulls wildly rolled, we gave three heavy-hearted cheers, and blindly plunged, like fate, into the lone Atlantic. CHAPTER Twenty Three, THE LEE SHORE some chapters back, one Bulkington was spoken of, a tall, new-landed mariner encountered in New Bedford at the inn. When on that shivering winter's night the Pequod thrust her vindictive bows into the cold, malicious waves, who should I see standing at her helm but Bulkington? I looked with sympathetic awe and fearfulness upon the man, who in midwinter just landed from a four years' dangerous voyage, could so unrestingly push off again for still another tempestuous term. The land seemed scorching to his feet. Wonderfulest things are ever the unmentionable. Deep memories yield no epitaphs. This six-inch chapter is the stoneless grave of Bulkington. Let me only say that it fared with him as with the storm-tossed ship that miserably drives along the lured land, the port would fain give succor. The port is pitiful. In the port is safety, comfort, hearthstone, supper, warm blankets, friends, all that's kind to our mortalities. But in that gale, the port, the land, is that ship's direst jeopardy. She must fly all hospitality. One touch of land, though it but graze the keel, would make her shudder through and through. With all her might she crowds all sail offshore, in so doing fights against the very winds that fain would blow her homeward, seeks all the lashed sea's landlessness again, for refuge's sake forlornly rushing into peril, her only friend, her bitterest foe. Know ye now, Bulkington, glimpses do you seem to see of that mortally intolerable truth, that all deep Earnest thinking is but the intrepid effort of the soul to keep the open independence of her sea, while the wildest winds of heaven and earth conspire to cast her on the treacherous, slavish shore. But as in landlessness alone resides highest truth, shoreless, indefinite as God, so better it is to perish in that howling infinite than be ingloriously dashed upon the lee, even if that were safety. For worm-like, then, oh, who would craven crawl to land? Terrors of the terrible, 
Is all this agony so vain? Take heart, take heart, O Bulkington, Bear thee grimly, demigod, Up from the spray of thy ocean perishing, Straight up leaps thy apotheosis. Chapter 24 The Advocate As Queequeg and I are now fairly embarked in this business of whaling, and as this business of whaling has somehow come to be regarded among landsmen as a rather unpoetical and disreputable pursuit, therefore I am all anxiety to convince you, ye landsmen, of the injustice hereby done to us hunters of whales. In the first place, it may be deemed almost superfluous to establish the fact that among people at large the business of whaling is not accounted on a level with what are called the liberal professions. If a stranger were introduced into any miscellaneous metropolitan society, it would but slightly advance the general opinion of his merits were he presented to the company as a harpooner, say, and if in emulation of the naval officers he should append the initials SWF, sperm whale fishery, to his visiting card, such a procedure would be deemed preeminently presuming and ridiculous. Doubtless one leading reason why the world declines honoring us whalemen is this. They think that at best our vocation amounts to a butchering sort of business, and that when actively engaged therein we are surrounded by all manner of defilements. Butchers we are, that is true. But butchers also, and butchers of the bloodiest badge, have been all the martial commanders whom the world invariably delights to honor. And as for the matter of the alleged uncleanliness of our business, you shall soon be initiated into certain facts, hitherto pretty generally unknown, and which, upon the whole, will triumphantly plant the sperm-whale ship at least among the cleanliest things of this tidy earth. But even granting the charge in question to be true, what disordered slippery decks of a whale-ship are comparable to the unspeakable carrion of those battlefields from which so many soldiers return to drink in all ladies' plaudits? And if the idea of peril so much enhances the popular conceit of the soldier's profession, let me assure you that many a veteran who has freely marched up to a battery would quickly recoil at the apparition of the sperm whale's vast tail, fanning into eddies the air over his head. For what are the comprehensible terrors of man compared with the interlinked terrors and wonders of God? But though the world scouts at us whale-hunters, yet does it unwittingly pay us the profoundest homage, yea, an all-abounding adoration. For almost all the tapers, lamps, and candles that burn round the globe burn as before so many shrines to our glory." But look at this matter in other lights. Weigh it in all sorts of scales. See what we whalemen are and have been. Why did the Dutch in De Witt's time have admirals of their whaling fleets? Why did Louis the Sixteenth of France, at his own personal expense, fit out whaling ships from Dunkirk, and politely invite to that town some score or two of families from our own island of Nantucket? Why did Britain, between the years 1750 and 1788, pay her whalemen in bounties of upwards of one million pounds? And lastly, how comes it that we whalemen of America now outnumber all the rest of the banded whalemen in the world, sail a navy of upwards of seven hundred vessels, manned by eighteen thousand men, yearly consuming four million of dollars, the ship's worth at the time of sailing twenty million dollars, and every year importing into our harbors a well-reaped harvest of seven million dollars. How comes all this if there be not something puissant in whaling? But this is not the half. Look again. I freely assert that the cosmopolite philosopher cannot, for his life, point out one single peaceful influence which, within the last sixty years, has operated more potentially upon the whole broad world, taken in one aggregate, than the high and mighty business of whaling. One way and another, it has begotten events so remarkable in themselves, and so continuously momentous in their sequential issues, that whaling may well be regarded as that Egyptian mother who bore offspring themselves pregnant from her womb. It would be a hopeless, endless task to catalogue all these things. 
let a handful suffice. For many years past, the whale ship has been the pioneer in ferreting out the remotest and least known parts of the earth. She has explored seas and archipelagos which had no chart, where no Cook or Vancouver had ever sailed. If American and European men of war now peacefully ride in once savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and glory of the whale ship, which originally showed them the way, and first interpreted between them and the savages. They may celebrate as they will the heroes of exploring expeditions, your cooks, your cruisensterns, but I say that scores of anonymous captains have sailed out of Nantucket that were as great and greater than your cook and your cruisenstern. For in their succorless, empty-handedness, they, in the heathenish, sharked waters, and by the beaches of unrecorded javelin islands, battled with virgin wonders and terrors that Cook, with all his marines and muskets, would not willingly have dared. All that is made such a flourish of in old South Sea voyages, those things were but the lifetime commonplaces of our heroic Nantucketers. Often adventures which Vancouver dedicates three chapters to, these men accounted unworthy of being set down in the ship's common log. Ah, the world! Ah, oh, the world! Until the whale fishery rounded Cape Horn, no commerce but colonial, scarcely any intercourse but colonial, was carried on between Europe and the long line of the opulent Spanish provinces on the Pacific coast. It was the whalemen who first broke through the jealous policy of the Spanish crown, touching those colonies, and, if space permitted, it might be distinctly shown how, from those whalemen, at last eventuated the liberation of Peru, Chile, and Bolivia from the yoke of old Spain, and the establishment of eternal democracy in those parts. That great America on the other side of the sphere, Australia, was given to the enlightened world by the whalemen. After its first blunder-born discovery by a Dutchman, all other ships long shunned those shores as pestiferously barbarous. But the whale-ship touched there. The whale-ship is the true mother of that now mighty colony. Moreover, in the infancy of the first Australian settlement, the emigrants were several times saved from starvation by the benevolent biscuit of the whale-ship luckily dropping an anchor in their waters. The uncounted isles of all Polynesia confess the same truth, and do commercial homage to the whale-ship that cleared the way for the missionary and the merchant, and in many cases carried the primitive missionaries to their first destinations. If that double-bolted land, Japan, is ever to become hospitable, it is the whale-ship alone to whom the credit will be due, for already she is on the threshold. But if, in the face of all this, you still declare that whaling has no aesthetically noble associations connected with it, then I am ready to shiver fifty lances with you there, and unhorse you with a split helmet every time. The whale has no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler, you will say. The whale no famous author, and whaling no famous chronicler? Who wrote the first account of our Leviathan? Who but mighty Job? And who composed the first narrative of a whaling voyage? Who but no less a prince than Alfred the Great, who with his own royal pen took down the words from Arthur, the Norwegian whale-hunter of those times? And who pronounced our glowing eulogy in Parliament? Who but Edmund Burke? True enough, but then whalemen themselves are poor devils. They have no good blood in their veins. No good blood in their veins? They have something better than royal blood there. The grandmother of Benjamin Franklin was Mary Morrill, afterwards by marriage Mary Folger, one of the old settlers of Nantucket, and the ancestress to a long line of Folgers and Harpeneers, all kith and kin to the noble Benjamin, to this day darting the barbed iron from one side of the world to the other. Good again, but then all confess that somehow whaling is not respectable. Whaling not respectable. Whaling is imperial. By the old English statutory law, the whale is declared a royal fish. Oh, that's only nominal. The whale himself has never figured in any grand, imposing way. The whale never figured in any grand, imposing way. 
in one of the mighty triumphs given to a roman general upon his entering the world's capital the bones of a whale brought all the way from the syrian coast were the most conspicuous object in the symboled procession footnote see subsequent chapters for something more on this head End of footnote. grant it since you cite it but say what you will there is no real dignity in wailing no dignity in wailing the dignity of our calling the very heavens attest cetus is a constellation in the south no more drive down your hat in the presence of the czar and take it off to queequeg no more i know a man that in his lifetime has taken three hundred and fifty whales i account that man more honourable than that great captain of antiquity who boasted of taking as many walled towns and as for me if by any possibility there be any as yet undiscovered prime thing in me if i shall ever deserve any real repute in that small but high hushed world which i might not be unreasonably ambitious of if hereafter i shall do anything that upon the whole a man might rather have done than to have left undone if at my death my executors or more properly my creditors find any precious manuscripts in my desk then here i prospectively ascribe all the honour and the glory to whaling for a whale-ship was my yale college and my harvard chapter twenty five postscript in behalf of the dignity of whaling i would fain advance naught but substantiated facts but after embattling his facts an advocate who should wholly suppress a not unreasonable surmise which might tell eloquently upon his case such an advocate would he not be blameworthy it is well known that at the coronation of kings and queens even modern ones a certain curious process of seasoning them for their functions is gone through there is a salt cellar of state so called and there may be a castor of state how they use the salt precisely who knows certain i am however that a king's head is solemnly oiled at his coronation even as a head of salad can it be though that they anoint it with a view of making his interior run well as they anoint machinery much might be ruminated here concerning the essential dignity of this regal process because in common life we esteem but meanly and contemptibly a fellow who anoints his hair and palpably smells of that anointing in truth a mature man who uses hair oil unless medicinally that man has probably got a quaggy spot in him somewhere as a general rule he can't amount to much in his totality but the only thing to be considered here is this what kind of oil is used at coronation certainly it cannot be olive oil or macassar oil nor castor oil nor bear's oil nor train oil nor cod liver oil what then can it possibly be but sperm oil in its unmanufactured unpolluted state the sweetest of all oils think of that ye loyal britons we whalemen supply your kings and queens with coronation stuff end of chapters twenty two to twenty five chapters twenty six and twenty seven chapter twenty six knights and squires the chief mate of the pequod was starbuck a native of nantucket and a quaker by descent he was a long earnest man and though born on an icy coast seemed well adapted to endure the hot latitudes his flesh being hard as twice-baked biscuit transported to the indies his live blood would not spoil like bottled ale he must have been born in some time of general drought and famine or upon one of those fast days for which his state is famous only some thirty arid summers had he seen those summers had dried up all his physical superfluousness but this his thinness so to speak seemed no more the token of wasting anxieties and cares than it seemed the indication of any bodily blight it was merely the condensation of the man he was by no means ill-looking quite the contrary his pure tight skin was an excellent fit 
and closely wrapped up in it, and embalmed with inner health and strength like a revivified Egyptian, this Starbuck seemed prepared to endure for long ages to come, and to endure always as now, for be it polar snow or torrid sun, like a patent chronometer, his interior vitality was warranted to do well in all climates. Looking into his eyes, you seemed to see there the yet lingering images of those thousandfold perils he had calmly confronted through life. A staid, steadfast man, whose life for the most part was a telling pantomime of action, and not a tame chapter of sounds. Yet for all his hardy sobriety and fortitude, there were certain qualities in him which at times affected, and in some cases seemed well nigh to overbalance all the rest, uncommonly conscientious for a seaman, and endued with a deep natural reverence, the wild watery loneliness of his life did therefore strongly incline him to superstition, but to that sort of superstition which in some organizations seems rather to spring, somehow, from intelligence than from ignorance. Outward portents and inward presentiments were his, and if at times these things bent the welded iron of his soul, so much more did his far-away domestic memories of his young Cape wife and child tend to bend him still more from the original ruggedness of his nature, and open him still further to those latent influences which, in some honest-hearted men, restrain the gush of dare-devil daring so often evinced by others in the more perilous vicissitudes of the fisheries. I will have no man in my boat, said Starbuck, who is not afraid of a whale. By this he seemed to mean, not only that the most reliable and useful courage was that which arises from the fair estimation of the encountered peril, but that an utterly fearless man is a far more dangerous comrade than a coward. Aye, aye, said Stubb, the second mate. Starbuck there is as careful a man as you'll find anywhere in this fishery. But we shall ere long see what that word careful precisely means when used by a man like Stubb, or almost any other whale hunter. Starbuck was no crusader after perils. In him courage was not a sentiment, but a thing simply useful to him, and always at hand, upon all mortally practical occasions. Besides, he thought, perhaps, that in this business of whaling, courage was one of the great staple outfits of the ship, like her beef and her bread, and not to be foolishly wasted. Therefore he had no fancy for lowering for whales after sundown, nor for persisting in fighting a fish that too much persisted in fighting him. For, thought Starbuck, I am here in this critical ocean to kill whales for my living, and not to be killed by them for theirs and that hundreds of men had been so killed, Starbuck well knew. What doom was his own father's? Where in the bottomless deeps could he find the torn limbs of his brother? With memories like these in him, and moreover given to a certain superstitiousness, as has been said, the courage of this Starbuck, which could nevertheless still flourish, must indeed have been extreme. But it was not in reasonable nature that a man so organized, and with such terrible experiences and remembrances as he had, it was not in nature that these things should fail in latently engendering an element in him which, under suitable circumstances, would break out from its confinement, and burn all his courage up. And brave as he might be, it was that sort of bravery chiefly, visible in some intrepid men, which, while generally abiding firm in the conflict with seas or winds or whales or any of the ordinary irrational horrors of the world, yet cannot withstand those more terrific because more spiritual terrors which sometimes menace you from the concentrating brow of an enraged and mighty man. But were the coming narrative to reveal in any instance the complete abasement of poor Starbuck's fortitude, scarce might I have the heart to write it, for it is a thing most sorrowful, nay shocking, to expose the fall of valour in the soul. Men may seem detestable as joint-stock companies and nations. Knaves, fools, and murderers there may be. Men may have mean and meagre faces. But man, in the ideal is so noble and so sparkling, such a grand and glowing creature, that over any ignominious blemish in him all his fellows should run to throw their costliest robes. 
That immaculate manliness we feel within ourselves, so far within us that it remains intact though all the outer characters seem gone, bleeds with keenest anguish at the undraped spectacle of a valor-ruined man. Nor can piety itself, at such a shameful sight, completely stifle her upbraidings against the permitting stars. But this august dignity I treat of is not the dignity of kings and robes, but that abounding dignity which has no robed investiture. Thou shalt see it shining in the arm that wields a pick or drives a spike, that democratic dignity which, on all hands, radiates without end from God himself, the great God absolute, the centre and circumference of all democracy, his omnipresence, our divine equality. If, then, to meanest mariners, and renegades, and castaways, I shall hereafter ascribe high qualities, though dark, weave round them tragic graces, if even the most mournful, perchance the most abased among them all, shall at times lift himself to the exalted mounts, if I shall touch that workman's arm with some ethereal light, if I shall spread a rainbow over his disastrous set of sun, then against all mortal critics bear me out in it, thou just spirit of equality, which has spread one royal mantle of humanity over all my kind, Bear me out in it, thou great democratic god, who didst not refuse the swart convict Bunyan the pale poetic pearl, thou who didst clothe with doubly hammered leaves of finest gold the stumped and paupered arm of old Cervantes, thou who didst pick up Andrew Jackson from the pebbles, who didst hurl him upon a war-horse, who didst thunder him higher than a throne, Thou who, in all thy mighty earthly marchings, ever cullest thy selectest champions from the kingly commons, bear me out in it, O God. Chapter 27 Knights and Squires Stubb was the second mate. He was a native of Cape Cod, and hence, according to local usage, he was called a Cape Codman. A happy-go-lucky, neither craven nor valiant, taking perils as they came with an indifferent air, and while engaged in the most imminent crisis of the chase, toiling away calm and collected as a journeyman joiner engaged for the year. Good-humoured, easy, and careless, he presided over his whaleboat as if the most deadly encounter were but a dinner, and his crew all invited guests. He was as particular about the comfortable arrangement of his part of the boat as an old stage-driver is about the snugness of his box. When close to the whale, in the very death-lock of the fight, he handled his unpitying lance coolly and off-handedly, as a whistling tinker his hammer. He would hum over his old rigadig tunes while flank and flank with the most exasperated monster— Long usage had, for this stub, converted the jaws of death into an easy chair. What he thought of death itself there was no telling. Whether he ever thought of it at all might be a question. But if he ever did chance to cast his mind that way after a comfortable dinner, no doubt, like a good sailor, he took it to be a sort of a call to the watch to tumble aloft and bestir themselves there, about something which he would find out when he obeyed the order, and not sooner. What, perhaps, with other things, made Stubb such an easy-going, unfearing man, so cheerfully trudging off with the burden of life in a world full of grave peddlers, all bowed to the ground with their packs, what helped to bring about that almost impious good humour of his, that thing must have been his pipe. For, like his nose, his short, black little pipe was one of the regular features of his face, you would almost as soon have expected him to turn out of his bunk without his nose as without his pipe. He kept a whole row of pipes there, ready loaded, stuck in a rack, within easy reach of his hand, and whenever he turned in he smoked them all out in succession, lighting one from another to the end of the chapter, then loading them again to be in readiness anew. For when Stubb dressed, instead of first putting his legs into his trousers, he put his pipe into his mouth. I say this continual smoking must have been one cause, at least, of his peculiar disposition, for everyone knows that this earthly air, whether ashore or afloat, is terribly infected with the nameless miseries of the numberless mortals who have died exhaling it. 
and as in a time of cholera some people go about with camphorated handkerchiefs to their mouths so likewise against all mortal tribulations stubb's tobacco smoke might have operated as a sort of disinfecting agent the third mate was flask a native of tisbury in martha's vineyard a short stout ruddy young fellow very pugnacious concerning whales who somehow seemed to think that the great leviathans had personally and hereditarily affronted him and therefore it was a sort of point of honour with him to destroy them whenever encountered so utterly lost was he to all sense of reverence for the many marvels of their majestic bulk and mystic ways and so dead to anything like an apprehension of any possible danger from encountering them that in his poor opinion the wondrous whale was but a species of magnified mouse or at least water rat requiring only a little circumvention and some small application of time and trouble in order to kill and boil this ignorant unconscious fearlessness of his made him a little waggish in the matter of whales he followed these fish for the fun of it and a three years voyage round cape horn was only a jolly joke that lasted that length of time as a carpenter's nails are divided into wrought nails and cut nails so mankind may be similarly divided little flask was one of the wrought ones made to clinch tight and last long they called him king post on board the pequod because in form he could be well likened to the short square timber known by that name in arctic whalers and which by the means of many radiating side timbers inserted into it serves to brace the ship against the icy concussions of those battering seas now these three mates starbuck stubb and flask were momentous men they it was who by universal prescription commanded three of the pequod's boats as headmen in that grand order of battle in which captain ahab would probably marshal his forces to descend on the whales these three headsmen were as captains of companies or being armed with their long keen whaling spears they were as a picked trio of lancers even as the harpooners were flingers of javelins and since in this famous fishery each mate or headsman like a gothic knight of old is always accompanied by his boat steerer or harpooner who in certain conjunctures provides him with a fresh lance when the former one has been badly twisted or elbowed in the assault and moreover as there generally subsists between the two a close intimacy and friendliness it is therefore but meet that in this place we set down who the pequod's harpooners were and to what headsman each of them belonged first of all was queequeg whom starbuck the chief mate had selected for his squire but queequeg is already known next was tashtego an unmixed indian from gayhead the most westerly promontory of martha's vineyard where there still exists the last remnant of a village of red men which has long supplied the neighboring island of nantucket with many of her most daring harpooners in the fishery they usually go by the generic name of gay headers tashtego's long lean sable hair his high cheekbones and black rounding eyes for an indian oriental in their largeness but antarctic in their glittering expression all this sufficiently proclaimed him an inheritor of the unvitiated blood of those proud warrior hunters who in quest of the great new england moose had scoured bow in hand the aboriginal forests of the maine but no longer snuffing in the trail of the wild beasts of the woodland tashtego now hunted in the wake of the great whales of the sea the unerring harpoon of the sun fitly replacing the infallible arrow of the sires to look at the tawny brawn of his lithe snaky limbs you would almost have credited the superstitions of some of the earlier puritans and half believe this wild indian to be a son of the prince of the powers of the air tashtego was stubb the second mate's squire third among the harpooners was dagoo a gigantic coal-black negro savage with a lion-like tread an ahashvarosh to behold suspended from his ears were two golden hoops so large that the sailors called them ring bolts and would talk of securing the topsail halyards to them in his youth dagoo had voluntarily shipped on board a whaler lying in a lonely bay on his native coast 
and never having been anywhere in the world but in Africa, Nantucket, and the pagan harbors most frequented by whalemen, and having now led for many years the bold life of the fishery in the ships of owners uncommonly heedful of what manner of men they shipped, Dagoo retained all his barbaric virtues, and erect as a giraffe, moved about the decks in all the pomp of six feet five in his socks. There was a corporeal humility in looking up at him, and a white man standing before him seemed a white flag come to beg truce of a fortress. Curious to tell, this imperial negro, a Hashvorosh Dagoo, was the squire of Little Flask, who looked like a chessman beside him. As for the residue of the Pequod's company, be it said that at the present day not more than one in two of the many thousand men before the mast employed in the American whale fishery are Americans born, though pretty nearly all the officers are. Herein it is the same with the American whale fishery as it is with the American army and military and merchant navies, and the engineering forces employed in the construction of the American canals and railroads. The same, I say, because in all these cases the native American liberally provides the brains, the rest of the world is generously supplying the muscles. No small number of these whaling seamen belong to the Azores, where the outward-bound Nantucket whalers frequently touch to augment their crews from the hardy peasants of those rocky shores. In like manner the Greenland whalers sailing out of Hull or London put in at the Shetland Islands to receive the full complement of their crew. Upon the passage homeward they drop them there again. How it is there is no telling, but islanders seem to make the best whalemen. They were nearly all islanders in the Pequod. Isolatos, too, I call such, not acknowledging the common continent of men, but each isolato living on a separate continent of his own. Yet now, federated along one keel, what a set these isolatos were! An Anacarsis Clute's deputation from all the isles of the sea, and all the ends of the earth, accompanying old Ahab in the Pequod, to lay the world's grievances before that bar from which not very many of them ever come back. Black little Pip, he never did. Oh no, he went before. Poor Alabama boy! On the grim Pequod's forecastle you shall ere long see him, beating his tambourine, prelusive of the eternal time, when sent for, to the great quarter-deck on high, he was bid strike in with angels, and beat his tambourine in glory. Called a coward here, hailed a hero there. End of chapters 26 and 27 Chapters 28 to 31. Chapter 28. Ahab. For several days after leaving Nantucket, nothing above hatches was seen of Captain Ahab. The mates regularly relieved each other at the watches, and for aught that could be seen to the contrary, they seemed to be the only commanders of the ship only they sometimes issued from the cabin with orders so sudden and peremptory that after all it was plain they but commanded vicariously. Yes, their supreme lord and dictator was there, though hitherto unseen by any eyes not permitted to penetrate into the now sacred retreat of the cabin. Every time I ascended to the deck from my watches below I instantly gazed aft, to mark if any strange face were visible, for my first vague disquietude touching the unknown captain, now in the seclusion of the sea, became almost a perturbation. This was strangely heightened at times by the ragged Elijah's diabolical incoherences uninvitedly recurring to me, with a subtle energy I could not have before conceived of. But poorly could I withstand them, much as in other moods I was almost ready to smile at the solemn whimsicalities of that outlandish prophet of the wharves. But whatever it was of apprehensiveness or uneasiness, to call it so, which I felt, whenever I came to look about me in the ship it seemed against all warranty to cherish such emotions. 
For though the harpooners, with the great body of the crew, were a far more barbaric, heathenish, and motley set than any of the tame merchant ship companies which my previous experiences had made me acquainted with, Still I ascribed this, and rightly ascribed it, to the fierce uniqueness of the very nature of that wild Scandinavian vocation in which I had so abandonedly embarked. But it was especially the aspect of the three chief officers of the ship, the mates, which was most forcibly calculated to allay these colourless misgivings, and induce confidence and cheerfulness in every presentment of the voyage. Three better, more likely sea officers and men, each in his own different way, could not readily be found, and they were, every one of them, Americans, a Nantucketer, a Vineyarder, a Cape Man. Now, it being Christmas when the ship shot from outer harbour, for a space we had biting polar weather, though all the time running away from it to the southward and by every degree and minute of latitude which we sailed, gradually leaving that merciless winter and all its intolerable weather behind us. It was one of those less lowering but still grey and gloomy enough mornings of the transition, when, with a fair wind, the ship was rushing through the water with a vindictive sort of leaping and melancholy rapidity, that as I mounted to the deck at the call of the forenoon watch, so soon as I levelled my glance toward the taffrail, foreboding shivers ran over me. Reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon his quarter-deck. There seemed no sign of common bodily illness about him, nor of the recovery from any. He looked like a man cut away from the stake, when the fire has overrunningly wasted all the limbs without consuming them or taking away one particle from their compacted aged robustness, his whole high, broad form seemed made of solid bronze, and shaped in an unalterable mould like Cellini's cast Perseus. Threading its way out from among his grey hairs, and continuing right down one side of his tawny, scorched face and neck, till it disappeared in his clothing, you saw a slender, rod-like mark, lividly whitish, it resembled that perpendicular seam sometimes made in the straight lofty trunk of a great tree, when the upper lightning tearingly darts down it, and without wrenching a single twig peels and grooves out the bark from top to bottom, ere running off into the soil, leaving the tree still greenly alive, but branded. Whether that mark was born with him, or whether it was the scar left by some desperate wound, no one could certainly say. By some tacit consent throughout the voyage, little or no allusion was made to it, especially by the mates. But once Tashtego Sr., an old gay-head Indian among the crew, superstitiously asserted that not till he was full forty years old did Ahab become that way branded, and then it came upon him not in the fury of any mortal fray, but in an elemental strife at sea. Yet this wild hint seemed inferentially negatived by what a grey manxman insinuated, an old sepulchral man, who, having never before sailed out of Nantucket, had never ere this laid eye upon wild Ahab. Nevertheless, the old sea traditions, the immemorial credulities, popularly invested this old manxman with preternatural powers of discernment, so that no white sailor seriously contradicted him when he said that if ever Captain Ahab should be tranquilly laid out, which might hardly come to pass, so he muttered, then whoever should do that last office for the dead would find a birthmark on him from crown to soul. So powerfully did the whole grim aspect of Ahab affect me, and the livid brand which streaked it, that for the first few moments I hardly noted that not a little of this overbearing grimness was owing to the barbaric white leg upon which he partly stood. It had previously come to me that this ivory leg had at sea been fashioned from the polished bone of a sperm whale's jaw. Ay, he was dismasted off Japan, said the old gay-head Indian once, but like his dismasted craft, he shipped another mast without coming home for it. He has a quiver of em. I was struck with the singular posture he maintained, 
Upon each side of the Pequod's quarter deck, and pretty close to the mizzen shrouds, there was an auger hole, bored about half an inch or so into the plank. His bone legs steadied in that hole, one arm elevated and holding by a shroud, Captain Ahab stood erect, looking straight out beyond the ship's ever-pitching prow. There was an infinity of firmest fortitude, a determinate, unsurrenderable willfulness in the fixed and fearless forward dedication of that glance. Not a word he spoke, nor did his officers say aught to him, though by all their minutest gestures and expressions they plainly showed the uneasy, if not painful, consciousness of being under a troubled master eye. And not only that, but moody, stricken Ahab stood before them with a crucifixion in his face, in all the nameless, regal, overbearing dignity of some mighty woe. Ere long, from his first visit in the air, he withdrew into his cabin. But after that morning he was every day visible to the crew, either standing in his pivot-hole, or seated upon an ivory stool he had, or heavily walking the deck. As the sky grew less gloomy, indeed began to grow a little genial, he became still less and less a recluse, as if when the ship had sailed from home nothing but the dead wintry bleakness of the sea had then kept him so secluded. And by and by it came to pass that he was almost continually in the air. But as yet, for all that he said, or perceptibly did, on the at last sunny deck, he seemed as unnecessary there as another mast. But the Pequod was only making a passage now, not regularly cruising. Nearly all whaling preparatives needing supervision, the mates were fully competent to, so that there was little or nothing out of himself to employ or excite Ahab now, and thus chase away for that one interval the clouds that layer upon layer were piled upon his brow, as ever all clouds choose the loftiest peaks to pile themselves upon. Nevertheless, ere long, the warm, warbling persuasiveness of the pleasant holiday weather we came to seemed gradually to charm him from his mood. For as when the red-cheeked dancing girls, April and May, trip home to the wintry, misanthropic woods, even the barest, ruggedest, most thunder-cloven old oak will at least send forth some few green sprouts to welcome such glad-hearted visitants, so Ahab did, in the end, a little respond to the playful allurings of that girlish air. More than once did he put forth the faint blossom of a look which, in any other man, would have soon flowered out in a smile. Chapter 29 Enter Ahab, to him, Stubb. Some days elapsed, and, ice and icebergs all astern, the Pequod now went rolling through the bright Quito spring, which at sea almost perpetually reigns on the threshold of the eternal August of the tropic. The warmly cool, clear, ringing, perfumed, overflowing, redundant days were as crystal goblets of Persian sherbet, heaped up, flaked up with rose-water snow, the starred and stately knights seemed haughty dames in jewelled velvets, nursing at home in lonely pride the memory of their absent conquering earls, the golden-helmeted sons. For sleeping man, t'was hard to choose between such winsome days and such seducing nights. But all the witcheries of that unwaning weather did not merely lend new spells and potencies to the outward world. Inward they turned upon the soul— especially when the still mild hours of eve came on. Then memory shot her crystals as the clear ice most forms of noiseless twilights. And all these subtle agencies, more and more they wrought on Ahab's texture. Old age is always wakeful, as if the longer linked with life, the less man has to do with aught that looks like death. Among sea commanders, the old greybeards will oftenest leave their berths to visit the night-cloak deck. It was so with Ahab, only that now, of late, he seemed so much to live in the open air, that, truly speaking, his visits were more to the cabin than from the cabin to the planks. "'It feels like going down into one's tomb,' he would mutter to himself, "'for an old captain like me to be descending this narrow scuttle.' to go to my grave-dug berth. 
So almost every twenty-four hours, when the watches of the night were set and the band on deck sentineled the slumbers of the band below, and when, if a rope was to be hauled upon the forecastle, the sailors flung it not rudely down as by day, but with some cautiousness dropped it to its place for fear of disturbing their slumbering shipmates, when this sort of steady quietude would begin to prevail, habitually the silent steersman would watch the cabin scuttle, and ere long the old man would emerge, gripping at the iron banister to help his crippled way. Some considering touch of humanity was in him, for at times like these he usually abstained from patrolling the quarter-deck, because to his wearied mates, seeking repose within six inches of his ivory heel, such would have been the reverberating crack and din of that bony step that their dreams would have been on the crunching teeth of sharks. But once the mood was on him too deep for common regardings, and as with heavy lumber-like pace he was measuring the ship from taffrail to mainmast, Stubb, the old second mate, came up from below, with a certain unassured deprecating humorousness, hinted that if Captain Ahab was pleased to walk the planks, then no one could say nay, but there might be some way of muffling the noise, hinting something indistinctly and hesitatingly about a globe of tow and the insertion into it of the ivory heel. Ah, Stubb, thou didst not know Ahab then. Am I a cannon-ball, Stubb? said Ahab, that thou wouldst wad me that fashion? But go thy ways, I had forgot. Below to thy nightly grave, where such as ye sleep between shrouds, to use ye to filling one at last. Down, dog, and kennel! Starting at the unforeseen concluding exclamation of the so suddenly scornful old man, Stubb was speechless for a moment, and then said excitedly, "'I am not used to be spoken to that way, sir. I do but less than half like it, sir.' "'Avast!' gritted Ahab between his set teeth, and violently moving away as if to avoid some passionate temptation. "'No, sir, not yet,' said Stubb, emboldened. I will not tamely be called a dog, sir. And be called ten times a donkey and a mule and an ass, and be gone or I'll clear the world of thee. As he said this, Ahab advanced upon him with such overbearing terrors in his aspect that Stubb involuntarily retreated. I was never served so before without giving a hard blow for it, muttered Stubb, as he found himself descending the cabin scuttle. It's very queer. Stop, Stubb. Somehow, now, I don't well know whether to go back and strike him, or what's that? Down here on my knees and pray for him? Yes, that was the thought coming up in me. But it would be the first time I ever did pray. It's queer, very queer. And he's queer, too. I take him fore and aft. He's about the queerest old man Stubb ever sailed with. How he flashed at me! his eyes like powder-pans. Is he mad? Anyway, there's something on his mind, as sure as there must be something on a deck when it cracks. He ain't in his bed now, either, more than three hours out of twenty-four, and he don't sleep then. Didn't that doughboy, the steward, tell me that of a morning he always finds the old man's hammock clothes all rumpled and tumbled, and the sheets down at the foot? and the cover-lid almost tied into knots, and the pillow a sort of frightful hot, as though a baked brick had been on it. A hot old man. I guess he's got what some folks ashore call a conscience. It's a kind of tick-dolly row, they say. Worse nor a toothache. Well, well, I don't know what it is, but the Lord keep me from catching it. He's full of riddles. I wonder what he goes into the afterhold for every night, as Doughboy tells me he suspects. What's that for, I should like to know? Who's made appointments with him in the hold? Ain't that queer now? But there's no telling. It's the old game. Here it goes for a snooze. Damn me, it's worth a fellow's while to be born into the world, if only to fall right asleep. And now that I think of it, that's about the first thing babies do. And that's sort of queer, too. Damn me, but all things are queer, come to think of them. But that's against my principles. Think not is my eleventh commandment, and sleep when you can is my twelfth. So here goes again. 
But how's that? Didn't he call me a dog? Blazes, he called me ten times a donkey and piled a lot of jackasses on top of that. He might as well have kicked me and be done with it. Maybe he did kick me, and I didn't observe it. I was so taken all aback with his brow, somehow. It flashed like a bleached bone. What the devil's the matter with me? I don't stand right on my legs. Coming afoul of that old man has a sort of turned me wrong side out. By the Lord, I must have been dreaming, though. How? 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 But the only way is to stash it. So here goes to hammock again, and in the morning I'll see how this plaguy juggling thinks over by daylight. Chapter 30 The Pipe When Stubb had departed, Ahab stood for a while leaning over the bulwarks, and then, as had been usual with him of late, calling a sailor of the watch, he sent him below for his ivory stool and also his pipe, Lighting his pipe at the binnacle lamp and planting the stool on the weather side of the deck, he sat and smoked. In Old Norse times the thrones of the sea-loving Danish kings were fabricated, saith tradition, of the tusks of the narwhal. How could one look at Ahab, then, seated on that tripod of bones, without bethinking him of the royalty it symbolized? for a Khan of the Plank, and a King of the Sea, and a great Lord of Leviathans, was Ahab. Some moments passed, during which the thick vapour came from his mouth in quick and constant puffs, which blew back again into his face. "'How now?' he soliloquized at last, withdrawing the tube. "'This smoking no longer soothes. Ah, oh, my pipe! Hard must it go with me if thy charm be gone.' Here have I been unconsciously toiling, not pleasuring, I in ignorantly smoking to windward all the while, to windward, and with such nervous whiffs, as if, like the dying whale, my final jets were the strongest and fullest of trouble. What business have I with this pipe, this thing that is meant for sereneness, to send up mild white vapors among mild white hairs, not among torn iron-gray locks like mine. I'll smoke no more. He tossed the still-lighted pipe into the sea. The fire hissed in the waves. The same instant the ship shot by the bubble the sinking pipe made. With slouched hat, Ahab lurchingly paced the planks. Chapter 31 Queen Mab Next morning Stubb accosted Flask. Such a queer dream, King Post, I never had. You know the old man's ivory leg? Well, I dreamed he kicked me with it. And when I tried to kick back upon my soul, my little man, I kicked my leg right off. And then presto, Ahab seemed a pyramid, and I, like a blazing fool, kept kicking at it. But what was still more curious, Flask, you know how curious all dreams are, through all this rage that I was in, I somehow seemed to be thinking to myself that, after all, it was not much of an insult, that kick from Ahab. Why, thinks I, what's the row? It's not a real leg, only a false leg. And there's a mighty difference between a living thump and a dead thump. That's what makes a blow from the hand, Flask, fifty times more savage to bear than a blow from a cane. The living member. That makes the living insult, my little man. And thinks I to myself all the while, mind, while I was stubbing my silly toes against that cursed pyramid, so confoundedly contradictory was it all all the while, I say, I was thinking to myself, what's his leg now but a cane, a whalebone cane? Yes, thinks I, it was only a playful cudgeling, in fact only a whaleboning that he gave me, not a base kick. Besides, thinks I, look at it once, why, the end of it, the foot part, what a small sort of end it is, whereas if a broad-footed farmer kicked me, there's a devilish broad insult. But this insult is whittled down to a point only. But now comes the greatest joke of the dream, Flask. While I was battering away at the pyramid, a sort of badger-haired old merman, with a hump on his back, takes me by the shoulders and slews me round. What are you about? says he. Slid, man, but I was frightened. Such a fizz! But somehow next moment I was over the fright. 
"'What am I about?' says I at last. "'And what business is that of yours, I should like to know, Mr. Humpback? "'Do you want a kick?' "'By the Lord, Flask, I had no sooner said that "'than he turned round his stern to me, bent over, "'and dragging up a lot of seaweed he had for a clout, "'what do you think I saw? "'Why, thunder alive, man, his stern was stuck full of marlin spikes "'with the points out. "'Says I, on second thoughts, "'I guess I won't kick you, old fellow.' "'Wise stub,' says he, "'wise stub,' and kept muttering it all the time, "'a sort of eating of his own gums like a chimney-hag. "'Seeing he wasn't going to stop saying over his wise stub, wise stub, "'I thought I might as well fall to kicking the pyramid again. "'But I had only just lifted my foot for it when he roared out, "'Stop that kicking! "'Hello,' says I, "'what's the matter now, old fellow? "'Look ye here,' says he, "'let's argue the insult.' "'Captain Ahab kicked you, didn't he?' "'Yes, he did,' says I. "'Right here it was.' "'Very good,' says he. "'He used his ivory leg, didn't he?' "'Yes, he did,' says I. "'Well, then,' says he, "'wise stub, what have you to complain of? "'Didn't he kick you with right good will? "'It wasn't a common pitch-pine leg he kicked with, was it? "'No, you were kicked by a great man, "'and with a beautiful ivory leg, stub. "'It's an honour. "'I consider it an honour. "'Listen, wise stub. In old England, the greatest lords think it great glory to be slapped by a queen, and made garter knights of. But be your boast, Stub, that ye were kicked by old Ahab, and made a wise man of. Remember what I say. Be kicked by him. Account his kicks honours, and on no account kick back, for you can't help yourself, wise Stub. Don't you see that pyramid? With that, he all of a sudden seemed somehow, in some queer fashion, to swim off into the air. I snored, rolled over, and there I was in my hammock. Now what do you think of that dream flask? I don't know. It seems sort of foolish to me, though. Maybe, maybe, but it's made a wise man of me, flask. Do you see Ahab standing there, sideways looking over the stern? Well, the best thing you can do, flask, is to let the old man alone. Never speak to him, whatever he says. Hello! What's that he shouts? Hark! Masthead there! Look sharp, all of ye! There are whales hereabouts! If ye see a white one, split your lungs for him! What do you think of that now, Flask? Ain't there a small drop of something queer about that, eh? A white whale! Did ye mark that, man? Look ye, there's something special in the wind. Stand by for it, Flask. Ahab has that that's bloody on his mind. But, Mum, he comes this way. End of chapters 28 to 31 Chapter 32 Cetology Already we are boldly launched upon the deep, but soon we shall be lost in its unshored, harbourless immensities, Ere that come to pass, ere the Pequod's weedy hull rolls side by side with the barnacled hulls of the Leviathan, at the outset it is but well to attend to a matter almost indispensable to a thorough appreciative understanding of the more special Leviathanic revelations and illusions of all sorts which are to follow. It is some systematized exhibition of the whale in his broad genera that I would now fain put before you, yet it is no easy task. The classification of the constituents of a chaos, nothing less is here essayed. Listen to what the best and latest authorities have laid down. Quote, no branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, end quote, says Captain Scoresby, A.D. 1820. Quote, it is not my intention, were it in my power, to enter into the inquiry as to the true method of dividing the cetacea into groups and families. Utter confusion exists among historians of this animal, end quote, sperm whale, says Surgeon Beale, A.D. 1839. Quote, unfitness to pursue our research in the unfathomable waters, End quote. Quote, impenetrable veil covering our knowledge of the cetacea. End quote. Quote, a field strewn with thorns. End quote. Quote, all these incomplete indications but serve to torture us naturalists. End quote. 
thus speak of the whale the great cuvier and john hunter and lesson those lights of zoology and anatomy nevertheless though of real knowledge there be little yet of books there are a plenty and so in some small degree with cetology or the science of whales many are the men small and great old and new landsmen and seamen who have at large or in little written of the whale run over a few the authors of the bible aristotle pliny aldrovandi sir thomas brown gesner ray linnaeus rondelicius willoughby green arteddy sibald brisson martin lacepede Bonterre, de Marais, Baron Cuvier, Frederick Cuvier, John Hunter, Owen, Scoresby, Beale, Bennett, J. Ross Brown, the author of Miriam Coffin, Olmsted, and the Reverend T. Cheever. But to what ultimate generalizing purpose all these have written, the above cited extracts will show. Of the names in this list of whale authors, only those following Owen ever saw living whales, and but one of them was a real professional harpooner and whaleman, I mean Captain Scoresby. On the separate subject of the Greenland or right whale, he is the best existing authority. But Scoresby knew nothing and says nothing of the great sperm whale, compared with which the Greenland whale is almost unworthy mentioning. And here be it said that the Greenland whale is a usurper upon the throne of the seas. He is not even by any means the largest of the whales. Yet owing to the long priority of his claims, and the profound ignorance which until some seventy years back invested the then fabulous or utterly unknown sperm whale, and which ignorance to this present day still reigns in all but some few scientific retreats and whale ports, this usurpation has been every way complete. Reference to nearly all the leviathanic allusions in the great poets of past days will satisfy you that the Greenland whale, without one rival, was to them the monarch of the seas. But the time has at last come for a new proclamation. This is Charing Cross. Hear ye, good people all. The Greenland whale is deposed. The great sperm whale now reigneth. There are only two books in being which at all pretend to put the living sperm whale before you, and at the same time in the remotest degree succeed in the attempt. Those books are Beale's and Bennett's, both in their time surgeons to English South Sea whale ships, and both exact and reliable men. The original matter touching the sperm whale to be found in their volumes is necessarily small, but so far as it goes it is of excellent quality, though mostly confined to scientific description. As yet, however, the sperm whale, scientific or poetic, lives not complete in any literature. Far above all other hunted whales, his is an unwritten life. Now the various species of whale need some sort of popular, comprehensive classification, if only an easy outline one for the present, hereafter to be filled in all its departments by subsequent laborers. As no better man advances to take this matter in hand, I hereupon offer my own poor endeavors. I promise nothing complete, because any human thing supposed to be complete must for that very reason infallibly be faulty. I shall not pretend to a minute anatomical description of the various species, or, in this place at least, to much of any description. My object here is simply to project the draft of a systematization of cetology. I am the architect, not the builder. But it is a ponderous task. No ordinary letter sorter in the post office is equal to it. To grope down into the bottom of the sea after them, to have one's hands among the unspeakable foundations, ribs and very pelvis of the world, this is a fearful thing. What am I that I should essay to hook the nose of this leviathan? The awful tauntings in Job might well appall me. Will he, the leviathan, make a covenant with thee? Behold, the hope of him is vain. But I have swam through libraries and sailed through oceans. 
I have had to do with whales with these visible hands. I am in earnest, and I will try. There are some preliminaries to settle. First, the uncertain, unsettled condition of this science of cetology is in the very vestibule attested by the fact that in some quarters it still remains a moot point whether the whale be a fish. In his System of Nature, A.D. 1776, Linnaeus declares, quote, I hereby separate the whales from the fish, end quote. But I, of my own knowledge, know that down to the year 1850, sharks and shad, alewives and herring, against Linnaeus's express edict, were still found dividing the possession of the same seas with the Leviathan. The grounds upon which Linnaeus would fain have banished the whales from the waters, he states as follows, quote, on account of their warm, bilocular heart, their lungs, their movable eyelids, their hollow ears, penem intrantum feminam mamis lactinem, end quote. And finally, quote, ex lege nature jure meritoque, end quote. I submitted all this to my friends Simeon Macy and Charlie Coffin of Nantucket, both messmates of mine in a certain voyage, and they united in the opinion that the reasons set forth were altogether insufficient. Charlie profanely hinted they were humbug. Be it known that, waiving all argument, I take the good old-fashioned ground that the whale is a fish, and call upon holy Jonah to back me. This fundamental thing settled, the next point is, in what internal respect does the whale differ from other fish? Above, Linnaeus has given you those items, but in brief, they are these, lungs and warm blood, whereas all other fish are lungless and cold-blooded. Next, how shall we define the whale by his obvious externals, so as conspicuously to label him for all time to come? To be short, then, a whale is a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. There you have him. However contracted, that definition is the result of expanded meditation. A walrus spouts much like a whale, but the walrus is not a fish because he is amphibious. But the last term of the definition is still more cogent, as coupled with the first. Almost anyone must have noticed that all the fish familiar to landsmen have not a flat but a vertical or up-and-down tail. Whereas among spouting fish, the tail, though it may be similarly shaped, invariably assumes a horizontal position. By the above definition of what a whale is, I do by no means exclude from the Leviathanic Brotherhood any sea creature hitherto identified with the whale by the best informed Nantucketers, nor, on the other hand, link with it any fish hitherto authoritatively regarded as alien. Hence, all the smaller, spouting, and horizontal-tailed fish must be included in this ground plan of cetology. Now, then, come the grand divisions of the entire whale host. Footnote. I am aware that down to the present time the fish-styled lamatins and dugongs, pigfish and sowfish of the coffins of Nantucket, are included by many naturalists among the whales, but as these pigfish are a noisy, contemptible set, mostly lurking in the mouths of rivers and feeding on wet hay, and especially as they do not spout, I deny their credentials as whales, and have presented them with their passports to quit the kingdom of cetology. End of footnote. First, according to magnitude, I divide the whales into three primary books, subdivisible into chapters, and these shall comprehend them all, both small and large. 1. The folio whale. 2. The octavo whale. 3. The duodecimo whale. As the type of the folio, I present the sperm whale. Of the octavo, the grampus. Of the duodecimo, the porpoise. Folios. Among these, I here include the following chapters. 1. The sperm whale, 2. The right whale, 3. The finback whale, 4. The humpback whale, 5. The razorback whale, 6. The sulfur bottom whale. Book 1. 
Folio, Chapter One, Sperm Whale. This whale, among the English of old vaguely known as the Trumpa Whale, and the Fissiter Whale, and the Anvil-Headed Whale, is the present cachalot of the French, and the potsfish of the Germans, and the macrocephalus of the long words. He is without doubt the largest inhabitant of the globe, the most formidable of all whales to encounter, the most majestic in aspect, and lastly, by far, the most valuable in commerce, he being the only creature from which that valuable substance, spermaceti, is obtained. All his peculiarities will, in many other places, be enlarged upon. It is chiefly with his name that I now have to do. Philologically considered, it is absurd. Some centuries ago, when the sperm whale was almost wholly unknown in his own proper individuality, and when his oil was only accidentally obtained from the stranded fish, in those days spermaceti, it would seem, was popularly supposed to be derived from a creature identical with the one then known in England as the Greenland or right whale. It was the idea also that this same spermaceti was that quickening humour of the Greenland whale which the first syllable of the word literally expresses. In those times also spermaceti was exceedingly scarce, not being used for light, but only as an ointment and medicament. It was only to be had from the druggists as you nowadays buy an ounce of rhubarb. When, as I opine in the course of time, the true nature of spermaceti became known, its original name was still retained by the dealers, no doubt to enhance its value by a notion so strangely significant of its scarcity and so the appellation must have at last come to be bestowed upon the whale from which this spermaceti was really derived. Book One, Folio, Chapter Two, Right Whale. In one respect this is the most venerable of the leviathans, being the one first regularly hunted by man. It yields the article commonly known as whalebone or baleen, and the oil specially known as whale oil, an inferior article in commerce. Among the fishermen he is indiscriminately designated by all the following titles, the whale, the Greenland whale, the black whale, the great whale, the true whale, the right whale. There is a deal of obscurity concerning the identity of the species thus multitudinously baptized, what, then, is the whale which I include in the second species of my folios? It is the great mysticetus of the English naturalists, the Greenland whale of the English whalemen, the Baleen ordinaire of the French whalemen, the Growlands wallfish of the Swedes. It is the whale which, for more than two centuries past, has been hunted by the Dutch and English in the Arctic seas. It is the whale which the American fishermen have long pursued in the Indian Ocean, on the Brazil banks, in the Norwest coast, and in various other parts of the world designated by them right whale cruising grounds. Some pretend to see a difference between the Greenland whale of the English and the right whale of the Americans, but they precisely agree in all their grand features nor has there yet been presented a single determinate fact upon which to ground a radical distinction. It is by endless subdivisions based upon the most inconclusive differences that some departments of natural history become so repellingly intricate. The right whale will elsewhere be treated of at some length with reference to elucidating the sperm whale. Book One, Folio, Chapter Three, Finback under this head I reckon a monster which, by the various names of Finback, Tall Spout, and Long John, has been seen almost in every sea, and is commonly the whale whose distant jet is so often descried by passengers crossing the Atlantic, in the New York packet tracks. In the length he attains, and in his baleen, the Finback resembles the right whale, but is of a less portly girth, and a lighter color, approaching to olive, his great lips present a cable-like aspect, formed by the intertwisting, slanting folds of large wrinkles. His grand distinguishing feature, the fin, from which he derives his name, is often a conspicuous object. This fin is some three or four feet long, growing vertically from the hinder part of the back, 
of an angular shape, and with a very sharp pointed end. Even if not the slightest other part of the creature be visible, this isolated fin will at times be seen plainly projecting from the surface. When the sea is moderately calm, and slightly marked with spherical ripples, and this gnomon-like fin stands up and casts shadows upon the wrinkled surface, it may well be supposed that the watery circle surrounding it somewhat resembles a dial, with its style and wavy hour lines graved on it. On that Ahaz dial the shadow often goes back. The finback is not gregarious. He seems a whale-hater, as some men are man-haters. Very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters, his straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic spear upon a barren plain, gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming as to defy all present pursuit from man, this leviathan seems the banished and unconquerable cane of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. From having the baleen in his mouth, the finback is sometimes included with the right whale among a theoretic species denominated whalebone whales, that is, whales with baleen. Of these so-called whalebone whales there would seem to be several varieties, most of which, however, are little known. Broad-nosed whales and beaked whales, pike-headed whales, bunched whales, underjawed whales, and rostrated whales are the fishermen's names for a few sorts. In connection with this appellative of whalebone whales, it is of great importance to mention that however such a nomenclature may be convenient in facilitating allusions to some kinds of whales, yet it is in vain to attempt a clear classification of the leviathan, founded upon either his baleen, or hump, or fin, or teeth, notwithstanding that those marked parts or features very obviously seem better adapted to afford the basis for a regular system of cetology than any other detached bodily distinctions which the whale in his kinds presents. How, then? The baleen, hump, back fin, and teeth these are things whose peculiarities are indiscriminately dispersed among all sorts of whales, without any regard to what may be the nature of their structure in other and more essential particulars. Thus the sperm whale and the humpback whale each has a hump, but there the similitude ceases. Then this same humpback whale and the Greenland whale, each of these has baleen, but there again the similitude ceases and it is just the same with the other parts above mentioned. In various sorts of whales they form such irregular combinations, or in the case of any one of them detached, such an irregular isolation, as utterly to defy all general methodization formed upon such a basis. On this rock every one of the whale naturalists has split. But it may possibly be conceived that in the internal parts of the whale, in his anatomy, there, at least, we shall be able to hit the right classification. Nay, what thing, for example, is there in the Greenland whale's anatomy more striking than his baleen? Yet we have seen that by his baleen it is impossible to correctly classify the Greenland whale. And if you descend into the bowels of the various leviathans, why, there you will not find distinctions a fiftieth part as available to the systematizer as those external ones already enumerated. What then remains? Nothing but to take hold of the whales bodily, in their entire liberal volume, and boldly sort them that way. And this is the bibliographical system here adopted, and it is the only one that can possibly succeed, for it alone is practicable. To proceed... Book 1, Folio, Chapter 4, Humpback. This whale is often seen on the northern American coast. He has been frequently captured there and towed into harbor. He has a great pack on him like a peddler, or you might call him the elephant and castle whale. At any rate, the popular name for him does not sufficiently distinguish him, since the sperm whale also has a hump, though a smaller one. His oil is not very valuable. He has baleen. He is the most gamesome and light-hearted of all whales, making more gay foam and white water generally 
than any other of them. Book One, Folio, Chapter Five, Razorback. Of this whale, little is known but his name. I have seen him at a distance off Cape Horn. Of a retiring nature, he eludes both hunters and philosophers. Though no coward, he has never yet shown any part of him but his back, which rises in a long, sharp ridge. Let him go. I know little more of him, and nor does anybody else. Book One, Folio, Chapter Six, Sulphur Bottom. Another retiring gentleman, with a brimstone belly, doubtless got by scraping along the Tartarian tiles in some of his profounder divings. He is seldom seen, at least I have never seen him, except in the remoter southern seas, and then always at too great a distance to study his countenance. He is never chased, he would run away with rope walks of line. Prodigies are told of him. Adieu, Sulphur Bottom, I can say nothing more that is true of ye, nor can the oldest Nantucketer. Thus ends Book One, Folio, and now begins Book Two, Octavo. Octavos. These embrace the whales of middling magnitude, among which present may be numbered 1. the Grampus, 2. the Blackfish, 3. the Narwhale, 4. the Thrasher, 5. the Killer. Footnote. Why this book of whales is not denominated the Quarto is very plain, because while the whales of this order, though smaller than those of the former order, nevertheless retain a proportionate likeness to them in figure, yet the bookbinder's quarto volume, in its dimensioned form, does not preserve the shape of the folio volume, but the octavo volume does. End of footnote. Book Two, Octavo, Chapter One, Grampus. Though this fish, whose loud sonorous breathing, or rather blowing, has furnished a proverb to landsmen, is so well known a denizen of the deep, yet he is not popularly classed among whales, but possessing all the grand distinctive features of the leviathan, most naturalists have recognized him for one. He is of moderate octavo size, varying from fifteen to twenty-five feet in length, and of corresponding dimensions round the waist. He swims in herds. He is never regularly hunted, though his oil is considerable in quantity and pretty good for light. By some fishermen his approach is regarded as premonitory of the advance of the great sperm whale. Book Two, Octavo, Chapter Two, Blackfish. I give the popular fishermen's names for all these fish, for generally they are best. Where any name happens to be vague or inexpressive, I shall say so and suggest another. I do so now, touching the blackfish, so called, because blackness is the rule among almost all whales. So call him the hyena whale, if you please. His voracity is well known, and from the circumstance that the inner angles of his lips are curved upwards, he carries an everlasting Mephistophelian grin on his face. This whale averages some sixteen or eighteen feet in length. He is found in almost all latitudes. He has a peculiar way of showing his dorsal hooked fin in swimming, which looks something like a Roman nose. When not more profitably employed, the sperm whale hunters sometimes capture the hyena whale to keep up the supply of cheap oil for domestic employment, as some frugal housekeepers in the absence of company and quite alone by themselves burn unsavory tallow instead of odorous wax. Though their blubber is very thin, some of these whales will yield you upwards of thirty gallons of oil. Book Two, Octavo, Chapter Three, Narwhale, that is, Nostril Whale. Another instance of a curiously named whale, so named, I suppose, from his peculiar horn being originally mistaken for a peaked nose. The creature is some sixteen feet in length, while its horn averages five feet, though some exceed ten and even attain to fifteen feet. Strictly speaking, this horn is but a lengthened tusk, growing out from the jaw in a line a little depressed from the horizontal. But it is only found on the sinister side, which has an ill effect, giving its owner something analogous to the aspect of a clumsy left-handed man. What precise purpose this ivory horn or lance answers, it would be hard to say. 
It does not seem to be used like the blade of the swordfish and billfish, though some sailors tell me that the narwhale employs it for a rake in turning over the bottom of the sea for food. Charlie Coffin said it was used for an ice piercer, for the narwhale, rising to the surface of the polar sea, and finding it sheeted with ice, thrusts his horn up and so breaks through. But you cannot prove either of these surmises to be correct. My own opinion is that however this one-sided horn may really be used by the narwhale, however that may be, it would certainly be very convenient to him for a folder in reading pamphlets. The narwhale I have heard called the tusked whale, the horned whale, and the unicorn whale. He is certainly a curious example of the unicornism to be found in almost every kingdom of animated nature. From certain cloistered old authors I have gathered that this same sea unicorn's horn was in ancient days regarded as the great antidote against poison, and as such preparations of it brought immense prices. It was also distilled to a volatile salts for fainting ladies, the same way that the horns of the male deer are manufactured into hartshorn. Originally it was in itself accounted an object of great curiosity. Blackletter tells me that Sir Martin Frobisher, on his return from that voyage, when Queen Bess did gallantly wave her jewelled hand to him from a window of Greenwich Palace, as his bold ship sailed down the Thames, quote, When Sir Martin returned from that voyage, saith Blackletter, on bended knees he presented to her highness a prodigious long horn of the narwhale, which for a long period after hung in the castle at Windsor, end quote. An Irish author avers that the Earl of Leicester, on bended knees, did likewise present to Her Highness another horn, pertaining to a land-beast of the unicorn nature. The narwhale has a very picturesque, leopard-like look, being of a milk-white ground color dotted with round and oblong spots of black. His oil is very superior, clean and fine, but there is little of it, and he is seldom hunted. He is mostly found in the circumpolar seas. Book two, octavo, chapter four, killer. Of this whale little is precisely known to the Nantucketer, and nothing at all to the professed naturalist. From what I have seen of him, at a distance, I should say he was about the bigness of a grampus. He is very savage, a sort of Fiji fish. He sometimes takes the great folio whales by the lip, and hangs there like a leech till the mighty brute is worried to death. The killer is never hunted. I never heard what sort of oil he has. Exception might be taken to the name bestowed upon this whale on the ground of its indistinctness. For we are all killers on land and on sea, Bonapartes and sharks included. Book Two, Octavo, Chapter Five, Thrasher this gentleman is famous for his tail, which he uses for a ferule in thrashing his foes. He mounts the folio whale's back, and as he swims, he works his passage by flogging him, as some schoolmasters get along in the world by a similar process. Still less is known of the thrasher than of the killer. Both are outlaws, even in the lawless seas. Thus ends Book Two, Octavo, and begins Book Three, Duodecimo. Duodecimos. These include the smaller whales. 1. The Huzza porpoise. 2. The Algerine porpoise. 3. The Mealy-mouthed porpoise. To those who have not chanced specifically to study the subject, it may possibly seem strange that fishes not commonly exceeding four or five feet should be marshaled among whales, a word which, in the popular sense, always conveys the idea of hugeness but the creatures set down above as duodecimos are infallibly whales, by the terms of my definition of what a whale is, i.e., a spouting fish with a horizontal tail. Book Three, Duodecimo, Chapter One, Huzza Porpoise. This is the common porpoise found almost all over the globe. The name is of my own bestowal, for there are more than one sort of porpoises, and something must be done to distinguish them. I call him thus because he always swims in hilarious shoals, which, upon the broad sea, keep tossing themselves to heaven like caps in a fourth of July crowd. Their appearance is generally hailed with delight by the mariner. 
full of fine spirits, they invariably come from the breezy billows to windward. They are the lads that always live before the wind. They are accounted a lucky omen. If you yourself can withstand three cheers at beholding these vivacious fish, then heaven help you. The spirit of godly gamesomeness is not in you. A well-fed, plump huzza porpoise will yield you one good gallon of good oil. But the fine and delicate fluid extracted from his jaws is exceedingly valuable. It is in request among jewelers and watchmakers. Sailors put it on their hones. Porpoise meat is good eating, you know. It may never have occurred to you that a porpoise spouts. Indeed, his spout is so small that it is not very readily discernible. But the next time you have a chance, watch him, and you will then see the great sperm whale himself in miniature. Book Three, Duodecimo, Chapter Two, Algerine Porpoise. A pirate. Very savage. He is only found, I think, in the Pacific. He is somewhat larger than the Huzza porpoise, but much of the same general make. Provoke him, and he will buckle to a shark. I have lowered for him many times, but never yet saw him captured. Book Three, Duodecimo, Chapter Three, Mealy Mouth Porpoise. The largest kind of porpoise, and only found in the Pacific, so far as it is known. The only English name by which he has hitherto been designated is that of the fishers, right whale porpoise, from the circumstance that he is chiefly found in the vicinity of that folio. In shape he differs in some degree from the huzza porpoise, being of a less rotund and jolly girth. Indeed, he is of quite a neat and gentlemanlike figure. He has no fins on his back, most other porpoises have. He has a lovely tail, and sentimental Indian eyes of a hazel hue. But his mealy mouth spoils all. Though his entire back, down to his side fins, is of a deep sable, yet a boundary line, distinct as the mark in a ship's hull, called the bright waist, that line streaks him from stem to stern, with two separate colors, black above and white below. The white comprises part of his head and the whole of his mouth, which makes him look as if he had just escaped from a felonious visit to a meal bag, a most mean and mealy aspect. His oil is much like that of the common porpoise. Beyond the duodecimo, this system does not proceed, inasmuch as the porpoise is the smallest of the whales. Above you have all the leviathans of note, but there are a rabble of uncertain, fugitive, half-fabulous whales, which, as an American whaleman, I know by reputation, but not personally. I shall enumerate them by their forecastle appellations, for possibly such a list may be valuable to future investigators, who may complete what I have here but begun. If any of the following whales shall hereafter be caught and marked, then he can readily be incorporated into this system, according to his folio, octavo, or duodecimo magnitude. The bottlenose whale, the junk whale, the pudding-headed whale, the cape whale, the leading whale, the cannon whale, the scrag whale, the coppered whale, the elephant whale, the iceberg whale, the quag whale, the blue whale, etc. From Icelandic, Dutch, and Old English authorities, there might be quoted other lists of uncertain whales, blessed with all manner of uncouth names, but I omit them as altogether obsolete, and can hardly help suspecting them for mere sounds full of leviathanism, but signifying nothing. Finally, it was stated at the outset that this system would not be here and at once perfected, you cannot but plainly see that I have kept my word, but I now leave my cetological system standing thus unfinished, even as the great cathedral of Cologne was left, with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower. For small erections may be finished by their first architects. Grand ones, true ones, ever leave the copestone to posterity. God keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is but a draft, nay, but the draft of a draft. Oh, time, strength, cash, and patience. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 The Speck Cinder Concerning the officers of the whale craft, 
this seems as good a place as any to set down a little domestic peculiarity on shipboard arising from the existence of the harpooner class of officers a class unknown of course in any other marine than the whale fleet the large importance attached to the harpooner's vocation is evinced by the fact that originally in the old dutch fishery two centuries or more ago the command of a whale-ship was not wholly lodged in the person now called the captain, but was divided between him and an officer called the specksender. Literally, this word means fat-cutter. Usage, however, in time made it equivalent to chief harpooner. In those days, the captain's authority was restricted to the navigation and general management of the vessel— while over the whale-hunting department and all its concerns, the specksender or chief harpooner reigned supreme. In the British Greenland fishery, under the corrupted title of specksioneer, this old Dutch official is still retained, but his former dignity is sadly abridged. At present he ranks simply as senior harpooner, and as such is but one of the captain's more inferior subalterns. Nevertheless, as upon good conduct of the harpooners the success of a whaling voyage largely depends, and since in the American fishery he is not only an important officer in the boat, but under certain circumstances, night watches on a whaling ground, the command of the ship's deck is also his, therefore the grand political maxim of the sea demands that he should nominally live apart from the men before the mast, and be in some way distinguished as their professional superior, though always by them familiarly regarded as their social equal. Now the grand distinction drawn between officer and man at sea is this, the first lives aft, the last forward. Hence, in whale-ships and merchantmen alike, the mates have their quarters with the captain, and so too, in most of the American whalers, the harpooners are lodged in the after part of the ship, that is to say, they take their meals in the captain's cabin, and sleep in a place indirectly communicating with it. Though the long period of a southern whaling voyage, by far the longest of all voyages now or ever made by man, the peculiar perils of it, and the community of interest prevailing among a company, all of whom, high or low, depend for their profits, not upon fixed wages, but upon their common luck, together with their common vigilance, intrepidity, and hard work, though all these things do, in some cases, tend to beget a less rigorous discipline than in merchantmen generally, yet never mind how much like an old Mesopotamian family these whalemen may, in some primitive instances, live together. For all that, the punctilious externals, at least, of the quarter-deck are seldom materially relaxed, and in no instance done away. Indeed, many are the Nantucket ships in which you will see the skipper parading his quarter-deck with an elated grandeur not surpassed in any military navy, nay, extorting almost as much outward homage as if he wore the imperial purple, not the shabbiest of pilot-cloth. And though of all men the moody captain of the Pequod was the least given to that sort of shallowest assumption, and though the only homage he ever exacted was implicit, instantaneous obedience, though he required no man to remove the shoes from his feet ere stepping upon the quarter-deck, and though there were times when, owing to peculiar circumstances connected with events hereafter to be detailed, he addressed them in unusual terms, whether of condescension or in terrorem or otherwise, yet even Captain Ahab was by no means unobservant of the paramount forms and usages of the sea. Nor, perhaps, will it fail to be eventually perceived that behind those forms and usages, as it were, he sometimes masked himself, incidentally making use of them for other and more private ends than they were legitimately intended to subserve. That certain sultanism of his brain which had otherwise in good degree remained unmanifested. Through those forms that same sultanism became incarnate in an irresistible dictatorship. For be a man's intellectual superiority what it will, it can never assume the practical available supremacy over other men without the aid of some sort of external arts and entrenchments, 
always in themselves more or less paltry and base. This it is that forever keeps God's true princes of the empire from the world's hustings, and leaves the highest honors that this heir can give to those men who become famous more through their infinite inferiority to the choice hidden handful of the divine inert than through their undoubted superiority over the dead level of the mass. Such large virtue lurks in these small things when extreme political superstitions invest them, that in some royal instances even to idiot imbecility they have imparted potency. But when, as in the case of Nicholas the Tsar, the ringed crown of geographical empire encircles an imperial brain, then the plebeian herds crouch abased before the tremendous centralization. Nor will the tragic dramatist who would depict moral indomitableness in its fullest sweep and direct swing ever forget a hint incidentally so important in his art as the one now alluded to. But Ahab, my captain, still moves before me in all his Nantucket grimness and shagginess, and in this episode touching emperors and kings, I must not conceal that I have only to do with a poor old whale-hunter like him. And, therefore, all outward majestical trappings and housings are denied me. O oh, Ahab, what shall be grand in thee, it must needs be plucked at from the skies, and dived for in the deep, and featured in the unbodied air. Chapter 34 The Cabin Table It is noon, and Doughboy, the steward, thrusting his pale loaf-of-bread face from the cabin scuttle, announces dinner to his lord and master, who, sitting in the lee quarter-boat, has just been taking an observation of the sun, and is now mutely reckoning the latitude on the smooth medallion-shaped tablet reserved for that daily purpose on the upper part of his ivory leg. From his complete inattention to the tidings, you would think that moody Ahab had not heard his menial. But presently, catching hold of the mizzen shrouds, he swings himself to the deck, and in an even, unexhilarated voice, saying, Dinner, Mr. Starbuck, disappears into the cabin. When the last echo of his sultan's step has died away, and Starbuck, the first emir, has every reason to suppose that he is seated, then Starbuck rouses from his quietude, takes a few turns along the planks, and after a grave peep into the binnacle, says, with some touch of pleasantness, Dinner, Mr. Stubb, and descends the scuttle. The second emir lounges about the rigging a while, and then, slightly shaking the main brace to see whether it will be all right with that important rope, he likewise takes up the old burden, and, with a rapid, Dinner, Mr. Flask, follows after his predecessors. But the third emir, now seeing himself all alone on the quarter-deck, seems to feel relieved from some curious restraint, for tipping all sorts of knowing winks in all sorts of directions, and kicking off his shoes, he strikes into a sharp but noiseless squall of a hornpipe right over the Grand Turk's head, and then, by a dexterous slight, pitching his cap up into the mizzen-top for a shelf, he goes down rollicking, so far at least as he remains visible from the deck, reversing all other processions by bringing up the rear with music. But ere stepping into the cabin doorway below, he pauses, ships a new face altogether, and then, independent, hilarious little flask, enters King Ahab's presence, in the character of Abjectus, or the slave. It is not the least among these strange things, bred by the intense artificialness of sea usages, that while in the open air of the deck some officers will, upon provocation, bear themselves boldly and defyingly enough towards their commander, yet ten to one let those very officers the next moment go down to their customary dinner in that same commander's cabin, and straightway their inoffensive, not to say deprecatory and humble air towards him as he sits at the head of the table, this is marvellous, sometimes most comical. Wherefore this difference? A problem? Perhaps not. To have been Belshazzar, king of Babylon, and to have been Belshazzar not haughtily but courteously, therein certainly must have been some touch of mundane grandeur. 
But he who, in the rightly regal and intelligent spirit, presides over his own private dinner table of invited guests, that man's unchallenged power and dominion of individual influence for a time, that man's royalty of state, transcends Belshazzar's, for Belshazzar was not the greatest. He who has but once dined his friends has tasted what it is to be Caesar. It is a witchery of social czarship which there is no withstanding. Now, if to this consideration you superadd the official supremacy of a shipmaster, then by inference you will derive the cause of that peculiarity of sea life just mentioned. Over his ivory inlaid table, Ahab presided like a mute, maned sea lion on the white coral beach, surrounded by his warlike but still deferential cubs. In his own proper turn, each officer waited to be served. They were as little children before Ahab, and yet in Ahab there seemed not to lurk the smallest social arrogance. With one mind, their intent eyes all fastened upon the old man's knife, as he carved the chief dish before him. I do not suppose that for the world they would have profaned that moment with the slightest observation, even upon so neutral a topic as the weather. No. And when reaching out his knife and fork, between which the slice of beef was locked, Ahab thereby motioned Starbuck's plate towards him, the mate received his meat as though receiving alms, and cut it tenderly, and a little started if, perchance, the knife grazed against the plate, and chewed it noiselessly, and swallowed it not without circumspection. For, like the coronation banquet at Frankfurt, where the German emperor profoundly dines with the seven imperial electors, so these cabin meals were somehow solemn meals, eaten in awful silence, and yet, at table, old Ahab forbade not conversation, only he himself was dumb. What a relief it was to choking stub when a rat made a sudden racket in the hold below. And poor little Flask, he was the youngest son, and little boy of this weary family party. His were the shin-bones of the saline beef, his would have been the drumsticks, for Flask to have presumed to help himself, this must have seemed to him tantamount to larceny in the first degree. Had he helped himself at that table, doubtless never more would he have been able to hold his head up in this honest world. Nevertheless, strange to say, Ahab never forbade him. And had Flask helped himself, the chances were Ahab had never so much as noticed it. Least of all did Flask presume to help himself to butter. Whether he thought the owners of the ship denied it to him, on account of its clotting his clear, sunny complexion, or whether he deemed that on so long a voyage in such marketless waters butter was at a premium, and therefore was not for him a subaltern, however it was, Flask, alas, was a butterless man. Another thing. Flask was the last person down at dinner, and Flask is the first man up. Consider— for hereby Flask's dinner was badly jammed in point of time. Starbuck and Stubb both had the start of him, and yet they also have the privilege of lounging in the rear. If Stubb even, who is but a peg higher than Flask, happens to have but a small appetite, and soon shows symptoms of concluding his repast, then Flask must bestir himself. He will not get more than three mouthfuls that day." for it is against holy usage for Stubb to precede Flask to the deck. Therefore it was that Flask once admitted in private that ever since he had arisen to the dignity of an officer, from that moment he had never known what it was to be otherwise than hungry, more or less. For what he ate did not so much relieve his hunger as keep it immortal in him. Peace and satisfaction, thought Flask, have forever departed from my stomach. I am an officer, but how I wish I could fish a bit of old-fashioned beef in the forecastle as I used to when I was before the mast. There's the fruits of promotion now, there's the vanity of glory, there's the insanity of life. Besides, if it were so that any mere sailor of the Pequod had a grudge against Flask, in Flask's official capacity, all that sailor had to do in order to obtain ample vengeance was to go aft at dinner-time and get a peep at Flask through the cabin skylight, sitting silly and dumbfounded before awful Ahab. Now Ahab and his three mates formed what may be called the first table in the Pequod's cabin. 
After their departure, taking place in inverted order to their arrival, the canvas cloth was cleared, or rather was restored to some hurried order by the pallid steward, and then the three harpooners were bidden to the feast, they being its residuary legatees. They made a sort of temporary servants' hall of the high and mighty cabin. In strange contrast to the hardly tolerable constraint and nameless invisible domineerings of the captain's table was the entire carefree license and ease, the almost frantic democracy of those inferior fellows, the harpooners, while their masters, the mates, seemed afraid of the sound of the hinges of their own jaws, the harpooners chewed their food with such a relish that there was a report to it. They dined like lords. They filled their bellies like Indian ships all day loading with spices. Such portentous appetites had Queequeg and Tashtego that to fill out the vacancies made by the previous repast, often the pale doughboy was fain to bring on a great baron of salt junk seemingly quarried out of the solid ox. And if he were not lively about it, if he did not go with a nimble hop, skip, and a jump, then Tashtego had an ungentlemanly way of accelerating him by darting a fork at his back, harpoon-wise. And once Dagoo, seized with a sudden humor, assisted Doughboy's memory by snatching him up bodily, and thrusting his head into a great empty wooden trencher, while Tashtego, knife in hand, began laying out the circle preliminary to scalping him. He was naturally a very nervous, shuddering sort of little fellow, this bread-faced steward, the progeny of a bankrupt baker and a hospital nurse. And what with the standing spectacle of the black, terrific Ahab, and the periodical, tumultuous visitations of these three savages, Doughboy's whole life was one continual lip-quiver. Commonly, after seeing the harpooners furnished with all things they demanded, he would escape from their clutches into his little pantry adjoining, and fearfully peep out at them through the blinds of its door till all was over. It was a sight to see Queequeg seated over against Tashtego, opposing his filed teeth to the Indians. Crosswise to them, Dagoo seated on the floor, for a bench would have brought his hearse-plumed head to the low car lines, at every motion of his colossal limbs making the low cabin framework to shake, as when an African elephant goes passenger in a ship. But for all this, the great negro was wonderfully abstemious, not to say dainty, it seemed hardly possible that by such comparatively small mouthfuls he could keep up the vitality diffused through so broad, baronial, and superb a person. But, doubtless, this noble savage fed strong and drank deep of the abounding element of air, and through his dilated nostrils snuffed in the sublime life of the worlds, not by beef or by bread are giants made or nourished. But Queequeg, he had a mortal, barbaric smack of the lip in eating, an ugly sound enough, so much so that the trembling doughboy almost looked to see whether any marks of teeth lurked in his own lean arms. And when he would hear Tashtego singing out for him to produce himself, that his bones might be picked, the simple-witted steward all but shattered the crockery hanging round him in the pantry by his sudden fits of the palsy, nor did the whetstone which the harpooners carried in their pockets for their lances and other weapons, and with which whetstones at dinner they would ostentatiously sharpen their knives, that grating sound did not at all tend to tranquilize poor Doughboy. How could he forget that, in his island days, Queequeg, for one, must certainly have been guilty of some murderous convivial indiscretions? Alas, Doughboy, hard fares the white waiter who waits upon cannibals, not a napkin should he carry on his arm but a buckler. In good time, though, to his great delight, the three salt-sea warriors would rise and depart, to his credulous, fable-mongering ears, all their martial bones jingling in them at every step, like Moorish scimitars in scabbards. But, though these barbarians dined in the cabin, and nominally lived there, still, being anything but sedentary in their habits, they were scarcely ever in it except at meal-times, and just before sleeping-time when they passed through it to their own peculiar quarters. 
In this one matter, Ahab seemed no exception to most American whale captains, who, as a set, rather inclined to the opinion that by rights the ship's cabin belongs to them, and that it is by courtesy alone that anybody else is at any time permitted there. So that in real truth the mates and harpooners of the Pequod might more properly be said to have lived out of the cabin than in it. For when they did enter it, it was something as a street door enters a house, turning inwards for a moment only to be turned out the next, and as a permanent thing residing in the open air. Nor did they lose much hereby. In the cabin was no companionship. Socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in the census of Christendom, he was still alien to it. He lived in the world as the last of the grizzly bears lived in settled Missouri. And as when spring and summer had departed that wild Logan of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws, so in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul, shut up in the caved trunk of his body, there fed upon the sullen paws of its gloom. CHAPTER Thirty Five, THE MASTHEAD It was during the more pleasant weather that in due rotation with the other seamen my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port, even though she may have fifteen thousand miles and more to sail ere reaching her proper cruising ground and if, after a three, four, or five years' voyage, she is drawing nigh home with anything empty in her, say an empty vial even, then her mastheads are kept manned to the last, and not till her skysail poles sail in amongst the spires of the port does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one whale more. Now, as this business of standing mastheads, ashore or afloat, is a very ancient and interesting one, let us in some measure expatiate here. I take it that the earliest standers of mastheads were the old Egyptians, because in all my researches I find none prior to them. For though their progenitors, the builders of Babel, must doubtless by their tower have intended to rear the loftiest masthead in all Asia or Africa either, yet, ere the final truck was put to it, as that great stone mast of theirs may be said to have gone by the board, in the dread gale of God's wrath, therefore we cannot give these Babel builders priority over the Egyptians, and that the Egyptians were a nation of masthead standers is an assertion based upon the general belief among archaeologists that the first pyramids were founded for astronomical purposes, a theory singularly supported by the peculiar stair-like formation of all four sides of those edifices, whereby, with prodigious long upliftings of their legs, those old astronomers were wont to mount to the apex, and sing out for new stars, even as the lookouts of a modern ship sing out for a sail, or a whale just bearing in sight. In St. Stylites, the famous Christian hermit of old times, who built him a lofty stone pillar in the desert, and spent the whole latter portion of his life on its summit, hoisting his food from the ground with a tackle, in him we have a remarkable instance of a dauntless stander of mastheads, who was not to be driven from his place by fogs or frosts, rain, hail, or sleet, but valiantly facing everything out to the last, literally died at his post. Of modern standers of mastheads we have but a lifeless set, mere stone, iron, and bronze men, who, though well capable of facing out a stiff gale, are entirely incompetent to the business of singing out upon discovering any strange sight. There is Napoleon, who, upon the top of the column of Vendôme, stands with arms folded, some one hundred and fifty feet in the air, careless now who rules the decks below, whether Louis Philippe, Louis Blanc, or Louis the Devil. Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering mainmast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. Admiral Nelson, also, on a capstan of gunmetal, stands his masthead in Trafalgar Square, and ever, when most obscured by that London smoke, token is yet given that a hidden hero is there for where there is smoke there must be fire. 
But neither Great Washington, nor Napoleon, nor Nelson will answer a single hail from below, however madly invoked, to befriend by their counsels the distracted decks upon which they gaze, however it may be surmised that their spirits penetrate through the thick haze of the future, and descry what shoals and what rocks must be shunned. It may seem unwarrantable to couple in any respect the masthead standards of the land with those of the sea, but that in truth it is not so, is plainly evinced by an item for which Obed Macy, the sole historian of Nantucket, stands accountable. The worthy Obed tells us that in the early times of the whale fishery, ere ships were regularly launched in pursuit of the game, the people of that island erected lofty spars along the sea coast, to which the lookouts ascended by means of nailed cleats, something as fowls go upstairs in a hen house. A few years ago this same plan was adopted by the Bay Whalemen of New Zealand, who, upon descrying the game, gave notice to the ready-manned boats nigh the beach. But this custom has now become obsolete. Turn we, then, to the one proper masthead, that of a whale-ship at sea. The three mastheads are kept manned from sunrise to sunset, the seamen taking their regular turns, as at the helm, and relieving each other every two hours. In the serene weather of the tropics it is exceedingly pleasant, the masthead. Nay, to a dreamy, meditative man it is delightful. There you stand, a hundred feet above the silent decks, striding along the deep, as if the mass were gigantic stilts, while beneath you, and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous Colossus at Old Rhodes. There you stand, lost in the infinite series of the sea, with nothing ruffled but the waves. The tranced ship indolently rolls, the drowsy trade winds blow, everything resolves you into a languor. For the most part, in this tropic whaling life, the sublime uneventfulness invests you. You hear no news, read no gazettes, extras with startling accounts of commonplaces never delude you into unnecessary excitements, you hear of no domestic afflictions, bankrupt securities, fall of stocks, are never troubled with the thought of what you shall have for dinner, for all your meals for three years and more are snugly stowed in casks, and your bill of fare is immutable. In one of those southern whalemen, on a long three or four years' voyage, as often happens, the sum of the various hours you spend at the masthead would amount to several entire months, and it is much to be deplored that the place to which you devote so considerable a portion of the whole term of your natural life should be so sadly destitute of anything approaching to a cosy inhabitiveness, or adapted to breed a comfortable localness of feeling, such as pertains to a bed, a hammock, a hearse, a sentry-box, a pulpit, a coach, or any other of those small and snug contrivances in which men temporarily isolate themselves. Your most usual point of perch is the head of the tagallant mast where you stand upon two thin parallel sticks, almost peculiar to whalemen, called the tagallant cross-trees. Here, tossed about by the sea, the beginner feels about as cosy as he would standing on a bull's horns. To be sure, in cold weather you may carry your house aloft with you in the shape of a watch-coat, but properly speaking the thickest watch-coat is no more of a house than the unclad body, for as the soul is glued inside of its fleshy tabernacle, and cannot freely move about in it, nor even move out of it without running great risk of perishing, like an ignorant pilgrim crossing the snowy Alps in winter, so a watch-coat is not so much of a house as it is a mere envelope, or additional skin encasing you. You cannot put a shelf or chest of drawers in your body, and no more can you make a convenient closet of your watch-coat. Concerning all this, it is much to be deplored that the mastheads of a southern whale-ship are unprovided with those enviable little tents or pulpits called crow's nests, in which the lookouts of a Greenland whaler are protected from the inclement weather of the frozen seas. In the fireside narrative of Captain Sleet, entitled A Voyage Among the Icebergs in Quest of the Greenland Whale, and incidentally for the rediscovery of the lost Icelandic colonies of old Greenland, 
In this admirable volume, all standers of mastheads are furnished with a charmingly circumstantial account of the then recently invented crow's nest of the glacier, which was the name of Captain Sleet's good craft. He called it the Sleet's Crow's Nest in honor of himself, he being the original inventor and patentee, and free from all ridiculous false delicacy, and holding that if we call our own children after our own names, we fathers being the original inventors and patentees, so likewise we should denominate after ourselves any other apparatus we may beget. In shape, the Sleet's Crow's Nest is something like a large tierce or pipe. It is open above, however, where it is furnished with a movable side screen to keep to windward of your head in a hard gale. Being fixed on the summit of the mast, you ascend into it through a little trap hatch in the bottom. On the after side, or the side next to the stern of the ship, is a comfortable seat with a locker underneath for umbrellas, comforters, and coats. In front is a leather rack in which to keep your speaking trumpet, pipe, telescope, and other nautical conveniences. When Captain Sleet in person stood his masthead in this crow's nest of his, he tells us that he always had a rifle with him, also fixed in the rack, together with a powder flask and shot, for the purpose of popping off the stray narwhals or vagrant sea unicorns infesting those waters, for you cannot successfully shoot at them from the deck owing to the resistance of the water, but to shoot down upon them is a very different thing. Now, it was plainly a labor of love for Captain Sleet to describe, as he does, all the little detailed conveniences of his crow's nest, but though he so enlarges upon many of these, and though he treats us to a very scientific account of his experiments in this crow's nest, with a small compass he kept there for the purpose of counteracting the errors resulting from what is called the local attraction of all binnacle magnets, an error ascribable to the horizontal vicinity of the iron in the ship's planks, and in the glacier's case, perhaps, to there having been so many broken-down blacksmiths among her crew, I say that though the captain is very discreet and scientific here, yet for all his learned binnacle deviations, azimuth compass observations, and approximate errors, he knows very well, Captain Sleet, that he was not so much immersed in those profound magnetic meditations as to fail being attracted occasionally towards that well-replenished little case-bottle so nicely tucked in on one side of his crow's nest within easy reach of his hand. Though upon the whole I greatly admire and even love the brave, the honest, and learned captain, yet I take it very ill of him that he should so utterly ignore that case-bottle, seeing what a faithful friend and comforter it must have been, while with mittened fingers and hooded head he was studying the mathematics aloft there in that bird's nest within three or four perches of the pole. But if we southern whale-fishers are not so snugly housed aloft as Captain Sleet and his Greenlandmen were, Yet that disadvantage is greatly counterbalanced by the widely contrasting serenity of those seductive seas in which we south fishers mostly float. For one, I used to lounge up in the rigging very leisurely, resting in the top to have a chat with Queequeg, or any one else off duty whom I might find there. Then, ascending a little way further, and throwing a lazy leg over the topsail yard, take a preliminary view of the watery pastures and so at last mount to my ultimate destination. Let me make a clean breast of it here, and frankly admit that I kept but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving in me, how could I, being left completely to myself, at such a thought-engendering altitude, how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale-ships' standing orders, keep your weather eye open, and sing out every time? And let me in this place movingly admonish you, you shipowners of Nantucket, beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with lean brow and hollow eye, given to unseasonable meditativeness, and who offers to ship with the Phaedon instead of Bowditch in his head. Beware of such a one, I say. Your whales must be seen before they can be killed, and this sunken-eyed young Platonist will tow you ten wakes round the world, and never make you one pint of sperm the richer. Nor are these monitions at all unneeded. For, nowadays, the whale-fishery furnishes an asylum for many romantic, melancholy, and absent-minded young men, 
disgusted with the carking cares of earth, and seeking sentiment in tar and blubber. Child Harold not infrequently perches himself upon the masthead of some luckless, disappointed whale-ship, and in moody phrase ejaculates, Roll on, thou deep, dark blue ocean, roll! Ten thousand blubber-hunters sweep over thee in vain. Very often do the captains of such ships take those absent-minded young philosophers to task, upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so hopelessly lost to all honourable ambition, as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But all in vain. Those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect, they are short-sighted. What use, then, to strain the visual nerve? They have left their opera-glasses at home. "'Why, thou monkey,' said a harpooner to one of these lads, "'we've been cruising now hard upon three years, and thou hast not raised a whale yet. Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up here.' Perhaps they were. Or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie, is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts, that at last he loses his identity, takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep, blue, bottomless soul pervading mankind and nature, and every strange, half-seen, gliding, beautiful thing that eludes him, every dimly discovered, uprising fin of some undiscernible form seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. In this enchanted mood thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space like Crammer's sprinkled pantheistic ashes, forming at last a part of every shore the round globe over." There is no life in thee now except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her borrowed from the sea, by the sea from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on you, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. Over Descartian vortices you hover, and perhaps at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half-throttled shriek you drop through that transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, you pantheists. End of chapters 33 to 35 Chapters 36 to 40 Chapter 36 The Quarter Deck Enter Ahab, then all. It was not a great while after the affair of the pipe, that one morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There most sea captains usually walk at that hour as country gentlemen, after the same meal take a few turns in the garden. Soon his steady, ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he paced his old rounds, upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented, like geological stones, with the peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon that ribbed and dented brow, there also you would see still stranger footprints, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. But on the occasion in question those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And so full of his thought was Ahab that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see that thought turn in him as he turned, and pace in him as he paced, so completely possessing him indeed that it all but seems the inward mould of every outer movement. Do you mark him, Flask? whispered Stubb. The chick that's in him pecks the shell. Twill soon be out. The hours wore on. Ahab now shut up within his cabin, anon pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. 
It drew near the close of day. Suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. Sir, said the mate, astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Masthead's there. Come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks, and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint, and, as though not a soul were nigh him, resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half-slouched hat he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men, till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, "'What do you do when you see a whale, men?' "'Sing out for him,' was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of clubbed voices. "'Good!' cried Ahab, with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. "'And what do you do next, men?' "'Lower away, and after him.' "'And what tune is it you pull to, men?' "'A dead whale or a stove-boat.' More and more strangely and fiercely, glad and approving, grew the countenance of the old man at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marvelling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. But they were all eagerness again, as Ahab, now half revolving in his pivot-hole, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them thus. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye, do you see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun. It is a sixteen-dollar piece, men. Do you see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. While the mate was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster, and without using any words was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced towards the mainmast with the hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed whale, with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever of ye raises me that white-headed whale, with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of ye raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. "'It's a white whale, I say,' resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top maul. "'A white whale. Skin your eyes for him, men. Look sharp, for white water. If you see but a bubble, sing out!' All this while Tashtego, Dagoo, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest, and at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw, they had started as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. "'Captain Ahab,' said Tashtego, "'that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick.' "'Moby Dick!' shouted Ahab. "'Do you know the white whale, then, Tash?' "'Does he fantail a little curious, sir, before he goes down?' said the gay-header, deliberately. "'And he has a curious spout, too,' said Dagoo. "'Very bushy, even for a parmacetti. "'And mighty quick, Captain Ahab?' "'And he have one, two, three, oh! "'Good many iron in him hide, too, Captain. 
cried Queequeg disjointedly. "'All twisky tea, uh, be twisk like him, him!' faltering hard for a word, and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle. "'Like him, him!' "'Corkscrew!' cried Ahab. "'Aye, Queequeg, the harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him. "'Aye, Dagu, his spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat.' and white as a pile of our Nantucket wool after the great annual sheep-shearing. Aye, Tashtego, and he fantails like a split jib in a squall. Death and devils, men, it is Moby Dick you have seen. Moby Dick! Moby Dick! Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, who, with stub and flask, had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought, which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg. Who told thee that? cried Ahab, then pausing. Ay, Starbuck, ay, my hearties, all around. It was Moby Dick that dismasted me. Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. Ay, ay! he shouted with a terrific, loud, animal sob, like that of a heart-stricken moose. Ay, ay! It was that accursed white whale that razied me, made a poor pegging lubber of me forever and a day. Then, tossing both arms with measureless imprecations, he shouted out, Ay, ay! And I'll chase him round good hope and round the horn, and round the Norway maelstrom, and round perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what ye have shipped for, men, to chase that white whale on both sides of land, and over all sides of the earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave." "'Aye, aye!' shouted the harpooners and the seamen, running closer to the excited old man. "'A sharp eye for the white whale! A sharp lance for Moby Dick!' "'God bless ye!' he seemed to half sob and half shout. "'God bless ye, men! Steward, go draw the great measure of grog! "'But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck? Wilt thou not chase the white whale?' Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his crooked jaw, and for the jaws of death, too, Captain Ahab, if it fairly come in the way of the business we follow. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee, even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market! Hoot! <laughs> But come closer, Starbuck. Thou requirest a little lower layer. If money's to be the measurer, man, and the accountants have computed their great counting-house the globe by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest, whispered Stubb. What's that for? Methinks it rings most vast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the mouldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask! How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me the white whale is that wall shoved near to me, Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me, 
I see in him outrageous strength, but with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent, or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then I could do the other, since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master man is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eye, more intolerable than fiend's glarings as a doltish stare. So, so, thou reddenest and palest, my heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat, that thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look, see yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun. The pagan leopards, the unwrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek and give no reason for the torrid life they feel. The crew, man, the crew, are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See, Stubb, he laughs. See, yonder Chilean, he snorts to think of it. Stand up amidst the general hurricane, thy one-tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis but to help strike a fin. No wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then, the best lance out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back, when every foremast hand has clutched a whetstone. Ah, constraining seize thee, I see. The billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak. Aye, aye. Thy silence, then, that voices thee. Aside. Something shot from my dilated nostrils. He has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine. Cannot oppose me now without rebellion. God keep me. Keep us all, murmured Starbuck lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the mass, as for a moment their hearts sank in. For again Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life, the subterranean laugh died away, the winds blew on, the sails filled out, the ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings, why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye predictions than warnings, you shadows, yet not so much predictions from without as verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities of our being, these still drive us on. The measure! The measure! cried Ahab. Receiving the brimming pewter, and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then, ranging them before him near the capstan, with their harpoons in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances, and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group, he stood for an instant searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves meet the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison, but, alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. "'Drink and pass!' he cried, handing the heavy charged flagon to this nearest seaman. "'The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round! Short draughts, long swallows, men, tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye, forks out at the serpent's snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me! 
here's a hollow. <laughs> Men, you seem the years, so brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered you round this capstan, and ye mates, flank me with your lances, and ye harpooners, stand there with your irons, and you stout mariners, ring me in, that I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O oh, men, you will yet see that, ha, boy, come back, bad pennies come not sooner, hand it me. Why, now this pewter had run brimming again, wert not thou St. Vitus's imp. Away, thou ague! Advance, ye mates, cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with extended arm, he grasped the three level radiating lances at their cross centers, while so doing suddenly and nervously twitched them. Meanwhile, glancing intently from Starbuck to Stubb, from Stubb to Flask, it seemed as though by some nameless interior volition he would fain have shocked into them the same fiery emotion accumulated within the laden jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stubb and Flask looked sideways from him. The honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. In vain, cried Ahab, but maybe tis well. For did ye three but once take the full-forced shock, then mine own electric thing, that perhaps had expired from out me. Perchance, too, it would have dropped ye dead. Perchance ye need it not. Down, lances! And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three cup-bearers to my three pagan kinsmen there. Yon three most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners, disdain the task? What, when the great Pope washes the feet of beggars, using his tiara for ewer? Oh, my sweet cardinals, your own condescension, that shall bend ye to it. I do not order ye, ye will it. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood, with the detached iron part of their harpoons some three feet long, held barbs up before him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Cant them, cant them over. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so, now ye cup-bearers advance. The irons, take them, hold them while I fill. Forthwith. Slowly going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now three to three ye stand. Commend the murderous chalices. Bestow them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha! Starbuck! But the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners! Drink and swear, ye men that man the deathful whale-boat's bow. Death to Moby Dick! God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death! The long, barbed steel goblets were lifted, and to cries and maledictions against the white whale, the spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled, and turned and shivered. Once more, and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew, when, waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed, and Ahab retired within his cabin. Chapter 37 Sunset The Cabin, by the stern windows, Ahab sitting alone and gazing out. I leave a white and turbid wake, pale waters, paler cheeks where'er I sail. The envious billows sidelong swell to whelm my track. Let them. But first I pass. Yonder, by the ever-brimming goblet's rim, the warm waves blush like wine. The gold brow plums the blue. The diver sun, slow dive from noon, goes down. My soul mounts up. She wearies with her endless hill. Is then the crown too heavy that I wear, this iron crown of Lombardy? 
yet it is bright with many a gem. I, the wearer, see not its far flashings, but darkly feel that I wear that that dazzlingly confounds. Tis iron, that I know, not gold. Tis split, too, that I feel. The jagged edge galls me so. My brain seems to beat against the solid metal. I steel skull mine, the sort that needs no helmet from the most brain-battering fight. Dry heat upon my brow. Oh, time was when as the sunrise nobly spurred me, so the sunset soothed. No more. This lovely light, it lights not me. All loveliness is anguish to me, since I can ne'er enjoy. Gifted with the high perception, I lack the low enjoying power. Damned most subtly and most malignantly. Damned in the midst of paradise. Good night. Good night. Waving his hand, he moves from the window. It was not so hard a task. I thought to find one stubborn at the least, but my one cogged circle fits into all their various wheels, and they revolve. Or, if you will, like so many ant hills of powder, they all stand before me, and I their match. Oh, hard, that to fire others the match itself must needs be wasting. What I've dared I've willed, and what I've willed I'll do. They think me mad. Starbuck does. But I'm demoniac. I am madness maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Now, then, be the prophet and the fulfiller one. That's more than ye, ye great gods, ever were. I laugh and hoot at ye, ye cricket players, ye pugilists, ye deaf burks and blinded bendigos. I will not say, as schoolboys do to bullies, take someone of your own size, don't pummel me. No. You've knocked me down, and I am up again, but ye have run and hidden. Come forth from behind your cotton bags. I have no long gun to reach ye. Come, Ahab's compliments to ye. Come and see if ye can swerve me. Swerve me? You cannot swerve me, else ye swerve yourselves. Man has ye there. Swerve me? The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, whereon my soul is grooved to run. Over unsounded gorges, through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents' beds, unerringly I rush. Not an obstacle, not an angle to the iron way. Chapter 38 Dusk By the Mainmast, Starbuck leaning against it. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned, and by a madman. Insufferable sting that sanity should ground arms on such a field. But he drilled deep down and blasted all my reason out of me. I think I see his impious end, but feel that I must help him to it. Will I, nil I, the ineffable thing has tied me to him, toes me with a cable I have no knife to cut. Horrible old man! Who's over him, he cries. Aye, he would be a Democrat to all above. Look how he lords it over all below. Oh, I plainly see my miserable office, to obey rebelling, and worse yet, to hate with a touch of pity. For in his eyes I read some lurid woe would shrivel me up, had I it. Yet is there hope, time and tide flow wide. The hated whale has the round, watery world to swim in, as the small goldfish has its glassy globe. His heaven-insulting purpose God may wedge aside. I would up heart, were it not like lead. But my whole clock's run down, my heart the all-controlling weight, I have no key to lift again. A burst of revelry from the forecastle. Oh, God! God, to sail with such a heathen crew that have small touch of human mothers in them, 
whelped somewhere by the sharkish sea. The white whale is their demigorgon. Hark! The infernal orgies! That revelry is forward. Mark the unfaltering silence aft. Methinks it pictures life. Foremost through the sparkling sea shoots the gay, embattled, bantering bow, but only to drag dark Ahab after it, where he broods within his sternward cabin, builded over the dead water of the wake, and further on hunted by its wolfish gurglings. The long howl thrills me through. Peace, ye revellers, and set the watch! Oh, life! Tis an hour like this, with soul beat down and held to knowledge, as wild, untutored things are forced to feed. O oh, life, tis now that I do feel the latent horror in thee, but tis not me, that horror's out of me, and with the soft feeling of the human in me, yet I will try to fight ye, ye grim phantom futures. Stand by me, hold me, bind me, O oh, ye blessed influences. Chapter 39 First night watch, foretop. Stub, solace, and mending a brace. Ha, 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 ha! Ahem. <clears throat> Clear my throat. I've been thinking over it ever since, and that ha-ha's the final consequence. Why so? Because a laugh's the wisest, easiest answer to all that's queer, and come what will, one's comfort's always left. That unfailing comfort is. It's all predestinated. I heard not all his talk with Starbuck, but to my poor eye Starbuck then looked something as I the other evening felt. <laughs> Be sure the old mogul had fixed him, too. I twigged it, knew it. Had had the gift, might readily have prophesied it. For when I clapped my eye upon his skull, I saw it. Well, Stubb. Wise Stubb. That's my title. Well, Stubb. What of it, Stubb? Here's a carcass. I know not all that may be coming, but be it what it will, I'll go to it laughing. Such a waggish leering as lurks in all your horribles. I feel funny. Fala, lira, skira. What's my juicy little pear at home doing now? Crying its eyes out? <laughs> Giving a party to the last arrived harpooners, I dare say. Gay as a frigate's pennant, and so am I. Fala, lira, skira. Oh! We'll drink tonight with hearts as light to love as gay as fleeting, as bubbles that swim on beaker's brim and break on the lips while meeting. A brave stave that. Who calls? Mr. Starbuck. Aye, aye, sir. Aside. He's my superior. He has his, too, if I'm not mistaken. Aye, aye, sir. Just through with this job. Coming. Chapter 40. Midnight. Folksal. Harpooners and sailors. Foresail rises and discovers the watch standing, lounging, leaning, and lying in various attitudes, all singing in chorus. Farewell and adieu to you, Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you, ladies of Spain. Our captains commanded. First Nantucket sailor. Oh, boys, don't be sentimental. It's bad for the digestion. Take a tonic and follow me. Sings, and all follow. Our captain stood upon the deck, a spyglass in his hand, a viewing of those gallant whales that blew at every strand. Oh, your tubs and your boats, my boys, and by your braces stand, and we'll have one of those fine whales, hand, boys, over hand. So be cheery, my lads, may your hearts never fail, while the bold harpooner is striking the whale. Mate's voice from the quarter-deck. Eight bells there, forward. Second Nantucket sailor. Avast the chorus! Eight bells there! Do you hear, bell-boy? Strike the bell eight, thou pip, thou blackling, and let me call the watch. I've the sort of mouth for that, the hogshead mouth. So, so, thrusts his head down the scuttle. Starboleens, ahoy! Eight bells there below! Tumble up! Dutch sailor. Grand snoozing tonight, matey. Fat night for that. I mark this in our old mogul's wine. It's quite deadening to some as filliping to others. We sing, they sleep. I lie down there like ground tear butts. At em again. There, take this copper pump and hail em through it. Tell em to a vast dreaming of their lasses. 
Tell them it's the resurrection, that they must kiss their last and come to judgment. That's the way. That's it. Thy throat ain't spoiled with eating Amsterdam butter. French Sailor Hist, boys! Let us have a jig or two before we ride to anchor in Blanket Bay. What say ye? There comes the other watch. Stand by, all legs. Pip! Little Pip! Hurrah with your tambourine! Pip, sulky and sleepy. Don't know where it is. French Sailor Beat thy belly then, and wag thy ears. Jig it, men, I say, marries the word. Hurrah! Damn me, won't you dance? Form now, Indian file, and gallop into the double shuffle. Throw yourselves! Legs! Legs! Iceland Sailor I don't like your floor, matey. It's too springy to my taste. I'm used to ice floors. I'm sorry to throw cold water on the subject, but excuse me. Maltese Sailor me too. Where's your girls? Who but a fool would take his left hand by his right and say to himself, How do you do? Partners! I must have partners. Sicilian sailor. Aye, girls and a green. Then I'll hop with ye. Yea, turn grasshopper. Long Island sailor. Well, well, ye sulkies, there's plenty more of us. Ho corn when ye may, say I. All legs go to harvest soon. Ah! Here comes the music, now for it. Azor Sailor, ascending, and pitching the tambourine up the scuttle. Here you are, Pip, and there's the windless bits. Up you mount. Now, boys. The half of them dance to the tambourine. Some go below, some sleep or lie among the coils of rigging. Oaths aplenty. Azor Sailor, dancing. Go to it, Pip! Bang it, bellboy! Rig it, dig it, stig it, quig it, bellboy! Make fireflies! Break the jinglers! Pip. Jinglers, you say? There goes another, dropped off, I pound it so. China Sailor. Rattle thy teeth, then, and pound away. Make a pagoda of thyself. French Sailor. Merry mad! Hold up thy hoop, Pip, till I jump through it. Split jibs! Tear yourselves! Tashtego, quietly smoking. That's the white man. He calls that fun. Humph! I save my sweat. Old Manx Sailor. I wonder whether those jolly lads bethink them of what they are dancing over. I'll dance over your grave, I will. That's the bitterest threat of your night women that beat headwinds round corners. Oh, Christ! to think of the green navies and the green-skulled crew. Well, well, belike the whole world's a ball, as you scholars have it, and so tis right to make one ballroom of it. Dance on, lads, you're young. I was once. Third Nantucket Sailor. Spell! Oh, whew! This is worse than pulling after whales in a calm. Give us a whiff, Tash. They cease dancing and gather in clusters, Meantime the sky darkens, the wind rises. Lascar sailor. By Brahma, boys, it'll douse sail soon. The sky-born, high-tide Ganges turned to wind. Thou showest thy black brow, Siva. Maltese sailor, reclining and shaking his cap. It's the waves. The snow-caps turn to jig it now. They'll shake their tassels soon. Now would all the waves were women. Then I'd go drown, and chassis with them evermore. There's naught so sweet on earth, heaven may not match it, as those swift glances of warm, wild bosoms in the dance, when the over-arboring arms hide such ripe, bursting grapes. Sicilian Sailor, reclining. Tell me not of it. Hark ye, lad, fleet interlacings of the limbs, lithe swayings, coyings, flutterings, lip, heart, hip, all graze, unceasing touch and go. Not taste, observe ye, else come satiety. Eh, pagan? Nudging. Tahitian sailor, reclining on a mat. Hail, holy nakedness of our dancing girls, the heva heva. Ah, low-veiled high palm Tahiti, I still rest me on thy mat, but the soft soil has slid. I saw thee woven in the wood, my mat. Green the first day I brought ye thence, now worn and wilted quite. 
Ah, me! Not thou nor I can bear the change. How then, if so be transplanted to yon sky? Hear I the roaring streams from Pirohiti's peak of spears when they leap down the crags and drown the villages? The blast! The blast! Up, spine, and meet it! Leaps to his feet. Portuguese sailor. How the sea rolls, swashing against the side. Stand by for reefing, hearties. The winds are just crossing swords. Pell-mell they go lunging presently. Danish sailor. Crack, crack, old ship. So long as thou crackest, thou holdest. Well done. The mate there holds ye to it stiffly. He's no more afraid than the isle fort at Kattegat, put there to fight the Baltic with storm-lashed guns, on which the sea-salt cakes. Fourth Nantucket sailor. He has his orders, mind ye that. I heard old Ahab tell him he must always kill a squall, something as they burst a water-spout with a pistol. Fire your ship right into it. English sailor. Blood! But that old man's a grand old cove. We are the lads to hunt him up his whale. All. Aye, aye! Old Manx sailor. How the three pines shake! Pines are the hardest sort of tree to live when shifted to any other soil. And here there's none but the crew's cursed clay. Steady, helmsman, steady. This is the sort of weather when brave hearts snap ashore, and keeled hulls split at sea. Our captain has his birthmark. Look yonder, boys, there's another in the sky. Lurid-like, you see, all else pitch black. Dagoo. What of that? Who's afraid of black's afraid of me? I'm quarried out of it. Spanish sailor. Aside. He wants to bully, eh? The old grudge makes me touchy. Advancing. Ay, harpooner, thy race is the undeniable dark side of mankind, devilish dark at that. No offense. Dagoo grimly. None. St. Jago's sailor. That Spaniard's mad or drunk, but that can't be, or else in his one case our old mogul's firewaters are somewhat long in working. Fifth Nantucket sailor. What's that I saw? Lightning? Yes. Spanish sailor. No. Dagoo showing his teeth. Dagoo springing. Swallow thine, mannequin. White skin, white liver. Spanish sailor, meeting him. Knife thee hardly, big frame, small spirit. All. A row, a row, a row. Tashtego, with a whiff. A row alow and a row aloft. Gods and men, both brawlers. Humph. <laughs> Belfast sailor. A row, a row, a row. The virgin be blessed, a row. Plunge in with ye. English sailor. Fair play. Snatch the Spaniard's knife. A ring, a ring. Old Manx sailor. Ready formed. There, the ringed horizon. In that ring Cain struck Abel. Sweet work, right work. No? Why, then, God, mates thou the ring? Mates voice from the quarter-deck. Hands by the halyards, in topgallant sails. Stand by to reef topsails. All. The squall, the squall, jump, my jollies. They scatter. Pip, shrinking under the windlass. Jollies? Lord, help such jollies. Crish, crash, there goes the jib-stay. Blang, wang. God, duck lower, Pip. Here comes the royal yard. It's worse than being in the world woods the last day of the year. Who'd go climbing after chestnuts now? But there they go, all cursing. And here I don't. Fine prospects to em. They're on the road to heaven. Hold on hard. Jiminy, what a squall! But those chaps are worse yet. They are your white squalls, they. White squalls? White whale? Sure, sure. Here have I heard all their chat just now. And the white whale? Sure, sure. But spoken of once, and only this evening, it makes me jingle all over like my tambourine. That anaconda of an old man swore him in to hunt him. Oh, thou big white god aloft there somewhere in yon darkness, have mercy on this small black boy down here. Preserve him from all men that have no bowels to feel fear. 
End of chapters 36 to 40. Chapter 41. Moby Dick. I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. My shouts had gone up with the rest. My oath had been welded with theirs. And stronger I shouted, and more did I hammer and clinch my oath, because of the dread in my soul. A wild, mystical, sympathetical feeling was in me. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. With greedy ears I learned the history of that murderous monster against whom I and all the others had taken our oaths of violence and revenge. For some time past, though at intervals only, the unaccompanied, secluded white whale had haunted those uncivilized seas mostly frequented by the sperm whale fishermen. But not all of them knew of his existence. Only a few of them, comparatively, had knowingly seen him, while the number who as yet had actually and knowingly given battle to him was small indeed. For, owing to the large number of whale cruisers, the disorderly way they were sprinkled over the entire watery circumference, many of them adventurously pushing their quest along solitary latitudes so as seldom or never for a whole twelve month or more on a stretch to encounter a single news-telling sail of any sort, the inordinate length of each separate voyage, the irregularity of the times of sailing from home, all these, with other circumstances, direct and indirect, long obstructed the spread through the whole world-wide whaling fleet of the special individualizing tidings concerning Moby Dick. It was hardly to be doubted that several vessels reported to have encountered, at such or such a time, or on such or such a meridian, a sperm whale of uncommon magnitude and malignity, which whale, after doing great mischief to his assailants, had completely escaped them. To some minds it was not an unfair presumption, I say, that the whale in question must have been no other than Moby Dick. Yet, as of late, the sperm whale fishery had been marked by various and not unfrequent instances of great ferocity, cunning, and malice in the monster attacked, Therefore it was that those who, by accident, ignorantly gave battle to Moby Dick, such hunters, perhaps, for the most part, were content to ascribe the peculiar terror he bred more, as it were, to the perils of the sperm whale fishery at large than to the individual cause. In that way, mostly, the disastrous encounter between Ahab and the whale had hitherto been popularly regarded. And as for those who previously hearing of the white whale by chance caught sight of him, in the beginning of the thing they had every one of them almost as boldly and fearlessly lowered for him as for any other whale of that species. But at length such calamities did ensue in these assaults, not restricted to sprained wrists and ankles, broken limbs, or devouring amputations, but fatal to the last degree of fatality, those repeated disastrous repulses all accumulating and piling their terrors upon Moby Dick, those things had gone far to shake the fortitude of many brave hunters to whom the story of the white whale had eventually come. Nor did wild rumors of all sorts fail to exaggerate, and still the more horrify the true histories of these deadly encounters, for not only do fabulous rumors naturally grow out of the very body of all surprising terrible events, as the smitten tree gives birth to its fungi, but in maritime life, far more than in that of terra firma, wild rumors abound, wherever there is any adequate reality for them to cling to, and as the sea surpasses the land in this matter, so the whale fishery surpasses every other sort of maritime life in the wonderfulness and fearfulness of the rumors which sometimes circulate there. For not only are whalemen as a body unexempt from that ignorance and superstitiousness hereditary to all sailors, but of all sailors they are, by all odds, the most directly brought into contact with whatever is appallingly astonishing in the sea. Face to face they not only eye its greatest marvels, but hand to jaw give battle to them. Alone in such remotest waters, that though you sailed a thousand miles, and passed a thousand shores, you would not come to any chiseled hearthstone, or aught hospitable beneath that part of the sun, 
in such latitudes and longitudes, pursuing too such a calling as he does, the whaleman is wrapped by influences all tending to make his fancy pregnant with many a mighty birth. No wonder, then, that ever-gathering volume from the mere transit over the widest watery spaces, the outblown rumors of the white whale did in the end incorporate with themselves all manner of morbid hints and half-formed fetal suggestions of supernatural agencies which eventually invested Moby Dick with new terrors unborrowed from anything that visibly appears, so that in many cases such a panic did he finally strike, that few who by those rumours at least had heard of the white whale, few of those hunters were willing to encounter the perils of his jaw. But there were still other and more vital practical influences at work. Not even at the present day has the original prestige of the sperm whale, as fearfully distinguished from all other species of the leviathan, died out in the minds of the whalemen as a body. There are those this day among them who, though intelligent and courageous enough in offering battle to the Greenland or right whale, would perhaps, either from professional inexperience or incompetency or timidity, decline a contest with the sperm whale. At any rate, there are plenty of whalemen, especially among those whaling nations not sailing under the American flag, who have never hostily encountered the sperm whale, but whose sole knowledge of the leviathan is restricted to the ignoble monster primitively pursued in the north. Seated on their hatches, these men will hearken with a childish fireside interest and awe to the wild, strange tales of southern whaling. Nor is the preeminent tremendousness of the great sperm whale anywhere more feelingly comprehended than on board of those prows which stem him and as if the now tested reality of his might had in former legendary times thrown its shadow before it, we find some book naturalists, Olison and Povelson, declaring the sperm whale not only to be a consternation to every other creature in the sea, but also to be so incredibly ferocious as continually to be a thirst for human blood, nor even down to so late a time as Cuvier's were these or almost similar impressions effaced. For in his natural history the baron himself affirms that at sight of the sperm whale all fish, sharks included, are struck with the most lively terrors, and often in the precipitancy of their flight dash themselves against the rocks with such violence as to cause instantaneous death and however the general experiences in the fishery may amend such reports as these, yet in their full terribleness, even to the bloodthirsty item of Povelson, the superstitious belief in them is, in some vicissitudes of their vocation, revived in the minds of the hunters. So that, overawed by the rumours and portents concerning him, not a few of the fishermen recalled, in reference to Moby Dick, the earlier days of the sperm whale fishery, when it was oftentimes hard to induce long-practiced right whalemen to embark in the perils of this new and daring warfare, such men protesting that, although other leviathans might be hopefully pursued, yet to chase and point lance at such an apparition as the sperm whale was not for mortal man, that to attempt it would be inevitably to be torn into a quick eternity. On this head there are some remarkable documents that may be consulted. Nevertheless, some there were who, even in the face of these things, were ready to give chase to Moby Dick, and a still greater number who, chancing only to hear of him distantly and vaguely, without the specific details of any certain calamity, and without superstitious accompaniments, were sufficiently hardy not to flee from the battle if offered. One of the wild suggestions referred to, as at last coming to be linked with the white whale in the minds of these superstitiously inclined, was the unearthly conceit that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had actually been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and the same instant of time. Nor, credulous as such minds might have been, was this conceit altogether without some faint show of superstitious probability. 
for as the secrets of the currents of the seas have never yet been divulged even to the most erudite research so the hidden ways of the sperm whale when beneath the surface remain in great part unaccountable to his pursuers and from time to time have originated the most curious and contradictory speculations regarding them especially concerning the mystic modes whereby after sounding to a great depth he transports himself with such vast swiftness to the most widely distant points it is a thing well known to both american and english whale ships and as well a thing placed upon authoritative record years ago by scoresby that some whales have been captured far north in the pacific in whose bodies have been found the barbs of harpoons darted in the greenland seas nor is it to be gainsaid that in some of these instances it has been declared that the interval of time between the two assaults could not have exceeded very many days. Hence, by inference, it has been believed by some whalemen that the Northwest Passage, so long a problem to man, was never a problem to the whale. So that here, in the real living experience of living men, the prodigies related in old times of the inland Strelo Mountain in Portugal, near whose top there was said to be a lake in which the wrecks of ships floated up to the surface and that still more wonderful story of the arethusa fountain near syracuse whose waters were believed to have come from the holy land by an underground passage these fabulous narrations are almost fully equalled by the realities of the whalemen forced into familiarity then with such prodigies as these and knowing that after repeated intrepid assaults the white whale had escaped alive it cannot be much matter of surprise that some whalemen should go still further in their superstitions declaring moby dick not only ubiquitous but immortal for immortality is but ubiquity in time that though groves of spears should be planted in his flanks he would still swim away unharmed or if indeed he should ever be made to spout thick blood such a sight would be but a ghastly deception for again in unsanguined billows hundreds of leagues away his unsullied jet would once more be seen but even stripped of these supernatural surmisings there was enough in the earthly make and incontestable character of the monster to strike the imagination with unwonted power for it was not so much his uncommon bulk that so much distinguished him from other sperm whales but as elsewhere thrown out a peculiar snow-white wrinkled forehead and a high pyramidical white hump these were his prominent features the tokens whereby even in the limitless uncharted seas he revealed his identity at a long distance to those who knew him the rest of his body was so streaked and spotted and marbled with the same shrouded hue that in the end he had gained his distinctive appellation of the white whale a name indeed literally justified by his vivid aspect when seen gliding at high noon through a dark blue sea leaving a milky way wake of creamy foam all spangled with golden gleamings nor was it his unwonted magnitude nor his remarkable hue nor yet his deformed lower jaw that so much invested the whale with natural terror as that unexampled intelligent malignity which according to specific accounts he had over and over again evinced in his assaults more than all his treacherous retreats struck more dismay than perhaps aught else for when swimming before his exulting pursuers with every apparent symptom of alarm he had several times been known to turn round suddenly and bearing down upon them either stave their boats to splinters or drive them back in consternation to their ship already several fatalities had attended his chase but those similar disasters however little bruited ashore were by no means unusual in the fishery yet in most instances such seemed the white whale's infernal aforethought of ferocity that every dismembering or death that he caused was not wholly regarded as having been inflicted by an unintelligent agent judge then to what pitches of inflamed distracted fury the minds of his more desperate hunters were impelled when amid the chips of chewed boats and the sinking limbs of torn comrades 
they swam out of the white curds of the whale's direful wrath into the serene, exasperating sunlight that smiled on as if at a birth or a bridal. His three boats stove around him, and oars and men both whirling in the eddies, one captain, seizing the line-knife from his broken prow, had dashed at the whale, as an Arkansas duelist at his foe, blindly seeking with a six-inch blade to reach the fathom-deep life of the whale. That captain was Ahab, and then it was that, suddenly sweeping his sickle-shaped lower jaw beneath him, Moby Dick had reaped away Ahab's leg, as a mower a blade of grass in the field. No turban Turk, no hired Venetian or Malay, could have smote him with more seeming malice. Small reason was there to doubt, then, that ever since that almost fatal encounter, Ahab had cherished a wild vindictiveness against the whale. All the more fell, for that in his frantic morbidness he at last came to identify with him not only all his bodily woes, but all his intellectual and spiritual exasperations. The white whale swam before him as the monomaniac incarnation of all those malicious agencies which some deep men feel eating in them, till they are left living on with half a heart and half a lung. That intangible malignity which has been from the beginning, to whose dominion even the modern Christians ascribe one half of the worlds, which the ancient Ophites of the East reverenced in their statue devil, Ahab did not fall down and worship it like them, but deliriously transferring its ideas to the abhorred white whale, he pitted himself all mutilated against it. All that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil to crazy Ahab, were visibly personified and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. He piled upon the white whale's hump the sum of all the general rage and hate felt by his whole race from Adam down, and then, as if his chest had been a mortar, he burst his hot heart's shell upon it. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at the precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Then, in darting at the monster, knife in hand, he had but given loose to a sudden, passionate, corporal animosity, and when he received the stroke that tore him, he probably but felt the agonizing bodily laceration, but nothing more. Yet when by this collision forced to turn towards home, and for long months of days and weeks Ahab and Anguish lay stretched together in one hammock, rounding in midwinter that dreary howling Patagonian cape, then it was that his torn body and gashed soul bled into one another, and so interfusing made him mad that it was only then, on the homeward voyage after the encounter that the final monomania seized him, seems all but certain from the fact that, at intervals during the passage, he was a raving lunatic, and though unlimbed of a leg, yet such vital strength yet lurked in his Egyptian chest, and was moreover intensified by his delirium, that his mates were forced to lace him fast, even there as he sailed, raving in his hammock, in a straitjacket he swung to the mad rockings of the gales, and when running into more sufferable latitudes the ship, with mild stunsails spread, floated across the tranquil tropics, and to all appearances the old man's delirium seemed left behind him with the Cape Horn swells, and he came forth from his dark den into the blessed light and air, even then when he bore that firm collected front, however pale, and issued his calm orders once again, and his mates thanked God the direful madness was now gone, even then Ahab in his hidden self raved on. Human madness is oftentimes a cunning and most feline thing. When you think it fled, it may have but become transfigured into some still subtler form. Ahab's full lunacy subsided not, but deepeningly contracted, like the unabated Hudson, when that noble Northman flows narrowly but unfathomably through the highland gorge. 
But as in his narrow flowing monomania not one jot of Ahab's broad madness had been left behind, so in that broad madness not one jot of his great natural intellect had perished. That before living agent now became the living instrument. If such a furious trope may stand, his special lunacy stormed his general sanity, and carried it, and turned all its concerted cannon upon its own mad mark, so that far from having lost his strength, Ahab, to that one end, did now possess a thousandfold more potency than ever he had sanely brought to bear upon any one reasonable object. This is much, yet Ahab's larger, darker, deeper part remains unhinted. But vain to popularize profundities, and all truth is profound, winding far down from within the very heart of this spiked Hôtel de Cluny where we here stand, however grand and wonderful, now quit it, and take your way, ye nobler, sadder souls, to those vast Roman halls of Thermes, where far beneath the fantastic towers of man's upper earth, his root of grandeur, his whole awful essence, sits in bearded state, an antique buried beneath antiquities, and throned on torsos. So with a broken throne the great gods mock that captive king. So like a caryatid his patient sits, upholding on his frozen brow the piled entablatures of ages. Wind ye down there, ye prouder, sadder souls. Question that proud, sad king. A family likeness? Aye, he did beget ye ye young exiled royalties, and from your grim sire only will the old state secret come. Now in his heart Ahab had some glimpse of this, namely, all my means are sane, my motive and my object mad. Yet without power to kill or change or shun the fact, he likewise knew that to mankind he did long dissemble, in some sort did still, but that thing of his dissembling was only subject to his perceptibility, not to his will determinate. Nevertheless, so well did he succeed in that dissembling, that when, with ivory leg, he stepped ashore at last, no Nantucketer thought him otherwise than but naturally grieved, and that to the quick, with the terrible casualty which had overtaken him. The report of his undeniable delirium at sea was likewise popularly ascribed to a kindred cause. And so too all the added moodiness which always afterwards, to the very day of sailing in the Pequod on the present voyage, sat brooding on his brow. Nor is it so very unlikely that far from distrusting his fitness for another whaling voyage, on account of such dark symptoms, the calculating people of that prudent isle were inclined to harbour the conceit, that for those very reasons he was all the better qualified and set on edge for a pursuit so full of rage and wildness as the bloody hunt of whales. Gnawed within and scorched without, by the infixed, unrelenting fangs of some incurable idea, such a one, could he be found, would seem the very man to dart his iron and lift his lance against the most appalling of all brutes, or if for any reason thought to be corporeally incapacitated for that, yet such a one would seem superlatively competent to cheer and howl on his underlings to the attack. But be all this as it may, certain it is that, with the mad secret of his unabated rage bolted up and keyed in him, Ahab had purposely sailed upon the present voyage with the one only and all-engrossing object of hunting the white whale. Had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him then, how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man? They were bent on profitable cruises, the profit to be counted down in dollars from the mint. He was intent on an audacious, immitigable, and supernatural revenge." Here, then, was this grey-headed, ungodly old man, chasing with curses a Job's whale round the world, at the head of a crew, too, chiefly made up of mongrel renegades, and castaways, and cannibals, morally enfeebled also, by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness in Starbuck, 
the invulnerable jollity of indifference and recklessness in stub, and the pervading mediocrity in flask. Such a crew, so officered, seemed specially picked and packed by some infernal fatality to help him in his monomaniac revenge. How it was that they so aboundingly responded to the old man's ire, by what evil magic their souls were possessed, that at times his hate seemed almost theirs, the white whale as much their insufferable foe as his, how all this came to be, what the white whale was to them, or how to their unconscious understandings also, in some dim, unsuspected way, he might have seemed the gliding great demon of the seas of life, all this to explain would be to dive deeper than Ishmael can go. The subterranean miner that works in us all, how can one tell whither leads his shaft by the ever-shifting muffled sound of his pick? Who does not feel the irresistible arm drag? What skiff in tow of a seventy-four can stand still? For one, I gave myself up to the abandonment of the time and the place, but while yet all a rush to encounter the whale, could see naught in that brute but the deadliest ill. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 The Whiteness of the Whale What the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted, what at times he was to me, as yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest, and yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it, that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. But how can I hope to explain myself here, and yet in some dim random way explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be naught. Though in many natural objects whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, and pearls, and though various nations have in some ways recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pegu placing the title Lord of the White Elephants, above all their other magniloquent ascriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing the one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Austrian empire, Caesarian, heir to overlording Rome, having for the imperial color the same imperial hue, and though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though besides all this whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizings this same hue is made the emblem of many touching noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age, though among the red men of America the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest pledge of honor, though in many climes whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge, and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk-white steeds, though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions it has been made the symbol of the divine spotlessness and power, by the Persian fire-worshippers, the white-forked flame being held the holiest on the altar, and in the Greek mythologies great Jove himself being made incarnate in a snow-white bull, and though to the noble Iroquois the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology, that spotless, faithful creature being held the purest envoy they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity, 
and though directly from the Latin word for white, all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sacred vesture, the alb, or tunic, worn beneath the cassock, and though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith, white is specially employed in the celebration of the passion of our Lord, though in the vision of St. John white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the holy one that sitteth there white like wool. Yet for all these accumulated associations with whatever is sweet, and honourable, and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness, when divorced from more kindly associations, and coupled with any object terrible in itself, to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Witness the white bear of the poles, and the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are? That ghastly whiteness it is, which imparts such an abhorrent mildness, even more loathsome than terrific, to the dumb gloating of their aspect, so that not the fierce-fanged tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white-shrouded bear or shark. Footnote. With reference to the polar bear, it may possibly be urged by him who would fain go still deeper into this matter, that it is not the whiteness separately regarded which heightens the intolerable hideousness of that brute. For, analyzed, that heightened hideousness, it might be said, only rises from the circumstance that the irresponsible ferociousness of the creature stands invested in the fleece of celestial innocence and love and hence by bringing together two such opposite emotions in our minds, the polar bear frightens us with so unnatural a contrast. But even assuming all this to be true, yet were it not for the whiteness, you would not have that intensified terror. As for the white shark, the white gliding ghostliness of repose in that creature, when beheld in his ordinary moods, strangely tallies with the same quality in the polar quadruped. This peculiarity is most vividly hit by the French, in the name they bestow upon that fish. The Romish mass for the dead begins with requiem eternum, eternal rest, whence requiem denominating the mass itself, and any other funeral music. Now, in allusion to the white, silent stillness of death in this shark, and the mild deadliness of his habits, the French call him Requin. End of footnote. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations? Not Coleridge first threw that spell, but God's great unflattering laureate, Nature. Footnote. I remember the first albatross I ever saw. It was during a prolonged gale, in waters hard upon the Antarctic seas. From my forenoon watch below, I ascended to the overclouded deck, and there, dashed upon the main hatches, I saw a regal feathery thing of unspotted whiteness, and with a hooked Roman bill sublime. At intervals it arched forth its vast archangel wings, as if to embrace some holy ark. Wondrous flutterings and throbbings shook it. Though bodily unharmed, it uttered cries, as some king's ghost in supernatural distress. Through its inexpressible strange eyes, methought I peeped to secrets which took hold of God. As Abraham before the angels, I bowed myself. The white thing was so white, its wings so wide, and in those forever exiled waters, I had lost the miserable warping memories of traditions and of towns. Long I gazed at that prodigy of plumage. I cannot tell, can only hint the things that darted through me then. But at last I awoke, and turning, asked a sailor what bird was this. A goni, he replied. Goni? Never had heard that name before. Is it conceivable that this glorious thing is utterly unknown to men ashore? Never! 
But some time after I learned that Goni was some seaman's name for albatross, so that by no possibility could Coleridge's wild rhyme have had aught to do with those mystical impressions which were mine when I saw that bird upon our deck. For neither had I then read the rhyme, nor knew the bird to be an albatross. Yet in saying this I do but indirectly burnish a little brighter the noble merit of the poem and the poet. I assert, then, that in the wondrous bodily whiteness of the bird chiefly lurks the secret of the spell, a truth more evinced in this, that by a solecism of terms there are birds called grey albatrosses, and these I have frequently seen, but never with such emotions as when I beheld the Antarctic fowl. But how had the mystic thing been caught? Whisper it not, and I will tell with a treacherous hook and line, as the fowl floated on the sea. At last the captain made a postman of it, tying a lettered leathern tally round its neck, with the ship's time and place, and then letting it escape. But I doubt not that leathern tally, meant for man, was taken off in heaven, when the white fowl flew to join the wing-folding, the invoking and adoring cherubim. End of footnote most famous in our western annals and indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies a magnificent milk-white charger large-eyed small-headed bluff-chested and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty overscorning carriage he was the elected xerxes of vast herds of wild horses whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the rocky mountains and the alleghanies at their flaming head he westward trooped it, like that chosen star which every evening leads on the hosts of light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him. A most imperial and archangelical apparition of that unfallen western world, which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times, when Adam walked majestic as a god, bluff-browed and fearless as this mighty steed, whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains like an Ohio, or whether with his circumambient subjects browsing all around at the horizon, the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness, in whatever aspect he presented himself always to the bravest Indians he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse, that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly which so clothed him with divineness, and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which invests it in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye, as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? It is that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears. The albino is as well made as other men, has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Nor in quite other aspects does nature, in her least palpable but not the less malicious agencies, fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntleted ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall, nor, in some historic instances, has the art of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary. How wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Froissart, when, masked in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the market-place. Nor in some things does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. 
it cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there, as if indeed that pallor were as much like the badge of consternation in the other world as of mortal trepidation here. And from that pallor of the dead we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them. Nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in a milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods, symbolize whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness, no man can deny that in its profoundest idealized significance it calls up a peculiar apparition to the soul. But though without dissent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it would seem impossible. Can we then by the citation of some of those instances wherein this thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart to it aught fearful, but nevertheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try. But in a matter like this, subtlety appeals to subtlety, and without imagination no man can follow another into these halls. And though doubtless some at least of the imaginative impressions about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now. Why, to the man of untutored ideality, who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day, does the bare mention of Whitsuntide marshal in the fancy such long, dreary, speechless processions of slow-pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooden with new-fallen snow? Or to the unread, unsophisticated Protestant of middle American states, why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue in the soul? Or what is there, apart from the traditions of dungeoned warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the white tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untravelled American than those other storied structures, its neighbours, the byward tower, or even the bloody, and those sublimer towers, the white mountains of New Hampshire, whence, in peculiar moods, comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name, while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge is full of a soft, dewy, distant dreaminess? Or why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the yellow sea lulls us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets. Or, to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance, purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall, pale man of the heart's forests whose changeless pallor unrustlingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps of the Blocksburg? Nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral-toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the tearlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wide field of leaning spires, wrenched copestones, and crosses all a-droop, like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of house-walls lying upon each other as a tossed pack of cards, it is not these things alone which make tearless Lima the strangest, saddest city thou canst see. For Lima has taken the white veil, and there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins for ever new, 
admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortions. I know that, to the common apprehension, this phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible, nor to the unimaginative mind is there aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner, when drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, if by night he hear the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties. But under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing through a midnight sea of milky whiteness, as if from encircling headlands shoals of combed white bears were swimming round him, then he feels a silent superstitious dread. The shrouded phantom of the whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost. In vain the lead assures him he is still off soundings. Heart and helm they both go down. He never rests till blue water is under him again. Yet where is the mariner who will tell thee, Sir, it was not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me? Second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the snow howdahead Andes conveys naught of dread except, perhaps, in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning at such vast altitudes, and the natural conceit of what a fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes. Much the same is it with the backwoodsman of the West, who with comparative indifference views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow, no shadow of tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness. Not so the sailor, beholding the scenery of the Antarctic seas, where at times by some infernal trick of leisure domain in the powers of frost and air, he, shivering and half shipwrecked, instead of rainbows speaking hope and solace to his misery, views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him, with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses. But, thou sayest, methinks that white-led chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out from a craven soul. Thou surrenderest to a hypo, Ishmael. Tell me why this strong young colt, fold in some peaceful valley of Vermont, far removed from all beasts of prey, why is it that upon the sunniest day, if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him, so that he can not even see it, but only smells its wild animal muskiness, why will he start, snort, and with bursting eyes paw the ground, in frenzies of affright? There is no remembrance in him of any gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home, so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils. For what knows he, this New England colt, of the black bisons of distant Oregon? No, but here thou beholdest, even in a dumb brute, the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in the world. Though thousands of miles from Oregon, still when he smells that savage musk, the rending, goring bison herds are as present as to the deserted, wild foal of the prairies, which in this instant they may be trampling into dust. Thus, then, the muffled rollings of a milky sea, the bleak rustlings of the festooned frosts of mountains, the desolate shiftings of the wind-road snows of prairies, all these to Ishmael are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt though neither knows where lie the nameless things of which the mystic sign gives forth such hints, yet with me, as with the colt, somewhere those things must exist, though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love, 
the invisible spheres were formed in fright. But not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness, and learned why it appeals with such power to the soul, and more strange and far more portentous. Why, as we have seen, it is at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian deity, and yet should be, as it is, the intensifying agent in things most appalling to mankind. Is it that by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe, and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation, when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that as in essence whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time the concrete of all colors, is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness, full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless all-color of atheism from which we shrink, and when we consider that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all other earthly hues, every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, the gilded velvets of butterflies, and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without, so that all deified nature absolutely paints like a harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel-house within. And when we proceed further, and consider that the mystical cosmetic, which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colorless in itself, and, if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge, Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper, and like willful travellers in Lapland who refuse to wear coloured and colouring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? Chapter 43 Hark! Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? It was the middle watch, a fair moonlight. The seamen were standing in a cordon extending from one of the fresh water butts in the waist to the scuttle butt near the taffrail. In this manner they passed the buckets to fill the scuttle butt. Standing, for the most part, on the hallowed precincts of the quarter-deck, they were careful not to speak or rustle their feet. From hand to hand the buckets went in the deepest silence, only broken by the occasional flap of a sail, and the steady hum of the unceasingly advancing keel. It was in the midst of this repose that Archie, one of the cordon, whose post was near the after-hatches, whispered to his neighbor, a cholo, the words above. Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? Take the bucket, will ye, Archie? What noise do you mean? There it is again, under the hatches. Don't you hear it? A cough. It sounded like a cough. Cough be damned. Pass along that return bucket. There again. There it is. It sounds like two or three sleepers turning over now. Caramba! Have done, shipmate, will ye? It's the three soaked biscuits ye eat for supper turnin' over inside of ye. Nothing else. Look to the bucket. Say what ye will, shipmate, I've sharp ears. Aye, you are the chap, ain't ye, that heard the hum of the old Quakeress's knitting needles fifty miles at sea from Nantucket. <laughs> You're the chap. Grin away. We'll see what turns up. Hark ye, Kabako. There is somebody down in the after hold that has not yet been seen on deck, and I suspect our old mogul knows something of it, too. I heard Stubb tell Flask one morning watch that there was something of that sort in the wind. Tish! The bucket! Chapter 44 The Chart 
Had you followed Captain Ahab down into his cabin after the squall that took place on the night succeeding that wild ratification of his purpose with his crew, you would have seen him go to a locker in the transom, and, bringing out a large wrinkled roll of yellowish sea-charts, spread them before him on his screwed-down table. Then, seating himself before it, you would have seen him intently study the various lines and shadings which there met his eye, and with slow but steady pencil trace additional courses over spaces that before were blank. At intervals he would refer to piles of old log-books beside him, wherein were set down the seasons and places in which, on various former voyages of various ships, sperm-whales had been captured or seen. While thus employed, the heavy pewter lamp suspended in chains over his head continually rocked with the motion of the ship, and forever threw shifting gleams and shadows of lines upon his wrinkled brow till it almost seemed that while he himself was marking out lines and courses on the wrinkled charts, some invisible pencil was also tracing lines and courses upon the deeply marked chart of his forehead. But it was not this night in particular that, in the solitude of his cabin, Ahab thus pondered over his charts. Almost every night they were brought out, Almost every night some pencil marks were effaced, and others were substituted. For with the charts of all four oceans before him, Ahab was threading a maze of currents and eddies, with a view to the more certain accomplishment of that monomaniac thought of his soul. Now to any one not fully acquainted with the ways of the Leviathans, it might seem an absurdly hopeless task thus to seek out one solitary creature in the unhooped oceans of this planet. But not so did it seem to Ahab, who knew the sets of all tides and currents, and thereby calculating the driftings of the sperm whale's food, and also calling to mind the regular ascertained seasons for hunting him in particular latitudes, could arrive at reasonable surmises almost approaching to certainties, concerning the timeliest day to be upon this or that ground in search of his prey. So assured, indeed, is the fact concerning the periodicalness of the sperm whales resorting to given waters, that many hunters believe that, could he be closely observed and studied throughout the world, were the logs for one voyage of the entire whale fleet carefully collated, then the migrations of the sperm-whale would be found to correspond in invariability to those of the herring-shoals or the flights of swallows. On this hint, attempts have been made to construct elaborate migratory charts of the sperm-whale. Footnote. Since the above was written, the statement is happily borne out by an official circular, issued by Lieutenant Maury of the National Observatory, Washington, April 16, 1851. By that circular, it appears that precisely such a chart is in course of completion, and portions of it are presented in the circular. Quote, this chart divides the ocean into districts of five degrees of latitude by five degrees of longitude, perpendicularly through each of which districts are twelve columns for the twelve months, and horizontally through each of which districts are three lines, one to show the number of days that have been spent in each month in every district, and the two others to show the number of days in which whales, sperm, or right have been seen. End, quote. End of footnote. Besides, when making a passage from one feeding ground to another, the sperm whales, guided by some infallible instinct, say rather secret intelligence from the deity, mostly swim in veins, as they are called, continuing their way along a given ocean line with such undeviating exactitude that no ship ever sailed her course by any chart with one tithe of such marvellous precision. Though in these cases the direction taken by any one whale be as straight as a surveyor's parallel, and though the line of advance be strictly confined to its own unavoidable straight wake, 
yet the arbitrary vein in which at these times he is said to swim generally embraces some few miles in width more or less as the vein is presumed to expand or contract but never exceeds the visual sweep from the whale-ship's mastheads when circumspectly gliding along this magic zone the sum is that at particular seasons within that breadth and along that path migrating whales may with great confidence be looked for and hence not only at substantiated times upon well-known separate feeding grounds could ahab hope to encounter his prey but in crossing the widest expanses of water between those grounds he could by his art so place and time himself on his way as even then not to be wholly without prospect of a meeting there was a circumstance which at first sight seemed to entangle his delirious but still methodical scheme but not so in the reality perhaps though the gregarious sperm whales have their regular seasons for particular grounds yet in general you cannot conclude that the herds which haunted such and such a latitude or longitude this year say will turn out to be identically the same with those that were found in the preceding season though there are peculiar and unquestionable instances where the contrary of this has proved true in general the same remark only within a less wide limit applies to the solitaries and hermits among the matured aged sperm whales so that though moby dick had in a former year been seen for example on what is called the seychelle ground in the indian ocean or volcano bay on the japanese coast yet it did not follow that were the pequod to visit either of those spots at any subsequent corresponding season she would infallibly encounter him there so too with some other feeding grounds where he had at times revealed himself but all these seemed only his casual stopping places and ocean inns so to speak not his places of prolonged abode and where ahab's chances of accomplishing his object have hitherto been spoken of allusion has only been made to whatever wayside antecedent extra prospects were his ere a particular set time or place were attained when all possibilities would become probabilities and as ahab fondly thought every possibility the next thing to a certainty that particular set time and place were conjoined in the one technical phrase the season on the line for there and then for several consecutive years moby dick had been periodically descried lingering in those waters for a while as the sun in its annual round loiters for a predicted interval in any one sign of the zodiac there it was too that most of the deadly encounters with the white whale had taken place there the waves were storied with his deeds there also was that tragic spot where the monomaniac old man had found the awful motive to his vengeance but in the cautious comprehensiveness and unloitering vigilance with which ahab threw his brooding soul into this unfaltering hunt he would not permit himself to rest all his hopes upon the one crowning fact above mentioned however flattering it might be to those hopes nor in the sleeplessness of his vow could he so tranquillize his unquiet heart as to postpone all intervening quest now the pequod had sailed from nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line no possible endeavor then could enable her commander to make the great passage southwards double cape horn and then running down sixty degrees of latitude arrive in the equatorial pacific in time to cruise there therefore he must wait for the next ensuing season yet the premature hour of the pequod's sailing had perhaps been correctly selected by ahab with a view to this very complexion of things because an interval of three hundred and sixty-five days and nights was before him an interval which instead of impatiently enduring ashore he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt 
if by chance the white whale, spending his vacation in the seas far remote from his periodical feeding grounds, should turn up his wrinkled brow off the Persian Gulf, or in the Bengal Bay, or China Seas, or in any other waters haunted by his race. So that monsoons, pampas, nor'westers, harmattans, trades, any wind but the Levanter and Samoon, might blow Moby Dick into the devious zigzag world circle of the Pequod's circumnavigating wake. But, granting all this, yet regarded discreetly and coolly, seems it not but a mad idea, this, that in the broad boundless ocean, one solitary whale, even if encountered, should be thought capable of individual recognition from his hunter, even as a white-bearded mufti in the thronged thoroughfares of Constantinople? Yes, for the peculiar snow-white brow of Moby Dick, and his snow-white hump, could not but be unmistakable. And have I not tallied the whale, Ahab would mutter to himself, as after poring over his charts till long after midnight he would throw himself back in reveries, tallied him, and shall he escape? His broad fins are bored and scalloped out like a lost sheep's ear, and here his mad mind would run on in a breathless race, till a weariness and faintness of pondering came over him, and in the open air of the deck he would seek to recover his strength. Ah, God, what trances of torment does that man endure who is consumed with one unachieved revengeful desire? He sleeps with clenched hands, and wakes with his own bloody nails in his palms. Often, when forced from his hammock by exhausting and intolerably vivid dreams of the night, which, resuming his own intense thoughts through the day, carried them on amid a clashing of frenzies, and whirled them round and round and round in his blazing brain till the very throbbing of his life-spot became insufferable anguish, and when, as was sometimes the case, these spiritual throes in him heaved his being up from its base, and a chasm seemed opening in him, from which forked flames and lightning shot up, and accursed fiends beckoned him to leap down among them, when this hell in himself yawned beneath him, a wild cry would be heard through the ship, and with glaring eyes Ahab would burst from his stateroom, as though escaping from a bed that was on fire. Yet these, perhaps, instead of being the unsuppressible symptoms of some latent weakness, or fright at his own resolve, were but the plainest tokens of its intensity. For at such times crazy Ahab, the scheming, unappeasedly steadfast hunter of the white whale, this Ahab that had gone to his hammock, was not the agent that so caused him to burst from it in horror again. The latter was the eternal living principle or soul in him, and in sleep, being for the time dissociated from the characterizing mind, which at other times employed it for its outer vehicle or agent, it spontaneously sought escape from the scorching contiguity of the frantic thing, of which, for the time, it was no longer an integral. But as the mind does not exist unless leagued with the soul, therefore it must have been that, in Ahab's case, yielding up all his thoughts and fancies to his one supreme purpose, that purpose, by its own sheer inveteracy of will, forced itself against gods and devils into a kind of self-assumed independent being of its own, nay, could grimly live and burn, while the common vitality to which it was conjoined fled, horror-stricken from the unbidden and unfathered birth. Therefore, the tormented spirit that glared out of bodily eyes, when what seemed Ahab rushed from his room, was for the time but a vacated thing, a formless, somnambulistic being, a ray of living light to be sure, but without an object to color, and therefore a blankness in itself. God help thee, old man. Thy thoughts have created a creature in thee, and he whose intense thinking thus makes him a Prometheus, a vulture feeds upon that heart forever. That vulture, the very creature, he creates.
End of chapters 42 to 44. Chapters 45 to 47. Chapter 45. The Affidavit. So far as what there may be of a narrative in this book, and indeed is indirectly touching one or two very interesting and curious particulars in the habits of sperm whales, the foregoing chapter, in its earlier part, is as important to one as will be found in this volume, but the leading matter of it requires to be still further and more familiarly enlarged upon, in order to be adequately understood, and moreover to take away any incredulity which a profound ignorance of the entire subject may induce in some minds, as to the natural verity of the main points of this affair. I care not to perform this part of my task methodically, but shall be content to produce the desired impression by separate citations of items practically or reliably known to me as a whaleman, and from these citations, I take it, the conclusion aimed at will naturally follow of itself. First, I have personally known three instances where a whale, after receiving a harpoon, has effected a complete escape, and after an interval, in one instance of three years, has been again struck by the same hand and slain, when the two irons, both marked by the same private cipher, have been taken from the body. In the instance where three years intervened between the flinging of the two harpoons, and I think it may have been something more than that, the man who darted them, happening in the interval to go in a trading ship on a voyage to Africa, went ashore there, joined a discovery party, and penetrated far into the interior, where he travelled for a period of nearly two years, often endangered by serpents, savages, tigers, poisonous miasmas, with all the other common perils incident to wandering in the heart of unknown regions. Meanwhile, the whale he had struck must also have been on its travels. No doubt it had thrice circumnavigated the globe, brushing with its flanks all the coasts of Africa, but to no purpose. This man and this whale again came together, and the one vanquished the other. I say I myself have known three instances similar to this, that is, in two of them I saw the whale struck, and, upon the second attack, saw the two irons with the respective marks cut in them, afterwards taken from the dead fish. In the three-year instance, it so fell out that I was in the boat both times, first and last, and the last time distinctly recognized a peculiar sort of huge mole under the whale's eye, which I had observed there three years previous. I say three years, but I am pretty sure it was more than that. Here are three instances, then, which I personally know the truth of, but I have heard of many other instances from persons whose veracity in the matter there is no good ground to impeach. Secondly, it is well known in the sperm whale fishery, however ignorant the world ashore may be of it, that there have been several memorable historical instances where a particular whale in the ocean has been at distant times and places popularly cognizable. Why such a whale became thus marked was not altogether and originally owing to his bodily peculiarities as distinguished from other whales, for however peculiar in that respect any chance whale may be, they soon put an end to his peculiarities by killing him, and boiling him down into a peculiarly valuable oil. No, the reason was this, that from the fatal experiences of the fishery there hung a terrible prestige of perilousness about such a whale, as there did about Rinaldo Rinaldini, insomuch that most fishermen were content to recognize him by merely touching their tarpaulins when he would be discovered, lounging by them on the sea, without seeking to cultivate a more intimate acquaintance, like some poor devils ashore that happen to know an irascible great man, they make distant, unobtrusive salutations to him in the street, lest, if they pursued the acquaintance further, they might receive a summary thump for their presumption. But not only did each of these famous whales enjoy great individual celebrity, nay, you may call it an ocean-wide renown, 
not only was he famous in life and now is immortal in the forecastle stories after death but he was admitted into all the rights privileges and distinctions of a name had as much a name indeed as cambyses or caesar was it not so o timor tom thou famed leviathan scarred like an iceberg who so long didst lurk in the oriental straits of that name whose spout was often seen from the palmy beach of Ombay. Was it not so, O New Zealand Jack, thou terror of all cruisers that cross their wakes in the vicinity of the tattoo land? Was it not so, O Morkan, king of Japan, whose lofty jet, they say, at times assumed the semblance of a snow-white cross against the sky? Was it not so, O Don Miguel, thou Chilean whale, marked like an old tortoise with mystic hieroglyphics upon the back in plain prose here are four whales as well known to the students of cetacean history as marius or Sela to the classic scholar but this is not all new zealand tom and don miguel after at various times creating great havoc among the boats of different vessels were finally gone in quest of systematically hunted out chased and killed by valiant whaling captains who heaved up their anchors with that express object as much in view as in setting out through the narragansett woods captain butler of old had it in his mind to capture that notorious murderous savage anawan the headmost warrior of the indian king philip i do not know where i can find a better place than just here to make mention of one or two other things which seem to me important, as in printed form establishing in all respects the reasonableness of the whole story of the white whale, more especially the catastrophe. For this is one of those disheartening instances where truth requires full as much bolstering as error. So ignorant are most landsmen of some of the plainest and most palpable wonders of the world, that without some hints touching the plain facts, historical and otherwise, of the fishery, they might scoff at Moby Dick as a monstrous fable, or still worse and more detestable, a hideous and intolerable uh, allegory. First, though most men have some vague flitting ideas of the general perils of the grand fishery, yet they have nothing like a fixed vivid conception of those perils, and the frequency with which they recur. One reason, perhaps, is that not one in fifty of the actual disasters and deaths by casualties in the fishery ever finds a public record at home, however transient and immediately forgotten that record. Do you suppose that that poor fellow there, who this moment perhaps caught by the whale line off the coast of New Guinea, is being carried to the bottom of the sea by the sounding leviathan, do you suppose that that poor fellow's name will appear in the newspaper obituary you will read to-morrow at your breakfast? No, because the mails are very irregular between here and New Guinea. In fact, did you ever hear what might be called regular news direct or indirect from New Guinea? Yet I tell you that upon one particular voyage which I made to the Pacific, among many others, we spoke thirty different ships, every one of which had a death by a whale, some of them more than one, and three that had each lost a boat's crew. For God's sake, be economical with your lamps and candles. Not a gallon you burn, but at least one drop of a man's blood was spilled for it. Secondly, people ashore have indeed some indefinite idea that a whale is an enormous creature of enormous power, but I have ever found that when narrating to them some specific example of this twofold enormousness, they have significantly complimented me upon my facetiousness. When I declare upon my soul I had no more idea of being facetious than Moses when he wrote the history of the plagues of Egypt. But, fortunately, the special point I here seek can be established upon testimony entirely independent of my own. The point is this, the sperm whale is, in some cases, sufficiently powerful, knowing, and judiciously malicious, as with direct aforethought, to stave in, utterly destroy, and sink a large ship, and, what is more, the sperm whale has done it. First, 
in the year 1820, the ship Essex, Captain Pollard of Nantucket, was cruising in the Pacific Ocean. One day she saw spouts, lowered her boats, and gave chase to a shoal of sperm whales. Ere long several of the whales were wounded, when suddenly a very large whale, escaping from the boats, issued from the shoal, and bore directly down upon the ship. Dashing his forehead against her hull, he so stove her in, that in less than, quote, ten minutes, end quote, she settled down and fell over. Not a surviving plank of her has been seen since. After the severest exposure, part of the crew reached the land in their boats. Being returned home at last, Captain Pollard once more sailed for the Pacific in command of another ship. But the gods shipwrecked him again upon unknown rocks and breakers. For the second time his ship was utterly lost, and forthwith forswearing the sea, he has never tempted it since. At this day Captain Pollard is a resident of Nantucket. I have seen Owen Chase, who was chief mate of the Essex at the time of the tragedy. I have read his plain and faithful narrative. I have conversed with his son, and all this within a few miles of the scene of the catastrophe. Footnote. The following are extracts from Chase's narrative. Quote, Every fact seemed to warrant me in concluding that it was anything but chance which directed his operations. He made two several attacks upon the ship, at a short interval between them, both of which, according to their direction, were calculated to do us the most injury by being made ahead, and thereby combining the speed of the two objects for the shock, to effect which the exact maneuvers which he made were necessary. His aspect was most horrible and such as indicated resentment and fury. He came directly from the shoal which we had just before entered, and in which we had struck three of his companions, as if fired with revenge for their sufferings. End quote. Again, quote, At all events, the whole circumstances taken together, all happening before my own eyes, and producing at the time impressions in my mind of decided calculating mischief on the part of the whale, many of which impressions I cannot now recall, induce me to be satisfied that I am correct in my opinion. End quote. Here are his reflections some time after quitting the ship, during a black night in an open boat, when almost despairing of reaching any hospitable shore. Quote, the dark ocean and swelling waters were nothing. The fears of being swallowed up by some dreadful tempest, or dashed upon hidden rocks, with all the other ordinary subjects of fearful contemplation, seemed scarcely entitled to a moment's thought. The dismal-looking wreck, and the horrid aspect in revenge of the whale, wholly engrossed my reflections, until day again made its appearance. End quote. In another place, page 45, he speaks of, quote, the mysterious and mortal attack of the animal. End, quote. End of footnote. Secondly, the ship Union, also of Nantucket, was in the year 1807 totally lost off the Azores by a similar onset, but the authentic particulars of this catastrophe I have never chanced to encounter, though from the whale hunters I have now and then heard casual allusions to it. Thirdly, some eighteen or twenty years ago, Commodore J., then commanding an American sloop of war of the first class, happened to be dining with a party of whaling captains on board a Nantucket ship in the harbor of Oahu, Sandwich Islands. Conversation turning upon whales, the Commodore was pleased to be skeptical, touching the amazing strength ascribed to them by the professional gentlemen present. He peremptorily denied, for example, that any whale could so smite his stout sloop of war as to cause her to leak so much as a thimbleful. Very good, but there is more coming. Some weeks after, the Commodore set sail in this impregnable craft for Valparaiso, but he was stopped on the way by a portly sperm whale that begged a few moments confidential business with him. That business consisted in fetching the Commodore's craft such a thwack that with all his pumps going he made straight for the nearest port to heave down and repair. I am not superstitious, but I consider the Commodore's interview with that whale as providential. Was not Saul of Tarsus converted from unbelief by a similar fright? I tell you, the sperm whale will stand no nonsense. 
I will now refer you to Langsdorff's voyages for a little circumstance in point, peculiarly interesting to the writer hereof. Langsdorff, you must know, by the way, was attached to the Russian Admiral Krusenstern's famous discovery expedition in the beginning of the present century. Captain Langsdorff thus begins his seventeenth chapter. Quote, By the thirteenth of May our ship was ready to sail, and the next day we were out in the open sea on our way to Okoch. The weather was very clear and fine, but so intolerably cold that we were obliged to keep on our fur clothing. For some days we had very little wind. It was not till the nineteenth that a brisk gale from the northwest sprang up. An uncommon large whale, the body of which was larger than the ship itself, lay almost at the surface of the water, but was not perceived by any one on board till the moment when the ship, which was in full sail, was almost upon him, so that it was impossible to prevent its striking against him. We were thus placed in the most imminent danger as this gigantic creature, setting up its back, raised the ship three feet at least out of the water. The mass reeled, and the sails fell altogether, while we who were below all sprang instantly upon the deck, concluding that we had struck upon some rock. Instead of this, we saw the monster sailing off with the utmost gravity and solemnity. Captain de Wolf applied immediately to the pumps to examine whether or not the vessel had received any damage from the shock, but we found that, very happily, it had escaped entirely uninjured." End quote. Now the Captain de Wolf here alluded to as commanding the ship in question, is a New Englander, who, after a long life of unusual adventures as a sea captain, this day resides in the village of Dorchester near Boston. I have the honor of being a nephew of his. I have particularly questioned him concerning this passage in Langsdorff. He substantiates every word. The ship, however, was by no means a large one a Russian craft built on the Siberian coast, and purchased by my uncle after bartering away the vessel in which he sailed from home. In that up-and-down manly book of old-fashioned adventure, so full, too, of honest wonders, The Voyage of Lionel Wafer, one of ancient Dampier's old chums, I found a little matter set down so like that just quoted from Langsdorff, that I cannot forbear inserting it here for a corroborative example, if such be needed. Lionel, it seems, was on his way to John Ferdinando, as he calls the modern Juan Fernandez. Quote, in our way thither, he says, about four o'clock in the morning, when we were about 150 leagues from the main of America, our ship felt a terrible shock, which put our men in such consternation that they could hardly tell where they were or what to think. But every one began to prepare for death. And indeed the shock was so sudden and violent that we took it for granted the ship had struck against a rock. But when the amazement was a little over we cast the lead and sounded, but found no ground. The suddenness of the shock made the guns leap in their carriages, and several of the men were shaken out of their hammocks, Captain Davis, who lay with his head on a gun, was thrown out of his cabin. End quote. Lionel then goes on to impute the shock to an earthquake, and seems to substantiate the imputation by stating that a great earthquake somewhere about that time did actually do great mischief along the Spanish land. But I should not much wonder if, in the darkness of that early hour of the morning, the shock was after all caused by an unseen whale vertically bumping the hull from beneath. I might proceed with several more examples, one way or another known to me, of the great power and malice at times of the sperm whale. In more than one instance he has been known not only to chase the assailing boats back to their ships, but to pursue the ship itself, and long withstand all the lances hurled at him from its decks, the English ship Pusey Hall can tell a story on that head, and, as for his strength, let me say that there have been examples where the lines attached to a running sperm whale have, in a calm, been transferred to the ship and secured there, the whale towing her great hull through the water as a horse walks off with a cart. Again, it is very often observed that, if the sperm whale, once struck, is allowed time to rally, 
then he acts not so often with blind rage as with willful, deliberate designs of destruction to his pursuers. Nor is it without conveying some eloquent indication of his character that upon being attacked he will frequently open his mouth and retain it in that dread expansion for several consecutive minutes. But I must be content with only one more and a concluding illustration, a remarkable and most significant one, by which you will not fail to see that not only is the most marvellous event in this book corroborated by plain facts of the present day, but that these marvels, like all marvels, are mere repetitions of the ages, so that for the millionth time we say Amen with Solomon, Verily, there is nothing new under the sun. In the sixth Christian century lived Procopius, a Christian magistrate of Constantinople, in the days when Justinian was emperor and Belisarius general. As many know, he wrote the history of his own times, a work every way of uncommon value. By the best authorities he has always been considered a most trustworthy and unexaggerating historian, except in some one or two particulars not at all affecting the matter presently to be mentioned. Now in this history of his, Procopius mentions that, during the term of his prefecture at Constantinople, a great sea-monster was captured in the neighboring Propontis, or Sea of Marmora, after having destroyed vessels at intervals in those waters for a period of more than fifty years. A fact thus set down in substantial history cannot easily be gainsaid, nor is there any reason that it should be. Of what precise species this sea-monster was is not mentioned, but as he destroyed ships, as well as for other reasons, he must have been a whale, and I am strongly inclined to think a sperm-whale, and I will tell you why. For a long time I fancied that the sperm-whale had been always unknown in the Mediterranean and the deep waters connecting with it. Even now I am certain that those seas are not, and perhaps never can be, in the present constitution of things, a place for his habitual gregarious resort. But further investigations have recently proved to me that in modern times there have been isolated instances of the presence of the sperm-whale in the Mediterranean. I am told on good authority that on the Barbary coast a Commodore Davis of the British Navy found the skeleton of a sperm whale. Now, as a vessel of war readily passes through the Dardanelles, hence a sperm whale could, by the same route, pass out of the Mediterranean into the Propontis. In the Propontis, as far as I can learn, none of that peculiar substance called Brit is to be found, the element of the right whale but I have every reason to believe that the food of the sperm-whale, squid or cuttlefish, lurks at the bottom of that sea, because large creatures, but by no means the largest of that sort, have been found at its surface. If, then, you properly put these statements together, and reason upon them a bit, you will clearly perceive that, according to all human reasoning, Procopius's sea-monster, that for half a century stove the ships of a Roman emperor, must, in all probability, have been a sperm whale. Chapter 46. Surmises Though consumed with the hot fire of his purpose, Ahab, in all his thoughts and actions, ever had in view the ultimate capture of Moby Dick, though he seemed ready to sacrifice all mortal interest to that one passion, Nevertheless, it may have been that he was by nature and long habituation far too wedded to the fiery whaleman's ways altogether to abandon the collateral prosecution of the voyage. Or at least, if this were otherwise, there were not wanting other motives much more influential with him. It would be refining too much, perhaps, even considering his monomania, to hint that his vindictiveness toward the white whale might have possibly extended itself in some degree to all sperm-whales, and that the more monsters he slew by so much the more he multiplied the chances that each subsequently encountered whale would prove to be the hated one he hunted. But if such an hypothesis be indeed exceptionable, there were still additional considerations which, though not so strictly according to the wildness of his ruling passion, yet were by no means incapable of swaying him. To accomplish his object, Ahab must use tools, 
and of all tools used in the shadow of the moon, men are the most apt to get out of order. He knew, for example, that however magnetic his ascendancy in some respects was over Starbuck, yet that ascendancy did not cover the complete spiritual man any more than mere corporeal superiority involves intellectual mastership. For to the purely spiritual, the intellectual but stand in a sort of corporeal relation. Starbuck's body and Starbuck's coerced will were Ahab's, so long as Ahab kept his magnet at Starbuck's brain. Still he knew that for all this the chief mate in his soul abhorred his captain's quest, and could he would joyfully disintegrate himself from it, or even frustrate it. It might be that a long interval would elapse ere the white whale was seen. During that long interval Starbuck would ever be apt to fall into open relapses of rebellion against his captain's leadership, unless some ordinary, prudential, circumstantial influences were brought to bear upon him. Not only that, but the subtle insanity of Ahab respecting Moby Dick was no ways more significantly manifested than in his superlative sense and shrewdness in foreseeing that, for the present, the hunt should in some way be stripped of that strange imaginative impiousness which naturally invested it that the full terror of the voyage must be kept withdrawn into the obscure background, for few men's courage is proof against protracted meditation unrelieved by action, that when they stood their long night watches, his officers and men must have some nearer things to think of than Moby Dick, for however eagerly and impetuously the savage crew had hailed the announcement of his quest, Yet all sailors of all sorts are more or less capricious and unreliable. They live in the varying outer weather, and they inhale its fickleness. And when retained for any object remote and blank in the pursuit, however promissory of life and passion in the end, it is above all things requisite that temporary interests and employments should intervene and hold them healthily suspended for the final dash. Nor was Ahab unmindful of another thing. In times of strong emotion mankind disdain all base considerations, but such times are evanescent. The permanent constitutional condition of the manufactured man, thought Ahab, is sordidness. Granting that the white whale fully incites the heart of this my savage crew, and playing round their savageness even breeds a certain generous knight-errantism in them, still, while for the love of it they give chase to Moby Dick, they must also have food for their more common daily appetites, for even the high-lifted and chivalric crusaders of old times were not content to traverse two thousand miles of land to fight for their holy sepulchre without committing burglaries, picking pockets, and gaining other pious perquisites by the way. Had they been strictly held to their one final and romantic object, that final and romantic object too many would have turned from in disgust. I will not strip these men, thought Ahab, of all hopes of cash. Aye, cash. They may scorn cash now, but let some months go by and no prospective promise of it to them, and then this same quiescent cash, all at once mutinying in them, this same cash would soon cashier Ahab. Nor was there wanting still another precautionary motive, more related to Ahab personally. Having impulsively, it is probable, and perhaps somewhat prematurely, revealed the prime but private purpose of the Pequod's voyage, Ahab was now entirely conscious that in so doing, he had indirectly laid himself open to the unanswerable charge of usurpation, and with perfect impunity, both moral and legal, his crew, if so disposed, and to that end competent, could refuse all further obedience to him and even violently wrest from him the command. From even the barely hinted imputation of usurpation, and the possible consequences of such a suppressed impression gaining ground, Ahab must, of course, have been most anxious to protect himself. That protection could only consist in his own predominating brain and heart and hand, backed by a heedful, closely calculating attention to every minute atmospheric influence which it was possible for his crew to be subjected to. For all these reasons, then, and others perhaps too analytic to be verbally developed here, 
Ahab plainly saw that he must still in a good degree continue true to the natural nominal purpose of the Pequod's voyage, observe all customary usages, and not only that, but force himself to evince all his well-known passionate interest in the general pursuit of his profession. Be all this as it may, his voice was now often heard hailing the three mastheads, and admonishing them to keep a bright lookout, and not omit reporting even a porpoise. This vigilance was not long without reward. Chapter 47 The Matmaker It was a cloudy, sultry afternoon. The seamen were lazily lounging about the decks, or vacantly gazing over into the lead-colored waters. Queequeg and I were mildly employed weaving what is called a sword-mat, for an additional lashing to our boat. So still and subdued, and somehow preluding, was all the scene, and such an incantation of reverie lurked in the air, that each silent sailor seemed resolved into his own invisible self. I was the attendant or page of Queequeg while busy at the mat, as I kept passing and repassing the filling or woof of marline between the long yarns of the warp, using my own hand for the shuttle, and as Queequeg, standing sideways, ever and anon slid his heavy oaken sword between the threads, and idly looking off upon the water carelessly and unthinkingly drove home every yarn, I say so strange a dreaminess did there then reign all over the ship, and all over the sea, only broken by the intermitting dull sound of the sword, that it seemed as if this were the loom of time, and I myself were a shuttle mechanically weaving and weaving away at the fates. There lay the fixed threads of the warp, subject to but one single ever-returning, unchanging vibration, and that vibration merely enough to admit of the crosswise interblending of other threads with its own, this warp seemed necessity, and here, thought I, with my own hand, I ply my own shuttle, and weave my own destiny into these unalterable threads. Meantime Queequeg's impulsive, indifferent sword, sometimes hitting the woof slantingly, or crookedly, or strongly, or weakly, as the case might be, and by this difference in the concluding blow producing a corresponding contrast in the final aspect of the completed fabric, this savage's sword, thought I, which thus finally shapes and fashions both warp and woof, this easy, indifferent sword must be chance, ay, chance, free will and necessity, nowise incompatible, all interweavingly working together. The straight warp of necessity, not to be swerved from its ultimate course, its every alternating vibration, indeed only tending to that, free will still free to ply her shuttle between given threads, and chance, though restrained in its play, within the right lines of necessity, and sideways in its motion directed by free will, though thus prescribed to by both, chance by turns rules either, and has the last featuring blow at events. Thus we were weaving and weaving away, when I started at a sound so strange, long-drawn, and musically wild and unearthly, that the ball of free will dropped from my hand, and I stood gazing up at the clouds whence that voice had dropped like a wing. High aloft in the cross-trees was that mad gay-header, Tashtego. His body was reaching eagerly forward, his hand stretched out like a wand, and at brief sudden intervals he continued his cries, to be sure, the same sound was that very moment perhaps being heard all over the seas, from hundreds of whalemen's lookouts perched as high in the air. But from few of those lungs could that accustomed old cry have derived such a marvellous cadence as from Tashtego the Indians. As he stood hovering over you, half suspended in air, so wildly and eagerly peering towards the horizon, you would have thought him some prophet or seer beholding the shadows of fate and by those wild cries announcing their coming. "'There she blows! There! 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 She blows! She blows! Where away? On the lee-beam, about two miles off, a school of them!' Instantly all was commotion. The sperm-whale blows as a clock ticks, with the same undeviating and reliable uniformity. 
and thereby whalemen distinguish this fish from other tribes of his genus. "'There go flukes!' was now the cry from Tashtego, and the whales disappeared. "'Quick, steward!' cried Ahab. "'Time! Time!' Doughboy hurried below, glanced at the watch, and reported the exact minute to Ahab. The ship was now kept away from the wind, and she went gently rolling before it. Tashtego, reporting that the whales had gone down heading to leeward, we confidently looked to see them again directly in advance of our bows, for that singular craft at times evinced by the sperm whale when, sounding with his head in one direction, he nevertheless, while concealed beneath the surface, mills round and swiftly swims off in the opposite quarter, this deceitfulness of his could not now be in action, for there was no reason to suppose that the fish seen by Tashtego had been in any way alarmed, or indeed knew at all of our vicinity. One of the men selected for shipkeepers, that is, those not appointed to the boats, by this time relieved the Indian at the main masthead. The sailors at the fore and mizzen had come down, the line tubs were fixed in their places, the cranes were thrust out, the main yard was backed, and the three boats swung over the sea like three samphire baskets over high cliffs. Outside of the bulwarks, their eager crews, with one hand clung to the rail, while one foot was expectantly poised on the gunwale. So look the long line of man-of-war's men about to throw themselves on board an enemy's ship. But at this critical instant, a sudden exclamation was heard, that took every eye from the whale. With a start all glared at dark Ahab, who was surrounded by five dusky phantoms, that seemed fresh formed out of air. End of chapters 45 to 47 Chapter 48 The First Lowering The phantoms, for so they seemed, were flitting on the other side of the deck, and, with a noiseless celerity, were casting loose the tackles and bands of the boat which swung there. This boat had always been deemed one of the spare boats, though technically called the captain's, on account of its hanging from the starboard quarter. The figure that now stood by its bows was tall and swart, with one white tooth evilly protruding from its steel-like lips. A rumpled Chinese jacket of black cotton funereally invested him, with wide black trousers of the same dark stuff, but strangely crowning this ebonness was a glistening white-pleated turban, the living hair braided and coiled round and round upon his head. Less sward in aspect, the companions of this figure were of that vivid, tiger-yellow complexion peculiar to some of the aboriginal natives of the Manilas, a race notorious for a certain diabolism of subtlety, and by some honest white mariners supposed to be the paid spies and secret confidential agents on the water of the devil, their lord, whose counting-room they supposed to be elsewhere. While yet the wandering ship's company were gazing upon these strangers, Ahab cried out to the white-turbaned old man at their head, "'All ready there, Fadala!' Ready, was the half-hissed reply. Lower away, then, do you hear? Shouting across the deck. Lower away there, I say. Such was the thunder of his voice that, spite of their amazement, the men sprang over the rail, the sheaves whirled around in the blocks, with a wallow the three boats dropped into the sea, while, with a dexterous off-handed daring, unknown in any other vocation, the sailors, goat-like, leaped down the rolling ship's side into the tossed boats below. Hardly had they pulled out from under the ship's lee, when a fourth keel, coming from the windward side, pulled round under the stern, and showed the five strangers rowing Ahab, who, standing erect in the stern, loudly hailed Starbuck, Stub, and Flask to spread themselves widely, so as to cover a large expanse of water, but with all their eyes again riveted upon the swart Fadala and his crew, the inmates of the other boats obeyed not the command. "'Captain Ahab,' said Starbuck. "'Spread yourselves,' cried Ahab. "'Give way, all four boats! Thou flask, pull out more to leeward. "'Aye, aye, sir,' cheerfully cried little Kingpost, sweeping round his great steering oar. "'Lay back!' 
addressing his crew. There, there, there again. There she blows right ahead, boys. Lay back. Never heed yonder yellow boys, Archie. Oh, I don't mind em, sir, said Archie. I knew it all before now. Didn't I hear em in the hold? And didn't I tell Kabako here of it? What say ye, Kabako? They're stowaways, Mr. Flask. Pull, pull, my fine hearts alive. Pull, my children. Pull, my little ones. Drawlingly and soothingly sighed Stubb to his crew, some of whom still showed signs of uneasiness. Why don't you break your backbones, my boys? What is it you stare at? Those chaps in yonder boat? Tut! They are only five more hands come to help us. Never mind from where. The more the merrier. Pull, then. Do pull. Never mind the brimstone. Devils are good fellows enough. So, so. There you are now. That's the stroke for a thousand pounds. That's the stroke to sweep the stakes. Hurrah for the gold cup of sperm oil, my heroes. Three cheers, men, all hearts alive. Easy, easy. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Why don't you snap your oars, you rascals? Bite something, you dogs. So, so, so then. Softly, softly. That's it. That's it. Long and strong. Give way there. Give way. The devil fetch you, you ragamuffin rapscallions. You're all asleep. Stop snoring, you sleepers, and pull. Pull, will ye? Pull, can't ye? Pull, won't ye? Why in the name of gudgeons and ginger cakes don't you pull? Pull and break something. Pull and start your eyes out. Here, whipping out the sharp knife from his girdle, every mother's son of you draw his knife and pull with the blade between your teeth. That's it. That's it. Now you do something. That looks like it, my steel bits. Starter. Starter, my silver spoons. Starter, marling spikes. Stubb's exordium to his crew is given here at large because he had a rather peculiar way of talking to them in general, and especially in inculcating the religion of rowing. But you must not suppose from this specimen of his sermonizings that he ever flew into downright passions with his congregation. Not at all, and therein consisted his chief peculiarity. He would say the most terrific things to his crew, in a tone so strangely compounded of fun and fury, and the fury seemed so calculated merely as a spice to the fun, that no oarsman could hear such queer invocations without pulling for dear life, and yet pulling for the mere joke of the thing. Besides, he all the time looked so easy and indolent himself, so loungingly managed his steering oar, and so broadly gaped, open-mouthed at times, that the mere sight of such a yawning commander, by sheer force of contrast, acted like a charm upon the crew. Then again, Stubb was one of those odd sort of humorists whose jollity is sometimes so curiously ambiguous as to put all inferiors on their guard in the matter of obeying them. In obedience to a sign from Ahab, Starbuck was now pulling obliquely across Stubb's bow, and when, for a minute or so, the two boats were pretty near to each other, Stubb hailed the mate. "'Mr. Starbuck, a larboard boat there, ahoy! A word with you, sir, if you please.' "'Hello,' returned Starbuck, turning round not a single inch as he spoke, still earnestly but whisperingly urging his crew, his face set like a flint from Stubb's. "'What think you of those yellow boys, sir?' "'Smuggled on board somehow before the ship sailed. "'Strong, strong, boys!' in a whisper to his crew, "'then speaking out loud again. "'A sad business, Mr. Stubb. "'See there, see there, my lads. "'But never mind, Mr. Stubb, all for the best. "'Let your crew pull strong, come what will. "'Spring, my men, spring! "'There's hogsheads of sperm ahead, Mr. Stubb, "'and that's what you came for. "'Pull, my boys!' Sperm, sperm's the play. This at least is duty, duty and profit hand in hand. I, I, I thought as much, soliloquized Stubb, when the boats diverged. As soon as I clapped eye on him, I thought so. Ay, ay, that's what he went into the afterhold for so often, as Doughboy long suspected. They were hidden down there. 
the white whale's at the bottom of it. Well, well, so be it. Can't be helped. All right. Give way, men. It ain't the white whale today. Give way. Now the advent of these outlandish strangers at such a critical instant as the lowering of the boats from the deck, this had not unreasonably awakened a sort of superstitious amazement in some of the ship's company. But Archie's fancied discovery, having some time previous got abroad among them, though indeed not credited then, this had in some small measure prepared them for the event. It took off the extreme edge of their wonder. So what with all this, and Stubb's confident way of accounting for their appearance, they were, for the time, freed from superstitious surmisings, though the affair still left abundant room for all manner of wild conjectures as to dark Ahab's precise agency in the matter from the beginning. For me, I silently recalled the mysterious shadows I had seen creeping on board the Pequod during the dim Nantucket dawn, as well as the enigmatical hintings of the unaccountable Elijah. Meanwhile, Ahab, out of hearing of his officers, having sighted the furthest to windward, was still ranging ahead of the other boats, a circumstance bespeaking how potent a crew was pulling him. Those tiger-yellow creatures of his seemed all steel and whalebone, like five trip-hammers they rose and fell with regular strokes of strength, which periodically started the boat along the water like a horizontal burst boiler out of a Mississippi steamer. As for Fadala, who was seen pulling the harpooner oar, he had thrown aside his black jacket, and displayed his naked chest with the whole part of his body above the gunwale, clearly cut against the alternating depressions of the watery horizon, while at the other end of the boat Ahab, with one arm like a fencer's thrown half backward into the air, as if to counterbalance any tendency to trip, Ahab was seen steadily managing his steering oar, as in a thousand boat lowerings ere the white whale had torn him. All at once the outstretched arm gave a peculiar motion, and then remained fixed, while the boat's five oars were seen simultaneously peaked. Boat and crew sat motionless on the sea. Instantly the three spread boats in the rear paused on their way. The whales had irregularly settled bodily down into the blue, thus giving no distantly discernible token of the movement, though from his closer vicinity Ahab had observed it. "'Every man, look out along his oars!' cried Starbuck. "'Thou, Queequeg, stand up!' Nimbly springing up on the triangular raised box in the bow, the savage stood erect there, and with intensely eager eyes gazed off towards the spot where the chase had last been descried. Likewise upon the extreme stern of the boat, where it was also triangularly platformed level with the gunwale, Starbuck himself was seen coolly and adroitly balancing himself to the jerking tossings of his chip of a craft, and silently eyeing the vast blue eye of the sea. Not very far distant, Flask's boat was also lying breathlessly still, its commander recklessly standing upon the top of the loggerhead, a stout sort of post rooted in the keel, and rising some two feet above the level of the stern platform. It is used for catching turns with the whale line. Its top is not more spacious than the palm of a man's hand, and standing upon such a base as that, Flask seemed perched at the masthead of some ship which had sunk to all but her trucks. But little King Post was small and short, and at the same time little King Post was full of a large and tall ambition, so that this loggerhead standpoint of his did by no means satisfy King Post. "'I can't see three seas off. Tip us up an oar there, and let me on to that.' Upon this Dagoo, with either hand upon the gunwale to steady his way, swiftly slid aft, and then, erecting himself, volunteered his lofty shoulders for a pedestal. "'Good a masthead as any, sir.' "'Will you mount?' "'That I will, and thank you very much, my fine fellow. Only I wish you fifty feet taller.' Whereupon, planting his feet firmly against two opposite planks of the boat, the gigantic negro, stooping a little, presented his flat palm to Flask's foot, and then, putting Flask's hand on his hearse-plumed head, and bidding him spring, as he himself should toss, with one dexterous fling landed the little man high and dry on his shoulders, and here was Flask now standing, 
Dagoo, with one lifted arm furnishing him with a breastband to lean against and steady himself by. At any time it is a strange sight to the Tyro to see with what wondrous habitude of unconscious skill the whaleman will maintain an erect posture in his boat, even when pitched about by the most riotously perverse and cross-running seas. Still more strange to see him giddily perched upon the loggerhead itself under such circumstances. But the sight of little flask mounted upon gigantic dagoo was yet more curious, for sustaining himself with a cool, indifferent, easy, unthought-of, barbaric majesty, the noble negro to every roll of the sea harmoniously rolled his fine form. On his broad back, flaxen-haired flask seemed a snowflake. The bearer looked nobler than the rider. Though truly vivacious, tumultuous, ostentatious little flask would now and then stamp with impatience, but not one added heave did he thereby give to the negro's lordly chest. So have I seen passion and vanity stamping the living magnanimous earth, but the earth did not alter her tides and her seasons for that. Meanwhile Stubb, the third mate, betrayed no such far-gazing solicitudes. The whales might have made one of their regular soundings, not a temporary dive from mere fright. And if that were the case, Stubb, as his wont in such cases, it seems, was resolved to solace the languishing interval with his pipe. He withdrew it from his hat-band, where he always wore it aslant like a feather. He loaded it, and rammed home the loading with his thumb-end. But hardly had he ignited his match across the rough sandpaper of his hand, when Tashtego, his harpooner, whose eyes had been setting to windward like two fixed stars, suddenly dropped like light from his erect attitude to his seat, crying out in a quick frenzy of hurry, Down, down all, and give way! There they are! To a landsman, no whale, nor any sign of a herring, would have been visible at that moment, nothing but a troubled bit of greenish-white water, and thin scattered puffs of vapour hovering over it, and suffusingly blowing off to leeward, like the confused scud from white rolling billows. The air around suddenly vibrated and tingled, as it were, like the air over intensely heated plates of iron. Beneath this atmospheric waving and curling, and partially beneath a thin layer of water also, the whales were swimming. Seen in advance of all the other indications, the puffs of vapour they spouted seemed their forerunning couriers and detached flying outriders. All four boats were now in keen pursuit of that one spot of troubled water and air. But it bade fair to outstrip them. It flew on and on, as a mass of interblending bubbles borne down a rapid stream from the hills. "'Pull, pull, my good boys,' said Starbuck, in the lowest possible, but intensest concentrated whisper to his men, while the sharp fixed glance from his eyes darted straight ahead of the bow almost seemed as two visible needles in two unerring binnacle compasses. He did not say much to his crew, though, nor did his crew say anything to him. Only the silence of the boat was at intervals startlingly pierced by one of his peculiar whispers, now harsh with command, now soft with entreaty. How different the loud little king-post! Sing out and say something, my hearties! Roar and pull my thunderbolts! Beach me! Beach me on their black backs, boys! Only do that for me, and I'll sign over to you my Martha's Vineyard plantation, boys, including wife and children, boys. Lay me on! Lay me on! Oh, Lord, Lord, but I shall go stark staring mad! See! See that white water! And so shouting, he pulled his hat from his head, and stamped up and down on it, then, picking it up, flirted it far off upon the sea, and finally fell to rearing and plunging in the boat's stern like a crazed colt from the prairie. "'Look at that chap now,' philosophically drawled Stubb, who, with his unlighted short pipe, mechanically retained between his teeth at a short distance, followed after. "'He's got fits, that flask has. Fits? Yes, give him fits. That's the very word. Pitch fits into him. Merrily, merrily, hearts alive. Pudding for supper, you know. Mary's the word. Pull, babes. Pull, sucklings. Pull all. But what the devil are you hurrying about? Softly, softly, and steadily, my men. 
Only pull and keep pulling, nothing more. Crack all your backbones, and bite your knives in two, that's all. Take it easy. Why don't you take it easy, I say, and burst all your livers and lungs? But what it was that inscrutable Ahab said to that tiger-yellow crew of his, these were words best omitted here, for you live under the blessed light of the evangelical land. Only the infidel sharks in the audacious seas may give ear to such words, when, with tornado brow, and eyes of red murder, and foam-glued lips, Ahab leaped after his prey. Meanwhile all the boats tore on. The repeated specific allusions of Flask to that whale, as he called the fictitious monster which he declared to be incessantly tantalizing his boat's bow with its tail, these allusions of his were at times so vivid and lifelike that they would cause some one or two of his men to snatch a fearful look over the shoulder. But this was against all rule, for the oarsmen must put out their eyes and ram a skewer through their necks, usage pronouncing that they must have no organs but ears, and no limbs but arms in these critical moments. It was a sight full of quick wonder and awe. The vast swells of the omnipotent sea, the surging hollow roar they made as they rolled along the eight gunnels, like gigantic bulls in a boundless bowling green, the brief suspended agony of the boat, as it would tip for an instant on the knife-like edge of the sharper waves, that almost seemed threatening to cut it in two, the sudden profound dip into the watery glens and hollows, the keen spurrings and goadings to gain the top of the opposite hill, the headlong sled-like slide down its other side, all these, with the cries of the headsmen and harpooners, and the shuddering gasps of the oarsmen, with the wondrous sight of the ivory Pequod bearing down upon her boats with outstretched sails, like a wild hen after her screaming brood. All this was thrilling. Not the raw recruit, marching from the bosom of his wife into the fever heat of his first battle, not the dead man's ghost encountering the first unknown phantom in the other world, neither of these can feel stranger and stronger emotions than that man does who, for the first time, finds himself pulling into the charmed, churned circle of the hunted sperm whale. The dancing white water made by the chase was now becoming more and more visible, owing to the increasing darkness of the dun cloud shadows flung upon the sea. The jets of vapor no longer blended, but tilted everywhere to right and left, the whales seemed separating their wakes. The boats were pulled more apart, Starbuck giving chase to three whales running dead to leeward. Our sail was now set, and with the still rising wind we rushed along, the boat going with such madness through the water that the lee oars could scarcely be worked rapidly enough to escape being torn from the rowlocks. Soon we were running through a suffusing wide veil of mist, neither ship nor boat to be seen. "'Give way, men!' whispered Starbuck, drawing still further aft the sheet of his sail. "'There is time to kill a fish yet before the squall comes. There's white water again. Close to! Spring!' Soon after, two cries in quick succession on each side of us denoted that the other boats had got fast, but hardly were they overheard when, with a lightning-like, hurtling whisper, Starbuck said, "'Stand up!' and Queequeg, harpoon in hand, sprang to his feet. Though not one of the oarsmen was then facing the life-and-death peril so close to them ahead, yet with their eyes on the intense countenance of the mate in the stern of the boat, they knew that the imminent instant had come. They heard, too, an enormous wallowing sound, as of fifty elephants stirring in their litter. Meanwhile the boat was still booming through the mist, the waves curling and hissing around us like the erected crests of enraged serpents. "'That's his hump!' "'There! There! Give it to him!' whispered Starbuck. A short, rushing sound leaped out of the boat. It was the darted iron of Queequeg. Then, all in one welded commotion, came an invisible push from astern, while forward the boat seemed striking on a ledge. The sail collapsed and exploded. A gush of scalding vapor shot up nearby. Something rolled and tumbled like an earthquake beneath us. The whole crew were half suffocated as they were tossed, helter-skelter, into the white-curdling cream of the squall. 
Squall, whale, and harpoon had all blended together, and the whale, merely grazed by the iron, escaped. Though completely swamped, the boat was nearly unharmed. Swimming round it, we picked up the floating oars, and, lashing them across the gunwale, tumbled back to our places. There we sat up to our knees in the sea, the water covering every rib and plank, so that to our downward-gazing eyes the suspended craft seemed a coral boat, grown up to us from the bottom of the ocean. The wind increased to a howl, the waves dashed their bucklers together, the whole squall roared, forked, and crackled around us like a white fire upon the prairies, in which, unconsumed, we were burning, immortal in these jaws of death. In vain we hailed the other boats, as well roar to the live coals down the chimney of a flaming furnace, as hail those boats in that storm. Meanwhile the driving scud, rack, and mist grew darker with the shadows of night. No sign of the ship could be seen. The rising sea forbade all attempts to bail out the boat. The oars were useless as propellers, performing now the office of life preservers. So, cutting the lashing of the waterproof match keg, after many failures, Starbuck contrived to ignite the lamp in the lantern. Then, stretching it on a waif pole, handed it to Queequeg as the standard bearer of this forlorn hope. There, then, he sat, holding up that imbecile candle in the heart of that almighty forlornness. There, then, he sat, the sign and symbol of a man without faith, hopelessly holding up hope in the midst of despair. Wet, drenched through, and shivering cold, despairing of ship or boat, we lifted our eyes as the dawn came on. The mist still spread over the sea, the empty lantern lay crushed in the bottom of the boat. Suddenly Queequeg started to his feet, hollowing his hand to his ear. We all heard a faint creaking, as of ropes and yards, hitherto muffled by the storm. The sound came nearer and nearer, the thick mists were dimly parted by a huge, vague form. Affrighted, we all sprang into the sea, as the ship at last loomed into view, bearing right down upon us, within a distance not much more than its length. Floating on the waves, we saw the abandoned boat. As for one instant it tossed and gaped beneath the ship's bows, like a chip at the base of a cataract. And then the vast hull rolled over it, and it was seen no more till it came up weltering astern. Again we swam for it, were dashed against it by the seas, and were at last taken up and safely landed on board. Ere the squall came close to, the other boats had cut loose from their fish, and returned to the ship in good time. The ship had given us up, but was still cruising, if haply it might light upon some token of our perishing, an oar or a lance-pole. CHAPTER Forty Nine, THE HYENA there are certain queer times and occasions in this strange mixed affair we call life, when a man takes this whole universe for a vast practical joke, though the wit thereof he but dimly discerns, and more than suspects that the joke is at nobody's expense but his own. However, nothing dispirits and nothing seems worth while disputing. He bolts down all events, all creeds and beliefs and persuasions, all hard things, visible and invisible, never mind how knobby, as an ostrich of potent digestion gobbles down bullets and gunflints. And as for small difficulties and worryings, prospects of sudden disaster, peril of life and limb, all these, and death itself, seem to him only sly, good-natured hits, and jolly punches in the side bestowed by the unseen and unaccountable old joker. That odd sort of wayward mood I am speaking of comes over a man only in some time of extreme tribulation. It comes in the very midst of his earnestness, so that what just before might have seemed to him a thing most momentous now seems but a part of the general joke. There is nothing like the perils of whaling to breed this free and easy sort of genial desperado philosophy, and with it I now regarded this whole voyage of the Pequod, and the great white whale, its object. Queequeg, said I, when they had dragged me, the last man, to the deck, and I was still shaking myself in my jacket to fling off the water, Queequeg, my fine friend, does this sort of thing often happen? 
without much emotion, though soaked through just like me, he gave me to understand that such things did often happen. Mr. Stubb, said I, turning to that worthy, who buttoned up in his oil jacket, was now calmly smoking his pipe in the rain. Mr. Stubb, I think I have heard you say that of all whalemen you ever met, our chief mate, Mr. Starbuck, is by far the most careful and prudent. I suppose, then, that going plump on a flying whale with your sail set in a foggy squall is the height of a whaleman's discretion. Certain. I've lowered for whales from a leaking ship in a gale off Cape Horn. Mr. Flask, said I, turning to little Kingpost, who was standing close by, you are experienced in these things, and I am not. Will you tell me whether it is an unalterable law in this fishery, Mr. Flask, for an oarsman to break his own back, pulling himself back foremost into death's jaws? Can't you twist that smaller? said Flask. Yes, that's the law. I should like to see a boat's crew backing water up to a whale face foremost. Ha <laughs> ha! The whale would give them squint for squint, mind that! Here, then, from three impartial witnesses, I had a deliberate statement of the entire case. Considering, therefore, that squalls and capsizings in the water, and consequent bivouacs on the deep, were matters of common occurrence in this kind of life, considering that, at the superlatively critical instant of going on to the whale, I must resign my life into the hands of him who steered the boat, oftentimes a fellow who, at that very moment, is in his impetuousness upon the point of scuttling the craft with his own frantic stampings, considering that the particular disaster to our own particular boat was chiefly to be imputed to Starbuck's driving on to his whale almost in the teeth of a squall, and considering that Starbuck, notwithstanding, was famous for his great heedfulness in the fishery, considering that I belonged to this uncommonly prudent Starbuck's boat, and finally considering in what a devil's chase I was implicated, touching the white whale, taking all things together, I say, I thought I might as well go below and make a rough draft of my will. Queequeg, said I, come along. You shall be my lawyer, executor, and legatee. It may seem strange that of all men, sailors should be tinkering at their last wills and testaments, but there are no people in the world more fond of that diversion. This was the fourth time in my nautical life that I had done the same thing. After the ceremony was concluded, upon the present occasion, I felt all the easier. A stone was rolled away from my heart. Besides, all the days I should now live would be as good as the days that Lazarus lived, after his resurrection, a supplementary clean gain of so many months or weeks, as the case might be. I survived myself. My death and burial were locked up in my chest. I looked round me tranquilly and contentedly, like a quiet ghost with a clean conscience sitting inside the bars of a snug family vault. Now then, thought I, unconsciously rolling up the sleeves of my frock, here goes for a cool, collected dive at death and destruction, and the devil fetch the hindmost. Chapter 50 Ahab's Boat and Crew Fidala well, Who would have thought it, Flask? cried Stubb. If I had but one leg, you would not catch me in a boat, unless maybe to stop the plug hole with my timber toe. Ha! <laughs> He's a wonderful old man. I don't think it's so strange, after all, on that account, said Flask. If his leg were off at the hip, now, it would be a different thing. That would disable him. But he has one knee, and a good part of the other left, you know. I don't know that, my little man. I never yet saw him kneel. Among whale-wise people it has often been argued whether— considering the paramount importance of his life to the success of the voyage, it is right for a whaling captain to jeopardize that life in the active perils of the chase. So Tamerlane soldiers often argued with tears in their eyes whether that invaluable life of his ought to be carried into the thickest of the fight. But with Ahab the question assumed a modified aspect. Considering that with two legs man is but a hobbling white in all times of danger— 
considering that the pursuit of whales is always under great and extraordinary difficulties, that every individual moment indeed then comprises a peril, under these circumstances is it wise for any maimed man to enter a whale-boat in the hunt? As a general thing, the joint owners of the Pequod must plainly have thought not. Ahab well knew that although his friends at home would think little of his entering a boat in certain comparatively harmless vicissitudes of the chase, for the sake of being near the scene of action and giving his orders in person, yet for Captain Ahab to have a boat actually apportioned to him as a regular headsman in the hunt, above all for Captain Ahab to be supplied with five extra men, as that same boat's crew, he well knew that such generous conceits never entered the heads of the owners of the Pequod. Therefore he had not solicited a boat's crew from them, nor had he in any way hinted his desires on that head. Nevertheless he had taken private measures of his own touching all that matter. Until Archie's published discovery, the sailors had little foreseen it, though to be sure when, after being a little while out of port, all hands had concluded the customary business of fitting the whaleboats for service, when some time after this Ahab was now and then found bestirring himself in the matter of making thole-pins with his own hands for what was thought to be one of the spare boats, and even solicitously cutting the small wooden skewers, which, when the line is running out, are pinned over the groove in the bow, when all this was observed in him, and particularly his solicitude in having an extra coat of sheathing in the bottom of the boat, as if to make it better withstand the pointed pressure of his ivory limb, and also the anxiety he evinced in exactly shaping the thigh-board, or clumsy cleat as it is sometimes called, the horizontal piece in the boat's bow for bracing the knee against, in darting or stabbing at the whale, when it was observed how often he stood up in that boat, with his solitary knee fixed in the semicircular depression in the cleat, and with the carpenter's chisel gouged out a little here, and straightened it a little there, all these things, I say, had awakened much interest and curiosity at the time. But almost everybody supposed that this particular preparative heedfulness in Ahab must only be with a view to the ultimate chase of Moby Dick for he had already revealed his intention to hunt that mortal monster in person. But such a supposition did by no means involve the remotest suspicion as to any boat's crew being assigned to that boat. Now, with these subordinate phantoms, what wonder remained soon waned away, for in a whaler wonders soon wane. Besides, now and then such unaccountable odds and ends of strange nations come up from the unknown nooks and ash-holes of the earth to man these floating outlaws of whalers, and the ships themselves often pick up such queer castaway creatures, found tossing about the open sea on planks, bits of wreck, oars, whale-boats, canoes, blown-off Japanese junks, and what not, that Beelzebub himself might climb up the side, and step down into the cabin to chat with the captain, and it would not create any unsubduable excitement in the forecastle. But be all this as it may, certain it is, that while the subordinate phantoms soon found their place among the crew, though still, as it were, somehow distinct from them, yet that hair-turbaned Fadala remained a muffled mystery to the last, whence he came in a mannerly world like this, by what sort of unaccountable tie he soon evinced himself to be linked with Ahab's peculiar fortunes, nay, so far as to have some sort of half-hinted influence, heaven knows, but it might have been even authority over him, all this none knew. But one cannot sustain an indifferent air concerning Fidala. He was such a creature as civilized domestic people in the temperate zone only see in their dreams, and that but dimly, but the like of whom now and then glide among the unchanging Asiatic communities, especially the Oriental Isles to the east of the continent, those insulated, immemorial, unalterable countries, which even in these modern days still preserve much of the ghostly aboriginalness of the earth's primal generations, when the memory of the first man was a distinct recollection, and all men his descendants, unknowing whence he came, eyed each other as real phantoms, and asked of the sun and the moon why they were created, and to what end. 
when though according to genesis the angels indeed consorted with the daughters of men the devils also add the uncanonical rabbins indulged in mundane amours end of chapters forty eight to fifty chapters fifty one to fifty three chapter fifty one the spirit spout days weeks passed and under easy sail the ivory pequod had slowly swept across four several cruising grounds that off the azores off the cape de verdes on the plate so called being off the mouth of the rio de la plata and the carroll ground an unstaked watery locality southerly from st helena it was while gliding through these latter waters that one serene and moonlight night when all the waves rolled by like scrolls of silver and by their soft suffusing seethings made what seemed a silvery silence not a solitude on such a silent night a silvery jet was seen far in advance of the white bubbles at the bow lit up by the moon it looked celestial seemed some plumed and glittering god uprising from the sea fadala first descried this jet for of these moonlight nights it was his wont to mount to the main masthead and stand a lookout there with the same precision as if it had been day and yet though herds of whales were seen by night not one whaleman in a hundred would venture a lowering for them you may think with what emotions then the seamen beheld this old oriental perched aloft at such unusual hours his turban and the moon companions in one sky but when after spending his uniform interval there for several successive nights without uttering a single sound when after all this silence his unearthly voice was heard announcing that silvery moonlit jet every reclining mariner started to his feet as if some winged spirit had lighted in the rigging and hailed the mortal crew there she blows had the trump of judgment blown they could not have quivered more yet still they felt no terror rather pleasure for though it was a most unwanted hour yet so impressive was the cry and so deliriously exciting that almost every soul on board instinctively desired a lowering walking the deck with quick side-lunging strides ahab commanded the tagallant sails and royals to be set and every stunsail spread the best man in the ship must take the helm then with every masthead manned the piled-up craft rolled down before the wind the strange upheaving lifting tendency of the taffrail breeze filling the hollows of so many sails made the buoyant hovering deck to feel like air beneath the feet while still she rushed along as if two antagonistic influences were struggling in her one to mount direct to heaven the other to drive yawingly to some horizontal goal and had you watched ahab's face that night you would have thought that in him also two different things were warring while his one live leg made lively echoes along the deck every stroke of his dead limb sounded like a coffin tap on life and death this old man walked but though the ship so swiftly sped and though from every eye like arrows the eager glances shot yet the silvery jet was no more seen that night every sailor swore he saw it once but not a second time this midnight spout had almost grown a forgotten thing when some days after lo at the same silent hour it was again announced again it was described by all but upon making sail to overtake it once more it disappeared as if it had never been and so it served us night after night till no one heeded it but to wonder at it mysteriously jetted into the clear moonlight or starlight as the case may be disappearing again for one whole day or two days or three and somehow seeming at every distinct repetition to be advancing still further and further in our van this solitary jet seemed forever alluring us on nor with the immemorial superstition of their race and in accordance with the preternaturalness as it seemed which in many things invested the pequod 
were there wanting some of the seamen who swore that whenever and wherever descried at however remote times or in however far apart latitudes and longitudes that unnearable spout was cast by one self-same whale and that whale moby dick for a time there reigned too a sense of peculiar dread at this flitting apparition as if it were treacherously beckoning us on and on in order that the monster might turn round upon us and rend us at last in the remotest and most savage seas these temporary apprehensions so vague but so awful derived a wondrous potency from the contrasting serenity of the weather in which beneath all its blue blandness some thought there lurked a devilish charm as for days and days we voyaged along through seas so wearily lonesomely mild that all space in repugnance to our vengeful errand seemed vacating itself of life before our urn-like prow but at last when turning to the eastward the cape winds began howling around us and we rose and fell upon the long troubled seas that are there when the ivory tusked pequod sharply bowed to the blast and gored the dark waves in her madness till like showers of silver chips the foam flakes flew over her bulwarks then all this desolate vacuity of life went away but gave place to sights more dismal than before close to our bows strange forms in the water darted hither and thither before us while thick in our rear view flew the inscrutable sea-ravens and every morning perched on our stays rows of these birds were seen and spite of our hootings for a long time obstinately clung to the hemp as though they deemed our ship some drifting uninhabited craft a thing appointed to desolation and therefore fit roosting place for their homeless selves and heaved and heaved still unrestingly heaved the black sea as if its vast tides were a conscience and the great mundane soul were in anguish and remorse for the long sin and suffering it had bred cape of good hope do they call you rather cape tormentoto as called of yore for long allured by the perfidious silences that before had attended us we found ourselves launched into this tormented sea where guilty beings transformed into those fowls and these fish seem condemned to swim on everlastingly without any haven in store or beat that black air without any horizon but calm snow-white and unvarying still directing its fountain of feathers to the sky still beckoning us on from before the solitary jet would at times be descried during all this blackness of the elements ahab though assuming for the time the almost continual command of the drenched and dangerous deck manifested the gloomiest reserve and more seldom than ever addressed his mates in tempestuous times like these after everything above and aloft has been secured nothing more can be done but passively to await the issue of the gale then captain and crew become practical fatalists so with his ivory leg inserted into its accustomed hole and with one hand firmly grasping a shroud ahab for hours and hours would stand gazing dead to windward while an occasional squall of sleet or snow would all but congeal his very eyelashes together meantime the crew driven from the forward part of the ship by the perilous seas that burstingly broke over its bows stood in a line along the bulwarks in the waist and the better to guard against the leaping waves each man had slipped himself into a sort of bowline secured to the rail in which he swung as in a loosened belt few or no words were spoken and the silent ship as if manned by painted sailors in wax day after day tore on through all the swift madness and gladness of the demoniac waves by night the same muteness of humanity before the shrieks of the ocean prevailed still in silence the men swung from the bolands still wordless ahab stood up to the blast even when wearied nature seemed demanding repose he would not seek that repose in his hammock never could starbuck forget the old man's aspect 
when one night, going down into the cabin to mark how the barometer stood, he saw him with closed eyes sitting straight in his floor-screwed chair, the rain and half-melted sleet of the storm from which he had some time before emerged still slowly dripping from the unremoved hat and coat. On the table beside him lay unrolled one of those charts of tides and currents which have previously been spoken of, his lantern swung from his tightly clenched hand. Though the body was erect, the head was thrown back, so that the closed eyes were pointed towards the needle of the telltale that swung from a beam in the ceiling. Footnote. The cabin compass is called the telltale, because without going to the compass at the helm, the captain while below can inform himself of the course of the ship. End of footnote. Terrible old man! thought Starbuck, with a shudder. Sleeping in this gale, still thou steadfastly eyest thy purpose. Chapter 52 The Albatross Southeastward from the Cape, off the distant Crozettes, a good cruising ground for right whalemen, a sail loomed ahead, the Goni, Albatross by name. As she slowly drew nigh, from my lofty perch at the foremast-head I had a good view of that sight so remarkable to a tyro in the far ocean fisheries, a whaler at sea and long absent from home. As if the waves had been fullers, this craft was bleached like the skeleton of a stranded walrus. All down her sides this spectral appearance was traced with long channels of reddened rust, while all her spars and her rigging were like the thick branches of trees furred over with hoar-frost. Only her lower sails were set. A wild sight it was to see her long-bearded lookouts at those three mastheads. They seemed clad in the skins of beasts, so torn and bepatched the raiment that had survived nearly four years of cruising. Standing in iron hoops nailed to the mast, they swayed and swung over a fathomless sea, and though when the ship slowly glided close under our stern, we six men in the air came so nigh to each other that we might almost have leaped from the mastheads of one ship to those of the other, yet those forlorn-looking fishermen, mildly eyeing us as they passed, said not one word to our lookouts, while the quarter-deck hail was being heard from below. "'Ship ahoy! Have you seen the white whale?' But as the strange captain, leaning over the pallid bulwarks, was in the act of putting his trumpet to his mouth, it somehow fell from his hand into the sea, and the wind now rising amain, he in vain strove to make himself heard without it. Meantime his ship was still increasing the distance between. While in various silent ways the seamen of the Pequod were evincing their observance of this ominous incident at the first mere mention of the white whale's name to another ship, Ahab for a moment paused. It almost seemed as though he would have lowered a boat to board the stranger had not the threatening wind forbade. But taking advantage of his windward position, he again seized his trumpet, and knowing by her aspect that the stranger vessel was a Nantucketer, and shortly bound home, he loudly hailed, Ahoy there! This is the Pequod, bound round the world. Tell them to address all future letters to the Pacific Ocean. And this time three years, if I am not home, tell them to address them to— At that moment the two wakes were fairly crossed and instantly, then, in accordance with their singular ways, shoals of small, harmless fish, that for some days before had been placidly swimming by our side, darted away with what seemed shuddering fins, and ranged themselves fore and aft with the stranger's flanks. Though in the course of his continual voyagings Ahab must often before have noticed a similar sight, yet to any monomaniac man, the various trifles capriciously carry meanings. "'Swim away from me, do ye?' murmured Ahab, gazing over into the water. There seemed but little in the words, but the tone conveyed more of deep helpless sadness than the insane old man had ever before evinced. But turning to the steersman, who thus far had been holding the ship in the wind to diminish her headway, he cried out in his old lion voice, "'Up helm!' 
Keep her off round the world. Round the world. There is much in that sound to inspire proud feelings. But where to does all that circumnavigation conduct? Only, through numberless perils, to the very point whence we started, where those that we left behind secure were all the time before us. Were this world an endless plain, and by sailing eastward we could forever reach new distances and discover sights more sweet and strange than any Cyclades or islands of King Solomon, then there were promise in the voyage. But in pursuit of those far mysteries we dream of, or in tormented chase of that demon phantom that, some time or other, swims before all human hearts, while chasing such over this round globe, they either lead us on in barren mazes, or midway leave us whelmed. Chapter 53 The Gam The ostensible reason why Ahab did not go on board of the whaler we had spoken was this, the wind and sea betoken storms. But even had this not been the case, he would not, after all, perhaps have boarded her, judging by his subsequent conduct on similar occasions, if so it had been that, by the process of hailing, he had obtained a negative answer to the question he put. For, as it eventually turned out, he cared not to consort, even for five minutes, with any stranger captain except he could contribute some of that information he so absorbingly sought. But all this might remain inadequately estimated were not something said here of the peculiar usages of whaling vessels when meeting each other in foreign seas, and especially on a common cruising ground. If two strangers crossing the Pine Barrens in New York State, or the equally desolate Salisbury Plain in England, if casually encountering each other in such inhospitable wilds, these twain, for the life of them, cannot well avoid a mutual salutation, and stopping for a moment to interchange the news, and perhaps sitting down for a while and resting in concert, then how much more natural that upon the illimitable pine barrens and Salisbury plains of the sea, two whaling vessels descrying each other at the ends of the earth, off Lone Fanning's Island or the faraway King's Mills, how much more natural, I say, that under such circumstances these ships should not only interchange hails, but come into still closer, more friendly and sociable contact, and especially would this seem to be a matter of course in the case of vessels owned in one seaport, and whose captains, officers, and not a few of the men are personally known to each other, and consequently have all sorts of dear domestic things to talk about. For the long-absent ship, the outward bounder perhaps has letters on board. At any rate, she will be sure to let her have some papers of a date a year or two later than the last one on her blurred and thumb-worn files. And, in return for that courtesy, the outward-bound ship would receive the latest whaling intelligence from the cruising ground to which she may be destined, a thing of the utmost importance to her. And, in degree, all of this will hold true concerning whaling vessels crossing each other's track on the cruising ground itself, even though they are equally long absent from home. For one of them may have received a transfer of letters from some third and now far remote vessel, and some of those letters may be for the people of the ship she now meets. Besides, they would exchange the whaling news and have an agreeable chat, for not only would they meet with all the sympathies of sailors, but likewise with all the peculiar congenialities arising from a common pursuit and mutually shared privations and perils. Nor would difference of country make any very essential difference, that is, so long as both parties speak one language, as is the case with Americans and English, though to be sure from the small number of English whalers such meetings do not very often occur and when they do occur, there is too apt to be a sort of shyness between them, for your Englishman is rather reserved, and your Yankee he does not fancy that sort of thing in anybody but himself. 
Besides, the English whalers sometimes affect a kind of metropolitan superiority over the American whalers, regarding the long, lean Nantucketer, with his nondescript provincialisms, as a sort of sea peasant. But where this superiority in the English whalemen does really consist, it would be hard to say, seeing that the Yankees in one day collectively kill more whales than all the English collectively in ten years. But this is a harmless little foible in the English whale hunters, which the Nantucketer does not take much to heart, probably because he knows he has a few foibles himself. So then, we see that of all ships separately sailing the sea, the whalers have most reason to be sociable, and they are so. Whereas some merchant ships crossing each other's wake in the mid-Atlantic will oftentimes pass on without so much as a single word of recognition, mutually cutting each other on the high seas like a brace of dandies in Broadway, and all the time indulging, perhaps, in finical criticism upon each other's rig, as for men of war, when they chance to meet at sea, they first go through such a string of silly bowings and scrapings, such a ducking of ensigns, that there does not seem to be much right-down hearty good will and brotherly love about it at all. As touching slave ships meeting, why they are in such a prodigious hurry they run away from each other as soon as possible. And as for pirates, when they chance to cross each other's crossbones, the first hail is, how many skulls? The same way that whalers hail, how many barrels? And that question once answered, pirates straightway steer apart, for they are infernal villains on both sides, and don't like to see over much of each other's villainous likenesses. But look at the godly, honest, unostentatious, hospitable, sociable, free and easy whaler. What does the whaler do when she meets another whaler in any sort of decent weather? She has a gam, a thing so utterly unknown to all other ships, that they never heard of the name even, and if by chance they should hear of it, they only grin at it, and repeat gamesome stuff about spouters and blubber boilers, and such like pretty exclamations. Why it is that all merchant seamen, and also all pirates and man-of-war's men, and slave-ship sailors, cherish such a scornful feeling towards whale-ships, this is a question it would be hard to answer. Because in the case of pirates, say, I should like to know whether that profession of theirs has any particular glory about it. It sometimes ends in uncommon elevation, indeed, but only at the gallows. And besides, when a man is elevated in that odd fashion, he has no proper foundation for his superior altitude. Hence I conclude that in boasting himself to be high lifted above a whaleman, in that assertion the pirate has no solid basis to stand on. But what is a gam? You might wear out your index finger running up and down the columns of dictionaries and never find the word. Dr. Johnson never attained to that erudition. Noah Webster's Ark does not hold it. Nevertheless, this same expressive word has now for many years been in constant use among some 15,000 true-born Yankees. Certainly it needs a definition, and should be incorporated into the lexicon. With that view, let me learnedly define it. Gam. Noun. A social meeting of two or more whale ships, generally on a cruising ground, when, after exchanging hails, they exchange visits by boats' crews, the two captains remaining for the time on board of one ship, and the two chief mates on the other. There is another little item about gamming which must not be forgotten here. All professions have their own little peculiarities of detail, so has the whale fishery. In a pirate, man of war, or slave ship, when the captain is rowed anywhere in his boat, he always sits in the stern sheets on a comfortable, sometimes cushioned seat there, and often steers himself with a pretty little milliner's tiller decorated with gay cords and ribbons. But the whale-boat has no seat astern, no sofa of that sort whatever, and no tiller at all. 
High times indeed, if whaling captains were wheeled about the water on casters, like gouty old aldermen in patent chairs. And as for the tiller, the whaleboat never admits of any such effeminacy, and therefore, as in gamming a complete boat's crew must leave the ship, and hence as the boat steerer or harpooner is of that number, that subordinate is the steersman upon the occasion, and the captain, having no place to sit in, is pulled off to his visit all standing like a pine tree. And often you will notice that being conscious of the eyes of the whole visible world resting on him from the sides of the two ships, this standing captain is all alive to the importance of sustaining his dignity by maintaining his legs. Nor is this any very easy matter, for in his rear is the immense projecting steering oar hitting him now and then in the small of his back, the after oar reciprocating by wrapping his knees in front. He is thus completely wedged before and behind, and can only expand himself sideways by settling down on his stretched legs. But a sudden violent pitch of the boat will often go far to topple him, because length of foundation is nothing without corresponding breadth. Merely make a spread angle of two poles, and you cannot stand them up. Then, again, it would never do in plain sight of the world's riveted eyes, it would never do, I say, for this straddling captain to be seen steadying himself the slightest particle by catching hold of anything with his hands. Indeed, as token of his entire, buoyant self-command, he generally carries his hands in his trousers' pockets, but perhaps being generally very large, heavy hands, he carries them there for ballast. Nevertheless, there have occurred instances, well-authenticated ones too, where the captain has been known for an uncommonly critical moment or two, in a sudden squall, say, to seize hold of the nearest oarsman's hair, and hold on there like grim death. End of chapters 51 to 53 Chapter 54 The Town Hose Story As Told at the Golden Inn The Cape of Good Hope, and all the watery region about there, is much like some noted four corners of a great highway, where you meet more travellers than in any other part. It was not very long after speaking the goni that another homeward-bound whaleman, the Town Ho, was encountered. She was manned almost wholly by Polynesians. In the short gam that ensued, she gave us strong news of Moby Dick. To some, the general interest in the white whale was now wildly heightened by a circumstance of the town ho's story, which seemed obscurely to involve with the whale a certain wondrous inverted visitation of one of those so-called judgments of God which are at times said to overtake some men. This latter circumstance, with its own particular accompaniments, forming what may be called the secret part of the tragedy about to be narrated, never reached the ears of Captain Ahab or his mates, for that secret part of the story was unknown to the captain of the town Ho himself. It was the private property of three Confederate white seamen of that ship, one of whom, it seems, communicated it to Tashtego with Romish injunctions of secrecy, but the following night Tashtego rambled in his sleep, and revealed so much of it in that way, that when he was wakened he could not well withhold the rest. Nevertheless, so potent an influence did this thing have on those seamen in the Pequod who came to the full knowledge of it, and by such a strange delicacy, to call it so, were they governed in this matter, that they kept the secret among themselves so that it never transpired abaft the Pequod's mainmast. Interweaving in its proper place this darker thread with the story as publicly narrated on the ship, the whole of this strange affair I now proceed to put on lasting record. Footnote. Town Ho the ancient whale cry upon first sighting a whale from the masthead, still used by whalemen in hunting the famous Galapagos terrapin. End of footnote. 
For my humor's sake, I shall preserve the style in which I once narrated it at Lima, to a lounging circle of my Spanish friends, one saint's eve, smoking upon the thick-gilt, tiled piazza of the Golden Inn. Of those fine cavaliers, the young dons Pedro and Sebastian were on closer terms with me, and hence the interluding questions they occasionally put, and which are duly answered at the time. Quote, some two years prior to my first learning the events which I am about rehearsing to you, gentlemen, the town ho, sperm whaler of Nantucket, was cruising in your Pacific here, not very many days sail eastward from the eaves of this good golden inn. She was somewhere to the northward of the line. One morning, upon handling the pumps, according to daily usage, it was observed that she made more water in her hold than common, they supposed a swordfish had stabbed her, gentlemen. But the captain, having some unusual reason for believing that rare good luck awaited him in those latitudes, and therefore being very averse to quit them, and the leak not being then considered at all dangerous, though indeed they could not find it after searching the hold as low down as was possible in rather heavy weather, the ship still continued her cruisings, the mariners working at the pumps at wide and easy intervals. But no good luck came, more days went by, and not only was the leak yet undiscovered, but it sensibly increased, so much so that, now taking some alarm, the captain, making all sail, stood away for the nearest harbour among the islands, there to have his hull hove out and repaired. Though no small passage was before her, yet if the commonest chance favoured, he did not at all fear that his ship would founder by the way, because his pumps were of the best, and being periodically relieved at them, those six-and-thirty men of his could easily keep the ship free, never mind if the leak should double on her. In truth, well-nigh the whole of this passage being attended by very prosperous breezes, the town ho had all but certainly arrived in perfect safety at her port without the occurrence of the least fatality, had it not been for the brutal overbearing of Radney, the mate, a vineyarder, and the bitterly provoked vengeance of Steelkilt, a lakeman and desperado from Buffalo. Lakeman, Buffalo, pray what is a lakeman, and where is Buffalo? said Don Sebastian, rising in his swinging mat of grass. On the eastern shore of our Lake Erie, Don, but I crave your courtesy, uh, may be you shall soon hear further of all that. Now, gentlemen, in square-sail brigs and three-masted ships, well-nigh as large and stout as any that ever sailed out of your old Callao to far Manila, this lakeman, in the landlocked heart of our America, had yet been nurtured by all those agrarian freebooting impressions popularly connected with the open ocean. For in their interflowing aggregate, those grand freshwater seas of ours, Erie and Ontario and Huron and Superior and Michigan, possess an ocean-like expansiveness with many of the ocean's noblest traits, with many of its rimmed varieties of races and of climes, they contain round archipelagos of romantic isles, even as the Polynesian waters do, in large part are shored by two great contrasting nations as the Atlantic is. They furnish long maritime approaches to our numerous territorial colonies from the east, dotted all round their banks, here and there are frowned upon by batteries, and by the goat-like craggy guns of lofty Mackinaw. They have heard the fleet thunderings of naval victories. At intervals they yield their beaches to wild barbarians, whose red-painted faces flash from out their peltry wigwams. For leagues and leagues are flanked by ancient and unentered forests, where the gaunt pines stand like serried lines of kings in Gothic genealogies, those same woods harboring wild Afric beasts of prey, and silken creatures whose exported furs give robes to Tartar emperors. They mirror the paved capitals of Buffalo and Cleveland, as well as Winnebago villages. 
They float alike the full-rigged merchant ship, the armed cruiser of the state, the steamer, and the beach canoe. They are swept by Borean and dismasting blasts as direful as any that lash the salted wave. They know what shipwrecks are, for out of sight of land, however inland, they have drowned full many a midnight ship with all its shrieking crew. Thus, gentlemen, though an inlander, Steelkilt was wild ocean-born and wild ocean-nurtured, as much of an audacious mariner as any. And for Radney, though in his infancy he may have laid him down on the lone Nantucket beach, to nurse at his maternal sea, though in after-life he had long followed our austere Atlantic and your contemplative Pacific, Yet he was quite as vengeful and full of social quarrel as the backwoods seaman, fresh from the latitudes of buckhorn-handled buoy knives Yet was this Nantucketer a man with some good-hearted traits, and this lakeman a mariner who, though a sort of devil indeed, might yet by inflexible firmness, only tempered by that common decency of human recognition which is the meanest slave's right, Thus treated, this steel-kilt had long been retained harmless and docile. At all events, he had proved so thus far, but Radney was doomed and made mad, and steel-kilt— But, gentlemen, you shall hear. It was not more than a day or two at the furthest, after pointing her prow for her island haven, that the town hose leak seemed again increasing— but only so as to require an hour or more at the pumps every day. You must know that in a settled and civilized ocean like our Atlantic, for example, some skippers think little of pumping their whole way across it, though of a still sleepy night, should the officer of the deck happen to forget his duty in that respect, the probability would be that he and his shipmates would never again remember it, on account of all hands gently subsiding to the bottom nor in the solitary and savage seas far from you to the westward, gentlemen, is it altogether unusual for ships to keep clanging at their pump-handles in full chorus, even for a voyage of considerable length, that is, if it lie along a tolerably accessible coast, or if any other reasonable retreat is afforded them. It is only when a leaky vessel is in some very out-of-the-way part of those waters, some really landless latitude, that her captain begins to feel a little anxious. Much this way had it been with the town hoe. So, when her leak was found gaining once more, there was, in truth, some small concern manifested by several of her company, especially by Radney, the mate. He commanded the upper sails to be well hoisted, sheeted home anew, and every way expanded to the breeze. Now this Radney, I suppose, was as little of a coward, and as little inclined to any sort of nervous apprehensiveness touching his own person, as any fearless, unthinking creature on land or on sea that you can conveniently imagine, gentlemen. Therefore, when he betrayed this solicitude about the safety of the ship, some of the seamen declared that it was only on account of his being a part owner in her. So, when they were working that evening at the pumps, there was on this head no small gamesomeness slyly going on among them, as they stood with their feet continually overflowed by the rippling clear water, clear as any mountain spring, gentlemen, that, bubbling from the pumps, ran across the deck, and poured itself out in steady spouts at the lee scupper holes. Now, as you well know, it is not seldom the case in this conventional world of ours, watery or otherwise, that when a person placed in command over his fellow men finds one of them to be very significantly his superior in general pride of manhood, straightway against that man he conceives an unconquerable dislike and bitterness, and if he have a chance, he will pull down and pulverize that subaltern's tower, and make a little heap of dust of it. Be this conceit of mine as it may, gentlemen, at all events Steelkilt was a tall and noble animal with a head like a Roman, and a flowing golden beard like the tasseled housings of your last viceroy's snorting charger, and a brain and a heart and a soul in him, gentlemen, which had made Steelkilt Charlemagne, had he been born son to Charlemagne's father. 
But Radney, the mate, was as ugly as a mule, yet as hardy, as stubborn, as malicious. He did not love Steelkilt, and Steelkilt knew it. Espying the mate drawing near as he was toiling at the pump with the rest, the lake men affected not to notice him, but unawed went on with his gay banterings. Aye, aye, my merry lads, it's a lively leak, this. Hold a canakin, one of ye, and let's have a taste. By the Lord, it's worth bottling. I tell ye what, men, old Rad's investment must go for it. He had best cut away his part of the hull and tow it home. The fact is, boys, that swordfish only began the job. He's come back again with a gang of ship carpenters, sawfish, and filefish, and what not. And the whole posse of em are now hard at work, cutting and slashing the bottom, making improvements, I suppose. If old Rad were here now, I'd tell him to jump overboard and scatter em. They're playing the devil with his estate, I can tell him. But he's a simple old soul, Rad, and a beauty, too. Boys, they say the rest of his property is invested in looking-glasses. I wonder if he'd give a poor devil like me the model of his nose. "'Damn your eyes! What's that pump stopping for?' roared Radney, pretending not to have heard the sailors talk. "'Thunder away at it!' "'Aye, aye, sir,' said Steelkilt, merry as a cricket. "'Lively, boys, lively now!' And with that the pump clanged like fifty fire-engines. The men tossed their hats off to it, and ere long that peculiar gasping of the lungs was heard, which denotes the fullest tensions of life's utmost energies. Quitting the pump at last with the rest of his band, the lakeman went forward all panting, and sat himself down on the windlass, his face fiery red, his eyes bloodshot and wiping the profuse sweat from his brow. Now what cousining fiend it was, gentlemen, that possessed Radney to meddle with such a man in that corporeally exasperated state I know not. But so it happened. Intolerably striding along the deck, the mate commanded him to get a broom and sweep down the planks, and also a shovel, and remove some offensive matters consequent upon allowing a pig to run at large. Now, gentlemen, sweeping a ship's deck at sea is a piece of household work, which in all times but raging gales is regularly attended to every evening. It has been known to be done in the case of ships actually foundering at the time. Such, gentlemen, is the inflexibility of sea usages, and the instinctive love of neatness in seamen, some of whom would not willingly drown without first washing their faces. But in all vessels this broom business is the prescriptive province of the boys, if boys there be aboard. Besides, it was the stronger men in the town ho that had been divided into gangs, taking turns at the pumps, and, being the most athletic seaman of them all, Steelkilt had been regularly assigned captain of one of the gangs. Consequently, he should have been freed from any trivial business not connected with truly nautical duties, such being the case with his comrades. I mention all of these particulars so that you may understand exactly how this affair stood between the two men. But there was more than this. The order about the shovel was almost as plainly meant to sting and insult Steelkilt as though Radney had spat in his face. Any man who has gone sailor in a whale-ship will understand this, and all this, and doubtless much more, the lakeman fully comprehended when the mate uttered his command. But as he sat still for a moment, and as he steadfastly looked into the mate's malignant eye, and perceived the stacks of powder-casks heaped up in him, and the slow match silently burning along towards them, as he instinctively saw all this, that strange forbearance and unwillingness to stir up the deeper passionateness in any already ireful being, a repugnance most felt, when felt at all, by really valiant men, even when aggrieved, this nameless phantom feeling, gentlemen, stole over Steelkilt. Therefore, in his ordinary tone, only a little broken by the bodily exhaustion he was temporarily in, 
he answered him saying that sweeping the deck was not his business and he would not do it and then without at all alluding to the shovel he pointed to three lads as the customary sweepers who not being billeted at the pumps had done little or nothing all day to this radney replied with an oath in a most domineering and outrageous manner unconditionally reiterating his command meanwhile advancing upon the still seated lakeman with an uplifted cooper's club hammer which he had snatched from a cask near by heated and irritated as he was by his spasmodic toil at the pumps for all his first nameless feeling of forbearance the sweating steel kilt could but ill brook this bearing in the mate but somehow still smothering the conflagration within him without speaking he remained doggedly rooted to his seat till at last the incensed radney shook the hammer within a few inches of his face furiously commanding him to do his bidding steelkilt rose and slowly retreating round the windlass steadily followed by the mate with his menacing hammer deliberately repeated his intention not to obey seeing however that his forbearance had not the slightest effect by an awful and unspeakable intimation with his twisted hand he warned off the foolish and infatuated man but it was to no purpose and in this way the two went once slowly round the windlass when resolved at last no longer to retreat bethinking him that he had now forborne as much as comported with his humour the lakeman paused on the hatches and thus spoke to the officer mr radney i will not obey you take that hammer away or look to yourself but the predestinated mate coming still closer to him where the lakeman stood fixed now shook the heavy hammer within an inch of his teeth meanwhile repeating a string of insufferable maledictions retreating not the thousandth part of an inch stabbing him in the eye with the unflinching poniard of his glance steel kilt clenching his right hand behind him and creepingly drawing it back told his persecutor that if the hammer but grazed his cheek he steel kilt would murder him but gentlemen the fool had been branded for the slaughter by the gods immediately the hammer touched his cheek the next instant the lower jaw of the mate was stove in his head he fell on the hatch spouting blood like a whale ere the cry could go aft steel kilt was shaking one of the backstays leading far aloft to where two of his comrades were standing their mastheads they were both canallers canallers cried don pedro we have seen many whale ships in our harbours but never heard of your canallers pardon who and what are they canallers don are the boatmen belonging to our grand erie canal you must have heard of it nay senor hereabouts in this dull warm most lazy and hereditary land we know but little of your vigorous north ay well then don refill my cup your chicha's very fine and ere proceeding further i will tell you what our canallers are for such information may throw sidelight upon my story for three hundred and sixty miles gentlemen through the entire breadth of the state of new york through numerous populous cities and most thriving villages through long dismal uninhabited swamps and affluent cultivated fields unrivalled for fertility by billiard-room and bar-room through the holy of holies of great forests on roman arches over indian rivers through sun and shade by happy hearts are broken through all the wide contrasting scenery of those noble mohawk counties and especially by rows of snow-white chapels whose spires stand almost like milestones flows one continual stream of venetianly corrupt and often lawless life there's your true ashanti gentlemen there howl your pagans where you ever find them next door to you under the long-flung shadow and the snug patronizing lee of churches for by some curious fatality as it is often noted of your metropolitan freebooters that they ever encamp around the halls of justice so sinners gentlemen most abound in holiest vicinities 
"'Is that a friar passing?' said Don Pedro, looking downwards into the crowded piazza with humorous concern. "'Well, for our northern friend, Dame Isabella's inquisition wanes in Lima,' laughed Don Sebastian. "'Proceed, senor.' "'A moment! Pardon!' cried another of the company. "'In the name of all us Limis, I but desire to express to you, Sir Sailor, that we have by no means overlooked your delicacy in not substituting present Lima for distant Venice in your corrupt comparison. Oh, no, do not bow and look surprised. You know the proverb along all this coast, corrupt as Lima. It but bears out your saying, too, churches more plentiful than billiard-tables, and forever open, and corrupt as Lima. So, too, Venice, I have been there, the holy city of the blessed evangelist St. Mark. St. Dominic, purge it. Your cup. Thanks, here I refill. Now, you pour out again. Freely depicted in his own vocation, gentlemen, the canaller would make a fine dramatic hero, so abundantly and picturesquely wicked is he. Like Mark Antony, for days and days along his green-turfed flowery Nile, he indolently floats, openly toying with his red-cheeked Cleopatra, ripening his apricot thigh upon the sunny deck. But ashore all this effeminacy is dashed, the brigandish guise which the canaller so proudly sports, his slouched and gaily ribboned hat betoken his grand features, a terror to the smiling innocence of the villages through which he floats, his swart visage and bold swagger are not unshunned in cities. Once a vagabond on his own canal, I have received good turns from one of these canalers. I thanked him heartily, would fain not be ungrateful, but it is often one of the prime redeeming qualities of your man of violence that at times he is as stiff an arm to back a poor stranger in a strait as to plunder a wealthy one. In some, gentlemen, what the wildness of this canal life is, is emphatically evinced by this, that our wild whale-fishery contains so many of its most finished graduates, and that scarce any race of mankind, except Sydney men, are so much distrusted by our whaling captains, nor does it at all diminish the curiousness of this matter, that to many thousands of our rural boys and young men born along its line, the probationary life of the Grand Canal furnishes the sole transition between quietly reaping in a Christian cornfield and recklessly ploughing the waters of the most barbaric seas. "'I see, I see!' impetuously exclaimed Don Pedro, spilling his chicha upon his silvery ruffles. No need to travel. The world's one lima. I had thought now that at your temperate north the generations were cold and holy as the hills. But the story. I left off, gentlemen, where the lakeman shook the backstay. Hardly had he done so, when he was surrounded by the three junior mates and the four harpooners, who all crowded him to the deck. But sliding down the ropes like baleful comets, the two canalers rushed into the uproar, and sought to drag their man out of it toward the forecastle. Others of the sailors joined with them in this attempt, and a twisted turmoil ensued. While standing out of harm's way, the valiant captain danced up and down with a whale-pike, calling upon his officers to manhandle that atrocious scoundrel, and smoke him along to the quarter-deck. At intervals he ran close up to the revolving border of the confusion, and prying into the heart of it with his pike, sought to prick out the object of his resentment. But Steelkilt and his desperadoes were too much for them all. They succeeded in gaining the forecastle deck, where, hastily slewing about three or four large casks in a line with the windlass, these sea Parisians entrenched themselves behind the barricade. "'Come out of that, ye pirates!' roared the captain, now menacing them with a pistol in each hand, just brought to him by the steward. "'Come out of that, ye cutthroats!' Steelkilt leaped on the barricade, and, striding up and down there, defied the worst the pistols could do but gave the captain to understand distinctly that his, Steelkilt's, death 
would be the signal for a murderous mutiny on the part of all hands. Fearing in his heart lest this might prove but too true, the captain a little desisted, but still commanded the insurgents instantly to return to their duty. "'Will you promise not to touch us if we do?' demanded their ringleader. "'Turn to! Turn to! I make no promise. To your duty! Do you want to sink the ship by knocking off at a time like this? Turn to!' And he once more raised a pistol. "'Sink the ship!' cried Steelkilt. "'Aye, let her sink! Not a man of us turns to unless you swear not to raise a rope-yarn against us. What say ye, men?' turning to his comrades. A fierce cheer was their response. The lakeman now patrolled the barricade, all the while keeping his eye on the captain, and jerking out such sentences as these. "'It's not our fault. We didn't want it. I told him to take his hammer away. It was boy's business. He might have known me before this. I told him not to prick the buffalo. I believe I have broken a finger here against his cursed jaw.' Ain't those mincing knives down in the foxel there, men? Look to those handspikes, my hearties. Captain, by God, look to yourself. Say the word, and don't be a fool. Forget it all. We are ready to turn to. Treat us decently, and we're your men, but we won't be flogged. Turn to! I make no promises. Turn to, I say. Look ye now, cried the lakeman, flinging out his arms towards him. There are a few of us here, and I am one of them, who have shipped for the cruise, do you see? Now, as you well know, sir, we can claim our discharge as soon as the anchor is down. So we don't want a row. It's not our interest. We want to be peaceable. We are ready to work, but we won't be flogged. Turn to, roared the captain. Steelkilt glanced round him a moment, and then said, I tell you what it is now, Captain. Rather than kill you and be hung for such a shabby rascal, we won't lift a hand against you unless you attack us. But till you say the word about not flogging us, we don't do a hand's turn. Down into the forecastle, then. Down with ye. I'll keep you there till you're sick of it. Down you go. Shall we? cried the ringleader to his men. Most of them were against it, but at length, in obedience to Steelkilt, they preceded him down into their dark den, growlingly disappearing like bears into a cave. As the lakeman's bare head was just level with the planks, the captain and his posse leaped the barricade, and, rapidly drawing over the slide of the scuttle, planted their group of hands upon it and loudly called for the steward to bring the heavy brass padlock belonging to the companionway. Then, opening the slide a little, the captain whispered something down the crack, closed it, and turned the key upon them, ten in number, leaving on deck some twenty or more, who thus far had remained neutral. All night a wide-awake watch was kept by all the officers, forward and aft, especially about the forecastle scuttle and fore hatchway, at which last place was feared the insurgents might emerge after breaking through the bulkhead below. But the hours of darkness passed in peace, the men who still remained at their duty toiling hard at the pumps, whose clinking and clanking at intervals through the dreary night dismally resounded through the ship. At sunrise the captain went forward and, knocking on the deck, summoned the prisoners to work but with a yell they refused. Water was then lowered down to them, and a couple of handfuls of biscuit were tossed after it. When again turning the key upon them and pocketing it, the captain returned to the quarter-deck. Twice every day for three days this was repeated, but on the fourth morning a confused wrangling, and then a scuffling was heard, as the customary summons was delivered and suddenly four men burst up from the forecastle, saying they were ready to turn too. The fetid closeness of the air, and a famishing diet, united perhaps to some fears of ultimate retribution, had constrained them to surrender at discretion. Emboldened by this, the captain reiterated his demand to the rest, but Steelkilt shouted to him a terrific hint to stop his babbling and betake himself where he belonged. On the fifth morning, 
three others of the mutineers bolted up into the air from the desperate arms below that sought to restrain them. Only three were left. "'Better turn two now?' said the captain with a heartless jeer. "'Shut us up again, will ye?' cried Steelkilt. "'Oh, certainly,' the captain, and the key clicked. It was at this point, gentlemen, that, enraged by the defection of seven of his former associates, and stung by the mocking voice that had last hailed him, and maddened by his long entombment in a place as black as the bowels of despair, it was then that Steelkilt proposed to the two canallers, thus far apparently of one mind with him, to burst out of their hole at the next summoning of the garrison, and armed with their keen mincing knives, long crescentic, heavy implements with a handle at each end, run amuck from bowsprit to taffrail, and if by any devilishness of desperation possible, seize the ship. For himself he would do this, he said, whether they joined him or not. That was the last night he should spend in that den. But the scheme met with no opposition on the part of the other two. They swore they were ready for that, or for any other mad thing, for anything in short but a surrender. And what was more, they each insisted on being the first man on deck, when the time to make the rush should come. But to this their leader as fiercely objected, reserving that priority for himself, particularly as his two comrades would not yield the one to the other in the matter, and both of them could not be first, for the latter would but admit one man at a time. And here, gentlemen, the foul play of these miscreants must come out. Upon hearing the frantic project of their leader, each in his own separate soul had suddenly lighted, it would seem, upon the same piece of treachery, namely to be foremost in breaking out, in order to be the first of the three, though the last of the ten, to surrender, and thereby secure whatever small chance of pardon such conduct might merit. But when Steelkilt made known his determination still to lead them to the last, they in some way, by some subtle chemistry of villainy, mixed their before secret treacheries together, and when their leader fell into a doze, verbally opened their souls to each other in three sentences, and bound the sleeper with cords, and gagged him with cords, and shrieked out for the captain at midnight. Thinking murder at hand, and smelling in the dark for the blood, he and all his armed mates and harpooners rushed for the forecastle. In a few minutes the scuttle was opened, and, bound hand and foot, the still struggling ringleader was shoved up into the air by his perfidious allies, who at once claimed the honor of securing a man who had been fully ripe for murder. But all these were collared, and dragged along the deck like dead cattle, and side by side were seized up into the mizzen rigging, like three quarters of meat, and there they hung till morning. "'Damn ye!' cried the captain, pacing to and fro before them. The vultures would not touch ye, you villains. At sunrise he summoned all hands, and separating those who had rebelled from those who had taken no part in the mutiny, he told the former that he had a good mind to flog them all round, thought upon the whole he would do so, he ought to, justice demanded it, but for the present, considering their timely surrender, he would let them go with a reprimand, which he accordingly administered in the vernacular. But as for you, ye carrion rogues, turning to the three men in the rigging, for you, I mean to mince you up for the tripots. And seizing a rope, he applied it with all his might to the backs of the two traitors, till they yelled no more, but lifelessly hung their heads sideways, as the two crucified thieves are drawn. My wrist is sprained with ye, he cried at last but there's still rope enough left for you, my fine bantam, that wouldn't give up. Take that gag from his mouth, and let us hear what he can say for himself. For a moment the exhausted mutineer made a tremulous motion of his cramped jaws, then painfully twisting round his head, said in a sort of hiss, What I say is this, and mind it well. If you flog me, I murder you. "'Say ye so? See then how ye frighten me!' And the captain drew off with the rope to strike. "'Best not. 
hissed the lakeman. But I must, and the rope was once more drawn back for the stroke. Steelkilt here hissed out something, inaudible to all but the captain, who, to the amazement of all hands, started back, paced the deck rapidly two or three times, and then, suddenly throwing down his rope, said, I won't do it. Let him go. Cut him down, do you hear? But as the junior mates were hurrying to execute the order, a pale man with a bandaged head arrested them. Radney, the chief mate. Ever since the blow he had lain in his berth, but that morning, hearing the tumult on the deck, he had crept out, and thus far had watched the whole scene. Such was the state of his mouth that he could hardly speak, but mumbling something about his being willing and able to do what the captain dared not attempt, he snatched the rope and advanced to his pinioned foe. "'You are a coward,' hissed the lakeman. "'So I am, but take that!' The mate was in the very act of striking, when another hiss stayed his uplifted arm. He paused, and then, pausing no more, made good his words, spite of Steel Kilt's threat, whatever that might have been. The three men were then cut down, all hands were turned to, and sullenly worked by the moody seamen, the iron pumps clanged as before. Just after dark that day, when one watch had retired below, a clamour was heard in the forecastle, and the two trembling traders running up besieged the cabin door, saying they durst not consort with the crew. Entreaties, cuffs, and kicks could not drive them back, so at their own instance they were put down in the ship's run for salvation. Still, no sign of mutiny reappeared among the rest. On the contrary, it seemed that mainly at steel kilts instigation they had resolved to maintain the strictest peacefulness, obey all orders to the last, and, when the ship reached port, desert her in a body. But in order to ensure the speediest end to the voyage, they all agreed to another thing, namely, not to sing out for whales, in case any should be discovered. For spite of her leak, and spite of all her other perils, the town ho still maintained her mastheads, and her captain was just as willing to lower for a fish at that moment as on the day his craft first struck the cruising ground, and Radney, the mate, was quite as ready to change his berth for a boat, and with his bandaged mouth seek to gag in death the vital jaw of the whale. But though the lakeman had induced the seamen to adopt this sort of passiveness in their conduct, he kept his own counsel, at least till all was over, concerning his own proper and private revenge upon the man who had stung him in the ventricles of his heart. He was in Radney, the chief mate's watch, and, as if the infatuated man sought to run more than half-way to meet his doom, after the scene at the rigging he insisted, against the express counsel of the captain, upon resuming the head of his watch at night. Upon this, and one or two other circumstances, Steelkilt systematically built the plan of his revenge. During the night Radney had an unseamanlike way of sitting on the bulwarks of the quarter-deck, and leaning his arm upon the gunwale of the boat which was hoisted up there, a little above the ship's side. In this attitude, it was well known, he sometimes dozed. There was a considerable vacancy between the boat and the ship, and down between this was the sea. Steelkilt calculated his time, and found that his next trick at the helm would come round at two o'clock, in the morning of the third day from that in which he had been betrayed. At his leisure he employed the interval in braiding something very carefully in his watches below. "'What are you making there?' said a shipmate. "'What do you think? What does it look like?' "'Like a lanyard for your bag. But it's an odd one, seems to me.' "'Yes, rather oddish,' said the lakeman, holding it at arm's length before him. "'But I think it will answer. "'Shipmate, I haven't enough twine. Have you any?' but there was none in the forecastle. Then I must get some from old Rad. And he rose to go aft. You don't mean to go a-begging to him, said a sailor. Why not? Do you think he won't do me a turn when it's to help himself in the end, shipmate? And going to the mate, he looked at him quietly, 
and asked him for some twine to mend his hammock. It was given him. Neither twine nor lanyard were seen again, but the next night an iron ball, closely netted, partly rolled from the pocket of the lakeman's monkey jacket, as he was tucking the coat into his hammock for a pillow. Twenty-four hours after, his trick at the silent helm, nigh to the man who was apt to doze over the grave always ready dug to the seaman's hand, that fatal hour was then to come, and in the foreordaining soul of steel-kilt the mate was already stark and stretched as a corpse, with his forehead crushed in. But, gentlemen, a fool saved the would-be murderer from the bloody deed he had planned, yet complete revenge he had, and without being the avenger, for by a mysterious fatality heaven itself seemed to step in and take out of his hands into its own the damning thing he would have done. It was just between daybreak and sunrise of the morning of the second day, when they were washing down the decks, that a stupid Tenerife man, drawing water in the main chains, all at once shouted out, "'There she rolls! There she rolls! She's you! What a whale!' It was Moby Dick. "'Moby Dick!' cried Don Sebastian. "'Saint Dominic! Sir Sailor! But do whales have christenings?' Whom call you Moby Dick? A very white and famous and most deadly immortal monster, Don, but that would be too long a story. How, how, cried all the young Spaniards, crowding. Nay, Don's, Don's, nay, nay, I cannot rehearse that now. Let me get more into the air, sirs. The chicha, the chicha, cried Don Pedro. Our vigorous friend looks faint. Fill up his empty glass. No need, gentlemen. One moment, and I proceed. Now, gentlemen, so suddenly perceiving the snowy whale within fifty yards of the ship, forgetful of the compact among the crew, in the excitement of the moment the Tenerife man had instinctively and involuntarily lifted his voice for the monster, though for some little time past it had been plainly beheld from the three sullen mastheads, all was now a frenzy. The white whale! The white whale! was the cry from the captain, mates, and harpooners, who, undeterred by fearful rumors, were all anxious to capture so famous and precious a fish, while the dogged crew eyed askance, and with curses, the appalling beauty of the vast milky mass that lit up by a horizontal spangling sun shifted and glistened like a living opal in the blue morning sea. Gentlemen, a strange fatality pervades the whole career of these events, as if verily mapped out before the world itself was charted. The mutineer was the bowsman of the mate, and when fast to the fish, it was his duty to sit next to him while Radney stood up with his lance in the prow, and haul in or slacken the line at the word of command. Moreover, when the four boats were lowered, the mates got the start, and none howled more fiercely with delight than did Steelkilt as he strained at his oar. After a stiff pull their harpooner got fast, and spear in hand Radney sprang to the bow. He was always a furious man, it seems, in a boat, and now his bandaged cry was to beach him on the whale's topmost back. Nothing loath, his bowsman hauled him up and up, and through a blinding foam that blent two whitenesses together, till of a sudden the boat struck as against a sunken ledge, and, keeling over, spilled out the standing mate. That instant, as he fell on the whale's slippery back, the boat righted and was dashed aside by the swell, while Radney was tossed over into the sea, on the other flank of the whale. He struck out through the spray, and for an instant was dimly seen through that veil, wildly seeking to remove himself from the eye of Moby Dick. But the whale rushed round in a sudden maelstrom, seized the swimmer between his jaws, and rearing high up with him, plunged headlong again and went down. Meantime, at the first tap of the boat's bottom, the lakeman had slackened the line, so as to drop astern from the whirlpool. Calmly looking on, he thought his own thoughts. 
but a sudden terrific downward jerking of the boat quickly brought his knife to the line. He cut it, and the whale was free. But at some distance Moby Dick rose again, and with some tatters of Radney's red woolen shirt, caught in the teeth that had destroyed him. All four boats gave chase again, but the whale eluded them, and finally wholly disappeared. In good time the town ho reached her port, a savage, solitary place, where no civilized creature resided. There, headed by the lakemen, all but five or six of the foremastmen deliberately deserted among the palms, and eventually, as it turned out, seizing a large double war canoe of the savages, and setting sail for some other harbor. The ship's company being reduced to but a handful, the captain called upon the islanders to assist him in the laborious business of heaving down the ship to stop the leak. But to such unresting vigilance over their dangerous allies was this small band of whites necessitated, both by day and by night, and so extreme was the hard work they underwent, that upon the vessel being ready again for the sea, they were in such a weakened condition that the captain durst not put off with them in so heavy a vessel. After taking counsel with his officers, he anchored the ship as far off shore as possible, loaded and ran out his two cannon from the bows, stacked his muskets on the poop, and warning the islanders not to approach the ship at their peril, took one man with him, and setting the sail of his best whale-boat, steered straight before the wind for Tahiti, five hundred miles distant, to procure a reinforcement to his crew. On the fourth day of the sail a large canoe was descried, which seemed to have touched at a low isle of corals. He steered away from it, but the savage craft bore down on him, and soon the voice of steel-kilt hailed him to heave to, or he would run him under water. The captain presented a pistol. With one foot on each prow of the yoked war-canoes, the lakeman laughed him to scorn, assuring him that if the pistol so much as clicked in the lock, he would bury him in bubbles and foam. "'What do you want of me?' cried the captain. "'Where are you bound, and for what are you bound?' demanded Steelkilt. "'No lies!' I am bound to Tahiti for more men. Very good. Let me board you a moment. I come in peace. With that he leaped from the canoe, swam to the boat, and, climbing the gunwale, stood face to face with the captain. Cross your arms, sir. Throw back your head. Now repeat after me. As soon as Steelkilt leaves me, I swear to beach this boat on yonder island, and remain there six days. If I do not, may lightning strike me. A pretty scholar, laughed the lakeman. Adios, senor. And, leaping into the sea, he swam back to his comrades. Watching the boat till it was fairly beached, and drawn up to the roots of the coconut trees, Steelkilt made sail again, and in due time arrived at Tahiti, his own place of destination. There luck befriended him, Two ships were about to sail for France, and were providentially in want of precisely that number of men which the sailor headed. They embarked, and so forever got the start of their former captain, had he been at all minded to work them legal retribution. Some ten days after the French ships sailed, the whale-boat arrived, and the captain was forced to enlist some of the more civilized Tahitians, who had been somewhat used to the sea. Chartering a small native schooner, he returned with them to his vessel, and finding all right there, again resumed his cruisings. Where steel kilt now is, gentlemen, none know, but upon the island of Nantucket, the widow of Radney still turns to the sea, which refuses to give up its dead, still in dreams sees the awful white whale that destroyed him. "'Are you through?' said Don Sebastian quietly. "'I am, Don.' Then I entreat you. Tell me if, to the best of your own convictions, this your story is in substance really true. It is so passing wonderful. Did you get it from an unquestionable source? Bear with me if I seem to press. Also bear with all of us, Sir Sailor, for we all join in Don Sebastian's suit, cried the company, with exceeding interest. 
Is there a copy of the Holy Evangelist at the Golden Inn, gentlemen? <laughs> Nay, said Don Sebastian, but I know a worthy priest nearby who will quickly procure one for me. I go for it, but are you well advised? This may grow too serious. Will you be so good as to bring the priest also, Don? Though there are no auto de fes in Lima now, said one of the company to another, I fear our sailor friend runs risk of the archiepiscopy. Let us withdraw more out of the moonlight. I see no need of this. Excuse me for running after you, Don Sebastian, but may I also beg that you will be particular in procuring the largest-sized evangelists you can. This is the priest, and he brings you the evangelists, said Don Sebastian gravely, returning with a tall and solemn figure. Let me remove my hat. Now, venerable priest, further into the light, and hold the holy book before me, that I may touch it. So help me heaven, and on my honor, the story I have told you, gentlemen, is in substance, and its great items, true. I know it to be true. It happened on this ball. I trod the ship. I knew the crew. I have seen and talked with Steelkilt since the death of Radney. End of chapter 54